in the non-priority situation. So once again, three surfers try and find the last ride on that next set. We're just about 14 minutes from the start. All right, once again, we're asking the free surfers to clear the water. It looks like we're nine minutes from the start. Surfers in Eagle, grab jerseys. You guys can 
start making your way out whenever you're ready. We'll give you the one minute, uh, no thirteen. Hold your position, and then we'll have the ten second count in like we do. So about eight and a half to the start. These last fifteen surfers in the lineup, we ask your cooperation to find one last ride. Looks like a little mid size set coming in right now. A couple little waves, absolutely not a set, but rideable. So let's find one of these waves and clear the lineup. We're about eight minutes from the start. Finals day down here at Corvo Classic. Checking in, red, Taylor Jensen, blue, Eduard Del Perro. Standby, Kai Salas, Kaimana Takuyama. You guys will be paddling out about 15, 18 minutes for that. Into the first heat, 20 minutes will be underway. Malibu, one of the world's most iconic surf spots. The original perfect wave. A cultural hotbed where cool was born. How's that merch with style? The WSL Longboard Tour returns to this 400 yard long cobblestone point for its final stop, where world champions will be crowned. Looking free, looking yeah. powerful, looking dangerous. With the world titles up for grabs, Surfers look to cement themselves in the history books. Those who demonstrate the style, flow, and grace of traditional surfing will rise to the top. Poises himself on the nose. This is the Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. Across this thing, big, high 
Another trip to the nose. Dancing his way to this beautiful section. He controlled that with so much style. Trim and style through this inside section. Why not switch that? Unreal. Good morning and welcome to the Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. And the waves have shown up in a brilliant form. First point Malibu, looking dreamlike, three to four foot, light offshore winds, epic conditions. And what a day we have in store for you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kaipo, along with Matt Chanosky, AKA the Waxhead. And Matt, I was pleasantly surprised when I rolled up this morning and took a look at the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, that uh, groundswell that was meant to fill in a little earlier yesterday did come late, but it was slow, Kaipo, this morning. You know, it's kind of like a six hour delayed swell. So very consistent this morning in comparison to yesterday, three to four feet. So for those at home, that's probably about chest height, but we will have waves from waist up to probably head high, depending on the tides today. Yeah, and the height of the competitor. <laughs> of course, Skypo. <laughs> Starting off the morning with a joke. and uh, But I tell you what, these heats coming up are no joke. Heavy hitters straight out of the gate. Yeah, we, I mean, hey, we got world titles that are going to be handed out this afternoon on the sand here at an iconic break, Malibu, California. The most iconic longboard wave, this is the longboarders pipeline. Uh, for example, we talk about the holy grail for, for shortboard surfing and this is it for longboarding. Uh, there's a lot of history here. The walls, could, if they could speak, you know, it's been referred to in the past as a bulletin board of such, where the messages, whether it's good or bad, used to be graffitied up there, and you knew that you were the hot surfer in town if your name was up there, uh, whether it was a good or bad connotation associated with it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Yeah, and it's been generations. Uh, but you know what? The song remains the same. It's a perfect right point break, lots of opportunity, um, really excited for today, finals day. But for more on that, I'm going to throw it down to our beach reporter, Strider Wazalewski. Thank you, Kaipo. Beautiful morning down here. A little chilly, a little offshore, but definitely a lot of waves coming in. It looks beautiful out there. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to crown world champions today. The waves are absolutely pumping. It's about head high to a foot overhead for some people. No, <laughs> but it's really good. I'm excited. I can't wait to see the rest of it go down. So how's our format going today? So we're starting off with a round of 16 men's and finishing that. Then we'll go into the men's quarters, the women's quarters, men's semifinal, women's semifinal, men's final, and then we're actually finishing the day with the women's final, so. Well, the ladies are gonna finish us off today. I can't wait to see the rest of it go down. Thanks for the info. Back to you guys. Uh, thank you, Strider and Kira Seeley, who's uh, running the comp right now. Well, Kawabunga. Let's get it going. Can't wait. This is going to be a fantastic day and such a fitting finals day, Kaipo. Will this sun pop today? I think this, uh, this gloom may clear and we're going to get another beautiful, warm day ahead. Let's get some information from our good friends over at Surfline and today's forecast. Taking a look at what's been happening down in the Southern Hemisphere, Matt. So as we All can developing right there. Yeah, bringing us the swell. Absolutely, and Australia has just come off the back of some nice consistent swell, courtesy of this week-long storm that's been generating, and we're reaping the benefits of that with that long-range south-southwest swell. Uh, the periods dropped a little, so throughout the day, we will get three to four foot wave faces. You can see the period go from 16 through to 15 seconds. So we will see more consistency, and it's gonna be hitting the point just right. Uh, thank you to Surfline, as always, for the insight and the intel. But we've already kicked it off. Thank you for joining us and uh, spread the word because today's finals day here at the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. And we're just moments away for the start of the first heat of the morning. You can see out there that silky smooth surface. Uh, I think the surfers might relish a little bit of sunshine. Uh, although in some places that glassy, uh, the glassy waves can be exacerbated by that sun, but here in California, it's really hard to distinguish between what's set and what's not. 
when you don't have that uh, that sunshine to to provide. So the cloud cover can be a detriment. Yeah, uh, there is you know identifying in this flat light you would call it the flat light right there. Um, sometimes you can't see the contours of the waves, and like you said, Matt, a little bit harder to, to maybe spot the sets coming. And those inside sections that run off, which we saw uh, a number of surfers actually win heats but also make errors in judgment, not being able to capitalize on that end section because it runs away from you. It's really difficult to judge that timing. It's a perfect wave, but it does have its idiosyncrasies. 30 seconds. Well, how's 30 seconds. this opening matchup that we're looking at? Well, first we'll look at Ben Skinner because he's going to be coming up a little bit later. Skin Dog. Uh, but our opening matchup, Taylor Jensen. And Edward Del Perro is gonna are gonna start us off this morning. We're just moments away. I can hear the countdown from the beach, comms and the horn sounds. Clocks on 40 minute heat, overlapping format. First heat in the water. Taylor Jensen, Edward Del Perro. Remember Taylor Jensen. Uh, won our last event over at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Also, Taylor Jensen, a three-time world champ. So, my scouting report on this, Matt, on paper, I think Taylor Jensen's the favorites. What are your thoughts? I would have to agree with that, especially with the clips that he's produced in the lead up to this event. We're seeing a new invigorated Taylor really utilizing parts of the board that that we haven't seen. He, there was glimpses of it uh, with that flow and momentum in Huntington. But as we see here, and Edward Del Perro looks behind him, looks behind the shoulder to see what's behind him. Uh, we'll see if this wave breaks away. You can see that offshore wind, Kaipo. There's almost that little bowl that's cupping out. Beautiful timing there from Edward. A little bit of backwash there. The tide's transitioning. It'll be dropping with a midday low tide. Beautiful adjustment there from Edward. You see him sort of shuffle his feet around from a wide five to a tight five. A nice, clean, open face. So much opportunity. It's be difficult to try and pack it all into one wave. Well, nice opener so far. We'll see what happens right on the shore break in the finish. Gets back up to the nose one more time for Del Perro and kicks out with a lot of control. So that's got to be a good feeling to start off your heat. We've got 40 minutes ahead of <laughs> priority heat, so uh, you know, you just got to get the ball ball rolling, and that's exactly what Edward did, and we'll, we'll wait to see that replay. But Edward and Taylor, the, the rivalry goes a long way back, Kaipo, and uh, both of them have been said on webcast before that their best surfing comes out against each other. Well, the replay, we get one more look at this, Matt. Really, really impressed on the maneuvering that Edward's able to do right from the nose. And you see, uh, sort of pushing those hips forward, a little shuffle back just to make that nose ride and stop the nose from purling. And here, this little adjustment, bang, bang. All right, perfect. That's tip control, and that's showing the judges that there is some variety in his nose riding. It's not just to get up and plant them. And you can see the rocker in that log. It is a, a uh, traditional style board. There is an edge in the tail, but you can see the rails, quite bulky as well, and some nose flip as well. And that allows him to get those nose rides. And see there, the nose is hovering above the water. Not necessarily that elevation on that end section like we saw yesterday in moments, but on the outside section, that's where the weight of the board and the single fin really comes into its own. Yeah, on the paddle back out, waiting to hear the news of the opening score. And a lot of times what happens is that opening score will set the scale for the rest of the day. And what a lovely morning here in Malibu. Kicking it off, finals day. Again, we're going to have two world champs on the podium this afternoon, both for men and women's. And the road to those world titles starts right here. First heat of the morning, Taylor Jensen against Edward Del Perro. Taylor Jensen waiting out with priority. No waves written for Jensen, waiting for first score for Edward Del Perro. And a lot of times, Matt, this first score of the day takes a while because this is really when the judges are having discussions and setting today's scale. Absolutely, the judges will be taking into account 
um, the waves that we'll be expecting today. If that was in one of those slower heats yesterday, it would have gone possibly into the excellent range. But the judges have to consider the type of surfing they want to expect uh, for the rest of the day, the caliber of surfers, and we are at the world's best longboard wave. So there's going to be a very high expectation. But opening that up, Edward's score's been locked in, Kaipo. 6.5, you can see all the judges' numbers on your screen. Again, we dropped the low score of a six. We dropped the high score, which is a seven in this case, and then we average out the remaining three. And there you go with that 6.5. So above mid-range score, nice start for Edward Del Perro. He's gonna want some bigger numbers as keepers in his two wave heat total but it's a nice start right now i liked where the judges went with that edward uh, kaipo with edward's wave there was a lot of variety uh he really mixed up the nose with the turns but it was more so the critical positioning that he was able to position himself way back in the pocket well when we talk about judging let's have a little bit more insight with our head judge tori gilkerson and let's see what tori had to say about criteria and judging Malibu Longboard Championship. This is the culmination of the longboard season, where we'll be crowning a men's and women's world champion at one of the best longboard waves in the world, Malibu First Point. This is what the judges are going to be looking for at Malibu. The servers have to perform controlled maneuvers in the critical part of the wave, utilizing the entire wave and board in the spirit of traditional longboarding. The following are key elements for the judges to consider. Nose riding and rail surfing. Critical part of the wave, Variety, speed and power, commitment, control, and footwork. One of the most difficult and technical maneuvers in longboarding is hanging 10. It's really hard to do. It looks beautiful, and it's going to get highly rewarded. Malibu is one of the most special points in the world. You couldn't have a more ideal wave for traditional longboarding and the service to express their personal styles. Tori Gilkerson, our head judge on the longboard tour, and Tori also the 2016 world longboard champ. Another look at the 6.5, Matt, opener for Eduard Del Perro. Yeah, so we see him open up, wait for this section, then bang, straight up to the 10, deep into the pocket, and this wave's cupped out. It's a very, this is a classic morning Malibu wave, despite the little wonk and the wobble, uh, that offshore wind, making that wave almost appear hollow. Lots of touches of tens, technical nose steering, and here, gets some rail work done, sets it back up again. Gets a little excited here, but it's really difficult to tell what this wave was going to do. And it did allow lots of opportunities for Edward. The judges loving that combination of rail turns, that nose riding, but use of the middle of the board, the cross steps, as Tori said in our uh, judging recap, that was, that's a classic 6.5 ride. And if you're a competitor coming up, I think the biggest sign would be variety. We saw Tully White yesterday with the first excellent score get locked in. And she was very free form, Kaipo, very flowing. There was no specific agenda when Tully stood up on the wave. She surfed what was in front of her. And on a point break like Malibu, it's really easy to get stuck into a repetitive motion. As we see a lot at point breaks around the world with the Challenger Series and the Championship Tour, the repetitiveness through the rounds can get a little tiring for everyone to watch, and the judges take note of that. So today, I think the aim of the game will be to spice things up and increase that variety. A lot of opportunity to put uh, to add some variety to your ride because this is a long-running right-hand point here at First Point Malibu, and uh, the swell increased overnight, but also there will be some quiet periods because we're still in a, in a longer period. So I feel like later today when the, when the period shortens up, maybe that will help with the consistency. Your thoughts, Matt? I would think so. That tide may, as it starts to bottom out and come back in again, we will see another pulse. We do have overlapping heats, so no waves will go unridden. And I think with this type of swell, you may get those smaller waves, as I did allude to at the beginning of the broadcast, we'll get waist high waves. But there'll also be some head high waves, obviously, depending on the size of the, the surfer, but between two to four feet. And I don't think there's going to be much uh, deduction in points because the smaller waves spin and they allow really critical positioning on the nose. Taylor Jensen entering a, a possibility for a fourth world title, and he shows he's still got what it takes. Taylor Jensen looking back at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, where Taylor was dominant on the south side of the pier 
great mix of nose riding, but also, Matt, I enjoyed the power surfing from Jensen. Spot on, but it all came from his cross step. See here, stepping forward, and then in the middle, and off the tail. So he utilized that midsection, and here, back to the middle. Trim, 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 back on the tail again. There was no pumping off the tail. Everything was rail to rail and utilizing that flow. Yeah, Taylor Jensen, a family man, um, and also part of a great lineage. When you look at surfing and Taylor's story, he married Nat Young's daughter, Nava, and they have two, two, two daughters, uh, Jagger and Zion. Um, but when you look at the whole family tree of surfing, Nava's dad, Nat Young, not the Santa Cruz Nat Young, the original Australian Nat Young, had a lot of contributions to surfing and three world titles. And you know, the ironic thing about that is uh, Taylor's size and dominance in the modern era of longboarding can be compared to that of Nat's resurgence in the 80s, but also his performance in San Diego in 1966, where he took out that world title against favorites such as David Nueva and the performance that Nat put on is still revered today because after that win, it was considered to be the, the, the pinnacle of the longboard era. Longboarding disappeared for 20 years. Right. And guess who won the, 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 the first world title as it came back? 1988, Nat Young, Nat Young and he went, did a three-peat, 88, 89, and 90. But I want to correct myself because Nat Young is actually a four-time world champion. Back in 66, that wasn't a longboard world champion. That was a surfing surfing world champion. And, and in 66, you could choose your equipment. Could be a longboard, could be a fish. Yep. Could be a, you know. Like well, by 67, 68, uh, the Puerto Rico event in 1968. So we're talking 18 months to 24 months time. Guys went from riding 10-foot nose riders, turning up in Puerto Rico with seven, six pintails. Right. You guys are busting off the top, flexing out. Wayne Lynch going vertical while there was still some Californians hanging 10. Yeah, it was, it was a, a transition was a period time. in surfing, wasn't it? It was a really interesting... I mean, it, as, as bo both Matt and I, as surfers, but I, I, I encourage every surfer to kind of look at some archive footage, look at some old movies, old videos, and just the evolution of surfing because we have such a rich heritage, and that's part of our... And that's, that's still... What makes us who we are today as surfers is where we came from, mm. you know? And, 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 and where we came from, we're a bunch of like experimentalists. Guys just experimenting with stuff that, you know, they don't know what was gonna happen. They didn't know what was gonna work. And you know why longboards made a resurgence, Kaipo? It's because guys realized the right board for the right conditions needs to be applied. When Rocco really came into the shortboards, it became almost impossible for the average person to ride a high-performance surfboard, and it was at a detriment to a lot of professional surfers' careers. The guys got on those bananaed out boards in the early 90s and realized, wow, we, are, we can't paddle for waves, we're missing waves. We're not actually able to utilize the sole purpose of why we actually surf is to catch waves. Yeah. And longboards made that resurgence, mixing with the old and the new, and here we are today, uh, we are taking off, we are moving on from what Nat Young left in 1966. We're taking that and we're packaging up into a brand new uh, revitalized longboard tour. And thanks to the likes of Devin Howard and the WSL team, Will Hayden Smith working behind the scenes incredibly hard through 2017, 18 and 19 to get to where we are today in Malibu. I, I agree, and that, that, in that shortboard, in that glass slipper era, it was a tough era to surf through. Del Perro, wave number two, wants to back up that 6.5, and here he goes, right to the nose. Great option, under priority, Kaipo, holding that 10. Wow, and wow, super stable nose riding. You can see that offshore wind really allowing some extended nose time. He, I don't know why he's looking behind him. It's, he's on a perfect looking wave. Taylor's opening up his account behind oh. him. Wow, and Edward opts out of that wave. And so does Taylor. This is absolutely mind-boggling because it's pumping and the guys are so worried about each other, they need to surf. That's exactly what I was going to, I had the exact same thing. takeaway, Matt, is that both surfers appear to be really, really, maybe too aware of the other competitor instead of surfing is just in the moment and just surfing. Uh, so that was a wild exchange. That was uh, so we're gonna ha we're gonna have a little 
sneak into the mentality of surfers <laughs> right now. Mm. Competitive mentality, some sports psychology, what's going on out there. But Jensen right here, bad section in front of him. Wow, and I mean, I, I guess they're expecting, they've got a lot of respect for each other, so they really are wanting to go into that excellent range. And Edward was on his way here. That was a great setup. And here, it does not get any more perfect than that. Here he is. Bang. Hips go out. And he's just not quite. And it's just a very stable 10. Nice carve. Steps back off and looks behind him. And there's a great wall. I mean, it did bowl out on him, but it was he was on his way to an equal, if not better, score yeah. than that 6-5. That was um, perhaps even in the excellent range if he'd have finished it off. But highly unorthodox highly unorthodox and I did predict this I was chatting to our longboard uh, tour managers uh, mum who's a very well uh, versed spectator in longboarding having really uh, nurtured Kira through her career uh, before she became the the tour manager and I said I don't think there's gonna be that many waves ridden in this heat they're gonna be waiting for those sets but they just have so much respect for each other, both of these competitors. Well, what's on the line here is uh, Taylor Jensen, early on in this heat with this advantage towards Edward Del Paro, is it, it putting himself in risk of gaining that fourth world title. Taylor Jensen, our number two seed coming into this event. With that win in Huntington Beach, he's top tiered right now to take a world title, but he needs to get through this heat right here, and he's off to a clumsy start. Absolutely, <laughs> it's 15 minutes gone, and that would be a missed opportunity. We could uh, put a dot point there, and hopefully that doesn't come back to, to haunt him later in the heat. But they have been here since daybreak as well, Kaipo, no doubt timing sets and observing, and uh, as we see the two are leaderboard there. Keep in mind, both of those, uh, we've got one to ten there, and that includes both events, Manly and Huntington. As we go back to Taylor, nice arch ten there. Very critical nose ride. Playing a little safe by Taylor standards and leaning into that cutback, and here he goes, setting it up for the midsection of the wave. Elegant footwork. Trademark Taylor snap. You can see those beautiful glassy waves. Taylor's bowling out. It's going to, it's going to run on the inside. Some of the waves have been bowling a little too much and Edward may have the pick here beautiful hang 10 on the outside for our surfer in blue the Frenchman carving into the bowl as we cast our eyes to Edward on the outside and again gets that little touch 10 and Taylor on the inside getting a little upright moment wow this is a huge exchange and Taylor's going to be watching here let's see if Edward finishes this or pulls out to get priority no, he goes forward and he wants to complete. He knows he's onto a good wave and he needs it too because Taylor will be locking in a very healthy score after his opening set wave. Well, there you go. Taylor Jensen likely to regain first priority as well as his real first meaningful score in his matchup against Eduard Del Perro, the big man Jensen. Long strokes there, getting back out. And his performance on his wave, in contrast to Edward Del Perro, you could see the power of the turns that Taylor Jensen's able to put his leverage through. Absolutely, and really not even, uh, his hand does raise, but his upper body is barely, uh, there's no torque through the turns. He just shows that lower uh, power through his legs. He doesn't actually even, where Edward really, animates his body. Uh, it is part of his frame and he surfs to his body shape. And here we go, long five. And then he is sort of on the, the, uh, the looking into the wave. You could see he did get that foot over the rail. So it is like a, a, a hang 10 there. It's a, some would call it a tight five, but look, his, his back foot is teetering into the, into, onto the uh, side of the rail there. So. Be interesting to see where the judges go with that. There's a little bit of discussion that we talked about what a proper hang 10 is with Andy Meggs yesterday. Uh, but in certain elements on a wave, having those both feet over the front of the nose can interrupt the water flow. And here we have Taylor. Bang. Once again, see his back foot is sort of off to the side of the nose. I would call it a 10. Midsection pump. I love that transition there off the middle. Utilizing the top of the wave as it's bowling through, stepping back and bang. Great timing. 
great flow, great variety. Yeah. And that wave really allowed him to open up here, Kaipo. Yeah, just the leverage. I mean, the combination of footwork, nose riding, but then the power in which he's able to just scream through those turns is really what sets the difference to me between Taylor Jensen and Edward Del Perro. Yeah, that 10 at the end there was a, uh, a nice finish there. The judges will take note of that inside section and your legs start burning when it gets towards the end of a wave like this. Well, we're waiting for scores for both yeah, Edward Del Perro as well as Taylor Jensen. We're going to step away for a break. When we return, we're going to give you that score and the conclusion of this first heat here at the Cuervo Classic Malibu. Back at the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill and the scores are in for Taylor Jensen and Edward Del Perro. Eight point ride, excellent ride for Taylor Jensen, a seven point ride for Del Perro. But as you can see on your screen, the two wave total favors Edward Del Perro. In the overlapping heat format, we have a new heat in the water. As we come back live, Kai Salas versus Kaimana Takayama in the non-priority heat. And let's take a look here at Kaimana Takayama on his first wave. Kai, just mid-trim there, gets a five. And wave runs away on the inside right behind him. Planted on the nose is Kai Salas. Gets up to a 10, classic pose now to right Mid-board turns, utilizing the entire rail. Sweeping through another section, graceful in the style, light on the feet, right to the nose. Five toes curled over the nose, goes to 10, pulls it out there, gets the completion. And early advantage to Kai Salas on the opening exchange between those two in heat number two, Matt. Wow, great opener there for Kai Salas. Kaimana Takayama, I knew he was gonna start. Uh, on anything, just to get his feet in the wax, and he's going to enjoy this 40 minutes uh, to surf the world's premier longboard wave. I think we've got a board change from yesterday with uh, Kaiselis. Different board? It looks, it, it does appear like that. We'll get some confirmation. A little more pulled in tail, because yesterday he had a giant tail block on his board. Perhaps the nose a little narrower too. And here we go. Beautiful 10 to open up, and he holds it, Kaipo. This wave stretched all the way, so he's looking at a at a at 100 feet of wall in front of him, and here he goes. 
in the middle of the board. You saw a lot of surfers doing yesterday. And the wave is offshore wind is holding it up. It's not running away. But here, bang, straight up on the nose again. He's thinking variety. He's thinking that criteria. So if you can get a turn in here, he's going to tick those boxes. And what does he do? Banks it off the top and he finishes cleanly in the shore break. And that was surfed to perfection. Tankuyama here. And this is a drainy little one. This is one of those sort of knee to waist high waves that unfortunately the energy was sucked out from the wave behind him. And Kai just opening up his account, getting his feet in the wax, so to speak. And uh, he won't think much of that. And super confident surfer, Kaimana Takayama. And he'll be looking to grab a set wave whenever one pops up. Yeah, both Kaimana and Kai are in the non-priority heat. We have an overlapping heat format in this round of 16. So they're 40 minute heats. The first 20 minutes of your heat, you are in the non-priority heat where you have to yield to the priority heat no matter what the surfer is. And then the final 20 minutes of your heat, you're in the priority heat where you have really, you can rule the lineup within that heat. So a lot of heats, sometimes they can be, you know, a lot of advantage can happen in the non-priority heat, but the priority non-priority heat really are feeding on the scraps, if you would, of the priority heat in the water. Priority heat in the water being Edward Del Paro and Taylor Jensen with 14 minutes on the countdown. Non-priority heat, Kaimana Takayama and Kai Salas with 34 minutes on the countdown. Here is Kai Takayama on the Old Faithful. And again, just poised on the nose. Kaimana Takayama looking classic in every way. Right behind him though, the big, powerful Taylor Jensen with a nice mix of nose riding and giant down carves just like that. Edward Del Perro behind him wants to get in the conversation, slips up. Hope the board doesn't get away from Del Perro. We're gonna focus on Taylor Jensen here for his finish. A little ruffle on the inside here. Wall goes very tapered. So no more opportunity for Jensen. Right out the back though, Kai Salas finds the nose and scoots back for a beautiful carve back into the pocket. Wave cups out a bit and he's forced to carve back one more time. Looking for a long wall to be able to get into that nose right. Has to settle for a third carve. So a little bit of a tapered wall for Kai Salas, and he's just gonna have to do some turns right through the end. May affect the score on this wave, Matt. Wow, a lot to unpack during those exchanges there. All surfers getting phenomenal waves, but we'll go down to Strider, <laughs> and we'll see what uh, what he's got to say down there. Yeah, we're down here on the beach, actually getting the run around right now. Here we go, keep that hustle, and the, uh, the boys are, are opting to run around. The paddle is really long, you know, the conditioning and everything else that they're going for. Kai is now paddling in for the run around, so there's a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, techniques today to get back into the lineup. I mean, the beach here is, is beautiful. We've got such an epic setup down here. It's unbelievable. The scaffolding for the judges, you know, the, uh, the Turtle Bay VIP zone is epic. The competitors area is amazing here at the Cuervo Classic. I mean, it's super fun down here on the beach. So if you get the chance, you're in the area, get down here, check it out, because it's going to be just filling up and enjoyable all day. As you know, the vibe down here is second to none. And well, we got great waves to watch as well. It's almost painful because you want to be out there. <laughs> hey, Strider. What's happening? When, when's the sun going to come out? The sun is on its way. You can see it. It's up on the mountaintops right now. I'd give it about maybe an hour, and we're going to be back into the sunshine. So you guys can peel off the sweatshirts and get into your bikinis and enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Strider. Uh, he's the local weatherman, Strider Wazalewski. You can find him on a shortboard, longboard, a fish, anything. Usually he'll be in front of you. On a wave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, he's, he's very right. Yesterday, as soon as that sun that sun hit the clouds, uh, hit the sky, sorry, we and the clouds cleared. We, these sweatshirts did come off. We had to have a change of wardrobe through yesterday. And uh, I noticed today, Kaipo, you've got some uh, some socks and you've got some flip-flops as well. Um, we don't have a close-up of those, unfortunately, but uh, the Hawaiian Ugg boot, right? It's the Hawaiian Ugg boot. It's the slippers with the, with the uh, sock combo. All, All right. right, Taylor Jensen, this is a replay of his last ride. All right, Taylor. Tend to open up. Love that uh, sort of pulled back approach there because he knows he's got a long wave ahead. Beautiful rail carve, stepping back up into the middle, 
holding trim through the middle. Incredible timing there from Taylor. It's, it's really hard to put into uh, the equation here when you're looking at a wave that's running all the way down to the pier almost, Kaipo, and Taylor's timing, just holding back, less is more, and just everything perfectly placed. The camera angle looking into it was uh, quite dynamic, but also distracting because you had surfers in front and behind him as well. So this just shows how relaxed his body language was. And this one's Kaimana Takayama who opened up that exchange. He's in the non-priority heat. Beautiful 10 here, bang. Poised body language, that board levitating almost off the back of the wave. And he's leaning into this, trying to make, he knows it's a smaller wave and he's just trying to add some flair and show the judges, hey, Trying to use my rail here, some variety of uh, maneuvers. It was actually a really good wave by Kai, but unfortunately shadowed by the, the four wave set behind him. Well surfed, then he'll turn around and bang. Kai Salas, who actually picked this one up in front of Edward, who'd fallen off the previous wave in the priority heat. So he couldn't believe his luck. Kai's just like, yep, I'll take this. So I opened up with that nose ride and went to a series of rail carves here. Beautiful, seamless transitions. Almost falls off the back of one of them. And he gets a little tut here. But he makes a count. Okay, where's the nose? I want to touch the nose. It's been a good opening uh, start of this wave. And bang, 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 bang. And he rides into the shore break. So won't go into the excellent range, I feel, Kaipo. But uh, a, a really good settler type of wave there for uh, Kai Salas and Kaimana Takeyama. When we opened up those replays, we showed you Taylor Jensen's wave. That was a 6.23. So in the priority heat, that 6.23 combined with his eight-point ride, Taylor Jensen takes the lead off of Edward Del Perro with nine minutes remaining. Still waiting for scores for Kai Salas and Kai Takeyama in the non-priority heat. But Taylor Jensen getting the news now that he's in the lead. And we just saw there Kaimana and Kai Salas in that, that next heat just chatting. I uh, could imagine, how was your wave? How was your wave? Yeah, mine went all the way. Yeah, mine was so sick. I know how Kaimana gets all animated. He's like, yeah, I think like copped out. I was like, he was, he'd be so stoked. Then he would have turned around and seen Kai Salas' wave and gone, damn, I thought mine was good. Oh. Yeah. Let's, let's take a look at a, a moment in that exchange that just happened because there was a lot of waves that came through. It was a four-wave set. Now, check this out. Kai Salas is paddling for this, but Edward Derpero on the way out is in the priority heat. He could have spun around right there and taken that wave off of Kai Salas. So I don't know if that was a lapse in just uh, awareness for Edward Derpero. I mean, playing the priority game, hey, it might, it might look mean, <laughs> to someone to just burn someone like that, but he did have the right of way to take that wave off of Kai Salas. And Kai Salas got a decent score on that wave, a 5.23. Well, we saw it yesterday with Caitlin Mickelson turning around on Honolulu Blomfield in the same scenario, and both surfers recognized the situation. Honolulu actually pulled back off, and Caitlin was allowed priority. But I would imagine Edward's legs were burning. He just had a fantastic opening nose ride. And it was in between that exchange, but he, he pearled. He actually nosedived, and he didn't lose his board. But from a competitor and surfer's perspective, when you lose your board, there is that moment of, like, um, uh, energy, that adrenaline. You're like, where's my board? Where's my board? And, you know, you can start to feel really... Um, it's that oh, shoot moment. Yeah, that's correct. Where, where you're just... Am I swimming? Am or I, am How I, long am I swimming? Oh, there, it popped up yeah, right there. I was bang, like, bang, bang. You, know? you swim over to it, and that's exactly what I feel happened because he turned around there's this bomb wave and he needed to regain some you know momentum and some you know it's just some composure because he's got seven minutes left and he's only chasing a seven two four yeah and when you when you're not wearing a leash and you know that you're going to go down there are some techniques that you can utilize to make sure that board doesn't get in front of the wave and get kicked all the way to shore you can kick it out the back or you can pearl it on purpose and poke it out the back here we go Kaimana Takayama on this insider here. Nice long wall, though. Allows him to get to the nose for an extended period of time. Kaimana still perched up there. Goes to 10. And a little bit of levitation through that section right there. Well read and incredible balance by Kaimana Takayama. And just a little flare at the end. Cross steps up to the nose. Another little cutty for Kai Takayama. And tickles the nose, a little heel action, walks it back, and some great footwork before stepping off on the sand. 
Well, that's a great answer to his last 4-2-3. So the judge is recognizing that smaller wave and I guess the degree of, well not I guess, the degree of difficulty is minimized when you are on a smaller wave. When we, today we have set waves around that head high mark, the judges will be taking note of that degree of difficulty and his Kai stepping to the nose, almost a little head dip there, bang. Sort of out in the shoulder here and he'll wait for it to get in the pocket and he gets his 10 and waiting for it and bang in the pocket. Gets both feet over the nose, beautiful moment there. You can see the board fully getting barreled and he almost gets barreled too, a little head dip. Stepping back in this trademark slash from Kaimana Takayama on his uh, board that's been shaped by his father. And this is one of his favorite boards. He's won many events and competed on this board for, uh, for six or so years all around the world. And some slip check on the, uh, on the front of the nose there as an added bonus of some grip. Yeah, the, that's his old faithful there. Kaimana Takayama, uh, Michael Takayama, his dad is a esteemed uh, longboard shaper, much sought after Takayama designs. His great uncle, legendary Donald Takayama, who was a pioneer in so many ways in surfing. You could draw a lot of comparisons to the cha championship tour and sharp eye surfboards where, you know, a lot of surfers that had really prolonged relationships with their shapers were actually grabbing a sharp eye just to feel, see what all the, the hype was about. And you do see a lot of surfers on that cha championship tour with uh, quivers made by other shapers. And it's exactly the same with Kaimana Takayama, um, uh, Michael Takayama, sorry. The, the fear to spear boards are seen in quivers like Stevie Sawyer, Honolulu Blomfield, Sophia Colhane, uh, Haley Otto, Kai, even Kai Salas has ridden one. Uh, Carniella Stewart uh, made his name on, on the uh, Michael Takayama boards as well. So the ball, and even uh, Nacho from Uruguay. And there was uh, a lot of surfers have ended up with those boards and uh, put on really, I guess, establishing heat moments on those boards. Well, here's the board oh, at work again. And the great trip to a 10, got to get back to a five. Trimming through this section, rail grab there for some stability to seek out some open face. Not gonna get it, but hangs on to the board. Looking to improve upon his low of 4.23. I don't know if he's gonna do it on that wave, but Kaimana Takayama, no harm, no foul, staying busy in the non-priority heat. Interesting to note, Taylor's wave came in at a 6-2-3 in the priority heat. And here we have Kaisalis up and riding in the non-priority heat. We'll get back to the that in a moment, Kaipo. Yeah, Kaisalis with a beautiful extended hang 10. Has to set it back for a 5 just to get through this section. Back up to a 10. Toes curled over the nose. Little check turn there, stalls it out to regain his trim on the inside here. Little pump from the middle of the board. Beautiful gaffing turn on the shoulder. Back, touching a five, two to 10, right in the shore break. And Kai Salas styles it out for the finish. Wow, <laughs> finishing right in front of us behind the, the commentary booth here, Kaipo. We could hear the, the Hawaiian uh, cheers go up there and uh, yeah, he'll, he'll, that, I mean, couldn't have done anything more on that wave. It was beautiful surfing. Really loving how calm, cool, and collected Kai Salas is looking at the moment. But with two minutes 20 left in this priority heat, priority is with Eduard Del Pedro as we watch this replay from Kai. Staying high on the wave, getting multiple hang tens on this wave. You can just see a really nice, poised, relaxed looking Kai here. Back up to this 10 and holding it, arching back. And the way he's bowling, gets into those rail cups, and you could tell he's feeling it. Gets a little groovy through here, that mid-board trim, waiting, waiting, waiting. Light shuffle back, and a nice, as you said, gaffing turn, and sets it up for a nose right into the shore break. So tremendous variety, flow, elements of power in the rail game as well, and some really critical nose rides. I think the judges will really appreciate this score. And the one beforehand was Kaimana Takayama, who also did his best, but unfortunately the wave did race away. Being a little smaller, it just started to cup away from him there. 
Yeah, that was just a 2.73, so not one of the top two for Kaimana Takayama. Score came in for Kai Salas, a 6.27. Kai Salas over Kaimana Takayama in the non-priority heat. Our attention turns to the priority heat because we're down to just a minute. Edward Del Perro, he needs a 7.24. He has priority, and he's got 60 seconds, Matt. Wow, and I put that dot point at the beginning where Taylor waited for 15 minutes and Edward was on a wave in front of him, pulled off, and he was well on his way to a, to a good score after that opening nose ride. Edward did have a fantastic set wave that he pearled on, and he did let Kai Salas take that wave. So a couple of errors, we, if we have to like rewind mm. and kind of unpack what happened in this opening heat uh, for Del Perro. As we cast just behind my shoulder, I'm looking out and it doesn't appear to be too many swell lines coming in. We're a 724. As we see, yeah, there you go, there's that camera angle. So, uh, sad times there for Edward because he was looking really confident opening up in this heat and, and for Taylor, he did that run around and he didn't regain priority, which is interesting because that's a lot of energy to be sucked out of you on finals day. Okay, there you go, some sportsmanship there. Taylor Jensen coming back and taking the win in the opening heat of the day. We're gonna see Taylor Jensen in the quarterfinals. We got more for you. We're just starting. Stick around, we'll be back with more here from the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. First event of the season for the Longboard Tour, the Sydney Surf Pro, North Stain in Manly Beach. And Harrison Roach had to navigate through a ton of different conditions and some formidable beach break for that finals day, Matt. Absolutely, it was a well-earned win for Harrison because there was a, a long delay between the beautiful waist-high waves we had earlier in the week, and I think it was six days until the finals, which turned out to be a, a, a four to six feet, uh, pretty solid swell with a lot of rain and wind. So it was it was four seasons in one event there for Harry and a well-earned win coming into this. So he has those 5,000 points, and we'll see what happens in his heat against Stevie Sawyer. Yeah, Harrison Roach versus the 2018 world champ South Africa's Steven Sawyer out there in the non-priority heat. They have 37 minutes on the clock and counting down in that non-priority heat. And there's a vision of Harrison Roach sitting out with priority in that Steven Sawyer did get a wave to start off his account. And interesting to note, Stevie Sawyer down a little lower on the ratings than we'd expect. He is carrying that one result from Huntington. He didn't go and surf at Manly. Uh, he came up against a raging Justin Quintal. And that was a fantastic heat to call there at the, at the pier. Both surfers really ripping. But here we are on his backside. He's up against event favorite Harrison Roach, who 
He's going to leave nothing left in the tank. It's going to be a fantastic heat, but casting our eyes back to the priority heat. Kaimana Takayama on the nose. Beautiful setback slash bang, straight up, setting it up for a pocket nose right here. And he goes for the 10 really high, little composed. He probably, knowing Kai, would have liked to have stuck that a little longer, but he's surfing what's in front of him and just letting this wave flow out. He needs a nice, it's a nice open wave. This is the biggest wave he's caught, Kaipo, and, it, and he ended up way down behind the commentary booth here and we're somewhere between the toilet block and the pier. So that's a long wave there. Finishing right off in the shore break. So really nice completed wave there for Kai. And uh, Stevie Sawyer opening up his account. Beautiful backside 10 there. A point to prove after yesterday. He uh, was sort of up against the judges. He's up against the system. Um, was disappointed with his, with his scores yesterday and the priority judge. A lot he thought going against him. So he wants to come out all guns blazing and leave nothing left to doubt. So we'll be on standby for scores to set the situation and to set uh, the early bar in the non-priority heat. In the priority heat, Kai Salas does have the lead over Kaimana Takayama. And here's a replay of a wave that we're still waiting for the score for. So Kai Salas here, he's uh, on a self-shaped surfboard here. Obviously knows what it takes to surf at this top level. And he's brought a board that we, uh, or a quiver of boards that we haven't seen in the Kaiselis surfboard range. And oh wow, a little layback, one of the first ones, little little Larry there that we haven't seen, but a smooth one. Didn't, well, not one of those uh, loss of momentum turns. And carving that one through. So not a lot of variety on the inside section, which is why he opted for that uh, versatile layback turn. And the judges uh, still owe us a score for that one. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, we're waiting for scores. Let's hear from Taylor Jensen. He's with the Waz. Thank you very much, Kaipo. Uh, you ran up the beach all the way back out there. Tell me about, uh, the, I guess, being winded through that whole session. Yeah, I don't know if that's smart or stupid. It's uh, You so, burn the legs or burn the arms, I guess, is the question. And my right arms here. were feeling it from the paddle before. Yeah, kind of a little paddle battle with Edward. So, yeah, I just wanted to put it to the legs and, yeah, keep the blood flowing, I guess. You both had a few mistakes out there. There's nobody in the water. What's going through your head? Yeah, when there's a ton of people, you know exactly where to sit. And when those sets come, some of them push wider than you think they are. And yeah, both of us kind of, I think, did the same thing. Just got stuck behind that first section. And I mean, by then, that's dropped your score from a high to a low. So you might as well just kick out and, and start again. Well, you must be excited. The waves are pumping. You're back on the glass. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm stoked. I mean, you come into this with a shot at a world title. It's finals day. You know, like a whole year of preps come into this this one day in these couple of heats. So I'm just stoked we got waves. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, we'll let you hydrate. Get ready for your next one. Thanks, Ryder. Well, there you go. It's going to be world titles handed out to both the men and the women. And... Taylor starting his road today. I mean, it's going to be a long day uh, to get there to a world title, but, you know, it's all the path, and it's all going to go down today, Matt. Absolutely. We've got that trophy sitting right in front of us, and it could go down. Anyone in this heat, it could even be Taylor Jensen, who's looking absolutely on fire yesterday, carrying some of that momentum this morning, but I'm sure he's very happy to get Edward. Uh, ticked off the list because that was a gnarly heat to start off and I did say it was some heavy hitters but it wasn't without a lot of key talking points that we'll talk about throughout the day. Edward, a look at that as a missed opportunity because after you know missing Manly and Huntington due to some uh, issues beyond his control um, he's going to have to go through the qualification process more likely uh, with his regional uh, qualifiers next year and I'm sure we'll see him back on the tour. Yeah, as we talk about qualifying, we'll qualify the top eight men and top eight women will automatically qualify for the 2023 tour. Then the rest of the tour, Matt, will be filled in through regional. Is that correct? Correct. And those events, uh, some have been listed. We had one last week for North America and Hawaii at Pismo Beach. Yep. And Australia are looking to lock in their events very shortly. And there is no doubt some in Europe and in Asia as well. You know what? We're going to have a... Big announcement today, by the way, at the 805 post show. Not only are we going to be celebrating world new world champions, but we have a big announcement with the 2023 World Longboard Tour schedule. 
And uh, so want to stick around. Big news coming out today. And it looks like the tour is going to evolve. I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but we got it's, it's going to be a big announcement. But one thing that has been confirmed is that Malibu, which is a, a, the most iconic longboard wave, will be on the schedule. But ever since 1928, when the Pacific Highway opened up, Highway 1, and we were able to establish Malibu as a location you can access. And from the 40s onwards, this place has been a holy grail for movie stars, surf stars, a holiday place for the LA rich and famous. And to celebrate longboarding where it is today in this holy grail of surfing, it just feels so fitting, right, Kaipo? Yeah, I mean, and even for me as a WSL commentator, this is where I, ho I holiday as well every once in a while. Yeah. I, I, enjoy the, I enjoy the Malibu scene. And you've got the food here at the Malibu farm as we pan out there onto the pier. Um, amazing coffee, and uh, I think they call it uh, American American comfort food, so to speak. But oh, you love some American comfort food. Yeah, that's, I think there's a lot of Australian vibe in there, to tell you the truth. Really good <laughs> breakfasts as well. Um, though that exchange rate isn't helping very much at the moment. But uh, look, it's fantastic to have O'Neill and Cuervo come on board for the, this is the Cuervo Classic presented by O'Neill. Yeah. Two very iconic brands and O'Neill being the, the premier California, the quintessential Californian surf brand and the first company to produce wetsuits in North America. Yes, this is true. Jack O'Neill, hats off to you, keeping everybody, helping keep everybody warm for decades. And you know, actually set up the first surf shop in uh, 1951 in Santa, in, uh, uh, it was actually in um, San Francisco. Yeah, that's right. So O'Neill uh, been giving back. I mean, they had the uh, old saying, I don't think they use it anymore. It's always summer inside. Yeah. So uh, O'Neill, a great uh, supporter here for the World Championships. And also uh, you talked about cuisine and food and getting about American comfort food. Well, there's some great food that we're able to enjoy from Malibu Farms. You can find them right at the end of the Malibu Pier. And uh, it's healthy and tasty. And uh, thank you to Malibu Farms for um, the catering that they've been providing us. There they are. Got to visit there. You come down to Malibu and you don't walk out to the end of the pier and get a smoothie or enjoy some breakfast or lunch. Yep. You're blowing it. That's the best view as well. You can actually uh, hear the beach announcers and you can watch the surfing from that side angle from the Malibu farm and yeah and this guy uh, is actually looking at us in the commentary booth right now we can see you buddy he's got his airpods in and he's listening to the broadcast live <laughs> absolutely love it all right so eight minutes and 35 seconds counting down in the heat between Kai Salas and Ka uh, Kaimana Takayama those scores that did come in Kaimana did jump into the lead just briefly because he dropped a 7.67 but kai salas drops a 6.6 .6 and retakes the lead there you can see all of the scores for the two surfers on the board we take the highlighted top two here we go live action kaimana takiyama on old faithful a little trim line there waves waiting to present itself and you could see that wave went a little bit dead and that led to the rail dig. So yeah, seven minutes, 50 seconds left on the clock. So yeah, interesting move there for Kai because his low scores are a four, nine, seven. But in this type of heat, I tell you what, I think he's gonna need something close to excellent because Kai Salas is just warming up. If we have another flurry of set waves, both surfers will be looking to capitalize. Here we go, decision time. Salas turns it down. Harrison Roach is going to open up his account in the non-priority heat. Roach, poised, nice trim, and that's how priority works. A thumbs up from Harry. <laughs> Kaimana Takayama utilizes his position in the priority heat, and now it's time for Kaimana to do that dance on the nose, oh. little cross step, and then kicks out, bro. Well, I mean, there's not a lot left on that wave. And I alluded to uh, the Edward and Taylor's heat, and Taylor talked about in his post-heat interview, with these glassy conditions, and you've got these swell lines coming in, it is difficult to predict, is this wave gonna run away? Is it gonna, is it gonna cup out? Is it gonna allow some critical surfing, or is it just gonna you know, get all fat? And both Taylor and Edward making uh, a few mistakes there and can be forgiven because they were the first heat of the day. But you can sort of see, it's, it is glassy, and it's, it's so tricky to look at a big wall that's running um, many hundreds of feet down the line. It just all stretched out. 
it's difficult. And Kaimana Takeyama's taking off, taking off on two waves there. And Harrison Roach is probably just going, oh man, oh, that would have been a fantastic opener for me to settle some nerves. But he's out there now going into second priority behind Stevie Sawyer now in the non-priority heat. But that's how the cookie crumbles. The complexity of the overlapping heat situation. We'll take a look at this replay. Here's Harry, but here comes Kaimana. And interesting, that was a, a great nose ride for, for Harry. So he was setting up for a well beyond a mid-range score. Uh, Kai, a little sleepy here, just seeing if that inside was going to allow some extended tip time, which it does. He gets on the nose, but you can sort of see he's about uh, six feet out on the face. And the judges are looking for that critical nose ride back in the pocket. If you can get barreled on a 10-foot wave, just imagine on a two-foot wave, that's where you want to be hanging 10. That board needs to be fully barreled with the surfer's waist, knees, sort of just in front of the, the, uh, the barrel. And that's the perfect spot for a nose ride where the, the water's weighing down on that tail and lifting up the nose. That's the elevation we talk about. That's a great illustration of um, how to create that, that trim line and, and get some nose time. Well, speaking of boards, Strider's got some. What do you got, Strider? We got Taylor Jensen's board down here, 9-8. This is the board he rode at his heat this morning. And, you know, Waxhead was talking about breaking down the board into thirds. And, well, through the nose here, the, the top third of the board, you can see that beautiful concave that's going to give you some elevation, create some air underneath the nose so you can get that long nose ride. Through the middle, this is where they're going to find all their speed, and this is where they're doing their... Uh, what Taylor, uh, what Waxhead was kind of referring to yesterday even, which is like a hip movement. And actually, this is where you're going to drive from the board and get all your speed. And in the tail here, this is where you're turning from, obviously, but also this is where the hook is happening. So the board, the whole back of this board has to hook up into the back of the bowl on the wave in order for you to get all the, all the way on the nose to actually get some t uh, tip time. So, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thought that everything back here is going to matter for everything up front here because that's where you have to equalize yourself on the, on the seesaw of that tip time. It's such a beautiful thing. These boards are absolutely beautiful. They're, this one's made by Stu Kenson, and, you know, it, probably in the weight range, it's about 20 pounds. Uh, you know, Taylor's a big guy, but he's throwing this thing around like a toothpick. You watch some of those big turns he does, insane. <laughs> Huge fin on this thing. I mean, the base on this thing is massive. So. He's coming up later on today. We're going to see him get back out hey, there. Hey, Strider, what's, it, what's your it. estimate of, of that fin size right there? I'm just interested. You, you don't have to measure. You can this just thing's going, I think we're about 11 inches. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Wow, there you go. The steering right there, the hook. Thank you, Strider Wazalewski. And, uh, and interesting, gosh, there's a, that little blue tab in the front there uh, is a little insert that you can use for toolless. Um, fin placement so you can move that fin without using your screwdriver absolutely and we have seen some of the the, the tallest type fin systems including uh fcs the clip in and clip out and kai salas on a set three minutes left oh, ho, ho. kai salas has been looking money and now he's really putting it together on this wave again trim to 10 look at that it'll drop down to the bottom Midpoint turning, utilizing the rail. Beautiful cutty for Kai Salas. And Salas continues on with a mix of graceful footwork, balanced nose riding, and powerful surfing, finishing on the sand. Give it up for Kai Salas on that one. Wild. I <laughs> can't wait for that breakdown. Some key elements to, to pick apart on that wave, but beautiful surfing. And behind him, in every sense of the word, a shadowed wave. Yeah, I, this is Kaimana Taki. I'm staying busy, but you saw, and he does a good job on the nose, but the wave just with not as much oomph as that first wave of the set, but doing a good job getting up there, Kaimana Takayama. So we'll be waiting for two scores in our priority heat as we're down to the two minute mark. Wow, two minutes to go. Kaisal is running around. And uh, Kaitakiyama oh. left in the lineup. Look at that. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, sometimes when you take it to the There's beach. That tab. There's that tab. Yeah, so that was a breakaway. So that was that's kind of good news for the fin box, the right? To be able to have that fin break away. Yes. Yes. Good Good saves. The fin box lost the fin. Lost the fin, um, yeah. Now, interesting to note, if that was screwed in. Oh, who knows? We'll have a look. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do a breakdown. 
afterwards. We'll have a look at that board. Good idea, Matt. All right, I'm really intrigued. And he swapped back to the board he was writing yesterday. So it was a board change. Um, a minute 20 left on the clock. Hey, I mean, we've had an equipped, and just to confirm, we have an equipment malfunction. Yeah. But he did a re entry into the shore break. So what do you expect? Well, I mean, you have an 11. You have 11 inch fin and you're landing in nine inches of water, something's gonna happen. Here you go, replay though of Kai Salis. Oh, look at that opening nose ride. Four steps up to the tip, really delicate footsteps. Gets multiple touches of 10. And bang, straight up little touch. So a couple of hits of the 10, a nice carve, bang. That set him up for this. That was a really nice slashing carve and he stabs it straight up on the nose. This here. Gets to work here. Okay, rail line, bang. This is hard to do in that bowl on a flat log like this, flat rocket log. Okay, he's like, I need something here. I've missed a few nose rides. What have I got? What have I got? Loading up. And, oh, just on the shore break, pebbles, not even sand, bang. And that's where oh, the fin. Oh, there's the fin, yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there it popped up. You can see it right there. So now he's looking for that fin as it get, recedes back into the water. We saw it pop out. Look to retrieve the fin. You don't want to catch a board on the incoming. This is what you don't want oh. to do. Let the board bring it on itself. Spot the board. Signal to the shore. But you got to get that fin too. So hopefully he has someone in his entourage. There they are searching. <laughs> Every surfer knows this feeling. <laughs> Absolutely. But that was an, a, a really explosive end of that heat. That was uh, <laughs> that was exciting. Kai Salas' score still to be locked in. And a... Um, Wow. He needs a 7.38 because last score for Kaimana, Takeyama is 6.3. And we're waiting for that last score for Kai Salas. Clocks off. Horn is sounded for the priority heat, waiting for an important wave for Kai Salas, Matt. And that was very interesting because we talked. I talked down on that wave because it was overshadowed by Kai's size and the dynamic approach to it. But Kai only needed a mid-range 5. And he, he got it. He got a 6.3 based purely on those nose rides. But we'll have another replay of uh, Kai Salas and we're waiting for this score to be locked in. So he needs a 7-3-8. And this is the uh, similar replay the judges will be going over. Couple of touches, so uh, fairly critical nose ride on the outside, but it is a set wave. And another little 10 through there. And I love that moment where the board is hooking back in the pocket as Strider was alluding to that tail doing all its work. And here, I love this. Beautiful transition, utilizing the rail, all the criteria ticked here. And another little touch of the nose. No, nope, just stepping forward. And this is the, and I think this is a, a completion. Oh, there, I mean, he, he just ran out of water. Yeah. <laughs> so on the beach and now awaiting the news, who's going to move on into the quarterfinals? So congratulations by Michael Takayama and then a catch up with Dad and son there on the beach, Kaimana and Michael. But uh, Kai Salas waiting. Might be a little nervous right now because that's a substantial number that Kai Salas needs, a 7.38, and we're waiting for the scores. Wow, that was a, a fantastic ending of that heat. It was in Kai Salas' favor for the whole heat, but Kai Takayama coming in clutch at 6.3. It was a smaller wave, it had a little whitewash on it, but it did bowl out and it was able to stick that 10 for an extended period of time right past the judge's tent, which is in between that, that famous uh, toilet block and the entry down the, uh, the Malibu wall. So here's Kai's wave, Kai, Kai Takayama's wave in green. So this is a 6.3. Starts off with that 5 and at this point we're thinking, oh, it's a little small and it's not going to allow anything, but he has... So he sees something that we can't on the camera. And here, this is where I thought the wave was over, Kaipo, but no, five to 10, and he holds it through this next one here. Bang. Very critical. And yeah, that's where the crux of those points came from, and another 10. You got a little Herbie right there with some side slip action. Damn, straight, and then a little tap off the top. Definitely not as dynamic as Kai Salas's finishing maneuver in a smaller wave. Mm. And the numbers in a 7.434 Kai Salas, enough to do the job. 
Kai Salas moves on into the quarterfinals over Kaimana Takayama. Enjoy these messages. We'll be right back from Malibu. It's finals day. My name is Justin Quintal. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Growing up in Florida, you have a lot of small days, and that's kind of what got me into longboarding. Yeah, a lot of longboarders, a lot of great surfers, and uh, a lot of fun waves, so I, I love it back home. The WSL was going to be working on the longboard tour, and they were going to have a full tour, which was, you know, they hadn't done in a long time, so that was really exciting. Yeah, I won Nusa, which was the, the first event, and then went to Spain. I actually ended up winning there as well. Luckily, I ended up winning the title. Pretty stoked on that. Yeah, it's one of the coolest accomplishments in my life, I feel like, and definitely proud to be able to say I was a world champ. To accomplish that feels great. Yeah, stoked. <laughs> Welcome back to the Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships here in Malibu, California. Presented by O'Neill. It's been a great week of surfing so far, a great a couple of days of surfing, and we've had some amazing heats rolling through this morning. Shannon Hughes here in the booth alongside Sam Bleakley, and we can't wait to call the action. Absolutely. I mean, the first few heats, the exchanges have been at the very upper echelons of world-class longboarding. The conditions are absolutely perfect. It's consistent. You know, the waves are fast. There's that opportunity to really express yourself on the nose and on rail and the surfers are even taking it all the way through to that very inside shore break and we just saw Kai Salas went so committed that he lost his fin in the shore break. Oh that commitment is everything though wanting to get every last ounce out of that wave that he possibly can especially when it was so tight between him and Kaimana. And it made the difference he, he he's booked himself a place in the next round so you know it just demonstrates that you have to put it right to the edge and a little bit further. Well, in the water, we have Cole Robbins and Justin Quintal that have just paddled out, and they are in the non-priority heat up against, or not against, but in the water at the same time, as Steven Sawyer and Harrison Roach, who are in now the priority heat. And we'll take a look at some waves that were ridden for the start of this, starting out with Cole Robbins. So this is Cole Robbins. I just saw his shaper, Wayne Rich. Wayne Rich makes some of the best longboards in the world, and Cole Robbins, the rink on Star Master, demonstrating that really deep relationship he has with Wayne. Rincon, of course, is the queen of the coast. Malibu known as the king of the coast. He knows these right-handers like the back of his hand. And you could see the lock on that nose ride was extremely critical. Falling on the inside, but it might not affect the score too badly because a lot of good damage was done. Out back as Justin Quintal answers with, again, some tight nose riding. The type of nose riding that took him to that world title in 2019. Quintal looking for that second world title. Cole looking for his first world title. And Cole's been in that running for years. Would love to see him find that achievement. Justin Quintal now up and riding. 
in the non-priority heat, linked into a beautiful pocket, hang five, nice and tight. Pedals back, stays on that inside rail of the board as well. You can see that his toes are hardly touching the stringer. And great bit of footwork. Now starts to readjust here through to the inside. Little stall to check and runs back to the nose. And sets himself up as Cole Robbins is perched in such a long hang tin on the outside section. And Justin will save the fin, kick out a little bit earlier than Kai Salas did in his last wave. And Cole still now racing through the inside here. Looking to put on a nice finish, pedals back, drives through the tail, and whips it around easily, linking it together. And he'll finish off on the inside. And we've got waves up and riding with Harrison Roach, Sam. Harrison Roach, dynamic going for his first world title. Unfortunately, came unstuck to Ben Skinner last year here at Malibu, but riding the Thomas Beckson surfboards. He's on the scoop tail, and he's looking incredible. That hang 10, bolt upright. Harrison's turning, the nuances, the way he moves up and down the board and engages rail is some of the best in the history of longboarding. And Harrison's a firm favorite to win a world title here at Malibu, and that demonstrates why he is a firm favorite. Oh, that was such a pleasure to be able to watch, to hear you call the action on, and now to see him go for the runaround. So we've got the great Malibu Farms out there, the great restaurant here at the end of the pier. And... We've got scores to come through for all four surfers in the water. 10 minutes on the clock for our priority heat, 30 minutes on the clock for our non-priority heat. And in the last heat, we saw Kai Salas go finless at the finish. He's with Strider now. Thank you very much, Shannon. Kai, definitely worth the fin break. Oh, man, that one felt good. That was one of the most satisfying heat wins right there. Um, you know, I... Surfing against Kaimana, he's, he, you know, I met him, first time I met him, he was 12 years old at Oceanside, and he was asking me how to do a layback. And uh, his dad left him at the beach, and I had to give him a ride home because he wanted to stay and surf. So, you know, he, he pushed me more in that heat than any heat I can remember, and I've been doing contests for 25 years, you know. So, and the conditions we got today are, like, for Malibu, it's, you know, epic conditions, and you know, I was just, I was just saying, this is like, uh, for sure, a longboard dream tour. You know, it's, it's insane. Uh, that feels good to hear. I want to ask you about your reaction when you heard the score. You came up, you took your jersey off, and you went over to the shower. Yeah, I was just sitting under the shower, just like, you know, gave myself a little prayer, hoping to get the score, and I just got it. That last wave. Um, you know, I felt maybe I could have surfed it a little better, but it was such a good wave and had so much scoring opportunity. And I melted it to the very end and stomped the floater right in the sand, broke my fin out. And uh, I gotta say it was worth it. <laughs> well, it's finals day here. You're on the glass. Congratulations. Hope to see you back up here. All right, thanks. You. Kai Salas through to the quarterfinals, and what a feeling. That was hardcore frontline competitive that longboarding. Was amazing. The vibes, I mean, he says he's been competing for, you know, nearly three decades, you know, two and a half decades. He's been uh, at the front line of competitive longboarding, and he was feeling it. And the, the stoke was just right. oozing exactly. from Kai Salas. And to get that emotion from Kai really says a lot about the quality of the waves here. Yeah, and that's not something we see very often. He's quite, you know, keeps to himself quite calm and collected in interviews, but to see that much excitement, that much stoke coming through is incredible. As we've got Harrison Roach now up and riding. Nice rail work to start, sets up for this second nose ride. Perched in for a quick 10. Stays on that front third of the board to look for that next section and he'll kick out. So his last score dropped through as a 6.83, which keeps him in that leading position over Steven Sawyer. Steven in the blue jersey now has first priority in the priority heat with seven minutes to go. Steven is chasing a 6.27 at the moment to take the leading position away from Harrison as we wait for that last score to drop. Harry's just looking to increase on a 3.1. Some beautiful surfing done on that outside section. Absolutely, it's like an oil painting out there with waves. I mean, it's so smooth and glassy and the conditions are so perfect for somebody crowning their world title. This is a really important day for international longboarding and the surfers are getting every opportunity. Quintal now up to the nose, perched hang 10. Goes back to the five and stays with it as we see Steven Sawyer in the priority heat on a good looking set. 
getting some work done out the back, sets himself up for that rail. You can see Justin now coming through to the inside and he ducks out as Steven goes from the five to the long 10. Great tight footwork always from the South African, the Jeffrey. Sets it up as we see Cole Robbins up and riding out the back. Steven continuing through to the inside section. Cole getting a little bit of work done there as well. And Steven goes down on the inside. Cole now looking for a strong finish here. Engages that rail and brings in that smooth, seamless surfing back to a hang 10, hang five, and controls the entire board from the nose. And he's going to get out and put every last ounce into it as he kicks off on the sand. That was full seamless Santa Barbara style from Cole there. That was really, really strong surfing. Also the read that we saw from Steven Sawyer on that wave. He had to take a high line. He opted for the high line, it paid off. A good scoring ride to drop for Steven Sawyer. But Cole Robbins for me, that in that exchange, he just shone. I mean, those nose rides were critical. They were bolt upright, hood ornament hang tens and he just looked good right to the bitter end of the wave, stepping off on the sand. All right, so scores to come through. It looks like last of Harrison Roach, that smaller, quicker wave is not gonna factor into his top two. So that requirement will stay as a 6.27 for a surfer in blue, Steven Sawyer, with a score to drop. Let's take a look now at last of Justin Quintal. So Justin on the Black Rose boards, shaped by Ricky Cow. This is the company he owns, and look at that hang 10. I mean, that was incredible. The degree of difficulty on that backside hang 10 was next level. But just here, this wave runs away from him. You can see he's looking to pump. He's hoping that he's going to reconnect with that section. But at that point, he knows he's got to press the eject button. But that opening 10 is a demonstration of the skill level of Quintal. And that's why he's the 219 world champion. But look at this, the Santa Barbara style, silky smooth, locks in on the Wayne Rich boards. That is such a textbook hang 10. You can really see how those toes are curled. When you lock those toes around the tip, you feel all the energy of the rails. That would have felt brilliant, that double hang 10, the lift on the board. And the way he just then links up to this rail section to get one more speed drive, a little tap of the five, and here staying composed and smooth, and then wham, spray out of the tail and redirect back into the bowl section for another tap, a full hang 10 again on the inside. And I really like the way he just steps out over the cobbles onto the beach here at First Point Malibu. Cole Robbins going for his first world title. And this could be his day. This could be his day. This is the type of wave, the type of conditions that we know he can thrive in. You can see the expression on his face throughout that wave as well. He's absolutely feeling it the entire time. As we see a little bit of a uh, sharing between the two surfers. Justin Quintal goes down on that opening section. Harrison Roach now out the back, finding a good size wave, picks that high line for that five to 10 combination, sticks back to the 10. Now sets himself up here for a nice bit of rail work. And all of that classic Australian style coming through in Harry surfing. Drives back again. Great work linking through those nose rides, engaging the rail, using that combination. And gets a little bit stuck here, but finds the nose again. Looking for that last moment to put on a clean kick out. And he is now down into second place because Steven Sawyer dropped a 6.77 for his last wave. Harrison Roach chasing just a 3.61. Take the advancing position. And scores are in that quickly for last of Harrison Roach as an 8.4. He takes the lead with the excellent score. This is insane longboarding. This is such an exhibition. The waves have got power, they've got speed, they've got every ounce of finesse you could design for your perfect longboard wave. This is Malibu at its best. I mean, it's so smooth out there, but the read of the wave is key. Surfers deciding whether they take the high line, whether they go for the speed drive to, to get power off the rail edge, or whether they use nose riding to connect through sections. But at the moment, all four surfers in this overlapping heat, absolutely on fire as we see Steven Sawyer answering back. All right, Stevie, quick footwork. Gets that opening nose ride. Links it in for a second, long hang five to the 10. Puts that full commitment over as well. Great body posture in his upper body. And nice little drive through the rail. Big wrap around, love that drop knee that he throws in for the bottom turn as well. That variety in for the judges as Cole Robbins is up and riding looking to bank his next score. 
And Steven still with more to offer here on the inside. Readjusts, he's riding a different board than he did yesterday as he now goes switch stance for the last hang five. Back to his goofy foot stance and <laughs> gives the claim to the beach. Claim is on a Michael Takayama, obviously built for this coast, work all around the world. World champions have been crowned riding Michael Takayamas. Des, of course, Steven's dad, a great shaper himself. Steven, a great shaper. But it says a lot about the dynamic quality of Michael's shapes that Steven is choosing to ride a Michael Takayama board out here. And that backside nose riding was exceptional. I loved Harrison Roach's wave. I love the flow, the speed, the control, the variety. But what we saw from Steven just then was longer hang tens. We might not have seen better rail work than Harrison's ride, but it, it, the judges will be comparing Harrison's eight with that last ride of Stevens. And if Stevens does get the edge, it's those longer hang tens that might make the difference. This is an extremely important score. Down to 30 seconds on the clock for Harrison Roach and for Steven Sawyer. Steven chasing an 8.46 as we wait for scores to drop in from the panel. Harrison with priority if in the next 20 seconds uh, a wave will roll through. Harrison does have that one big event win this season at the Sydney Surf Pro at home in Australia, down at Manly Beach. And he's now waiting to find out if he will keep his dreams alive this year for a world title with a score to come through from the Jeffries Bay local and Steven Sawyer. And we still haven't seen a flinch from the judging tower. Well, I think the judges are going to have to really study the video replay on this. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, they spend a good amount of time because let's have a little analysis here. Four steps up to the tip. There's the five high in the line, but look at that 10. That's not the longest nose ride. There are two more longer nose rides, but back up for another section. There's the five, pulls up nice and high and gets the 10 again. So this is the first really long hang 10, and that was extremely critical. High degree of difficulty, outstanding nose riding, engages the rail. I love the use of the drop knee turn and the crisp footwork to set up for a quick hang 10 again. That was the third hang 10 of the ride. Nice throw of spray from the tail. This is where he's really recognizing that he's done a lot. He might be getting the score that he needs. He faces the wave into the switch stance. He even cross steps up to the nose for a hang five switch stance as a regular footer. Naturally, a goofy footer gives the claim to the beach and the judges will study that. They'll pick that apart. They'll have the possibility of comparing it to the other excellent 8.40 that Harrison got. And wow, that's going to be a big call. Scores have dropped. It falls shy as a 7.77 for the South African Stephen Sawyer and Harrison Roach. World number two keeps his dreams alive of walking away a world champion today here at Surfrider Beach in Malibu. Justin Quintal and Cole Robbins still in the water with Coniella Stewart and Kiyoki Saguba to join them. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for more action. Vote now on Instagram at WSL for the Hydroflask Let's Go moment, and Coniella Stewart is in the racing, Sam. 
Connie was just incredible yesterday. He's going to love the power and the juice today, but look at the sparkle factor on this wave, and look at that nose riding that style, the Hawaiian flair at its finest. The 867 from Connie Ella Stewart is up for a vote as he finished off here on the inside, and what pretty conditions we had. And Declan Whiten got an 8.01, and he's in the running as well, so take a look online and put your votes through for the Hydro Flask Let's Go moment. Again, there's those flying diamonds across the face, and the Manly Styler, the Manly Powerhouse, toes on the nose, looking really strong. Again, he's gonna thrive today, but this was a beautiful, sunny, classic Malibu day, and it really was a dynamic celebration of world-class longboarding. Oh, so special to be able to see great conditions yesterday through the afternoon, and now classic Malibu with a great swell rolling through, and the height of the waves has arrived as Justin Quintal starts out on this oily piece of canvas. Beautiful rail work, already got a nose right in at the start. Tap to the nose again, nice and calm. You can see how patient he's being with each of these maneuvers. Great footwork, pedaling back again, looking for this inside to run off in front of him and sets himself up here. To try to nose ride through the section, he'll pedal back and maintain control, go switch stance as well. So that was a bowly one for Justin Quintel there. He had to react a lot. There was not a, a big trim section for a long hang 10. He was finding 10s, pulling back, readjusting, engaging the rail, back up to the nose. So there was a lot of variety. There was a lot of movement. So Quintal chasing a 7-6-7 seven, seven to move into first position. Scores to come through now for Justin Quintal. And Harrison Roach gets the edge over Steven Sawyer in the last heat. He's with Strider now. Thank you, Shannon. Harrison, beautiful work out there. The waves are amazing. But there was a nail-biter moment at the end there waiting for scores. Yeah, uh, we never really got any waves in the first part of our heat. And then in the end, it sort of took like, we, we both had some average backups and we, we both got a good set wave in the end too. And so I guess I just got the better of him. So I'm lucky with that. Now, what's the vibe like for you? You're down here on finals day. Obviously, you got to kind of manage your emotions. Yeah, it's a long day. You have to surf four times a day for you to win it. So that's one done and three more to go, I guess. Well, we can't wait to see more of you. Any any changes through the day or just going to keep with what you're riding? No, just same, same. It's pretty perfect Malibu at the moment, so just keep an eye on it and figure it out as it comes. All right, well, I'd love to see the focus. Can't wait to see more of you. Cheers, thank you. Harrison Roach getting closer to winning that world title. He's currently tied for number two in the world alongside of Taylor Jensen. Connie Ellis Stewart is sitting at number one in the rankings, but actually it's Harrison Roach and Taylor Jensen with the best shot to win a world title today. Yeah, absolutely, because they're carrying 5,000 points from their respective wins at Manly and Huntington. And then combined with the possible 10,000 for winning here, they are two front runners, absolutely. And Harrison, he looks extremely focused to me, cool as a cat. That guy's horizons are way down the running here. He wants to be in that final, going for his first world title. He really wants to. And he was in that front running position in last year's event here for the world championships, but he fell out in the semifinals to an informed Ben Skinner. And that was a, a tough loss for him in a, in a space where it seemed like he would have had that momentum moving forward, a right hand point break him coming out of Noosa in, uh, on the Sunshine Coast of Australia. And who knows, they might meet up in the final today to battle it out for a world title. That would be incredible. It really would be. There's a lot of surfers who could go all the way today and everybody, you can just sense from the vibe on the sand that everybody is just so excited to have such consistent waves. Yesterday, the waves were good when they came, but a lot of people were extremely unlucky. The likes of Tully White, who just didn't have a chance to showcase herself because she had one of those heats where it just lolled out for a long time. But today, it's a very different story. Waves consistent. So consistent. We saw that for a few surfers that we would have really loved to just see put on good performances, like Avalon Gall as well. Just never got the opportunity to catch a good wave. As we take a look at the deep stats powered by Hydro Flask for the man in green, Justin Quintal, with three career longboard tour event wins, a world title summed up within that as well. He's got 34 career heat wins on the longboard tour and a very high win percentage of a 77. That was a special year, 219, him winning that world title. It was crowned in Taiwan, but it took the grit and determination resilience of a full tour. As we get the replay backside on the nose, Quintal, toes over, pedals back. This wave had a more of a bowly 
wall to it, so he wasn't able to lock in for long trim-based nose riding. It was a lot of rail work, a lot of readjustment there to get in the right pocket zone to touch the nose again. So it's two hang fives, great rail work. Here's another tap of the nose for another hang five. So Quintal knows that this won't be a, a, you know, a game-changing score. He wants something that allows that really locked-in 10 and that really dynamic rail work. But Quintal looking as electric as ever. Scores are through. It's a 4.93 for last of Justin Quintal. He's sitting in second behind Cole Robbins, who has a 6 and a 7.1 on the scoreboard. So Cole in that front running position, also holding on to priority, doing a little bit of fishing out the back. Well, they're both extremely keen fishermen, and, and they've been looking to hook up for a fishing trip for a long time. So this, this is exactly what they'll be talking about. But right now, you could hear them listening to the scores. Of course, one of the most important bits of communication the competitive surfers are receiving is what they've had and what they need. And another vital bit of information is priority. Expression on their face, what are you thinking, Shannon? Oh, they've, you know, they they know that this race is not finished. There's still 10 minutes on the clock. The conditions today as perfect as they could ever be. Oily sheet glass out in front and so much opportunity here in Malibu. And we're down to 10 minutes on the clock with Justin chasing that 7.67 to get himself a front running position above Cole Robbins. Justin's high score, a 5.43, his low score, 4.93. And entering the water from that last buzzer was Kaniela Stewart and Kiyoki Sagibo, who have not caught a wave yet in the non-priority heat. Justin now looking to get anything he can under priority. Goes up for that nose bride, but slips off the nose. Well, that was that long trim line nose ride he would have been looking for, and he had to commit to that. He knew he needed to get deep. He'd opt for, the, opt for the rail grab, just hoping that maybe that would give him the stability just to control and maybe drive through that section. But he's lost his board, so he's going to go for a little bit of body surfing here. He's still got time. He's got nine minutes. Justin Quintal, 32-year-old from Jacksonville Beach, Florida, the Sunshine State, demonstrating his water skills there, keeping up with the body surf with his board, but his boards just escaped from him. Shaped by Ricky Carroll, beautiful boards that Justin designs and makes. The Black Rose surfboards have taken him all the way to a world title. He's going to have to walk across the cobbles. But one of the good things about Malibu is, is they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty easy to walk on. They're pretty soft. Well, I wouldn't say they were soft, but, you know, they, they're not, like, covered in urchins like a right. lot of breaks in Indonesia would be. I mean, it's very rare for a, a reef or a point or a, or a cobble break globally to be as easy to walk on as some of these great West Coast spots here in the States. Down to eight minutes, 30 seconds on the clock, and Strider Wazalewski has found something down at the beach. Hey, Strider. I have him down here by the competitors area, and well, we grabbed Kai Salas's board, uh, you know, just to see what was going on with the damage that was done. So he had a, a traditional style fin that has the screw that holds it in. And with that, there's, there's no pop release, and with that, it got a lot of damage done. So Kai had to opt out for another board. And on his backup board, he had the same situation. So if he broke that fin out and he doesn't have another board, he's kind of searching for a surfboard to get back into the event, which I'm sure you could find one, but you know you want to have something that you've known before. So having a backup board uh, that to have down here with maybe a pop-up setup like Taylor has on his board. So this pop-out, if this thing hits the, the beach, it's going to pop right out, and it's not going to do all the damage to the fin box like you see on Kai Salas's board. Salas's board is basically unrideable now. So this is a great way to go if you're going to be out there and have to, you know, unfortunately hit the reef, hit the rocks, hit the beach. You know, this board's, this fin's most likely just going to pop right out, and you'll be able to get back out in the water right away. Uh, unfortunately for Kai... He's going to have to go back and uh, make himself a new one, but he's probably got a few. Well, it's a good thing he is a shaper and he's got uh, some talent behind him. But, man, look at that full commitment just landed straight on the sand at the end of that floater, Sam. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what... <laughs> the fin pops Yeah, out. that was that brilliant. Was <laughs> be interesting to know what his backup board is, whether it's uh, the same size, whether it's slightly smaller. If it, This is a 9.8 that he's on. If he's going to be using his backup and it's a slightly smaller board, it, it, you know, it might uh, go in his favor. He might actually really enjoy 
a little bit less board in, in, these, in these bigger waves today. But it might be actually exactly the same dimensions and size. We'll have to ask him when we get the opportunity. And losing a little bit of size because the conditions are a little bit bigger today allows for a little more fluidity maybe? Well, I think the, the reactivity as well you get, it, that increases ticking that flow box, that control, that style, that flow. So when you've got a lot of board in a tight section, of course, it's easier to dig a rail or catch an edge. When you've got a little bit less board in some of these sections, you can react quicker. But Malibu is the ultimate expression playground for bigger boards. And people ride very big boards very nicely here. So I, I still believe that someone on, on a board as big as 10 foot could still surf these conditions all the way to a world title. And that's just because of the way the wave facilitates it. And it's just such a good spot for classic traditional longboarding. Absolutely. So this, this uh, out of priority heat hasn't really got rolling whatsoever because they've had 15 minutes, no waves ridden. Connie Ellistuer, Ki Kiyoki. Kiyoki was telling me before he paddled out a little bit about his surfboard and he has his magazine, Lost Not Found. He's riding the Guru model shaped by Craig Karamura and he's also using a Kanoa Darlin Miss Lucy Finn. So if you ever see some of those incredible shots of Pipeline or Wyomere, they're often taken by Kyoki. He's an incredible photographer and a world-class longboarder. And his good friend Tommy was telling me when he can't decide if he's going to shoot photos or surf, <laughs> sometimes he goes out on his longboard with his water housing and shoots himself hanging 10. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's a great, great surfer to have in the mix this year. Got his qualification for this year's tour out of uh, taking out the regional event there in Hawaii and had that kind of number one spot. He still had to surf through the trials though at every one of the events leading into this year's tour. Absolutely, and, and over the last number of years, he's been extremely unlucky in trials rounds where he surfed very well on one excellent wave but not had a good backup wave. And this time at Malibu, he's really expressed himself and had the opportunity to show to the world how much of a world-class longboarder he is. And so great to see him. So he had surfed the most heats yesterday. Him and Steven Sawyer both made it through that early trials round yesterday morning before we kicked off with our women's round. And he's now up and riding to get going on his opening wave. He's been sitting quiet for about 15 minutes. Quick nose ride. Nice little drive back into the pocket. Sets himself up here with a nice S turn to start. And into that tight five. Pedals back. Again, drives into that rail resets the line here and just looks for that little bit of flow that feeling coming through the wave with that backwash nice critical nose ride coming in from behind the section nearly loses control but manages to hang on to it and puts that little jam on the finish that was extremely critical that last nose ride he was right under the pocket he was so under the pocket that he nearly lost it but he didn't lose it he connected through and he did that with flow with style with control that was a really beautifully ridden wave. Not one of those bigger set waves, but what he did on the wave he rode was exceptional. Down to three minutes on the clock for Cole Robbins and Justin Quintal. Still 23 minutes for uh, Kaniella and for Kiyoki. Kiyoki with a score to drop. Connie now sitting with first priority in the non-priority heat. And Cole Robbins is sitting in a pretty good position right now. He, he has first priority. He's in the priority heat as well and he's got that leading position over Justin Quintal. He really is in a strong position, but he's also got a stronger backup score. So he's got that 6.0 and that 7.10. Justin has got that 5.43 and that 4.93. As we see, Connie Ellis Stewart up and riding, bolt upright hang 10, looking brilliant. Brilliant opening hang 10, lines it up for that second hang five. Nice little tap back just to adjust that weight for a moment and then commits to that beautiful perched hang 10 through the pocket on his forehand, has a check back as well, and he'll kick out. So scores to come through now for opener in our second heat in the lineup. That was a magazine cover soul arch. You know, that, at that moment, you could just see that being a popular shared image. That really was incredible nose riding. Takes the high line, two steps, four steps. There's the five, there's the tight five, there's the 10, and just perfectly upright, as we've known to recognize from this super fluid, stylish Hawaiian. Back up for the tip, and then watch the way he just resets his line there with a little sh walk back and then the beautiful sole arch right under the pocket there. This is one of the great stylish longboarders of the modern era and somebody who seems to incorporate all of the beautiful references of Hawaiian surfing. Kiyoki on his opening wave, what are your thoughts on this, Sam? It was fantastic. It was very different to 
Connie Ella's wave, which is more about the nose rides. What we saw here was variety. It wasn't as, as big. It was a longer ride, but it was smaller, but it had a little bit more of a bowly wall, so it allowed Kiyoki to really put that board on rail and look at the criticalness of this last nose ride through the inside. Onto the five, pulls up for the 10, right under the hook of the pocket there, and lifts and drops and climbs and walks out cleanly. Down to one minute, 30 seconds on the clock as Kiyoki finished off on that last wave. So scores in for red and for blue. Kiyoki with a 4.27 and a 4.83 for opener of Coniella Stewart in the non-priority heat. They've still got 21 minutes on the clock. But for Justin Quintal, as we're down to one minute, 15 seconds on the clock for heat number four, he is chasing a 7.67 to get that advancing position over Cole Robbins the 2019 World Longboard Champion. It was so fun to have him come on and join the tour for the first time ever. He's got how many, maybe nine, 10 duct tape invitational wins. He's really the 11. goat of that side of things. 11, 11 duct tape wins. Absolutely, a legend of, of longboarding. You know, over 11 duct tape wins. He thrives on diversity. He loves Florida, he loves fishing. He's a great tube rider. He's a great logger. He's one of the greats, and he's going for a massive score here, Shannon. And now he has the opportunity, chasing a near eight, a 7.67, perched on the hang five. Gets that lift out of it as well. Drops down to that middle third of the board, and now engages that drop knee. Bottom turn, back to a tight five. Pedals off of it, and needs to do everything he possibly can as he comes through to the inside of this wave. He checks back behind him to see if maybe Cole is up and riding on something else. And this wave is a little bit soft for him now as he's coming through to the inside. He's waiting for that pocket to stand up as he goes switch stance for a moment and knows that that wave's not gonna have any more good scoring potential to it. It's not gonna have that big end section. And that's a big requirement for him. It will be his best ride, but it will also need to be the best ride of his heat. Absolutely, he surfed that wave incredibly well. The nose riding there was next level, but was it a wave that was big enough to really allow the 7.67 he needs? Cole Robin in the world title chase, Justin Quintal waiting for a score to drop. This is a big moment of the event, Shannon. This is huge. World titles on the line. We'll see if Justin Quintal is able to get the score to take out an inform Cole Robbins. Cole currently sitting equal number six on the rankings. And let's take one more look here and break it all down for he Justin. Pops up in the middle of the board so he can get two steps straight up for the nose. That is extremely difficult, critical nose riding, a really tight five. I love the drop knee set up there. Four steps back up for the tip. He's really putting everything into these nose rides. The trim speed he generates on that board on the nose is incredible, but at this moment, you can see from the body language, he knows that the scoring potential of that wave is finished. He's just kind of staying in the pocket, close to the face. He's having a look out back to see if Cole is riding. You get the feeling from the body language, he probably thinks it's not gonna be enough. More, not from what he did on the wave, but because of the shape of the wave and the size of the wave. That's absolutely right. Scores are in from the panel. It's just a 4.2. So he does not make the requirement. And Cole Robbins keeps his dream alive with a seven and a 6.00 as his high scores. And he's booked himself a spot into the quarterfinals. We've got more action to come with Coniella Stewart, Kyoki Sagibo, Ben Skinner, and Tosh Tudor paddling out next. Seven. Blue, you have a 427. And white and green, you're underway with 3730 on the clock. Yeah, so like there's a lot of different shapes in these long boards, you know. There's wide point backs, narrow point noses, you've got these wide tails that we see in the Kakiyamas. I'm someone that personally rides a pin tail, and if you look amongst kind of the competitors, not a lot of people are riding this pin tail. Everyone has kind of something they like. It's different. It works for them. And, um, yeah, I mean, everyone's got a different style. I think what I like seeing is when you have a variety.
This place is so special to me. I spend so much time here. So being here preserving this beach and this ocean is one of the most important things that I could possibly do as a surfer. We Are One Ocean activates at WCL events around the world, giving back to local communities through coastal restoration and environmental initiatives. Today, we are joining forces with Jose Cuervo and Surfrider for a beach cleanup to protect this special beach and surf ecosystem. We'd love to put ourselves out of business with beach cleanups and have a clean beach in the first place. So we're encouraging everybody to help reduce plastic pollution, prevent plastic pollution. It's very important to protect and spreading the word about protecting our beaches and nature. I want a clean beach for the next generation. We are one ocean! And we're back to the action here for the Cuervo Classic. The Longboard World Championships are running and will be crowning world titles today. Up and riding, Kiyoki Sagibo, straight to the nose. Nice, clean canvas opening up in front of him. Great pocket as he comes through for this inside nose ride. Having a paddle out the back is Tony Silvani, just entered the lineup. And Kiyoki drives off the bottom, gets a little shampoo in the hair, and washes it off now as he hits the nose again. Nice, quick five and finding that flow, that style through his surfing. Really enjoying the opportunity to watch more from Kiyoki as we see Tony getting some great rail work out the back. And now Taka Inui up and riding as well. Taka pumping down the line, trying to gain speed while Tony's just staying graceful and in the zone, connecting that board and that equipment, the variety of maneuvers as well with those drop knees thrown in. Taka still going out the back and readjusting now as he comes through for this inside line. Finds that nice pocket, hang five, drives back, and he'll go cruising past on the nose as Tony Silvani paddles past him to get into that priority rotation. And we've got 14 minutes on the clock for our priority heat between Connie and Kiyoki. We've got 34 minutes on the clock for Taka and Tony. Taka and Nui went for the Alan Salo speed drive on takeoff there, apart from he's on a full longboard rather than a shortboard. But Taka looking busy. Tony, great surfing. I loved what I saw from Kiyoki. That was dynamic, and I think that's going to be a really strong score. Scores to come through now for last of Carniella Stewart that happened during the break. Beautiful bolt upright 10 there. Degree of difficulty early in the ride, critical nose riding, great footwork, and there's that nice drop knee off the top. Throwing spray. The judges will love that and reward that highly. Again, flowing into that drop knee turn. So variety, rail work, degree of difficulty, speed, power, flow, control, everything ticking boxes there from Connie Ellis Stewart looking really strong. Scores through, it's a 5.67 for Connie. And he has a quick kick in and out for another score to roll through. So Connie currently sitting in first in that heat up against Kiyoki. And in the last one, we saw Cole Robbins take out the mighty Justin Quintal and Striders with Cole now. Thank you very much, Shannon. This morning, I saw you in the back of the car. You said, this is the board. <laughs> yeah. Wayne's been shaping me some amazing boards lately, and I finally found a, a real magic one. It's about 9-4. And for Malibu and right points, it just works so well. So thank you, Wayne Rich, for helping me out there. Uh, you know, electing for the trunks, how's the water? You know, the water's really nice. When there's a lot of sets that come through certain heats, so I kind of figured I'll stay warm pretty much the whole time. We sat pretty much the whole kind of back half of the heat, but it's just nice to be loose, especially on a board and we're running all up and down it. So I prefer trunks over a suit. And tell me about being here on the glass during finals day. Oh, it's, you know, this is what we kind of wait for all year. And it was interesting last year during the contest, I was just kind of focusing on pretty much requalifying. And then this year, it's kind of a different mindset where there's so many kind of variables and situations that could happen where we all have a, a shot to win the world title. So my parents came down and have a lot of support here and all around the world. And it, it kind of just means everything. I'm excited. I'm happy to be here. All right, well, he's got a smile on his face. Congratulations, hope to see you back. Thank you, Stad, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. A smiley Cole is a good one if you're not surfing against him in the water. Loose in the juice. He, uh, the, the option to wear board shorts and him expressing, just feeling loose, he looked fantastic. And really talking about that relationship he has with Wayne Rich. And Wayne is actually down here on the sand. So a lot of these surfers have their shapers on site. So Kai Salas is Coniella Stewart's shaper, 
and they have a, a, a full range of incredible models you can buy through Thunderbolt Technologies. And you can also get custom boards. As we see, another champion of Thunderbolt Technologies, Ben Skinner, he has a, a range of models available. And he's just riding, again, a tweak of one of those models that is what shapers and surfers do. They want to refine things to get the best out of the moment, as we see live action Taka Nui from Japan. Taka perched on a beautiful, smaller wave, but nice critical hang 10. Goes in for that re-entry on the finish. Find something different to end off with. Now, Tony Silvani, who's in the water against Taka and Nui, dropped in a 6.00, so Taka's now chasing a 6.01 to get the advancing position. And scores in for first of Taka, it's a 5.83, so he's now got a score on the board with a second to drop, and he'll take the lead over Tony, as that does. It's a 4.5 for last of Taka, so he's currently sitting in first with a 5.83 and a 4.5. Tony now chasing a 4.33 to get the lead over him. And down to 10 minutes on the clock for Kaniella and for Kiyoki. Kiyoki sitting in second, chasing a 4.6. And his 5.90, that last ride, that's the highest ride of the exchanges between Kaniella Stewart and himself. So he's in a really good position here. He's out of priority, but he's just chasing a 4.6, which is really attainable. Yeah, he's, he's not chasing a big score and having that little bit of momentum. What's it like when you're in a heat like that, Sam? And, and you know that even though you're sitting behind, you have the, the win of the exchanges so far, you've got that single highest score? Well, I think in this situation, because he's chasing a 4-6, he knows that's a possible score he can get out of priority. If he needed something in the excellent range, he's really got to get the pickings of the set. But in this situation, right. he might find a little bit of movement away from the takeoff spot could give him the wave he needs to get that score. Could facilitate something in that low range, that kind of mid range of a five. However, Connie Ellis Stewart is most likely going to get the next set and put something on the excellent range. So the other option is to sit there, wait for that priority. But on the replay, I love the setup off the bottom, a strong bottom turn that put him high in the lip for these multiple nose rides. And that hang 10 there was absolutely beautiful. Back and forth, up and down to the nose, locked in. You can see the spray coming off the rail on that rail release. And right in the pocket there, little head dip, little, little shampoo conditioner there. Back up to the tip, really loose and electric. And that's why it was rewarded a 5.90, which is the highest score of this heat so far in the Coniella Kyoko exchange. Beautiful surfing, boards looking great under his feet. He's finding that rhythm. He's had those those tough losses, like you said before, for so many times for Kiyoki. But now it seems like he's he's got that momentum towards him where if he does wait it out, lets Connie go on the first wave and then he's set up with priority and can take his pick of the lineup. There's still plenty of time on the clock as well with that eight minutes and 45 seconds. Absolutely, Tony got the better of the exchange in, the, in, in this out of priority heat. He got that six over Taka Inouye's 5.83, but Taka is backed up his 5.83 with a 4.5. So Taka, one of those surfers that when we see the skill level of some of the footwork and nose riding and turns, you go, wow, that guy's extremely talented. What will come through maturity is linking that all together. So he chooses the best waves and does that in, in a more refined style. So perhaps slowing things down and emphasizing the stronger qualities that give the, the big scores and losing some of the smaller movements that don't add to the score. Keeping everything as smooth as possible for the judging panel. Tony, five to 10 to start, back to the five and back to the 10 again. This is a long, long nose ride through that section. He's now gonna pump around, try and gain some speed and sets that rail line so that he can perch back to that hang five. Great footwork and now engages that deep drop knee cut back. Really gets a lot of spray off of it as well and is looking good as he comes through for the finish. Back to the 10 and looking for the kick out before he knocks the fin out. That was flawless from Tony. Those, ten, those 10s were absolutely sensational. They were really crisp and sharp and in the pocket. And that drop knee turn was just super electric. He's already sitting on a six point ride. Now waiting for a second to roll through, and let's break it down. Yeah, look at the line he takes here. Straight up, four steps to the tip. There's the five, and he holds this trim line in and out of the tens. First ten, second ten, stays on the five trim line. Third ten, walks back, pumps, accelerates, uses that middle of the board to climb and drop. Four steps back up, crisp, tight footwork, still in the pocket, toes curled over the tip. 
Four steps back, and I love that drop knee turn. I love the rail release. Back onto the inside section there, keeping all of that smooth footwork, looking incredible on his Bill Stewart board there. Wow, that was incredible surfing from Tony. I love the body posture as well. The way that his hands are just down by his, not totally at his side, but just kind of down low. And then as he engages in that drop knee cutback, you see his arms go up into the air for a moment and then back down. And everything's just, it's quiet, but it's functional the entire way through. Absolutely, that could go into the excellent range. That was a really dynamic bit of surfing. If it doesn't go into the excellent range, my criticism would be maybe, well, A, wave size, length of ride relative to some of the bigger sets, but B, just that, that driving flow. You know, some things were a little bit disjointed, which might put it in, in the slightly below excellent range. But as far as the degree of difficulty, very high, maybe the next agenda is just smooth it out and link it together so it ticks those flow marks. Well, scores are in, so it doesn't go excellent, but it is a 6.27 and drops through as the highest wave of the heat. That puts Taka now chasing a 6.44 to take the advancing position. Taka now with priority. And you can see our surfer in red waving his arms for the beach announcers to give them their situation update. It's our priority heat with five minutes, 30 seconds on the clock. Connie is sitting in the lead, but there hasn't really been a breakout moment for that heat. Are you feeling that as well? Yeah, absolutely. That This is a really close heat. Connie Kiyoki it, is gonna go right down to the wire. As you can see, Connie is just you know, he wants to know exactly what the situation is. He really needs to use the strategy here very wisely. Sitting with priority, he needs to make sure he, he gets a big score on the board when the set comes. Well, someone else that's using some great strategy down by the beach. He's worked his way into the VIP area, and he's searching for some snacks. Strider, any good food down there? You can. There's, uh, there's lots of stuff down here in the VIP area. This is the Turtle Bay VIP experience. So you come down here. We got Malibu Farm food over here on the back table, coffees, everything else that you want to get into. We got Gary Linden's agave board down here. Beautiful boards made down here. You can watch the couches. You got anything, you know, you come back here and hang out. There's actually no red tape here, so you could just walk right in. If you're random, come on down and enjoy this place. Uh, no, they're checking wristbands, but you know what? To watch the event from right here, looking out uh, at this venue, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, the conditions right now couldn't be any better for these guys. Uh, the viewing conditions couldn't be any better, so hats off to everybody here making this place very special in the Turtle Bay VIP zone is where you want to be at the moment. Uh, love it. Thanks so much, Strider. Save us some snacks while you're in there. We're down to four minutes on the clock. Connie is sitting with priority alongside Kyoki. They're not going to take a look at these smaller waves. So in the non-priority heat, Taka is going to use his priority on this one. Gives a few double arm paddles to get into this five to 10 combination with speed on the takeoff. Sticks to that nose ride. And I saw him doing this in his early surf this morning where he stayed on the nose so far through and he made the connection on the section. So he's already done it today. He's doing it again now. Incredible to be able to hold on to it for that long. And he is still going on the nose in that sort of cheater five position back up to a hang 10. And that was crazy. That was absolutely <laughs> sensational. That was one of the most intense <laughs> nose rides. Amazing Whoa. to have made that. He did it this morning. I watched him. I think it was his last wave in the free surfs right before the buzzer sounded to clear the water and knew that he could make it through that section with something different, a point of difference to the rest of the field. Well, this is the skill level this young man has from Japan. He just locks in there. He gets super low. He even grabs the rail here. He's, he's a good three feet behind the pocket there, but that Piccolo Clemente board holding, hanging tight, just allowing him to lift out of these sections enough to not nosedive. I mean... I mean, it's, it's not going to be a great score, but as far as skill level goes, it was an absolutely breathtaking bit of nose riding. It was a bit scrappy. That would be the criticism. Yes. And that was one of the criticisms we could give to Tony 6.27. A lot of fans at home might have watched that and thought that would have gone higher. I think the reason it didn't go slightly higher was some of the pauses between the nose rise and footwork. And flow has been a big factor. And style and flow on the judging criteria, what they're really trying to kind of translate that into is when they see that continuous movement, that continuous movement in the footwork, in and out of the nose rides, in and out of the rail work. I loved what I saw from Tony, but the criticism would be why he didn't go higher than the 627 is some of those pauses between the footwork and the setups for the rail work. Keeping those, those transitional moments very fluid, very smooth, 
super important. Scores in for Taka. It's just a three-point ride, but that was really fun to see and enjoyable. Absolutely. I mean, as far as entertainment value goes, I mean, you know, when it comes to, to, to log wrap, you know, for example, celebrating some of the best longboarding in the world, you know, that's the kind of thing that people just feast on. I mean, that was a, like an insanely <laughs> radical nose ride to hang on to. And the fact that he came out of it and went into a hang 10. Crazy, the fact that he could come out with that much speed and then compose himself up to his feet to that standing position, that he still had any strength left in his legs after being in that crouching position for so long. But this guy, Taka, I mean, I've been watching him free surf. He is just oozing talent. And I'm really excited to see how he can harness that talent to really kind of shine at all levels in international longboarding. So he does the right thing at the right time. Taka up and riding again under priority. Out the back, Kaniela Stewart finds that quick 10. Nice rail work and drives off the bottom as well to set himself up for this next 5 to 10 combination on the 5. Pedals back again. Beautiful S work as we see Kiyoki taking off behind as well. Connie still finding some great sections. Beautiful wave selection as it continues to offer pockets and rail work. Kaniella straight into the pocket again as that wave is just curling over the back of his board. Kiyoki as well, up and riding on the nose out the back. He's getting some great work done as Connie kicks out on the inside. And now we'll be able to watch the finish of this wave from Kiyoki as he's paddling back out. And Kiyoki with this last section to get it all done through to the inside. Has a quick stumble there, but regains composure. And he's looking to just drive through for the finish on the sand. Well, both of those surfers rode those waves brilliantly, but I think that was really smart surfing from Coniella. I think he got the better of that exchange. He chose the opening wave of the set. It was smoother, it was cleaner. It had more of a line. I think he'll get the better score, and I think this will book him a spot in the next round. That great first nose ride. Love the use of the drop knee turn. See how he accelerates coming off the bottom, back up for a nose ride in the middle of the wave, in the pocket. Again, using rail work, climbing and dropping, anticipating every section, right in the pocket the whole way. Great use of the drop knee turn. Good throw of spray off his Kai Salas board. Nice sole arch there. Really crisp, crisp and clean. Full variety. Exceptional surfing. And I think that's going to make the difference. And I think he's going to book himself a spot in the next round. So the buzzer has sounded. And Kyoki was up and riding just before. So both ways will be counting. Kyoki's 5 to 10 combination there. Excellent. So the difference between these two waves, I just feel like the wall line for Connie's wave was crisper. This wave slightly more bowl bowlier, but Kiyoki riding it on the nose critically. Extremely good nose riding. Already we've seen slightly more variety on the exchange from Coniella, but what we're seeing from Kiyoki could well go into the excellent range. Scores to come through now for last of Connie and last of Kiyoki. Surfer in red was sitting in first going into that exchange. Blue only requiring a 4.6, but both of them looking for those improvements on five-point rides. Very tight in the heat totals, and as they came into the beach. They're both borderline excellent range scores. I, I, I personally, from my opinion, think Connie will get the edge, but I think Kiyoki can be so proud of the way he surfed. He's really flown the flag for himself with great style here. He's been incredible, but this guy is going for his first world title. And these two, the Hawaiians, what a great battle between the North Shore and the South Shore going down in the water. But like you said, Connie Ellis Stewart, he's got that world title. His dreams, he's in that running for it. He's currently sitting at number one in the world coming into this event. And he's dropped in a 7.67, which means Kiyoki is chasing a 7.45 for his to take the lead back. So the judges now can compare those two rides. They've got that relative score to, to, to drop against what they've given a 7.67 for. So they'll be looking for degree of difficulty, flow, style, control, footwork, rail surfing. I think the scoring potential was slightly higher on Connie's waves, but Kiyoki rode this wave extremely well, setting up four steps, five, holds it, pulls up for the 10, nice and upright, stays on the five, crisply walks back to reset up for another tight five sole arch there, back up for a low in the wave, stretch into a full 10 sole arch, staying on the lows, nice and high. Nose riding has been absolutely incredible. There's the first rail turn. So Coniella had about three dynamic rail turns. Kiyoke opted for more longer nose rides, but just had that one dynamic rail turn. So that's where I think Coniella might just have the edge. And the scores are in. It's a 6.1 for last of Kiyoki Sagubo.
and he doesn't get the score. Connie Ellis Stewart as they rinse out their hair next to each other. Connie has booked himself a spot into the quarterfinals and keeps the world title hopes alive. Yeah. Yeah. You know Joe Pretty? I'm trying to figure out what's happening with him. to the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. And it's finals day. We're gonna crown a men's and women's champ here on the sands of Malibu. Iconic surf break in the context, not just of California surfing, but globally and the development of surfing. I'm Kaipo Guerrero, I'd like to welcome you as well as some special guests, Malibu's own star was Lucy and John Stockwell from Malibu Farms. Thank you for joining us, John. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, well, first of all, the quiche this morning was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my wife, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, as a longtime surfer and watching uh, the, uh, the culture and the evolution here at Malibu, what do you think about the, today's competition? Well, it's just amazing to see, you know, Malibu first point with only four people out. That's pretty rare. I saw it during COVID when the one guy paddled out and the, <laughs> and the sheriff and the, and the lifeguards took him down. But um, I used to surf out here. It's pretty chaotic. It is super chaotic out here. But, you know, for you, you know, coming down here, enjoying the beach and during the event and, and seeing, uh, you know, out that shot in the back there of your restaurant, it must feel pretty good. Yeah, it feels great. It feels good to see it standing. It took a hit during Hurricane Marie. We lost about 40 pilings. Um, uh, but it's 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 an amazing spot. Parking's not easy for anyone. Yeah, <laughs> for our staff, for our patrons. I know all the secret places to uh, double park. Well, I was just saying, hey, you come to Malibu. If you don't take a walk out to the end of the pier and have a smoothie or a, a breakfast or a lunch at Malibu Farms, you're blowing it because the view from there is incredible and uh, it's just a part of the whole Malibu experience. A guy that is experiencing Malibu in a different way, he's experiencing it in a successful way, and maybe a world champion. We'll see. I'm not putting a lot of pressure, but he's looking <laughs> in form. Connie Alice Stewart just won his last heat. He's into the quarterfinals, and he's down there with the wax head. Yeah, that's right. Kaniella is looking good. He's just warming up this morning. How did it feel out there at Malibu to get that heat out of the way? Uh, feels good to get the heat out of the way, definitely. Um, I wish we had more waves in that heat to kind of put on a show for everyone, me and Kyoki. Uh, Kyoki's been ripping lately, so, um, but yeah, I had a good time out there. And obviously you surf with Kyoki a lot at home. You see him around. Uh, he's a fixture 
both on the North Shore shooting photos and surfing as well. Um, what did you feel coming into this heat? You knew he was not going to leave anything left when he paddled back out. Oh, yeah, definitely. Kyoki's, you know, like I said, he's ripping. Um, you never know, you know. doesn't matter how good you are. Um, you can, you know, there's still a possibility, you know, the waves could go flat, you could lose. So there's so many different um, things that could happen. So, you know, having Kyoki in my heat is, it, it, you know, you, they're never... Like, it's never an easy heat. I know it's a little bit of a tricky one because he doesn't have a huge competitive uh, experience like some of the other competitors moving into the, the final rounds. But looking towards that, we didn't talk too much about a you know, world title. We just talked about sitting back on the glass. But we're talking points now. We're starting to get to that, that really pointy end. What's the method going forward? Are you going to change anything up? Or what, what are you feeling right now for your next few heats? Um, not, nothing's changing. Um, pretty much just get the sets. You know, those are the ones that are scoring the excellent scores. So that's probably the goal. Um, and just take it heat by heat. Great. All right. We may see you back up here in the glass. And that means you're getting even closer to clinching that world title, buddy. Well done. Anyone you say anything to at home? Anyone you yeah. want to thank? Um, aloha, everybody back home. Um, miss everyone back home. Thank you guys for watching, supporting me. Um, and hopefully I make it through this next heat. All right. Back to you guys in the booth. Hopefully see Kaniella up the next heat. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, it's about quarter to seven local time, Honolulu, Hawaii, where everyone's waking up and just getting the news that Connie Ellis Stewart is advancing to the quarterfinals. A little bit of friendly fire, however, in that round of 16 matchup between Kiyoki and Kaniala. Let's get into some replays right now, Strider. Let's start off with Taka Inoue. This happened during the break. I mean, just gliding. This guy has got so much energy. He'll surf 10 hours a day and still come back with surfing like this. He was the first guy out this morning, and look at his you know, finesse on the nose. He's just gliding, gets the five, beautiful style, and what a beautiful way to end this wave. He's going to come to the inside successfully, and wow. the very end of that, that was just gorgeous. The lean back, that style is just insane. Beautiful, but just the 6.07. This is a replay of Big Ben Skinner. Well, he, I mean, obviously this wave was one of the best waves that has come through and a lot of power underneath this guy. He's got technical surfing down. You know, it's so hard to finesse that board back and forth the way he's doing it. He's clicking all the boxes, throwing big turns, gliding on the nose, getting toes over. Beautiful 10 right there, uh, stepping back. You know, it's everything that the judges want. He's basically chalking up as he's coming through on this wave. So, you know, very composed and casual as well, which is also going to play into the criteria with style and grace. Yeah, Ben Skinner, a runner-up in 2021 here at Malibu. Back to live action and... A paced start for the young Tosh Tudor. Shades of dad in his style, arm placement and surfing, and beautiful cross-stepping up to the nose. Nice little five to trim that section. Beautiful transition into a switch stance and back to his goofy foot stance. Tosh Tudor, smooth on the board, little wobble on the inside. I love the display of and dexterity for Tosh Tudor uh, on that wave. Uh, love the switch stance. John, that was uh, kind of, you look kind of the same if you were out there right now what, on your, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, going switch yeah. stance. It could be me. <laughs> I wonder how strange it is for these guys to not have 20 people dropping in on them. <laughs> or I just paddling like out. Like, how do these people that are locals, it must be very odd to be surfing Malibu without the chaos. Yeah, so I mean, John, you're you're in the booth with us. Come, you know, talk to us a little bit about the controlled chaos that is Malibu. Well, you know, I don't, I live in um, Point Doom with Strider, so I don't I don't surf out here that much anymore. But it, it used to be don't blow up Strider's spots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I got to be friendly with Andy Lyons after some Matt Rapp helped me out. Uh -huh. I knew Sarlo, so you just you just get patient and. I guess now the theory is everyone drops in on everyone. and It is kind of crazy, yeah. And there's no reper repercussions for most people. Maybe Andy got some. Right. <laughs> Here we go. Ben Skinner on the nose. And Big Ben, it started off with a seven-point ride. Now he's looking to back that up in the non-priority heat against Tosh Tudor. Representing the UK and Skin Dog Surfboards, Ben Skinner is uh, powerful yet light-footed all at the same time, Strider. Yeah, you know, you can see the posture right there kicking out of that wave. He, he's looking good. And when you, when you feel that, that 
kind of confidence, you know, exuding through your, your posture, you can, you'll see it uh, transfer over into their surfing, and you can just see him just finding a comfort zone out there. I mean, he's got just pure technique. I mean, it is so hard to get up there and stay there, uh, but these boards are perfectly, you know, made to, to click in. Once you're up on the nose, big fin, tail's cook, hooking up into that uh, bowl section, so great surfing. I love the down carve like that. It's just beautiful to see the redirection and set themselves up to get back into that steeper part of the wave. Gliding across the nose there on the inside, right to the sand. So there was that posture I was talking about. Yeah, and uh, we'll be waiting for that score. Again, it's Kuiper Girls, Strider Wazalewski, and John Stockwell here on the set. And uh, John, coming from Malibu, and wearing a lot of hats. Not only are you a surfer, I'm just going to list some of your accomplishments. <laughs> okay. okay? Director of Blue Crush, which is an iconic film uh, yes. about surf culture and really started the wave of empowering female surfers. Yes, very proud of Blue Crush. I initially, Universal wanted us to film in Southern California in, in the winter until they realized that the girls would be wearing full suits. And right. They said, you know what? Let's, let's get them to Hawaii where they can be in. Yeah. And it was pretty bikinis. cool. You guys got Noah Johnson in a, in a <laughs> bikini as well for that, for that film, correct? Yeah, he was the only one who was willing to put on a bikini and shave his legs <laughs> until the guys on the beach saw him catch his first wave, and then, you know, everyone was volunteering. <laughs> but, yeah, Rochelle was hurt that the, 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 we, got, we got a spot during a Mike Stewart's bodyboard contest. Uh -huh. At Pipe. And, at Pipe. Yeah. And we had, like, 45 minutes to shoot, and Rochelle was hurt. Keala was, was, was in good. She's in the movie, but it, um, Kate was a regular foot, and, and Rochelle and Kate Scarrett were the only ones who could double her, and they were both hurt. So okay. Noah came in. Thanks. But most of the waves were, were Rochelle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it really did, as we watched Taka Inouye run up the beach uh, to look like a board change, Strider. That was amazing. Uh, the step off on the beach. We talked about how much energy this kid has, and it is so fun to see um, you know, him just really – coming out of his skin, literally, <laughs> as he <laughs> jumped off the beach onto the sand, runs over, grabs a new board, but the surfing he's doing is beautiful. And I'm, you know, questioning, why would you go change your board when you're, when you look this comfortable and you're gliding on the nose? I mean, he's just walking to 10 to 5 to 10 and just gliding across this inside section. I mean, that was such a beautiful wave. He's been on the nose the entire wave. And I mean, it, it's just incredible to see, uh, you know, how well and, and comfortable he is up there in a, in a place that's so so hard to be at and then finishes off with a beautiful little turn. So this is my favorite part, though. <laughs> I mean, look at that. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> like that wave. <laughs> the Energizer Bunny up the yeah. beach, and now he's going back out. Yeah, to frame this, uh, Taka is trailing Tony Silvani in the priority heat. Taka needs a 6.21 on that last ride. We're still waiting for the number for Taka Inoue to see if he can take the lead off of Tony Silvani. Judges are deliberating, and he's a 6.21. I have a feeling it's gonna come under his requirement. Here we go, live action. Tony Silvani on the Stewart surfboard. A nice paced approach for Silvani on the tail. Makes his way to the nose for a nice five, trimming through that section. Get a little soul arch to boot. Wraps around for a cutback. Silvani looking to better his low of a six-point ride and increase his lead over Taka Inouye. We're in the three-minute mark in the priority heat, and Silvani finishing it off right on the sand. Wow, that was much more like Stockwell, I'd say. <laughs> that was, uh... I'm going to do the face replacement <laughs> like we did in Blue Crush. How fun is it to, uh, to watch these athletes ride waves out here, Stockwell? I mean, normally when I'm watching anyone else surf, it's not pleasant because I want to be out there. You're the same way, right? <laughs> it's a selfish feeling, I guess. Uh, the true colors. No, of it's pretty amazing. It's pretty through. amazing. I, I, I'm still trying to understand more about how they're scoring longboarding, like the traditional longboarding versus more progressive. Um, obviously, no one gets to see as much longboarding as they do uh, shortboarding, so it's it's just it's uh, it's really interesting. It is a learning process, but you can really, um, I guess, appreciate the, the oh. beauty of <laughs> and the style. Is that a claim? And that the was character. a claim. This is, yeah, yeah, the, and the character <laughs> of, of, of the athletes so, in, the, in the longboard world. So let's uh, we'll clear this heat up. That last score for Takei Noi was not enough.
So he remains in second place. And uh, so that effort, that excitement from Taka, as we see him ri running back up the beach, is because he's pleading, John, for more. he's okay. pleading for a score right now. And here he is. Your thoughts on this wide. Yeah, this is a beautiful one, John. What do you think? Oh, it's amazing. I wish I could get to the, <laughs> no, that my board. I wish I could cross step. Again, you tell me what, what, what they're looking for right now. S style, flow, grace, use of the entire board, footwork, nose riding, as well as being able to trim the board from the middle, not just doing tail turns. So it is way more um, weighted. And you always got to get to the beach? On traditional surfing. Uh, finishing the wave, finishing the wave here <sighs> at Malibu is that they have been pretty, uh, you know, that crucial about that. Um, also, just doing your maneuvers and your and your nose rides and everything else in the, the steeper part of the wave, right? So when the wave actually gets really uh, steep and hollow, that's where they want to see you on the nose. So you can't just stay at the at the tail and and, and surf the wave. Definitely not. They can't do a stock well. They got to be up there <laughs> on the nose and just glide. Or your you stomach. That. You know, you got. <laughs> it's beautiful though. I mean, look at how well he's turning that board, and yeah. he's right in the in the critical part of the wave, and he's and he's walking the nose. He's cross stepping back and forth, and then you know, clicking all the boxes of the criteria like Kaipo just brought broke down. So you know, this wave is probably going to come in at at his highest wave of the heat so far. Beautiful. All right. So Silvani. Comes in with a 6.73. Requirement for Takanoi has increased to a 6.93. Judges still deliberating on the score for the Japanese competitor while there's just 20 seconds remaining in the priority heat. Inoi spocks this one and decides to go quick to the 5, to the 10. And now he's surfing for a 6.93. Takanoi on this. Little wave, I think he's gonna be hampered a bit by the size of the wave right behind him, Tony Silvani. So both surfers are gonna be making their way to the beach and waiting for scores and the final decision for heat eight in the round, uh, heat six, I'm sorry, in the round of 16. Look at Joel, tu uh, Joel Tudor's son out the back. I mean, this guy is on fire. I love watching Tosh surf. He's so you know fluid and clean. Rides uh, a short board and a long board just as well. It's so beautiful to watch How him. old is he? Uh, he's about 22, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he looks just like Dad as far as style and technique. And um, and actually, he's been, I mean, Strider can speak to this with Tosh. Is he's starting to bring a, a good act to, over to Pipeline. Yeah, it's super impressive. He uh, He's in the specialty event there this year. So, uh, you know, we get to see him out there. Back to what's happening out here in the water, though. Some beautiful nose work after a couple of turns. You know, it's um, it's all part of the criteria, right? We talked about that a bit, Stockwell. Like, you know, they want to see you do the turn back down into the bowl. And I, and I think Taka, his surfing is great up on the nose, but he didn't have a lot of rail work where he actually got his board back into the critical part of the wave. And that's why his scores came in a little lower. And, you know, you know Tony was doing big turns, throwing them around, getting back up on the nose. And that's why he came out on top in that heat. And, and each heat you'll watch, the guys who are clicking all the boxes of that criteria will come away with the higher scores. Sorry to be ignorant, but are there any Brazilians in this contest? There are. We yeah. had. I, I, I was like, why are they do not dominating long words? Um, well, was on the, when we get to the, the female side, um, Chloe Kalman out of Brazil is a pretty, oh, yeah, pretty f substantial force. Um, this is a replay here of Taka Inoue. And um, I want to say this was, this was not his last wave, but... Taka did not get the score that he needed in his matchup against Tony Silvani. So we'll enjoy this replay. However, we're going to say sayonara to our Japanese competitor, Taka Inoue, because he's eliminated from competition. Here's the numbers here. Tony Silvani on to the quarterfinals. We'll be back with more action here at Malibu. We'll be back with more Strider Wazalewski and John Stockwell right on the other side of this break. Stick around.
looks like that third wave of red then started to show up in the monitor here. He's going to throw away the 117. His second story opened up with that 5 3 3. And it looks like Declan and the White got on the board in the non priority heat. That, so, yeah, go ahead. That last score teacher came in for Ben at came in at a 4.83. Got a decent backup to the seven. Welcome back to the Cuervo Classic Malibu, presented by O'Neill, and we're gonna crown a world champ today for the men and the women, right here on the sands of Malibu. We got Heat 8 of the round of 16, just entered the water, the Australian Declan Whiten, matched up against Dana Point's Kevin Skavarna in the non-priority heat. I'm Kaipo, joined along with Strider Wazalewski and John Stockwell. John, no, no I, w I was going to list John. I was going to list all, you like all your, no, I was going to list all your, all your titles. Okay. Writer, yes. director, actor, and co-owner of Malibu Farms, John Stockwell. That's what you, that's what we were waiting for. There's so many layers that we got to peel <laughs> off of this on onion of Stockwell here uh, in competition. Uh, but we got Declan Whiten on his first wave. Hailing from North Stain, Manly Beach. And just a quick in and out. And while we reset out there, we're going to throw it down to the wax head. He's with Tony Silvani. Yeah, guys, Tony, fresh after that win, came in clutch. You had Tucker, the Energizer Bunny, doing two runarounds with a board change. What was going through your mind? Did you, did you feel comfortable the whole time, or were you worried that he was going to get the score? I definitely had a strategy going into that heat. I wanted to make sure that I had some good waves and you know, mid-range scores so that I could um, leverage that towards the end of the heat to use my priority. And unfortunately, I caught one of the waves that I had priority with and I got stuck behind the section. So I was a little nervous. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you if you notice from watching a lot of the heats, Taka has been doing some incredible hang tens and he's been a standout at this event. Well, obviously your surfing and your safe uh, plan rattled him with the board change and he was surfing well uh, but that's a testament to your your plan so do you think moving into the next round are you going to stay with those mid-range scores are you going to try and up them a little bit no I'm definitely going to push the Annie up and try and do my best to get higher scores and um, I'm just so happy to make it on to the next round it's been my goal and I've been striving hard at the event so I'm excited for this next round to come up and uh, you're back on the glass again. You get to say a little shout out to everyone back home. Uh, are they tuning in right now? Yeah, all my staff that's watching at home, thanks so much for taking good care of the business. And, you know, all my friends, Ron Misty, um, my whole entire family. My family's coming out here today, so it's going to be nice to see them later this evening. And I hope for a really eventful day. Wow, you might even have that uh, winner's trophy by the end of the day, but we'll, uh, we'll see what happens, see what unfolds. Hope to see you back up here shortly. Thank you so much. Back up to you guys. Well, there you go. The ageless Tony Silvani. He's been doing this for a long, long time. As we watch Big Ben Skinner run up the beach in his challenge against Tosh Tudor. Skinner already with a seven-point ride to his credit. You can see the graphic. T Tudor opening up with a five-point ride. 3-3. Three, three. And more waves on the way. This overlapping format, Strider, very few breaks. Uh, I enjoy it. I, I love the action. I mean, you just saw, you know, a surfer not take that wave and then Tosh Tudor on the inside paddling back out gets the opportunity. I mean, look at how perfect this wave is. I mean, it's a head high, perfect wall, at, you know, on the inside of... Uh, Oh, unfortunate for for a commentator's curse just took him out of that yeah, one. Yeah, it happened. It was just <laughs> that's tough. That's okay. Declan White and right behind him, and 
trying to 360. I don't know if that was gonna, that would help him or if that was exaggerated pullout. John, what did you take of that? That looked like a 180, 360. Yeah, trying to get some a, type of some aerials in the longboard roll. All right, so John, we talked about Blue Crush. Yep. I want to talk about some acting roles. I think um, you were in Top Gun for about yeah 30 seconds. Did you get shot, shot down real quick? <laughs> I, I could. I just was sweating and you know <laughs> thinking of my family. <laughs> I was Cougar, the guy who couldn't land his plane, so I was Top Gun, and then Tom Cruise took over. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, kind of the same thing when the waves get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Strider's right behind. Uh, but uh, on a, on a serious, well, Strider's, uh, you Strider's know what? in front of me. Strider's normally. in front of me a yeah. lot, too, John. Yeah, I travel yeah. a lot with this guy, and he's just got that knack of himself, and he always says he can't see you. I have an excuse. It was my turn. There's, there's actually like, there's a list of Striderisms on why he why either paddled around you, you or wh why he burned you. And well, I'm glad that we're experiencing no. this together, John, and exchanging notes. I'm getting older. A lot of things I, I can't hear anymore, <laughs> and I, it's really hard for me to see. So you know, it's just you know, I just see this wall of water, and I'm going. <laughs> yeah, those earplugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're enjoying our time over here. We're celebrating the day. It's it's a big day here, but. We got to get through this round of 16 first before we get down to the nitty gritty. And wanting to get through this round of 16 is Declan White. And you can see him on the nose in the foreground and in the background, Kevin Skvarna, who's up against the challenge um, with Declan in the non priority heat. Skvarna, sure footed. Whiten, little snap on the inside. Great camera work getting both of our surfers in the non-priority heat. So the judges will have to put pen to paper and give us some scores for Declan Whiten oh. and Kevin Skvarna going into the crowd position. <laughs> that was Maybe the tripod. Maybe the tiki <laughs> tripod. <laughs> that was a reverse tripod. <laughs> but one of the gnarly things, Stockwell, I want to tell you right now, with the, all these guys finishing off on the beach, we've already seen some fin damage because these guys are milking it all right. the way till the very last drop. And I would say that Probably 80, 90 percent of these guys don't have the pop-out fin system. When I went back there and looked, everybody had a screw in. So you know, it's kind of interesting to me that uh, that uh, to me the the pop-out would be a way to go. Just is no one surfing finless? Yeah, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> Skyler That'd and Davis are not here. <laughs> <laughs> we saw Talo just cross the, the parking lot a little bit. Speaking of he was foiling. Wonton? Yeah, he was yeah, Wonton. Was Wonton was foiling. <laughs> I would say Strider is the most stoked surfer, though. He'll come back from Chopu where he's surfed you yeah. know, double overhead and he'll be at, you know, ankle high Malibu and just as excited. Which I'm is always why excited. he gets to drop in on everyone because he's got uh, such I, a good stock level. Stock 50 and frothing. That's the whole <laughs> thing Stockwell. here, you guys. Please don't encourage him. Please. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hang around with this guy. Okay. <laughs> and he's got to surf with me, so he's actually, you know, trying he's to He's got a smile out. always, though. He's never, uh, he's never upset. So, yeah. Hey, John, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the work you and your wife do over at Malibu Farms because it really is a great place. We've been enjoying the catering here, and it has been A+. Plus. Yeah, that's Susie and my wife, Elena. Yeah. But yeah, we started out at the cafe in 2013. It used to be a Ruby's that didn't do well, and there was a beachcomber. Oh, yeah, at the cafe. And uh, oh, our yeah. sign is back up. That's there you nice. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Uh, and uh, we did a pop up. It was successful. Beachcomber went out of business. Ruby's um, had already gone out of business. And so we took over the front restaurant as, as well. It's challenging because our cooks in the, at the cafe, that, that moves a lot. Even on a small day like today, there's a lot of swing. Right. They take Dramamine. Oh, they, wow. To be in an enclosed hot space, it's, it's oh, like wow. a gallon. So there is, there is a little oh, bit of sway out there. Like, it's a wood it's like, pier. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of So a big south swell, you're really rocking. Oh, I mean, they, they usually they can't even cook. It's, it's like cooking on big. a boat. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, it is. Wow. It's, it's crazy out there. It's, it's, I mean, I love the experience. You know, you're out there. The way well, you're a boat are, guy, are, yeah. you know, going through, and you're out there, you know, eating some amazing food. But it's the best view. Oh, it's the view is the second to none, and you sit out on that side underneath that sign, and you're just enjoying probably the best view you could get when the, on a south swell anywhere in the world. I was asking you if you've ever shot the pier. You said only on a foil, right? Because one thing that happened after Hurricane Marie was they replaced a lot of the pilings under the pier, and guys like Sarlo, who are used to the way through, were like, right. "Well, there's a piling. Yeah. <laughs> there's a new, the new road <laughs> yes, for that. Yes, like they had to." Re adjust the whole <coughs> trajectory. Here we go with some replay, Strider. This is uh, Declan in the foreground and Skvarna 
in the background. You know, both on the nose, enjoying that tip time. Uh, this was, uh, um, you know, kind of a smaller little under the radar set that came through, but, you know, having perfect shape, you might as well go. Both of them opting in and both of them getting nice turns, both of them riding the, the nose of the board, but one going goofy foot and one going regular foot. So on the backhand, it's a little harder to stand up there and get 10. That's probably something I, uh, out of the two. There's that reverse that. tripod we saw, <laughs> almost into a cockroach. <laughs> Man, I just love longboarding. I feel like there's so many different, you know, things that you can do out here. This is a 7.9 for Ben Skinner Strider. Yeah, Ben. Ben is running away with this heat. I mean, he just looks so confident. We talked about it right in the beginning when he got that first seven-point ride where he kicked out of the wave and had that posture. And when you have that, you can just dial in your board and you feel like you have full control. And as you can see, he looks like he's completely in control out here. And that's something that the judges will take note of because if there's any hesitation, if you don't look like you're actually wielding the board or you know finding that nose and, and really have the hands down low when you're doing going through everything, you know, it looks like you're kind of frantic and all over the place. He's obviously looking really, really in control. Back to live action here, and just sneaking at one from underneath the pack in the non-priority heat, Declan Whiten, lifeguard from the Northern Beaches, Manly, North Stain. And he's been earning his way through this longboard tour, the young man with a bright future and some light feet getting to a 10 there. A little bit of hoverboarding right through that section. Great redirection, wonderful footwork, and the finish for Declan. It was a small wave, but very impressive surfing stock. Well, what do you think? I mean, everything is beautiful out here. I, what's, what's, remind me, what's the purse for this contest overall? The, the world title. But the money. Oh, we don't like to. We surf. We don't like to. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to talk about money. <laughs> We're not talking about that much. We don't want to put money first. <laughs> I'm 30 minutes in. Oh, nice. <laughs> I pointed it out. I didn't say yeah, it yet, but we're going to get back to this replay because we're on, on a, a beautiful glide across this wave on the inside to 10. I mean, look at this guy. Just looks like he's camping out up there. Even though this wave is in the non-priority heat, the work that he did on this wave was just gorgeous. I feel like, you know, um, very smooth and stylish and really having a lot of, uh, I guess, finesse on that uh, okay, wave. It's really fun to watch. Get, you get... Surf ranch or first point with three other people out? Which which is your choice? That's a good question. If if and what would you pay for this? This would be. You look at these purses. I was like, yeah. you could get a lot of money from people to surf Malibu by themselves. This is true. <laughs> what you, what's your choice? <laughs> Don't give the state any ideas, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's the county. <laughs> what, what's the your county choice, Strider? Money. Uh, we're going to watch this wave of uh, Tosh Tudor really quick because he's uh, making a quick effort right here to the inside <laughs> corner, and then we'll get back to my choice. There we go. Well, here we go. Tosh Tudor, he needs to come back, and he needs to come back in a big way. He needs a 9.57 at this moment to overcome Ben Skinner. Smaller wave, nice footwork, however, for Tosh. A little bit of a poke of the nose has to recover from there. A little downtime for Tudor, fading to the cross step once again to the nose. Puts in a valiant effort. However, the requirement, Strider, is near perfect at a 9.57. Yeah, he's going to have to uh, stack up a combination of waves in order for him to get himself back into this heat right now. That I think that's what he's trying to do. Um, this wave kind of letting him down a little bit. Not, you know, he's sitting out the back in a priority heat. He needs to find himself on something a little bit bigger for him to establish himself in this heat. And it looks like Kevin Skvarna right behind him. In the non-priority heat, and the judges are going to owe us a deck of scores, and they're just catching up. But Skvarna, a little bit of unorthodox oh. in the approach, but able to pull it like back it. out. Tremendous effort by Kevin Skvarna. The ultimate is, you know, hanging 10 out here, I feel like, at Malibu for as long as possible. But you do need to have the rest of, you know, the repertoire in the, in the, the ride. So the combination of maneuvers as well as nose rides are, are how you're scored and that's how you're going to go into the excellent range. I was going to say repertoire. Well, I stole my word. Sorry I stole your <laughs> word. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to the question about the surf ranch. This summer, a big swell came. I caught a wave that doubled up at Malibu, and it had a huge barrel, and it blew me away so much that I actually missed the barrel, and I blew it. <laughs> How many people were out? It was about 200 people in the lineup. Back. To, sorry. We're going to go to the replay. We'll be back to the story uh, of Tosh here, just you know, walking the nose, finding the beautiful cross step back into the bowl, really you know, sweeping that board around into a uh, beautiful position to regain composure into that steeper part of the wave, but the wave kind of tapered off here on the inside. have the number in it and my thoughts are that that wave did not have the number in it even no matter what he could do on that wave that wave didn't have an excellent score on it right so he needed to sit out the back and wait for a bigger wave that was a mistake you're saying uh, no I mean sometimes you don't have a choice <laughs> but that's just nature you know that's uh that's the playing field that we're on here's Ben big Ben Skinner and this is a victory lap for the founder of Skin Dog Surfboards, pride of the UK longboarding community, and uh, surfing's Thor, if you would. Big, powerful, falls off, that doesn't matter. Tudor on the inside here, just scrapping out this one, gets to the nose, shows some poise, glides through that section, that wave closed out, not gonna give him the opportunity, again, for that excellent score that he needs. Sound of the horn ends the heat, and all we have now is speculation and waiting for the judges. Was yeah, we're gonna some scores are gonna drop in. You know, we're gonna finish off on the inside okay. right here. Um, but we already know who took this one. We out. already took it. Yeah. Yeah, Ben. Ben wins that in my book, uh, tenfold. Thank you, John Stockwell. Thank you to Malibu Farms. Thank you for everything you do. You're writing another movie. You need someone who's like kind of an action hero type or, or a, a hilarious rom-com guy. I'm at Kaipo Guerrero. <laughs> and we're going to be back with more from Malibu here at the Cuervo Classic Malibu. You left your partner out of that. Cuervo. <laughs>
back in Malibu for the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. Kevin Svarna up and riding. Svarna kicks out. We are in round the 16, heat number eight, and our first quarterfinal has hit the water in this overlapping heat format. I know, I think Declan Whiten in the priority heat. This is heat eight of the round of 16 with Whiten on the tip. And carves through a beautiful cutback before regaining trim. Right behind him, Kevin Skavarna utilizing his priority over the non-priority heat. And Skavarna is on the comeback against Declan Whiten. Skavarna needs a 5.97 at the moment to take the lead off of the Australian. And Kevin does a nice job of finishing off that wave. So the situation with 15 and a half after those last exchanges came through for White. I'm Kaipo Guerrero. I'm joined by Strider Wazalewski, as well as Matt Chanoski, the Waxhead, talking you through all of the action. As I reference, quarterfinal number one out in the water right now as we look at our brackets here. Taylor Jensen against Kai Salas in quarterfinal number one. Quarterfinal number two will feature Cole Robbins against Harrison Roach. And we're looking at a Kai Salas doing a great job on those. Unfortunately, Matt poked the nose and went incomplete. Right behind him, though, Taylor Jensen. Talk us through this one, Matt. Wow. That was a, an amazing swoop from Taylor to set up on his first wave here with Kai going down. So uh, Interesting to see that, doesn't happen very often, but uh, there may have been a little bit of white water on the wave from the previous one of Declan's. They're watching Taylor here finishing off a fantastic opening wave, a lot of variety, beautiful footwork. And one thing we've noticed about Taylor is the middle of the board and the trimming and the, the uh, versatility in between sections. It's not all action off the tail or just the nose ride. There's a lot of in-between moments. Confidence, he looks so good out there. He looks like he's comfortable on that board. He let feel, you know, he's, his equipment looks amazing. And, you know, he ended up on the best wave of that exchange. Um, Salas had a beautiful line. I, I feel like there's a little bit of backwash out there, maybe some lump on the face that uh, was unexpected for him. And that's why he fell, uh, you know, he ended up sinking the nose there. Yeah. So um, we did have, you know, the exercising of priority out, out in this heat um, between Kai Salas and Taylor Jensen. But let's take a look at what happened here. So here we go. Taylor and Kai surfing together. And that's never, ever, ever, ever a good thing at the beginning of the heat when we don't have priority established. And now oh. Kevin Skvarna with the priority takes the wave, and rightfully so, but the damage has been done for Kai Salas as we run through this replay. And Kevin just is going to finish off this wave, but the interesting part was the beginning of this ride where we saw quarterfinal number one, the two surfers out there, Taylor Jensen and Kai Salas, both surfing at the same time and the judge's decision has come in, and it's a brutal one for Kai Salas. It is an interference on Kai Salas, Strider. Yeah, you know, I, it, only thing I can think is that there was a wave ridden before that, a smaller wave, maybe he thought, I don't know. Obviously, uh, obviously not, and there was uh, no priority what in do you that think heat. Happened, Matt? And if he dropped in on him, he's going to get an interference. We'll have to try and have another look at the beginning because none of us expected that. It's just heartbreaking for I, Kai right now. I mean, the heat isn't over. I mean, let's get this straight. Here, um, here it is again. Look. All right. So, so Kai didn't even look back is what I'm feeling. I wonder what happened 10 seconds before that, which we don't have the, the camera for that. But maybe it was a late turn from Taylor. And that's why Kai had sort of set his rail and began to paddle down the line because the wave is look, Kai pretty has, fast. Uh, Kai has no idea. No idea that his competitor, Taylor Jensen, is behind him. Taylor just finally goes and looks at him and just like, what? And then, yeah, he wow. Be, I wouldn't be surprised right now if Kai thinks that he interfered on Kevin's wave. That, because he didn't know Taylor he was behind him. He still doesn't know Taylor was, took off behind him because... He won't know. 
I mean, if you're in a heat, you're not going to call somebody off. No. <laughs> right? well, there's no priority. And to get this right, there's no priority. There's no stop. priority. It, a guy drops in on you, you're going to take the interference and, and run away with the heat. This is for a world title. Yeah, it sure is. No well, friends on a powder day. No, yeah. Well, gunning for a world title is Ben Skinner, and Ben's against the glass with Shannon. Let's hear from Ben. That's right, Kaipo. Ben, you're into the quarterfinals. You're that much closer to winning a world title today. How are you feeling coming out of the water? Oh, I'm just stoked to be here. The waves are amazing today. I mean, uh, the sets are incredible. Still the odd slow moment. Um, so you just got to stay patient and try and pick the best wave. So, yeah, I'm going to keep doing that. And you took a little spill after your, your second wave. You got a little blood on the leg. How's uh, the energy feeling? And how are you going to pace yourself going throughout today? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm just going to carry on enjoying myself. I mean, it's it's pumping and surfing with one other person in the water. So it's... Um, it's an incredible opportunity, really, to get some of the best waves of our lives at, at the most iconic wave. So, uh, yeah, excited to just keep going to surf more. <laughs> and you just feeling that same froth that you had last year walking away with that runner-up finish? Yeah, I love this wave. It's, uh, who doesn't? I mean, it it's really is. It, I feel like it suits my surfing. I've got a great board under my feet. Um, so everything's, like, feeling good. Incredible. We'll keep up the good work, and hopefully we'll see you here again. Thank you. Love you, kids. Michelle. Mwah. All right, Ben Skinner on to quarterfinal number four. Quarterfinal number one out in the water and some unexpected hijinks right at the beginning of that heat. I put Kai Salas with an interference. Now, my feeling is that we're gonna get it confirmed, but my feeling is that that was a non priority interference and there would be a difference between a priority interference and non-priority interference priority interference you lose an entire wave a non-priority interference your your second wave is cut in half but we'll wait for confirmations but i think that's what it's going to cost kai salas in this situation that yeah unfortunate times for kai but as i said the heat is not over we'll wait to get that confirmation but i just want to reiterate what ben just said in his post heat interview the best waves of his life at one of the best waves, or at the best longboard wave. That is why we're here at the Cuervo Classic, presented by O'Neill, I mean, iconic. It's good today, but it can't be the best wave of his life. No, well, there's a lot of things. That, okay, what is, what is the best wave of your life? Is it a state of mind, or is it actually like a physical wave? That's a, that's a, that's a tree best, dropping in a forest the, the right there. I catch the best wave of my life every day. Because you, for me, it's more metaphoric. It's it's more about how you're feeling and mm. and and where you're at. And and you know, John said it earlier. I'm always smiling because I'm just in a state of mind of the now. And for him, he just made it through a heat and is on sure. a march to for a world title. So maybe that's what he's playing into his comment of best way of his yeah. life. Much like the Groms yesterday, paddling out after uh, yesterday afternoon uh, here at Malibu, getting to experience perhaps one of them their personal most iconic sessions. They may have had the best waves of their life. So yeah. anyone out there listening, I think it's a state of mind. Have and your best wave. And, we get, and given it's first point Malibu with just uh, four surfers out. So this is uh, pretty unheard of. As we see Declan Whiten in the priority heat, he's leading against Kevin Skvarna, and he wants to build on that lead, doing a great job with that 10 right through that section. Now he's going to go for a couple of rhythmic roller coasters and then a big accentuated snap for Declan back up to the nose back into trim position great footwork by the Australian and checks his watch sees that he has seven and a half minutes remaining and now de making a decision whether he's going to run or paddle and I think the Dolphins has come have come to say hi this morning Strider. Yep, always out the back. Uh, we, we're very lucky and fortunate here in the Santa Monica Bay. We get a lot of dolphin activity and a lot of uh, whale activity. Uh, they always they, they kind of cruise in through the bay and then they head out to Point Doom, uh, scratch their backs on the sandbars there at Zuma and, and move on. But it's it's really cool vantage point from up there to watch them come in and you can usually see a bunch of them migrating. The dolphins are Amazing and friendly, and they come right up to you. It's pretty cool. You ever go underwater and try to squeak a little bit to get some dolphin communication with their sonar? You know what? I, you can hear the squeak underwater. Yeah. But squeak I back. actually, I actually rub my surfboard. Ah. 
and it gives off a little squeakish. Uh, the squeak actually emulates your own vibe too. So if you're calling out, they'll come over. Getting spiritual. It, it's, it happens. Here we go. Replay. <laughs> Beautiful ride right here. I'm a fan. I, I feel like uh, the style we have, and, and you know the poise and how the comfort level out of the Australian. I really enjoy the way he's surfing. I mean, he's got so much energy that he's moving that board around beautifully and then finding the nose again so i you know he's finishing off strong i love the way this kid's surfing yeah matt you've probably watched declan basically grow up uh what's your thoughts on on his surfing and where he's evolving to <laughs> well i'll tell you what the wave before the 6.5 just before all the commotion with uh kai and taylor uh that was a really well surfed wave um surprised it didn't go higher although there was no uh, single pinpoint moment that was overly critical. Declan's flow overall has, in has improved as the longboard tour has de developed, as the judging criteria has appreciated the elements of longboarding that make it what it is. So um, style, flow, connection, foot footwork, um, but mixed with power turns, Declan ticks all of those boxes, but his nose riding has improved out of sight and that's what's getting him the scores and that's why he's in uh, this, this uh, next round, round of four right now. As we see Kevin Scavano up and riding, and behind him we have Kai Salas. There we go, two surfers on your screen, both in separate heats in this overlapping heat format. And Kai Salas caught in the white water, finally finds the open face, but he's gonna have to kick out. Kevin Scavarna trying to milk this wave for all it's worth, because he's in the priority heat, and Scavarna needs a 7.07 if he wants to make his way into the quarterfinals. You know, back onto those dolphins, uh, Peter Benchley learned to surf here and was actually riding a board Dale Velzi made for him down the road. And Jaws was actually inspired by uh, his time in the ocean around here um, in Santa Monica Bay and at Malibu as well. That's awesome. That's a great trivia question. Wow. I mean, uh, thanks to Corky Carroll for that one. Oh, thanks, Corky. And thanks, Corky, for... Uh, for just being Corky Carroll. Well, Thank you a, just for being yourself, Corky Carroll. Putting a microphone on and going surfing. Yeah. Remember Rocky Point? Yeah, Corky's done a lot Corky's of stuff. He's, uh, he's made music. He's been up front in a lot of things. He's been national commercials. He's a, he's a former a multiple U.S. champion. Surf school. Everything. He's, he's the, uh, the American version of Peter Townend. Ah. S surfing socialite. There you go. I like it. PT will be watching us right now. We should pink shoes on. <laughs> or pink shirt. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's find out what happened at the beginning of this heat between Taylor Jensen and the interference by Kai Salas. Shannon, what's the info? Well, I've just gotten the word in from the judging panel. So start of the heat, no priority established, no waves ridden. Taylor Jensen in the red takes off on the first wave but stays on his stomach and his hands never leave the rail. He doesn't take off, and so that wave doesn't count. He kicks out of the wave, having not stood up. Kai Salas is out the back and just sees that Taylor had taken a wave, so assumed incorrectly that he was then given first priority because if Taylor had stood up, priority would have been, would have been put into effect. Then the next wave comes through. Taylor still on the inside position, and because we're on a point break, that inside position comes into right of way. Next wave rolls through, and they both take off on it. Taylor with the right of way gets priority on that wave, even though it's a non-priority situation. Kai Salas dropped in on him. Therefore, a non-priority interference is put on Kai Salas over Taylor Jensen, and Kai right, loses like half of his second scoring ride. Explanation is Shannon, and uh, kind of sneaky, you know, but you know what, Strider? It's just yeah, like it's like crossing PCH in Malibu. You always got to look. Mm. Well, in a heat, yeah, but if I'm out there, I'm not looking <laughs> back, so you know, it, unless uh, Big Daddy's coming down the line. Sarlo's always got priority. <laughs> But unfortunately for him, you know, I really, I knew that there something had happened before that. I knew somebody had been on a wave. The reality is if your hands don't leave the rails, it's not a counted wave. And right? the guy on screen knows about this more than anyone, uh, interrupting Harrison Roach's title run last year. Yeah. Harry got knocked out at Noosa yes. in 2020 with the exact scenario, assuming Kevin had lost priority Hands didn't leave the rail with a uh, concerted paddle, but hands didn't leave the rail. Judges deemed it no swap priority. Harrison took off at his home break at Noosa got and got knocked out early. That made 
room for Declan Wyden to progress through a heat that he was uh, he wasn't winning convincingly. Yeah. Well, you know what? Things are not as cruisy as they appear to be sometimes so the, on this longboard tour. I know it's all good vibes and peace signs, but sometimes a little gamesmanship can come into play when you got the jersey on. And uh, that was what went down in quarterfinal number one. But let's pay attention to round the 16, heat number eight, the last slot for the quarterfinals. One minute remaining in that heat, Declan Whiten out in the lead. Kevin Sparna needs a 5.91, but he's going to have to sneak one under the priority of Declan Whiten. And here we go. Sparna, small inside waves. Starts off switch, gets to the parallel stance, just looking for a switch nose ride perhaps, but the body language strider tells me that he has exhausted his opportunities. Time is not on his side at the moment. Uh, and he's been a little off kilter throughout this heat, you can tell. He hasn't been on his game. He's, he's um, a little wobbly. You know, the consistency of, of his cross steps and nose rides haven't been, you know, confident, and you can see that in the surfing. The momentum that has been with Declan the whole way through, throwing, showing flow through most of his waves. Off to, you know, there was a, there's a four, there was a couple of twos there, but Declan really came to fire with uh, a five six and a five four, a six five and a five five three. So, carrying momentum into the next round, Declan will take this one out, and some, yeah, nice camaraderie there, and Declan moves one step closer to potentially clinching a world title. There you go, Gromit, on fire. Thanks, Strider. Thanks, Waxhead. We are going to step away for a sec, but when we come back, we'll be back with more men's quarterfinals here at the Cuervo Classic Malibu. Surf culture and especially the culture of longboarding is really about tradition. And Jose Cuervo is really about tradition. Malibu, California, a jewel of the California coast as well as an iconic wave. I think it's so fantastic that Jose Cuervo has come on to support this event and also really support longboarding and surf culture. They're very synonymous with each other. It just makes so much sense. And, you know, I know all of us are stoked. Gets all the way up in a beautiful hang 10 trim line. Full use of the board, nose, and the tail. Beautiful footwork. Making the most of that one for sure, right onto the beach. That classic style, five to 10. With surfing and how much ingrained tradition there is in it, and so much ingrained tradition in Cuervo, the fact that they're working together and, and supporting longboarding, it's a real blessing. We're back from the Cuervo Classic here at Long 
<laughs> here for the Longboard World Championships in Malibu, and it's been a great day of surfing. There's been plenty of good sets rolling through. We've had a joy calling the action. The surfers themselves are so excited when they come out of the water. Shannon Hughes here in the booth alongside of Sam Bleakley, and it's just been so fun to see their reactions of getting to surf empty Malibu. Absolutely, the stoke level is through the roof. And what is really inspiring is seeing so many of the board builders on the sand. I was just talking to Michael Takiyama, who's one of the creators of some of the equipment a lot of the surfers are riding. A lot of the surfers who are competing are also shaping their own boards. Ben Skinner, Kai Salas. But the, the level of creativity that we're seeing with board design is really contemporary. And also the quality of the turns and nose riding. The way that longboarding has gone beyond just nose riding or just turning to this mix of dynamic critical in the pocket tens with lift and radical rail work. This is a very future-facing event and the surfing I'm seeing is some of the best I've ever seen. And the technicalities that we're seeing from the longboarders, the, di the technical difficulties to hanging 10 in the pocket to getting that lift, that all is equal to getting a perfect barrel. Doing all of the technical things that we see in shortboarding from great great airs and those sorts of things we're seeing here in longboarding as we take a look at our quarterfinals that have been set on the men's side of the draw. I mean, this is this is the world title run. There's, you know, the big names are here. You know, Taylor's going for the world title. Harry's going for the world title. Connie's going for the world title. Ben Skinner and Declan going for the world title. Th there's massive consequences here to get knocked out right now, losing that world title hope. And the great thing about today is the fact that the waves are delivering. The surfers know that they're going to get at least three sets in that 40 minute run. Yeah, there's plenty of time on the clock for them to wait it out, to use priority, and priorities come into play very strategically within these longer heats and the sets today because we know those sets, they have excellent scoring quality to them. They're such good waves that it would be difficult for the surfers to actually fail and not get an excellent score on them or not get into that high seven range, where some of those smaller ones, maybe not. They're not gonna get out of that five point range. So it's been really crucial to use that priority in the right moments. And we'll see who takes it out for quarterfinal number one. We got 14 minutes on the clock with Taylor Jensen currently in the lead over Kai Salas. But in that last heat, we've rounded out our men's round of 16, and Declan Whiten has booked himself the last spot in the men's quarterfinals, and he's on the glass with Waxhead now. Yeah, guys, we have Declan here. This could be a standard day on the North Stain benches right now. Everybody at home, it's 4.30 in the morning. They would have got up really early in the morning to watch Deckers here. How'd you feel during that heat? Uh, yeah, I felt pretty good. I, I was good to get an early start, get a few waves in. Um, it's, we got a set as well, which was cool. Um, I thought Kevin's wave was going to be a bit higher than, like, say, I think it came in at, like, a 4.5. He's such an amazing surfer, and I thought he surfed really well. But, um, yeah, I was bummed I had to surf against him so early as well. He's a good mate, so... But I'm um, stoked to get through. And us in the booth thought maybe your scores were compressed a little bit. We thought... They could have gone a little higher given the diversity. What have you got planned for your next heat? Have you thought that far ahead? Uh, well, I mean, you just got to step it up. Don't you? Like, you're like getting to the pointy end now. Um, quarterfinals on, I suppose. Just got to do more if you want those excellent scores. Um, so, yeah, maybe just a bit more stuff out the back, I think. Oh, that was probably lacking in that heat, but yeah. All right, sounds like he's ready to go. Any parting words to anyone at home who woke up really early? Yeah, 100%. Uh, shout out to all the team at Okanui. Um, for supporting me and getting me here. Shout out to the boys at Club Cavill at home. Um, I'm sure you guys have had a bit of a big weekend, so um, thanks for getting up early and watching. Who knows, you might be having breakfast and watching Declan clinch a world title or lunch by the time we get there. Good luck, Declan. We'll see you hopefully on the glass next time. Thank you. Back up to you guys. Incredible result for Declan, finding himself in the quarters as we see Taylor Jensen looking to back up his 7.83. Nice soul arch hang five as he comes through to this bottom section of the point. Beautiful rail work, S turn sets it up. Now for another nose ride, he's looking for that moment to try and find the 10, doesn't quite get there, gets that tighter five. And again, just throws so much smooth spray throughout this entire wave, keeping everything as seamless as ever as he works his way through into the shoreline. Throwing in that variety with turns, so nose ride, rail work, nose ride, rail work. He'll finish off on the sand, and up and riding behind him is Kai Salas. So Kai Salas will have that second score halved from that non-priority interference, so he's really going to be looking for that you know, near-perfect 10. He wants two excellent range scores because that second score will be broken down in half. But Taylor looked 
velvet smooth on that ride. It's really interesting because all of these surfers, they want to continue to push boundaries. And Taylor's already designed a full quiver of incredible all-rounder longboards in the TimberTech construction through Firewire now and the Thunderbolt construction with the carbon fiber. And he's opted to take that even further and redesign things to go for a world title here on a perfect point break at Malibu to really be able to maximize the time on the nose, the lift on the nose, as you see Kai Salas up and riding, perched beautifully on a 10. Uses that priority over Harrison Roach, who took off on that wave at the start. Nice drive back and love that smooth push that he gets out of that bottom turn to set himself up for this high line as well. And just cruising there in that little sole arch position as well, looking relaxed in his posture. And he's gonna need a big score on the board to battle out against Taylor Jensen now with that non-priority interference to his name. And he's doing so much beautiful work here, keeping things smooth and silky as he comes through to the inside and trying not to let that, that wobble at the start, that, that mistake at the beginning of this wave, interfere with his actual surfing in the slightest. Wow, that was absolutely incredible from Kai Salas. Those hang tens were just so dynamic. And that subtle moment where he was all in trim was just looking, anticipating that section where he knew the nose riding work could really happen as we see harry on a smaller wave but in that out of priority heat against cole robbins that's going to be another big exchange all regular footers in this du a double overlapping heat right now and it really says a lot about the benefit of of being on your front side here at malibu yeah it's difficult for the for the goofy footers to be able to find that little point of difference there's some of those kind of those down carves that have been coming into play but let's talk through this replay for last of kai so look at that high line holding beautifully in the 10 and this is his backup board but it looks like it's working fantastically readjust there good critical rail work getting high in the wave i like the subtleness here because he knows He's just got to keep that perfect line to get that lock, that hold, that tail and that fin lifting, holding, and he's right in the pocket there. And the beautiful response in that drop knee turn set up again to get one more nose ride through the inside. Kai Salas at his very best, knowing with that interference call that he really has to put everything on the line to keep his world title hopes alive. We've got nine minutes, 30 seconds on the clock as we see Kai get that finish onto the shoreline, being careful with that fin as well. So he's had a couple things going against him this morning. In that first heat, he went for that big closeout, so committed, stuck the landing, but broke his fin, then damaged his number one board, the board that he would have loved, I'm sure, to be riding his way through to the finals on. So he's on that backup board. And then at the start of the heat, he got that non-priority interference against Taylor Jensen. And Taylor's now just put him in a very difficult situation as Taylor's dropped in a second seven on the board of a 7.23. We do have another score to come for Kai Salas, but at the moment he's sitting in a combination situation of 15.06. But you, but you know that Kai Salas, even if he's in that combination situation, he's gonna continue to wanna put on a show. He's gonna wanna have at least a few more sets to really demonstrate to the world why he's one of the greats, why he's an incredible board shaper, incredible long boarder, and the chance to ride uncrowded Malibu. If he's gonna get eliminated here, he's still gonna do it in style. He absolutely will. And I've just worked it out that because it's the non-priority interference, the best case scenario for Kai on scores is that he gets a perfect 10, and then he gets a second perfect 10, and half of that score is a five. So his heat total cannot go above 15 points. Well, yeah. There we go. So it's, it's out of range, but there's there's also the possibility that Taylor could get tangled up in an interference. This so is true. Yeah. Anything could happen yeah. with eight minutes on the clock. Absolutely. But Taylor's been looking great. And, and I was seeing this with Ben Skinner as well. Surfers who have already designed incredible equipment that they could say, well, I've already designed my ultimate board for a point break, but they want to take it further because what's happening in longboarding at the moment is people are realizing that it's not just about nose riding or rail turns. It's about that combination of the types of critical nose rides that we've always seen from good loggers around the world on often heavy weight, often flatter, often wider tailed equipment, combined with that critical rail work that we used to see from people who rode more pulled in tailed, narrower boards, but those Aussie influenced wide point backboards, which were also pioneered here at Malibu, the Malibu chip, the types of pig shapes that had the wide point back. That is a precursor to the involvement surfing boards of the late, mid to late 1960s that we saw coming out of Australia that Nat Young famously won the 1966 world title on. There's a rediscovery of the turning radius of that board, 
mixed with the nose riding lift that we've learned so much about from that generation of 90s and 2000s loggers. And Taylor is really wanting to kind of rediscover a new kind of route in board design, particularly for this event at Malibu. And that's why he's riding these Stu Kenson custom boards, because he's in the hunt for a world title and he knows that he needs to really get that hold and lift on the nose alongside that rail turn. I absolutely love that breakdown. It makes so much sense in where we're currently sitting with the longboard criteria and what we want to see from the world's best longboarders in that traditional format is we want to see that balance. We want to see those perfect, critical, very critical nose rides combined with that beautiful rail work and powerful dynamic turns that are done in the pocket in those critical sections of the waves. Absolutely, and Harrison Roach riding the Thomas Bexon boards, he, he's been uh, you know using some of the most exciting designs available, but he said yesterday that he's come here with a particular board with a wider tail that will help his nose riding. Well, down on the sand, we have one of the biggest frothers when it comes to board design and surf history overall. Waxhead, Matt, take it away. Hey, guys, so down here at the board room, or the board racks, I should say, there's no room in here. As beautiful longboards are lined up like they would be on any given day along the wall at Malibu. We're going to go through a few diversities between each model. We got here Declan Wyden's board. This was his backup board from his last heat. And some modern interpretations will be an understanding, firstly, of flex. So uh, Steve O'Donnell, his shaper from uh, Brookvale in Sydney, Australia, is a, is a competitive surfer himself, and he understands the ability of a longboard to fit inside the shape of a wave. Hence, although the materials haven't changed much on this specific board for 60 years, it's the understanding of the right stringer, the right glassing schedule. So it's not glassed overly heavy, but choosing the right blank. The blank, the foam blank is blown and they're choosing a weight of the blank with this stringer for a certain weight that suits Declan's performance. This one was glassed at Rhino laminating in Brookvale with a schedule of probably a uh, double six bottom or a six and a four bottom and a six deck. So relatively light and the blank makes up a quite a bit of that weight. But a modern fin in here with an FCS um, flow model fin which has got this tip flex and that's the flex and the combination of performance is something that's come a long way since the emergence of this style of fin in the mid 60s don't forget longboarding went away for 30 years so the resurgence is coming back with new and improved designs although traditionally inspired what we see here with ben skinner's composite um, skin dog model which is what uh, ben was just alluding to with uh, taylor playing with his designs in recent years this thing is a different type of material, and you can hear it when I'm tapping on it. I don't know if you can hear that. It's like a really, uh, it's a very lightweight construction for a 10-foot uh, nose rider with a super wide tail. Uh, he's got a conventional screw and plate style uh, fin set up in that board, but this will allow Ben to turn this thing, but also nose ride it with the outline uh, being so cumbersome. Uh, but perfect for Ben's style. Really jamming that back foot and snapping the board through turns. But then you have something like uh, this CJ Nelson designs, which is very conventional board. Not a whole lot has changed since the mid-60s. But then something wild, like this Michael Takayama nose rider. If this was around in 1966, you could almost guarantee that a world title would have been won. But here we are in 2022, and Sophia Colain's Last, last week's winning board sitting right here, and it, who knows, it may go on to uh, serve a really good in this contest. So overall, modern interpretation with traditionally inspired equipment. Modern and traditional binding together. Thank you so much, Waxhead. That was an incredible breakdown of some of the types of equipment that these surfers are out in the water performing on. As we see Taylor Jensen slicing his way through the nose and through that critical section of the wave. Up and riding behind him is Cole Robbins from quarterfinal number two in the non-priority heat. As Taylor's looking to finish up here, Cole's got himself on a real perler out the back with that five to 10 combination back to the five. Taylor engaging that little jam in the pocket to throw something in, that little pointed difference in his turns, that, that excitement for the judging panel for the forehand surfer, and he'll be finished on the sand. Cole Robbins still going out the back and looking for another hang 10, hang five, hang 10 combination. And stumbles on the pedal back off of that section and he'll look to drive through the end on the finish. Wow, that was incredible. Taylor Jensen's going for a fourth world title to match Nat Young's four world longboard titles. Nat is his, is his father-in-law his father because Taylor's married to Narva. As we see Kai Salas up and riding. Kai up and riding, he's looking again 
to put on a great performance here. Gets stuck coming off the bottom of that one, and he won't ride out complete. Now, Kai's last wave was a 7.37. Surfing performance-wise, he's right in there alongside of Taylor Jensen, but because of that non-priority interference incurred at the beginning of the heat, he will not be able to get that score to take him through to the advancing position over Taylor, given that Taylor already has an over a 15-point heat total. As we're down to 1 minute 30 seconds on the clock, and that will be rounding out quarterfinal number one. Absolutely. It's been an unusual situation. Kai Salas having that 7.37, but the second wave getting halved from that non-priority heat interference. But Taylor getting those two near excellent scores and looking really good. And it was very interesting to listen to Matt Chernoski talk about Ben Skinner's cherry picker model. That is constructed with an EPS core, but carbon fiber. And the attraction for the for the surfers who've gone towards the Thunderbolt technology is using the flex capabilities of carbon fiber. And like shortboarders, longboarders are also highly interested in flex patterns. And being able to control flex is something that carbon fiber as a material really delivers. You see a lot of shortboarders riding PU boards in, in bigger waves because they like the flex, and epoxy boards in smaller waves because they're stiffer and they float more, they're more corky. Longboarders also have that fascination with finding that per perfect flex property in their designs. Well, we're down to 30 seconds on the clock and it's been fun to talk about those board designs and some of the prototypes that surfers like uh, Taylor Jensen, Ben Skinner, and Eduard Del Perro were surfing in this event that'll soon be hitting shelves and they'll be putting those boards out for the, the general public to get a test on as we're down to 15 seconds on the clock. And what a shame, what a bummer of a way for Kai Salas to be knocked out of this event, being that he was hopeful for that world title and his last scores fall through just very short of that requirement. And it's Taylor Jensen as our very first semi-finalist. But you know that Kai Salas will be on the beach supporting the rest of his team because he's got yes. world title surfers on his boards. And paddling out in the next heat, number three, joining into quarterfinal number two will be one of his surfers in Coniella Stewart up against Tony Silvani. More to come right after this. Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships here in Malibu at Surfrider Beach. And it's been a great day of surfing so far. And we're looking forward to crowning our world champions as we make our way through the quarterfinals. We are still running in the overlapping format for the quarterfinals of both men and women. Once we get to those semifinal matchups through to the finals, it will be back to head-on-head -head competition with no other surfers in the lineup. We'll be back to that normal format with 30 to 35 minutes on the clock. And currently in the water, we have 17 minutes on the clock for our priority heat with Cole Robbins and Harrison Roach. Cole sitting in the lead. 
in our non-priority heat that has just joined them. It's quarterfinal number three with world number one, Coniella Stewart, up against world number 10, Tony Silvani. Uh, this is a really interesting spread of four people because all of these four regular footers could work their way to the final. And it, it might be that two of these surfers match up in the next round, and that is a real world title decider. We know that Harrison's had the momentum before to get so close to world titles, but the way that Cole is surfing at the moment and the familiarity he has with Malibu, for me, is saying a lot. He's looking very strong, and he's kicked off at, in the out-of-priority heat with a 7.10. Incredible way to start things off. For a surfer that's from just north of here in Santa Barbara, surfs Rincon at home all of the time, close drive to Malibu as well. So this could be considered a local break for Cole. It's so close to where he's grown up and, and the types of waves that he's come through surfing. That comparison to someone like a Harrison Roach, Cole's got that local knowledge. And to find a seven point ride under priority in the non-priority heat, great way to kick things off. And he's been so close before. In 2012, he was fifth on the World Longboard Tour. 217, he was also fifth. 218, he had that bitter third place. You could see the disappointment when he was eliminated in the semifinals. That was the year that Steven Sawyer won the world title in Taiwan, beat Kai Salas in the finals. So Cole knows that he's been knocking at the door of a world title for a long time. Oh, he's been right there on the brink. I remember that loss back in 2018 in Taiwan at Jinsen Harbor, coming so close for Cole. And, and you can see that joy that comes through him when he's on that winning streak. And in the moment that, I mean, I guess it's the same for all surfers, the moment they kind of lose out of that that opportunity, you know, that heartache really sets in. But he's one of those strong-footed surfers that's been so consistent, that's also brought in a little bit more variety into the conversation. He's been one of those surfers over the years, Sam, where we've seen him bring that hang heels into the conversation that not a lot of other surfers have really been going for. But let's take a look now at the opener of Coniella Stewart. That was just exceptional nose riding. The way he brings that whole body so poised over the very front tip of the board there, he stands nice and high. The charisma, I mean, this guy is just, he's, he's an embodiment of Hawaiian surf culture. Beautiful, perfect nose ride to start off. It's just a 2.83 because it was just that single nose ride section, not a great sized wave, and he just rides here on the foam for the rest of it. But he does set himself up with a score. Tony Silvani now with first priority in the non-priority heat. And Taylor Jensen takes out a spot into the semifinals. Let's catch up with him now. Yeah, guys, down here with TJ, we had that world title talk we had about Cole Robbins and, of course, Kai Salas in that heat who lost out to uh, three-time world champion Taylor Jensen. What was going through your head at the beginning when uh, Kai burnt you on that wave? Well, I, I was just kind of going, what's he doing? Like, there's no priority at the start and I was deeper, so I went. I mean, that's just kind of the way it goes. I think he probably thought I caught that first wave. But the other heat had priority, and Kevin called me off it, so I had to pull back. And when I did, I ended up deeper than Kyle for that set. And yeah, no priority. That's kind of the, the I don't know, it's a crappy, crappy way to start heats with no priority. But there's no other way to do it. Yeah. Well, you capitalized on it, and we knew it wasn't a tactical error. It was more so a lapse of judgment from from Kai's uh, perspective. But we'll hear about that later on. Now, in terms of like warming up, we've noticed you've just been cruising through the heats. Obviously, it's been really hard, especially that one with Edward, first heat of the day. Uh, what are you doing, carrying? into this momentum what are you feeling coming to the next uh, next round um yeah i'm just cruising man we're surfing perfect malibu with nobody out i mean just kind of sit wait for good waves and make the most out of them and try and drop sevens and above if you're going to take off and yeah that's it i'm just kind of cruising taking it easy and glad we get a little break now with the girls quarters going and yeah see what happens i'm really fueling up with some water and uh anything you want to say to anyone down the coast or back in australia no, just thanks all my friends and family and uh, everybody at home for watching love you guys and yeah, it's going to be an exciting finish of the day. And a special one back to our uh, our friend Chad Andrews, who's watching from Australia right now. He's one of Taylor's biggest supporters and my own. So this one goes out to you, Chad. Back to you guys in the booth. Thanks so much, Matt. Great to hear from TJ with the opportunity to win a fourth world title today. He's sitting in one of those front running positions, currently tied number two in the world alongside Harrison Roach, who's currently in the water in white. Both of them, though, with those event wins out of Sydney and out of uh, Huntington Beach. So they've got that 5,000 points to their name and have the best chance at walking away a world champion. As we take a look at some replays here for last of Cole Robbins. Santa Barbara style, straight in for the hang 10. They took, took a high line. See how he dropped back down into the wave and accelerated to come to the middle of the wave for the second nose ride section, opting to do the hang 10 high up in the wave, but certainly deep in the pocket. So critical nose riding 100% and then puts the board on rail here and then 
propels himself through the bottom turn to get up high into the wave to generate trim speed and locks into a hang 10 on the inside section. Cole Robbins could well eliminate Harrison Roach with this type of performance, and Harrison is going for a world title. Cole Robbins is looking incredibly good. Wow, that was exceptional surfing. Now Cole sitting under second priority, Harrison sitting with that first priority next to his name, chasing just a 1.78 to get the lead. But Coniella now up and riding in the non-priority heat. And he finds that 5 to 10 combination, locks in for that 10 under the lip, and sticks it in the pocket for such a long trim line. Now jams that turn, throws spray off the bottom rail as well as he whips it back around to line up for this line. Finds another nose ride in that bottom third of the wave. Now drives through once again back into the pocket and up into the lip, but goes down. He went down on the inside, but some of the things he did on that wave were absolutely sensational. The risk he took with how deep he went on some of those turns was he, he put himself so behind the section, but he trusted that he would walk back into the section. So that was really impressive from Connie Ella, but also beautiful from Cole Robbins. Cole Robbins looked fresh, he looked lively. He looks like he's in a real good space. The 31 year old going for his first world title. He's the sixth seed coming into this event off the back of a fifth and a, ni and a ninth at the first two events of the season. Even in 2021, he had good runs. He got a fifth at the Surf Ranch and ninth at Malibu. And this guy really is on fire. Cole Robbins looking great. And I think that this guy could be a world title contender. And he's up and riding on his second ride, five to 10, five, 10 combination as Harrison Roach is matching it out the back. Cole continuing through the inside, engaging that rail. Now finding that speed line and that wave having a little bit more of that wedge section in front of it. Not that super clean drawn out line for Cole, but for Harrison Roach getting so much beautiful work done. And another surfer, it looks like Tony Silvani up and riding all the way out the back. That'll be Tony's first ride as Cole kicks off on the inside and Harrison continues through this middle section. Great nose work, great footwork pedaling back and Harrison engaging that Aussie style Thomas log. Nice little trim line there, finds some speed and momentum as he pedals back and Tony Silvani on the Stewart. Now driving back as he comes out of that nose ride, straight back onto the tail, engages that fin as well and looks for a beautiful section to finish off with as he comes through to the inside. Maybe the better of the wave selection even for Tony Silvani. We'll have to get a look at the replays because that was so much action. So much action, but an extremely important moment for Harrison Roach. And my instinct said, looking at that, that Harrison is going to have the biggest score of those three scores drop between Cole, himself, and Tony Silvani. I felt like he did a lot in the opening section. The wave had more of a bowl to it. There was a lot of variety. The nose rise were extremely critical. And I really feel like this is going to put Harrison in, in a strong position. It might mean that he still needs an important score, but I have a feeling that the score drop for Harrison Roach is going to be very significant for the opportunity to book that place in the semi-final. Four steps to the tip. There's the 10, opening nose ride. There's the readjust, staying high in the wave because he needs to maintain all that trim speed into the second hang 10, the third hang 10, and then look at this turn. Staying high in the wave, but using a little bit of drive power off the middle of the wave to accelerate. And there's another turn, a little bit of a variety with the rail work. The wave is bowly. I love that turn there, throwing spray, lifting the arms above the hips, getting another tight five to 10 on the inside, arcing back, staying low in the wave, climbing high, another cut back. For me, that could well go in the excellent range. Scores to come through now for Harrison Roach in white. It, was, it was style, flow and grace personified. That's a big factor there. The, 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 the fluidity between everything is something that we should really celebrate. Everything about it was style, flow, grace. As we see Connie Ellis Stewart now up and riding. Connie sitting on a 2.83 and a 7.67 for last of Stewart in a commanding lead as he's perched back into a calm and collected hang 10 comes up into the lip and rides out of a radical maneuver back to the five linked into the pocket here and this wave is just turning on for Connie great variety of the rail work as well as he goes for that big solar arch hang 10 through to the inside adds in the drop knee cut back and he'll kick out as we have our surfer in white Harrison Roach up and riding again. 
So that was great from Coniella. That was a chiropractor's dream seeing a back as flexible as that. But look at that flexible back <laughs> from Harrison Roach. This is a really important because Harrison needs a backup score. He doesn't want to be carrying that 5-3-3. Sk still a score to drop. I, I don't think this wave is going to be as strong or as the wave we're waiting for, but this is going to be an ins extremely important backup score. And Harrison Roach has really come alive now in these last two rides. Down to six minutes on the clock for our priority heat between Cole Robbins and Harrison Roach. We still have scores to come through, two for Harrison, one for Cole, as Cole's on the paddle back out. In our non-priority heat, Connie Ellis Stewart and Tony Silvani have 26 minutes on the clock. So Tony dropped an 8.10 for that wave. So it's going to be really interesting because you like Tony's wave. You felt like it might have had an edge as far as size and p potentially quality right, of performance. Right, I felt like the shape of the wave maybe had the best of the shape of that three-wave set. But let's take a look now at this last of Harrison. So this is, again, an extremely important score for Harrison. Look at the way he, after that 10, drops down into the low part of the wave to accelerate, walks up for that stretch five, gets high for a tight sole arch five into a 10, this is absolutely incredible. So this is actually on par with the score we're waiting to drop. But I still think that Harrison's wave is going to come out higher than Tony's score. We, 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 you know, it remains to be seen, but I, I just felt like there was electricity throughout that ride. The type of dynamic surfing that was done seamlessly, everything was stitched together so perfectly. But what about this nose riding, Shannon, from Connie L.A.? He, he's just just so graceful and, and that that bolt upright posture the you know the way he's able to just soul arch the casualness but then the explosiveness of coming off the tail and rebounding and wait for this section here four steps engages tip time and then he rebounds in that beautiful drop knee turn and this is where he does that really big soul arch there the chiropractors tuning in are going to love that one <laughs> Scores in for Coniella on this wave. It's an 8.67. He betters the 8.10 Tony Silvani in the non-priority heat. We're still waiting for the score for Harrison Roach, though, to drop through, which on Sam's call may be the best that we've seen so far. Two scores actually to drop through for Harrison and a score to drop through for Cole, who are in the priority heat. We're down to under five minutes on the clock for Cole and for Harrison, but we're going to take a break for a moment to check in with the Waxhead Matt Chinaski down at the O'Neill booth. Hey crew, we're down here at the O'Neill booth in the First Point car park. Some of the Moving forward in the modern day, it's still considered the quintessential Californian surf brand. When we talk about heritage, we have Jack O'Neill on this van behind us, who's also known as that salty seaman with that cool beard. But Patch, what's the story behind the Patch? Well, the wetsuit, which was invented in California in the 1940s, but popularized and performance tested by Jack O'Neill in Northern California in 1972, a leash sprung back and the board poked him in the eye. But pretty handy owning a wetsuit company. He was able to make up a patch that rumor has was made out of neoprene as well. So wetsuits on the body and a wetsuit is an eye patch. But since then, it went on to be a multi-million dollar company that's provided an essential service and items for surfers to keep warm during those cold winter months. We don't necessarily need too much rubber here at First Point, but you can come down and buy some merch. We thank O'Neill for being a part of this Cuervo Classic, and I hope they're on board for the next year because having an iconic wave like this and O'Neill involved just seems like a match made in heaven. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Matt, and incredible to think of that history. And if you're around, go down, check out the tent. It's right before the entrance to the beach here in the car park. Get your hat, get your T-shirts, all your merchandise, because this is a day you're going to want to remember forever. World champions are going to be crowned, and we're still waiting for scores to come through for last of Cole and Harry. Absolutely. So much on the line right now. Two scores waiting to be dropped for Harrison Roach. One score waiting to be dropped for Cole Robbins. The, the set that, that those three surfers rode, Tony Silvani got an 8.10. Your instinct, Shannon, said that you felt like Tony had the best of that exchange. My instinct felt that maybe Harrison's wave might come up slightly higher than Tony's, but we have to recognize that Cole's wave was also extremely strong. Extremely strong. Now scores in for Harrison Roach on the second to last wave. It's a 7.87. Now we're still waiting for his next to roll through. He's momentarily in the lead. 
Cole Robbins needs to drop in more than a 6.11 to take first away from Harrison. And we'll see if Harrison's able to improve on that 5.33 as his backup score to the 7.87 with his last wave. Currently, Surfer and Green sitting with priority with two minutes on the clock. You'd imagine that Harrison will improve on that 5.33. That was a really strong score that we're still waiting to receive. Now that 787, a near excellent score. Some judges going into the excellent range, others going just below of those five scores. The, the, the highest and lowest are eliminated and an average is taken from the three. So still awaiting for one more score to drop for Harrison. It was a really dynamic ride, so it might replace the 533. But Cole Robbins needs a 6.11 to move back into first. But that would change if Harrison replaces the 533. Now down to a minute, 30 seconds on the clock. The priority heat is quarterfinal number two with Harrison Roach in the lead. A score to drop, though, for last of Cole Robbins in green, chasing a 6.11 to take the advancing position. And then we'll see where Harrison's score falls in as well, if he can improve on his score line. So two to drop in a very important moment as we're down to the final minute. Scores in for last of Cole Robbins, a 7.07 .07 for his previous wave, sorry. So that factors into his top two. Harrison Roach now down into second, chasing a 6.30 to get the jump on Cole Robbins with scores to, scores to drop. And it, you'd imagine it's going to be very close because it was a really good wave that he got. Waiting for that score to drop, they might not have an opportunity to catch another wave, but Harrison Roach chasing a 6.30. Both of these surfers are going for a world title, and up and riding right now is Cole Robbins, Shannon. Cole Robbins with a chance to increase on the sevens. He already has on the scoreboard. A little bit behind the section, doing well to keep that speed and that trim moving forward, though. Straight up into a five to 10 combination. Quickly pedals back six steps to that back third of the board. Engages the rail to set up for this high line as Harrison Roach also on an opportunity. Harrison perched on the 10 while Cole trims through the curl on the inside and Harrison engages that rail, throws a lot of spray as Cole gets that extra hang five now as he links in through this finishing section and the buzzer sounds. This will be the last waves ridden from these two surfers and world titles are on the line as Cole kicks off on the sand. Harrison putting in every last ounce of energy he can on this wave while keeping that style, flow and grace fluid as he drives through that finishing turn and sets himself up for another nose ride here. Back to a five to 10, very critical nose ride on that small knee high section of this wave into the sand. And we gotta say they both put in an incredible effort in this heat. That was brilliant, so much to process there. So Cole's got a 710 and a 707. Harrison's looking to drop a score before this score that he's just ridden now. So most likely he will replace that 5.33, but then they've both got scores to drop that might change the situation once again. So scores coming through now for the previous ride of Harrison. This isn't the ride that you've just seen on camera. This is the previous ride. That could change the situation, but we have a whole equation to do with the other scores about to drop as we get the replay, Shannon. And it looked really good from Harrison. Good early line, high, there's the five, there's the 10, there's the sole arch, there's that distinctive dynamic power turn on his Thomas Beckson board and that measured footstep, keeping at pace with the breaking run of the wave here at first point down the cobblestones and then jamming that board on rail and setting himself up with footwork and a stall and staying low here, looking to lift back up in the next section, straight up onto the five, a type five, pedals back for a redirect, big powerful adjustment there and looking to milk every ounce of this wave all the way through to the inside. Okay, well scores are in for the second to last wave, not this one, we're waiting on this score to drop and that was a real beauty. A 6.5 for the previous wave of Harrison now means that Cole Robbins on this last wave needs to be a 7.28 or higher to take the leading position. And then, of course, we have to recognize that Harrison's still got a score to drop as well. Exactly. Which might change the requirement, but Cole looked great. Those locked-in tens were outstanding in the pocket. High degree of difficulty. We've seen good variety already. We've seen speed, flow, power, control, nose riding, rail surfing, certainly critical section. This is also going to be a big score, so it might well replace one of his sevens. Wow, I don't even know what to say or do right now because this heat, it was one of those heats where they were pushing each other's performances wave after wave. I think both of those last rides will, will be keepers, absolutely. So it depends which comes out higher. I mean, we've already seen Harrison replace that 5-3-3 with that 6-5-0, so for sure I would expect 
in my opinion, from looking at that, he's going to replace that 6.50. So, so it, th this last exchange here is just world titles on the line. And those, both those surfers, they put on an incredible performance. They, they can be extremely proud of themselves. They really put it on the line and surfed incredibly well. They surfed so well. They both just pushed each other higher and higher, like that heat that we saw from Kaimana, Takayama, and Kai Salas earlier this morning, where it brought them to the height of their surfing. Scores in, though, for last of Cole Robbins. A 6.67. He's now receiving the information. He doesn't get the score to take out the lead over Harrison Roach. We do still have another score to come through for Harry, which may increase the situation. It might improve on that 6.5 and make an even bigger. It's a 7.23 for last of Harrison, so Cole would have needed an eight-point ride, and Harry Roach is into the semis. So with 15 minutes remaining now in the Tony, Connie Elahi, Tony looking for the 825. And Ben and Declan now gonna start. Here at Malibu for the Cuervo Classic, the Longboard Championships will be crowned today as we see Tony Silvani up and riding on just his second wave of the heat. He's now in the priority heat in the water. And it's unbelievable how glassy the conditions still are here as we're into the afternoon. And Tony getting some more work done, little check off the top there, gains some speed and finds another perched five to 10 combination. Pedals back with lightning fast footwork from those nose rides back into that middle third of the board to gain that momentum moving forward on a smaller size wave. Goes for that drop knee, cut back, and goes for another hang five through to the inside section, back to the 10, and <laughs> goes down over the handlebars. But wow, he's already got an 8.1 on the board and another score to drop. Absolutely, that was incredible from Tony. Kicking off with of that 8.10 as we see Declan Whiten in the out of priority heat, arms up on a beautiful hang 10 to start off with. Gets that opening hang 10, finds a second hang 10 already after a nice five, pumps off the bottom to keep that trim line in that high trim line and just engaging with the curl of the wave, letting that board find its way down to a section that not many surfers I think would have made it past. That little closeout as the tide's draining and those waves are shutting down a little bit quicker. He finally seems to be caught just behind that green face. And that's the start of his wave. So Declan Whiten has just pedaled out. He's in quarterfinal number four up against Ben Skinner. So Ben Skinner will be hoping for a set right now because he's in the outer priority heat, but there's only two surfers out back there. So Connie Ellis Stewart, of course, gets the first pickings. But if a set comes in, Ben will be the only surfer out there. So he'd have priority over Tony Silvani, waiting to drop something in the 8.25 range if he wants to move into first position so 
massive opportunities for Tony because that was a really good bit of surfing. So it could be a very strong score. And what an incredible way for both of those surfers in their non-priority heat to bank in each with eight point rides on the board and for Connie to have a backup of a 7.67. We're down to 12 minutes on the clock, and at the start of this heat, we saw Tony Silvani take off as the third wave in a three-wave set where we had Cole Robbins and Harrison Roach in the priority heat get the first two waves of the action. We're going to take a look now at the replay to dissect the 8.10 of Tony. So he kicked off with just that long, streaking high five into the 10. I was loving what I was seeing from Harrison Roach, but it was Tony who got the bigger of that exchange with that 8.10. Just combining everything mixed up with those drop knee turns, that snaky climbing and dropping, those multiple hang 10s, again with that drop knee turn on his Bill Stewart surfboard, back up to the tip, a lot of quick footwork, a lot of tight nose riding, toes curled right over the tip, posture poised, ready to pounce on every section. Tony looking extremely good and still waiting for a score to drop. So that was his opening ride. We're now waiting for a second score. And Connie has been patient for a while as well, sitting with that 8.67 as his last score. He's now up and riding. Quick 10 to start. Arms poised high and drives through the rail on that cut back into the pocket. Gets another nose ride, drives through again as we see a paddle from Ben Skinner. He'll get his opening ride underway as Connie finds those hang tens again. And this wave just tapers off in size a little bit through to the inside here, but staying beautiful. And a little bit of a stumble there as he just goes a little too hard, but Skin Dog has been on the nose for so long, Sam. Wow, that was one of the best nose rides we've seen. I mean, the lift and the hold, he was almost above the lip line there. If he can just find one more little bit of open section here, he's going to stay nice and low just to get maybe one more rail turn, but it's not going to make much of a difference. But that nose ride was outstanding. Connie Ellis Stewart looked lively, looked dynamic, waiting to hear what score Tony Silvani drops, but he's in a commanding position. But Ben Skinner, out of priority, gets a really strong start to his heat. And I know that all of his fans will be tuning in, all of his family, Lucas Lila Levin, Lucy, Michelle, his wife, they'll, they'll be rooting for him. It's an exciting moment ahead. Well, scores to come and replays to come. But first, let's catch up with Harrison Roach and Matt Chinaski. Harry, that wave, you took off thinking that you required a pretty considerable score. The beach announcer hadn't updated that last run, your second to last wave. What was going through your mind on that? Uh, yeah, I was kind of just thinking that the beach announcer didn't really know what was going on because I knew I had two good waves. One was definitely better than a 5-3-3, but, you know, um, Cole got a wave right before me and it, it was always going to be, you know, I had to do my best no matter what. And, Cole's a good bloke and good mate, and uh, yeah, it's, I'm just lucky I, I beat him in the end. Yeah, and if it did come down to it in the end, that final wave, I'm not sure what it finished on, but it was really well surfed. The element of difference, I think, is showing some of that old mal surfing. You're really performing those transitions like in a really nostalgic fashion, but bringing some of that progression and those rail turns too. Yeah, well, as you know, like um, the old mal surfers, the guys from the 60s, guys like Nat Young and Bob McTavish, they could really turn, they could really nose ride, they could do it all. And like the first boards I ever rode that were like the ones I'm riding now were old males. So yeah, definitely influ influenced by that period. Um, and yeah, we're just so lucky to be surfing perfect Malibu with no one out. And of course those types of boards surf this place really well. And those two guys, Bob McTavish and Nat Young, in Australia at least, were the beginning of that resurgence of longboard era. And now you're at the top. Are you feeling the weight of Australia on your shoulders? Obviously, Declan's through as well. What's going through your mind? Yeah, not quite at the top yet, mate. A couple of heats to go, so, you know, I'm going to do my best, that's for sure. And I'm liking what I see out here. I'm liking my board, so see what happens. All right, he said a couple of heats to go, which is encouraging. Back up to you guys in the booth. Thanks so much. Into live action with Ben Skinner, straight onto the nose, perched in the pocket. That board looking so spicy under his feet as he just is able to lock in and find that trim line. Now engages that rail, drives off the bottom as well, sets it up straight into the curl as that wave is just breaking underneath his knees and on the back of that board. Drives through once again, sets himself up now for this inside section and adds a little forehand jam into the mix. Back to that five to 10 combo through a speedy line as he's nearly on the sand. And we've got scores to come through from a flurry of action, Sam, during that heat. And the emotions are there with Skin Dog. Skin Dog likes that. This is a nose-riding battle at the moment between Declan Whiten and Ben Skinner. 
Declan had a phenomenal ride. We're still waiting for two scores to drop for Declan. We're still waiting now for two scores to drop for Ben Skinner. I think between Ben and Declan, it's going to come down to who lucks into that bigger wave, who gets that opportunity to really do what we're seeing on these smaller ones on a bigger set. But the nose riding for both of them has been phenomenal. Declan's last ride is going to be big, but Ben's connection through the inside there was outstanding. There was a lot of variety in the rail game as he came through to that mid to inside section. So the, the four surfers here, again, all regular footers, again, all going for world titles, again, all surfing at the very, very, very top level and beyond. Incredible. Now, going back to that interview with Harrison Roach, taking note that we don't have any more Aussies left on the women's side of the draw. The quarterfinals are filled with USA, France, Brazil, and Hawaii for the women. On the Aussies on the men's side, it's Declan Whiten still in the mix if he makes it through this heat alongside of Harrison Roach. And we have not seen an Australian world champion on the longboard tour since 2014 when we had Harley Ingleby and Chelsea Williams both from Australia take out those world titles. But there have been so many greats. Of course, Nat Young won four world longboard titles between 1986 and 1990. You had Marty McMillan from Australia winning a longboard title. You had, of course, Bo Young winning two longboard titles. You had Josh Constable winning one. And, of course, you mentioned Harley Ingleby. Will Taylor equal that four world titles record of his father-in-law, Nat Young? Or will it be one of these four surfers? Any one of these four surfers could do it. And, and of course, they cannot get eliminated right now if they want to do that and win the 2020 World Longboard title here at Malibu. And that's how tight the race is. Coming into today, these surfers in the quarterfinals have a shot to win a world title. Looking at the points, it's so tight because we just have the three events of the year and only the top two, way, top two events count, with this event being worth double the points, that it's likely that whoever wins the contest today walks away the world champion. And I forgot to mention another great Australian, the late Stuart Entwistle, he won the world titles in 1987. But for Hawaii, there was so much domination. There was a period of time where Russ Kealana won three world longboard titles in a row. And then Bonga Perkins won one. Dino Mirando won one. We've had Dwayne DeSoto winning world title in 2010. Bonga won his second in 2008. So it's been a long time since Hawaii has won a world title for the men's. Dwayne DeSoto, 2010, was the last time. But that period of Hawaiian dominance in the world titles from Russ Kay's 1993 win all the way through to Dino Mirando's 1997 win. Can that be recreated as Ben Skinner's up and riding? Straight to that hang five, and we're waiting for his first score to drop through still. Caught a little bit behind that section, stays in that trim line though, as Declan Whiten is up and riding behind. So the non-priority heat getting a couple of great hang tens, just mirror images of each other for a moment as Declan engages the rail. Huge drop knee, carve, sets it up for our surfer and green out the back as the sole arch comes into play for Ben Skinner on the inside. And this is another great exchange with Declan throwing so much spray and really starting to push that power of those rail work as well. And that's what we love seeing in longboarding. We love seeing that engagement, those turns thrown in where that flow is still moving in the right direction. They're not doing any sort of pivoting turns like on a shortboard, but they're keeping that rail line flowing through the entire time. This is an absolute insane battle coming into this event. Declan was seeded fifth, Ben was seeded fourth, but Ben carries that second place finish at Manly. And the way these two men are surfing right now is phenomenal. And like I said five minutes ago, I feel as if it might come down to that surfer who lucks into the biggest, best shape way, because you can see that their surfing is on point. Look at the replay here. Ben Skinner already is nose road through that opening section, locked tight in the pocket for that really long hang 10. Well, Declan Whiten out back again on a tight hang 10. So both of these surfers absolutely on fire. Declan's big open face swooping drop knee turn, hooking back off the bottom and walking back up to the second nose ride section. And again, you'll see that drop knee sweeping turn there, throwing spray, stalling, but keeping all of that momentum into a third drop knee turn and whipping that board around at speed to get a 10 on the inside and clean footwork, another stall and one more little touch of the five there right through to the inside. Wow, that board has so much glide to it. Now scores came through for their first exchange between white and green and they were equal, both with five point rides for their opening rides. 
A couple of judges going in different directions with it, but the average comes through as fives. We're now waiting for that last exchange to roll through, essentially tied at the moment. And it is in our priority heat, the focus down to two minutes, 15 seconds on the clock as Coniella Stewart is still holding on to the lead. We have all scores in from those last exchanges between red and blue. Last of red after his 8.67 was a 6.5, so that doesn't factor into his top two. And last of blue for Tony Silvani was a 7.8. So that did increase his heat total, but it's shy of the 8.25 requirement that Tony requires in blue to take the win over Coniella Stewart in red. And he's sitting in second priority, so Coniella Stewart will be able to just patrol this set. But if a set does come, it's that decision as whether you go for the first or the second wave and where you sit. You can sense that that movement the surfers are showing, they can see something coming. This is the best surfing that I've seen all year. It is incredible to have pumping Malibu, to have sets available, to get that opportunity that everybody gets to surf, not just a wave catching contest to see what happens, but to be able to see performances, perfect hang tens like that from Coniella, that drive back into the section as well, as he goes in for a next nose ride and up and riding out the back behind him. It looks like our surfer in blue and Connie continues through to the inside taking all the boxes, but doing it with style, flow, and grace. Looking to improve on the 7.67 as his backup score, as we have Tony trimming through on his forehand, locked into a very long extended five to 10 with that arm held high. Tony engages that rail as well as Connie goes for the hang hills to the run back on the sand. And Tony continues riding through with two more surfers up and riding out the back. So those guys were just living on the nose, but they were also mixing it up. There was a lot of variety demonstrated. Ben Skinner out back there. Declan is on the furthest wave away, but Tony's given himself a good shot. But I think Coniella, for me personally, got the better of that exchange. Will it be enough for Tony to get the score that he needs? Both Ben Skinner and Declan have fallen. Declan looks like he might lose his board. How far it will go remains to be seen. But they'll be in the paddle battle to get out for priority. And we'll probably see Declan here. He'll try to body surf this wave. So the manly lifeguard is a great waterman. He'll have no trouble doing that. But Coniella was just electric on that last wave. That opening 10 was sensational. And the variety, and even throwing in the heels and the walk back on the inside. I think that he got the better of that exchange. But the judges will have to really analyze those last two rides to make that call. So the buzzer has sounded. Both Coniella and Tony are on the sand. And we'll take a look at the replays now. Can Coniella improve on his high scores? Well, he kicked off with a big bolt upright long hang 10. That was really calm, collected and cool on the nose, staying very poised. Backed it up with that big cut back there, throwing spray, walks back to the tail, and then second big cut back. So two big rail games, two long nose rides. The best nose ride was that opening 10. Inside here, the wave slows up a little bit, but he stays nice and busy and gets another quick 10 there. But he just mixes it up and continues to engage the rail, jamming hard off the bottom, pulling up nice and high for the 10, getting that sole arch posture there, that upright nose ride, and then staying nice and lively into the heels and the walk back and coming out clean. And he's rewarded well with a 9.07, the highest wave of the heat, and one of the highest of the day. And Tony had this on the answer back, but now needs a 9.64 to get the win. So the big moment for me for Coniella then was that long 10 on the opening section. The degree of difficulty to risk a 10 on that first section is extremely high. But Tony answered back, chasing a massive score. He can really be proud of how he surfed. He's been absolutely on fire, Shannon. Scores are in. It's a 7.8 for Tony Silvani. It's not enough. So Coniella Stewart is into the semifinals. World number one keeps his world title hopes alive. And we'll catch up with him soon and shortly. Ben Skinner in the water to finish out quarterfinal number four. We'll be back with more action right after this. Maybe a 7.5. Yeah, I knew you were bringing it down. 
No, yeah. the lo- you're the local. I don't see it that much. I get up here and just see Malibu and go, whoa, well, here's Malibu. Malibu. Yeah. I come from bad beach breaks in Orange I'll County. Give you, I'll give you 8.5 eight because it's empty. <laughs> yeah, true. I hear you, though. 7.58 for condition. 8.5 for the essence of it all. Look at that. It's got a good aura right now, so I'm going with it. Okay, Ben, he's going to throw away the five, starting to see initial scores of that third wave. It's a 6.6. So now Green looking for a 7.28. And we're waiting on more scores. Last of Green, 7.9. Sorry. Third wave of green, 793 takes the lead. White now. So today here in Malibu for WSL Rising Tides, it's a really special edition. This is the first time that we've had boys here as well as girls. And we also have four of our very best adaptive surfers for the first time. I went to the Long Beach WSL event in 2019 and I saw them all surf and that was the first time where I was like, wow, I want to be like them, you know? I've worked alongside the WSL to allow adaptive surfers to get in with the rising tides. Like to have a little bit of spotlight and to give them some recognition because surfing is for everyone. The participants that we have here today are the very best in America. They've come from all over the states. All the athletes have been handpicked by the National Scholastic Surfing Association. We're here to crown champions and WSL Rising Tides is also about that because these are going to be the champions of tomorrow. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, every kid rips. These kids rip harder than me. I don't know, I might have to retire after watching these kids surf. We truly believe that surfing is for everyone and we're here to demonstrate that here today on the beach in Malibu. Rising It's finals day for the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill and quarterfinal number four out in the water. Unfortunately, there's only one room for a surfer to make it to the semifinals, but hey, I'm Kaipo, and you know what? When I think of Malibu longboard female surfing, I think of Cassia Medar, and you are with us here in the booth. Thank you. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's awesome to be here and watch so much epic surfing go down. It has been an epic uh, run, hasn't it been, Waxhead? Phenomenal, starting off with men surfing today, and it's been nonstop. It's heating up outside, and it's also heating up in the water, Kaipo. It sure is. Here we go with Declan Whiten. Norstein represented here and a great trip to the nose. Some hang time for Declan. Smooth flow in between turns. Gets a five there, trimming through. Nice little section. Again, pumping up and down, roller coastering through the glistening wall of First Point Malibu. And right behind him is Big Ben Skinner. Awesome camera work capturing both of the surfers. And Declan Whiten coming into this wave with a decided advantage over Ben Skinner. Skinner goes down. Whiten to look to finishing up here on the shore. Great job by Declan. What do you think, Cassia? Wow. I mean, it is just so beautiful witnessing everybody's style. I feel like Malibu is one of those places. It's such a perfect wave that it really highlights everybody's just pure talent. Yeah. You know? It's just, it's such a gorgeous wave to watch longboards glide across. But don't you think like perfect waves like a J-Bay or a Malibu or even like a Surf Edge can expose your weakness too? Well, that's a, such a good point, Kaipo, and that was the other side of it, right? The shadow side of it is it, it exposes and highlights your and accentuates your talents as well as really exposes the weaknesses. So it's a really interesting and beautiful place to watch everybody get out their A game on these beautiful longboards. I just want to see what everybody's riding. Like, you know, the fins, yeah. the tail. Like, what are you all riding out here? I know that people have been coming up, surfing up here, changing equipment from what they normally ride just to kind of suit this wave yeah and and it's been ever evolving and we're going to peek at some equipment but first let's check in with the last heat winner we're going to see him in the semi-finals oh my god congratulations Kaniala Stewart Kaniala you're into the semi-finals and you dropped the first nine point ride of the men's side of the draw can you talk us through that wave and how it felt yeah um it was a good wave it felt really good uh, I saw it coming in and I kind of looked down the line and had that good wall on it and that 
nice pace to it. And, um, you know, I just stood up on that wave and just let my mind surf, and I just did whatever I could. And all of those practice runs back at home, surfing at Waikiki and Queens, everything leading you up into this moment within your life, you're very close to winning world title. Are you feeling that pressure today? Uh, yeah, a little pressure, but, I mean, you just got to take it heat by heat. Um, yeah, just wave by wave, heat by heat, and just, you know, I've been praying a bunch. My family's been praying and just hoping that, you know, my dream would come true. And your support crew on the, on the beach is just outrageous. Yeah, everybody's here from Hawaii, pretty much, you name it. Um, everyone who's not here, you know, love you guys. Thank you guys for watching, and I miss you guys. Best of luck in the semis. We'll see you back here again. Thank you, guys. Aloha. That, that deserves a one big chihu. Kanye Ellis threw it on, too, the semifinals, Matt. Phenomenal surfing there from Kanye speaking to him after all his previous uh, heats. So calm, cool, collected. It's a scary Kaniella and Taylor Jensen. They're feeling uh, absolutely no pressure at all. Compared to, say, Harrison Roach, who's the other Aussie in the draw with Declan Wyden in this heat now, uh, there, there, you can tend, feel a little bit of weight there. You know, Taylor has been out of that world title talk the last few years. Kaniella's fallen short as well. So that pressure that Harry's been carrying in, you can, you can sense a little bit of it, especially at the end of that heat with Cole. Checking back in with the scores, you guys. We're waiting for a score for Declan Whiten on his last ride. He needs a 7.17 if he wants to take the lead off of Big Ben Skinner. Skinner's sitting out the back with priority, trying to control the heat. Cassia, priority and the lead, an opportunity for Skinner to control the heat. But he's going to get the news right now that Declan Whiten did what he needed to do. 7.6 drops for the Australian. Well, with 10 minutes left, I really think that Ben can pull it. You know, he's such a seasoned competitor and such a, another beautiful surf. Everyone here is such a gracious and gorgeous surfer. And I really think that, you know, it seems that maybe it might be that a little bit of more time in the water might pay off for Skinner here, you know? He's been surfing comp competitions for a long time. He's very seasoned. Yeah. You know, I think that could be the thing. Maybe maybe nerves will get the young gun. Who knows? I, you know, he, he was a runner-up last year in, in, in the competition here. Uh, last year, I saw him on PCH basically living in a little rental van, too, warming up, you know? As we look at a replay here of Declan Whiten on this 7.6 map. It was very interesting to see uh, the spread from 6.8 up to 8.0. Some judges went excellent, and we'll see why. So some really nice nose riding on the outside, some critical moments. I love that midsection high line and that flow up onto the nose. Uh, why it went around 6.8, maybe the ending, not as dynamic perhaps as some of the heats that we've seen in the past, uh, but surfing nonetheless with extreme flow, and it, was, it did go into his top two. So 7.93 and a 7.6. Declan's looking... On fire. And, you know, uh, we've seen it throughout competition yesterday and today. I'm going to ask Cassia this question. Surfers are taking it all the way to the beach, but we've seen some fin damage, some boring damage. Is it worth that last six inches of a ride? I mean, I think it is worth that last six inches of a ride. You know, it's also like Malibu is one of those places that everybody's there stepping off right. the beach and kind of like owning that last maneuver is so classy. I love that. I love like the owning the last maneuver and stepping off on the beach. And as we saw, perhaps that spread of scores was because uh, on Declan's last wave because it did shrink towards the end. And sometimes we saw on Carcellus earlier losing a fin on the shore break. Do you want to and the shore break's gnarly. This, here, yeah. Here we go. Ben Skinner on the comeback. He's a 793. And he's just parked on the nose through that first section. Now we're going to see some of the power of Ben Skinner illustrated with a big swooping cutback. Back to the nose again for a five. Just touches it for a while. Again, powerful rail surfing. Skinner gets the 10. Gets through this section. Little hand drag to stall. High and tight and hot. Look at him. Yes, perched. That's what's up. That is what's up. Like Cassia said, That's points what's there. Up. That's what's up. That's what's up. That, I mean, he knows. That felt good. Again, he stepped off on the sand. He owned that. He was actually out here practicing just that right before the last WSL event at 
uh, Huntington tend, Beach. Yeah. So I was surfing with him a bunch and he was all fired up and he's like, I'm here. I'm not going to go surf Huntington. I'm surfing this. I'm like, you know, and again, it's just so nice to see what longboards can really do as you see Ben Perchy on the replay. As you know, it's a lot of those competitors who did surf Huntington uh, did come up here that Malibu swell. And guess what? Most of those crew are in the finals. Um, as we see, Ben, beautiful drop knee carve. We don't see many on the forehand with a wraparound carve. Malibu doesn't give you that opportunity very often on a set wave. Carve into the bowl again. Ben setting up this inside. He knows he needs to go excellent, chasing a 7.93 on this wave. And it wasn't giving it to him on that section, but he sets up and watch this, ladies and gentlemen. He gets up on those and hits 10. Bang! Hips extended, and Judd has been loving that this whole event. Shuffles back and taps it off the top and finishes on that shore break that uh, in the previous wave of Declan's, it didn't have a shore break. So maybe the judges might highlight that as, a, as an element of difference. Well, that's it. He also kind of went off the top on the last little bit. He was really illustrating proper use of his entire board in also an elegant and flowy way. Is it hard to pick those waves, Cassia? A Malibu local uh, were at least through in the 90s and 2000s when traditional longboarding was emerging. How do you pick those waves that carry all the way through? Well, I mean, right now, the swell direction, it has definitely more of a south tone to it. Like, it's around the 200 degree, the main swell that's running, which is going to be wrapping a lot more around the point. When it has a bit more of that west, you'll see it kind of like washing out a bit, you know? Like, not washing out, but kind of like... It'll get quick through that section. So this is really an ideal swell that's wrapping across. But you notice that people aren't sitting way, way up the top. They're kind of like right off of, you know, the Adamson House peak. And that's really where you want to be right now. And it's putting together some perfect lines to just perch it up. I mean, you know, look at how wonderfully everybody's surfing and also just really highlighting the perfect waves. Yeah, I mean, beautiful shot panning through and showing the swell angle here in the beautiful beach of Malibu. Well, number for Ben Skinner. He did enough on that last wave. Eight-point ride. He goes excellent. He takes lead from Declan Whiten. Whiten now with priority. Five minutes, 15 seconds, counting down on the clock for the Australian. Declan needing a 7.68. What's he got to do for that 7.68, Cassio? I mean, he's got to pull all the tricks out of the bag on this one to get that higher score than Ben did. You know, I don't know if he's spent as much time as Ben has over the years. Maybe not as much time in heats. Maybe the nerves are getting the best of him. I mean, you know, you know what's up. Declan's coming from kind of your neck of the woods. Mm, that's right. You know? Well, he's been surfing every single day. I see him every day out there in the water. So he's prepped and fit and ready to go. But we've been talking about that keyword connection and connection to, in Australia, we, we call it connection to country, uh, where it's an Aboriginal term where people feeling like, and, and Hawaii too, where people are feeling, you know, really in, uh, in depth and feeling really involved of where they come from. You don't necessarily have to be born in that place, but you've got to put in time. And it's the connection with the people, you know, sessions in the water, uh, the landscape, and it's a whole multitude of things that uh, really, um, that's what surfing differs from other sports. I like the insight from you, Cassia, on, on Ben Skinner. Spending time here in Malibu, and, you know, when the competition was warming up for, for Huntington, that's really smart of Ben because he already has a keeper score with a runner-up finish in Manly. What's the point? Because this is where the show is going to be decided. This is the big time. This is the world titles. So his time put here at Malibu first point seems to be paying off. Oh, absolutely. You can see it. It's like I spent so much time in the water with him during that kind of week when he was here, during that swell, and we were talking about it. We were like, oh, yeah, like, notice this section right now. As much as we have cobblestones, unlike Australia, and, you know, you can really kind of guarantee the waves are going to be similar more often than not. It's not like the banks wash out like That's it does right. at the pass and stuff like that. There is still those subtle nuances where the creek flows out, where the sand is. There is still those subtle nuances where some years it's better than others. Some years it's shutting down on the inside a little bit more. Some years it's holding up. And then again, when it comes to the angle, Ben has put in so much time between last year, even this year, earlier in the year, that he really is aware of those subtle nuances that some people might be missing right now. Well, not to mention he surfed here in last year's event as well. Uh, and that's something, it's a story being told with the Longboard Tour right now where these surfers are no longer unfamiliar. Declan hasn't surfed here in an event before, so Ben has. So he's got that comp experience here too with no one out. It, well, that's a different story, right? It happens at Malibu. Usually there's going to be 100 people out here and you can kind of line up on the crowd. Now it's all yourself. I mean, the same thing happens, you know, on the championship tour, guys 
that are new to Pipeline, you're mm -hmm. out there alone. You lost being able to surf off of the crowd or line up off of the crowd. So it's really important to know those lineups when you're in these kind of situations. A hundred percent. And you'll see that maybe right here as Ben's taking a look. He knows that that's going to run on him. It's not worth wasting his time. Declan uses priority, gets to the nose, looking super casual through that first section, has to skip around here. Another five for Declan. Just taps a 10. Swooping cut back. Skinner on the wave behind him. Both surfers able to fire mm. back and forth over each other. Again, a reminder, Declan Whiten needs a 7.68. Needs to really line up something on the inside here. And a little caught up on that final turn for Declan Whiten. Turn our attention to Ben Skinner caught up in the white water. A little bobble, more bobble going on for Big Ben. And fighting through that section, trying to get to the nose, still battling with that inside section. And Ben Skinner straightens out. I don't know if he's going to improve his score line. And I don't know if Declan Whiten is going to get that 7.68. What are your thoughts, Waxhead? And there's a storyline here as well. The enduring Manly down the beach, uh, which is a shifty beach break. Between tides, it was a session I had with Ben and Declan going at it just randomly, and who would have known they would be fighting for a world title or getting through a quarterfinal here at Malibu in instead of one foot onshore beach breaks. We're here at perfect Malibu. And let's have a look at Declan's wave. So beautiful, relaxed body language on that opening five. Love that mid-board redirection. Back up to a 10, showing the judges his toes are right over. And this, he gets to work hot-dogging through off the tail, up on the nose, great positioning of that nose ride, and bang, love that, and then bang, again, and then back up on the nose again, beautiful rhythm and flow, controlled rail work, a little bit of power thrown in, and technical nose rides. He honestly could not have done anything more on that wave. I think it would be the score, but it's this turn here. The judges may find a reason not to go excellent because of that finish, but it could be wrong as well. It was beautiful surfing. Cassia, talk us through what you're seeing here with Big Ben Skinner. Oh, absolutely. So Big Ben kind of coming off the bottom, little drop knee carve to kind of redirect, set back up for that perch. There was a little bit of a fumble in that kind of walk up. You know, there's a little bit of backwash as he kind of like pulls it around again. He doesn't want to go all the way around because he doesn't want to lose that section. He spent so much time knowing that that section, that kind of mid section can totally get away from you right now mm. if you overcommit to your turn, you know? And so he's kind of milking it through this little wobbly kind of inside section. There's a a bit of backwash, you know, a bit of backwash that everybody's fighting against as the tide's dropping out. You, uh, definitely. And it was a beautiful wave. Definitely not Ben's highest score. I don't know if that last wave was Declan's highest score. What I do know is his drop knees remind me of Wrigley. Oh, my goodness. The numbers are in. And he went way above that 7-point wow. ride. 8.43. Down to the wire. Buzzer beater. Declan Whiten is moving on to wait but we do need one more score i got ahead of myself because the judges owe us a score for ben skinner but ben needs a giant giant number he needs an 8.37 i didn't see an 8.37 in that wave the judges didn't see an 8.37 in that wave either here's the numbers populated 6.73 not enough and it will be declan whiten on to the semifinals. The variety was what got that win, Kaipo. That last wave, Declan threw not everything. didn't throw every trick in the book at it, but he surfed what was in front of him, and he did it exceptionally well. I think it was excellent surfing, and the judges agreed. Wow. Well, that was wild. We're going to give you guys a chance to take a breather. We're going to take a break. We'll be back. Women's quarterfinals will be in the water. Start of your heat. Yeah, he's 
set with the semi. Good job, bro. Good luck in the semi. From Manly. Are you 21? 24? Okay, that's still young. Women's quarterfinals in the water at the Cuervo Classic Malibu Championships presented by O'Neill. We got to set up the semifinals and the first challenge. Quarterfinal number one features local girl Soleil Erico against last year's champion Elise Lemoyne. What a matchup, Cassia. This is going to be an epic heat. I'm so excited about this. And look at the quarterfinals we have on the way, Matt. Got some challenges right there and a lot, some potential rivalries as well. And I'm more interested in quarter one and quarter four where we have, uh, sorry, quarter two and quarter four, we have a goofy footer and we have a regular footer as well in those heats. Um, that's very complex. We have the, the master out here, Cassia Medo. So tell me about a backside here at Malibu. You went switch a lot. I went switch a lot, not really. Switch wasn't so much my thing, to be quite honest. Like, I feel like I, surfing Malibu so much my whole life, you know, growing up on this wave, like, I feel like there's something that you can get extra high and tight backside, that it's just a different approach than on your forehand, you know? And, and when I would have a hard time getting around those sections, it was Josh Farbro that's like, dude, switch it up. And that's the thing. So I think like getting through sections, I love the switch stance, you know? I wouldn't say that like, that's my thing. That said, like, I love getting it, you know, it puts you through that sections, but backside, I feel like I can hang 10 so much better going backside than front side because it's that heel edge. There's a different sort of leverage and I freaking love it. This wave is so awesome. Oh, it's oh. gonna be so exciting to watch. I mean, fantastic surfers. Soleil spending so much time here, you know. Chloe, she's been ripping. Alice, who won it last year. Yeah. It's going to be, and Mason, Mason's a fantastic surfer who spent a lot of time here over the years. Young, so it's going to be washing. Yeah, awesome. young, young up and comer. Well, the men's semifinals are all set and Declan Whiten earned his way into that semifinal. He had to scratch his way with a buzzer beater. Let's hear from Declan. That's right, Declan, the last spot in the men's semifinals and you right, got through on the buzzer go, beater. How did it feel to have that score received on the sand? Yeah, it was, it was tight. It was such a tight heat. Um, I think that last wave was my best two, wave and one. I was just happy to get the chance, you know, like there's nothing worse than just sitting out there with priority and the wave doesn't come through. So to get that wave come through, I was, I was just stoked and made it count. And what was it like being in the water with Ben Skin Dog Skinner? Yeah, amazing. Like I love Ben um, and I do just want to give a big shout out to people like Skin Dog and Taylor and Kai who are the reason that we've got this at the moment you know they went through a lot of hard years with longboarding um and those are the guys that stuck with it through the whole time um talking to kai salas the other day who's saying 20th year on tour or something you know so and it's definitely hasn't had waves like this the whole time so big shout out to guys like skin dog and those guys who have stuck with it and reason we've got this here today oh so well said and we can't wait to see you in the semi-finals anything you'll change up heading into water uh i don't think so i think uh no overlapping heat and slightly longer heat, so just wait for the sets will be, um, and get it to ourselves, so that'll be it. But yeah, I'm just stoked to serve some more waves out there. It's, it's pumping. Best of luck, Declan, and hopefully we'll see you back. Thank you. Well, there you go. We'll see him in the semifinals, rocking the free world, showing up. Why not? 
Guy's yeah. got a Nirvana shirt on. And that Dang last it. last heat, guys. <laughs> that was Declan was in uh, fifth place going into that with uh, with Ben just ahead. So it was fourth and fifth. Declan's overtaken Ben. Ben's now knocked out. So it looks like it is well. It is between Carney, Harry, Taylor, and Ben. It was and Declan, sorry, for the world title. It is almost at the point. If the mass is correct, the winner will win the world title. So it's going to come down to that final hit. Pretty exciting moments. Good a lot stuff. of math still to do, Axe, we're going to see how it all works out. But yeah, we definitely, one thing we're going to do for sure is we're crowning champs today, world champs. Will it be Soleil Erico? Will it be Elise Lemoy? It can't be bo both of them. So it got to come through this quarterfinal number one. Soleil, Cassia, you probably see your surf a lot here. Absolutely, and this is where, you know, that wave knowledge and just this being her backyard may just pay off as she's picking a good first opening wave to ride it on, but she's noticing that it's going to shut down a little bit, and that's something that's been happening. You know, people can get too deep. You don't want to get too deep, and we saw that that wave was going to shut down. It's peeling through the inside, but you can really kind of sit too far out the back and get one of those ones that just doesn't stay open enough, which is a bummer. Because there's so much perfect wave to ride, you right, know? Right, yeah. And, and, like, that's where it can get tricky and a little bit of local knowledge is good. So that was Soleil utilizing that local knowledge and knowing when to kick out. Yeah. So just a couple feet out of, out of position can ruin the whole ride. Totally, totally. And the more west the swell has it, the more kind of, like, it, it kind of can pinch on you. And the more south, it kind of wraps a little bit more. So we do have more of a south-trending swell. You know, it's in that 200-degree window. Generally, it's that 190 to 200 that's, like, ideal. Over 200, it has a bit more west in it, and it can close. But it makes it good for when it's crowded out here because you know that people aren't going to make it yeah. through. You know, you're like, yeah. Right. And just the way that the the the, the bathymetry of of Malibu, the way we're facing, we're not really facing west right now, right? We're bending a little bit into the Santa Monica Bay. Well, yeah, we bend a lot. Actually, in the evening, it'll be that studio light, and actually, the, the sun sets behind the mountain, so it kind of lights it up. So that's where you know rises in the east, right. sets in the west. West is behind us. Yeah. Mm. You know, so it's a, it's a trippy little zone, but really, it likes that more pure south. Yeah. Malibu like really turns on when it's that pure south. But of course, that direction uh, allows, uh, like the physical location allows that afternoon winds and summer to blow across shore, and the inside of the bay is clean as a whistle. So you're able to surf with that ruffled classic Southern California trade wind. Well, that's it. You know, that northwest, west-northwest trade wind, I guess you could call it here. You know, it's like our predominant wind that we get, and that's where it can be blowing a gale. And you can just come in and get, like, those cozy little corners. And, and really, you know, Malibu, it's just one of those places that's good all day, not like a lot of the beach breaks that just kind of get blown out blown after out, yeah. 10 a.m. And that's why, it, apart from its consistency, but... You can surf in a variety of different winds, which is also what's forged its reputation as a reliable, world-class longboard spot. I mean, it's just cobblestones, you know? Cobblestones make for perfection, and there is just something about this place that you were talking about the energy of, of spots mm. before, Matt, and, like, really the energy of this place has always pulled people in. From the Chumash people whose land we're mm. on right now, you know, there was, like, at one point in time, 10,000 people that lived here on this beach, you know? They fished the steelhead in, in the river and, you know, kind of were thriving. Truly, you know, mm. and, and what a, a beautiful, so it's really always gathered people. It's always been this beacon that really invited people in. And I think, too, it's it's also what really helped to kind of start longboarding. I mean, in, in Australia, you guys call longboards Malibus. It is. That's correct. Yeah. And, and you know what? Go back to, like, the, the native cultures here in the Chumash, Malibu is really an anglicized version of the Chumash word, who malihu, right? And which means... The place where the surf sounds loudly. So the connection with the indigenous culture here was, was here from the beginning, acknowledging the miracle that this wave is. Absolutely, absolutely, you know, and, and that's it. We'd be like, as groms, like crashing on the beach over like, you know, over by Broad Beach or whatever, and you would hear the south cell swells crack on the beach. Right. And that's when we knew, oh, the south swells here, because it would crack in a different way than rumble, you know, and, and they were tuned into that, you know, they knew, you know, they had their canoes, they were surfing out here, they were fishing, you know, there was probably like deers and all these animals thriving. What a utopic paradise this was. And 
and still really is. Well, it wasn't until the early 40s, well, no, early 20s, when uh, the highway was actually built through the cliff faces here and carved out. But surfing was starting to become the, the, the place to be was Malibu in the 40s, where we saw the evolution from Redwood, then into Balsa, and that energy continued, not only with the boards that were actually made from locally sourced materials, Dale Velzi had his surf shop down the road making surfboards, and it's where that movie Big Wednesday uh, was actually based off, you know, it was that feeling of Dale Velzi making those boards, um, although Malibu isn't really the place where, a, you know, a massive 50-year uh, storm may light up the place and um, get iconic big waves like they saw at, um, you know, where they actually filmed it down in El Salvador. But I tell you what, one thing that always rings true is the characters that Malibu brings out. You know, we talk about that energy and everyone from different demographics, financial positions um, and different hierarchy or class in life, everyone's neutral when they come to Malibu. I mean, Malibu is a special spot, you know. The McClure Tunnel in 1936 is really what opened up the PCH and gave people access to this really beautiful and dynamic place. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's for everyone. It's a home for so many people and always has been a gathering place. So, you know, it pulls in people from all walks of life, all places, like everybody's here. And whether it's like the parking lot scene that's going down and everybody's crashing their cars when there's a good swell or when we were Groms, <laughs> we had the Palapa here and we We'd all mm. just like sleep on the beach in the Palapa, you know, it's just like, it feels like home, you know, in a lot of ways. And it's nice. always kind of been that. Yeah. And he, you know what? On that note, I want to send a big mahalo, a big thank you to the entire Malibu surf community for supporting us and welcome us here. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of frothy surfers over here. It's part of the culture. So thank you all for, um, again, hosting us for another World Championships. And thank you, Cassia. We're just coming in here and dropping some knowledge, girl. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, it's just so stunning to watch everybody that's in this event just really grace these waves with their, you know, painterly ways, really. Yeah, yeah. It's just, like, so gorgeous. Just watching a wave break with nobody on it is a gift, purely. Just mm. to be on the bay, you know, just when I first got here, just watching a couple waves, just, like, feather down the point. It's just a pure miracle. Like, we're witnessing that right now. Yeah, look at that little one right there. Totally. It's like perfect. You know, it's like, yes, there's wave machines and this is nature's wave machine right here. You know, whether it's two foot or 22 foot, it is picture perfect. I don't think it gets 22 foot. No. Though we have had a couple big swells that have definitely knocked off Done the pilot. Done some pilots. Yeah, yeah, the pier, I was yeah, say, yeah, totally. You know, you know it's bombing when, when you know, Alan Sarlo is going through the pier. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know that avocado and toast at the Malibu uh, farm restaurant there may not taste as good on a, on a huge south swell. <laughs> the prep might be a little bit. Oh, you get some salt, though. Yeah, well, no, well, we had John Stockwell on the set from Malibu Farms, and he actually talked about how in the kitchen it's a tight space, and on bigger swells, it's swaying out there. Oh, yeah. So it's like cooking on a ship. Oh, totally. It's, it's more like you're getting a meal and a ride, and you might also <laughs> be in the blue section, you know? <laughs> oh, good stuff. There we go, Malibu Farms. Thanks again for yeah. uh, all the delicious catering uh, and the support beautiful farm to table meals right you know mm -hmm. just gorgeous spot and and when we were groms we used to jump off the pier because it was condemned for a long time mm -hmm. you know it was condemned you couldn't go out on it we jump off it when it was flat in the summer which was sometimes often you know the the guards would chase us up the beach we'd run on the pch it's you know we've done That's so many fun, fun things yeah. now that i can get a really nice cup of coffee and an avocado mm. toast out there <laughs> makes it a little easier you oh. know <laughs> Easier to ride out those long summer days here when you're just surfing for like 10 hours. Oh, man, I love it. Well, someone that's enjoyed Malibu, grown up here, and has a graceful style against its beautiful walls is Soleil Erico. Let's learn more about Soleil. Here's a little profile. Longboarding was the start of surfing, and I think to honor that and be a part of it is really cool. When you're at Malibu and you're just watching the surfers, like, they just put on a show. You know, it's such a longboard-oriented community, especially, you know, Malibu's, you know, first point is, like, the, you know, the highlight of longboarding. I'm just, like, so thankful to be growing up here in such a longboard-oriented place. The 2018 World Longboard Champion goes to Soleil Erico. I just started crying, like bawling. Like I've never really cried like that before in a long time. 
Thank you so much. Oh my God, this is insane. I can't even believe it. It didn't really set in until I held up the trophy. It was just like such a dream of mine, you know, for, throughout like my whole journey. 2018 world champ Soleil Erico out in the water. And that was a wonderful piece on Soleil. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, when, when did, was the first time that you kind of met Soleil or just saw her start surfing around here, Cassia? You know, maybe it was about like, I don't know, maybe around a decade ago was the first time I kind of saw her out here and she was a Grom yeah. and her dad Danny's like super awesome guy yeah. and is just like really supportive and they were down here surfing and I was like, oh, that little Grom's got a vibe, you know, and and it was really awesome just kind of watching her and, and she's worked with a couple different people, mentored with them over the years and it's been awesome to see kind of like their influence on her surfing and watching her and witnessing her develop mm. into such a well-rounded surfer has just been so cool to see you know the fact that she won a world title a couple years ago and you know is here in literally her backyard able to like express herself she has such a beautiful kind of combination of that classic longboard style that i love so much as well as some kind of progressive tones like if we were talking yeah. about it like it was coffee yeah. you know she has some like <laughs> progressive nodes that is really cool and dynamic mixing it up in a really cool way and it's just been so awesome summer after summer watching her surf here and just really just continue to refine and redefine her surfing and it's excellent her surfing is excellent and Needless to say, she won a world title. She's here in her own backyard, and she's going to put on a show for all of us. Yeah. I've been a fan, uh, Matt, of, of Soleil for quite a while, but she's got a lot of facets to her. She's also studying at the University of San Diego, so she's away from home a lot now, you, maybe summertime's in Malibu, but really applying herself to being a more well-rounded person. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen her come to Noosa, the big Noosa Festival of Surfing, uh, for probably close to 10 years now, and seen her grow physically but mentally as well but as a well-rounded surfer i loved how you mentioned that with different mentors you can see those uh inspirations coming out in her surfing and her board choices and i think right now and the performances that she put on yesterday uh were fairly mind-blowing i think her performances yesterday yeah, well, as we're waiting for some sets to formulate, we're going to step away. We're going to take a break. When we come back, quarterfinal one will still be in the water. We've got 25 minutes on that countdown. Taking a look at uh, Soleil Erico and uh, yesterday's Hydro Flask Let's Go Moments. This was an 8.67 for Soleil Erico and really 
Matt surfing to the criteria. Absolutely, in the background, that music's really suiting Soleil surfing. Talk about longboarding having elements of funk, soul, jazz, and a little bit of rock and roll thrown in. Soleil's boogie on the nose, in and around the, the pocket, suits this style and this wave really well. Well completed waves there from Soleil. All right, another nominee, 8.4 Cassia for this wave surfed by Honolua Bloomfield. Beautiful. I mean, look at that perch. Just so much poise and elegance. And as you see her, she's kind of like riding that nose. And then again, using the middle of the board to get through that section and redirect her into when it's set up again for that perfect nose ride. And just really kind of like highlighting and utilizing that front part of her board. I like that she went back into that turn, you know. Gorgeous surfing, just stunning surfing. Great surfing. Watching women ride longboards is pure poetry in motion. I agree with you. And you know what, you watching? Vote for your choice on the Hydro Flask Let's Go moment. Go to the WSL Instagram, put in your vote. Is it Soleil? Is it Honolua? We're gonna let you, the fans, decide. So go to Instagram, WSL Instagram, and uh, place your vote. That's right. And fans, who's your vote for? Well, Matt? I mean, sending us notes on Instagram is going to help, guys. You've got to, you got to let them know. Let the WSL know how you feel. Jump on there. Comment. Tag your favorite surfers. Tell them how bad we are on the commentary. Like, let's just do it. Let's get involved. And it's an open forum. But honestly, I love the way Sole's hands were moving with the con in conjunction with her movements uh, on the board. Uh, Hono just had a natural intuition. The waves were really quiet during a heat yesterday and she plucked those waves out of nowhere and she performed. But I'd give the nod to Soleil uh, on some of that technical surfing. I would do the same. Soleil had me on that one. You know, I also really liked her turn, the way she floated and her just body language on it. You know, a lot about longboarding is those subtle body languages, like those kind of hip movements as we're seeing right now. And lack of hands. And lack of hands or the way that you move your hand intentionally as you see Elise perching on this one oh. you know gorgeous surfing just beautiful surfing very quiet upper body as you see Soleil out the back kind of navigating back into this little pocket to perch 10 lovely nasal navigation Ooh. wow wow all right so Elise finishing off on the inside and Soleil Erico going to some turns to finish off her ride. Nice five in here to 10 for Soleil. But at the beginning of Elise's ride, gang, she spent so much time on the nose, might have to charge her rent. Love that, or as Lance Carson said in the end of the summer, a ha or Bruce Brown, sorry, a ham sandwich. A ham sandwich. You can, he's got enough time to make a ham sandwich. Um, wow. Well, we waited a long time for the, this first exchange. Cassia, and it did not let us down. No, it definitely did not let us down. There was a bit of a lull, and now you see a lot more action coming through as Elise kind of pops up on this first part, that first section, just delicately walking to the nose, hanging a really nice five. It's a little stretch. It's going fast through this section here, and she hangs it well as she goes into 10. Full perch, back to five, back to 10, back to five, back to 10, 10, five, 10, five. And that is what's so epic about Malibu. The section keeps going. It's perfect. Look at her. She's having the best time ever. It was just worth coming over here for this wave right now. <laughs> oh. I mean, I'm excited to see. She claimed it. She's all, what up? <laughs> and now in comparison here to Sole, looking behind her, not too confident if this is going to be the waves, but Get to the tip, now this 10. That was a functional maneuver to get it down into this next section, all right? A lot more variety on this wave from Sole. Didn't have the tip length that uh, uh, Alice did, but here's Sole gets to work in this. I love this little drop knee off the top. Comes around, bang, bang. Stabs the section, back up on the nose. Perfect timing and variety, and a little bit of use of rail work there too. One critique there in comparison both surfers, Soleil's do it using her turns and rounding her turns out to get back in the pocket, where Alice's wave didn't really allow that, and her nose rides were um, impressive and clear, except not way back in the pocket, but we may see something different on this wave. Elise back on it and finds a home on the nose again, cruising through there on the 10, just clocking some time. Cassie, I'm going to use your term, nasal navigation on display for the French surfer. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful surfing. 
beautiful surfing, nice little cutback on the inside. You know, she got to the tail of her board. You know, she's stoked on that one again. I mean, obviously, that was a freaking epic wave. <laughs> I'm fired up. That said, you know, good highlights. Matt, you know, it was really good to highlight that, right? So Soleil was really utilizing all of her board, kind of like getting back into that pocket point. You know, Elise was like, had one that kind of reeled up in front of her. She didn't even really get back to the middle. She kind of was just staying on that nose and really not utilizing the whole board. It's not about ripping huge turns. That said, Malibu's such a perfect wave that you can really just nose ride the whole thing. You don't even have to get back. So it's also getting that flow down. I mean, this wave though for Elise is also just highlighting why she won it last year with surfing like this come on she just hanging 10 perch city oh, unbelievable this next one here and she even she surprised herself about here she's just like wow i can't believe i just did two tens that were about six seconds long each and the wave you're right it just keeps reeling this is another one that didn't allow too much turning action except for the end she is surfing what's in front of her and my gosh that board is allowing her even when she gets a little more on the face, it's still allowing her to stay on the nose. And it's like the barrel, right? <laughs> Why would you want to, you know, come out of the barrel, do a cutback and get back in when you're still in it? Well, still in it. And that's also the difference, you know, you're noticing too. It's like when, when these ladies and even when the guys are up pushing on the nose, their boards aren't sliding out on them in that really deep pocket. But then you're also noticing sometimes people get hung up a little bit on the turn and something that definitely like, you know, I think about, and like, I'm sure that other people are thinking about, like when you're surfing Malibu, you're putting your fin a little more back. When yeah. you're going to a place like Sano and you're kind of like more like a, a lighter turning radius, not that much like kind of wall in front of you, you want a little bit more movement in your board, you know? So it's something to kind of highlight. Like, you know, these people, these, these surfers out here, the ladies and the men are really shredding and they're really, you know, kind of like going through those sections and you brought up the barrel. It's pockety in there, you know? It might look soft because they're just making it look so beautiful they're making it look so easy and that's what's so graceful and elegant about watching longboard that said that is a very critical part of the wave that they are demonstrating excellent maneuverability through that 10 that uh at least did on both waves uh the judges really enjoyed that first some of the seven six seven but one thing we cannot tell in the booth cassia is the extremity and the um, intensity that goes they've waited for 20 minutes for a wave and then for at least to stand on that nose with complete composure impressive hey man i just want to bring up uh we got a second quarter final out on the water in this overlapping format chloe Kalman out in the water versus mason schremer so that is the non-priority heat in the water that's why you see four surfers chloe in the white mason in the green they have 35 minutes on their clock for the non-priority heat. No waves ridden as of yet in that non-priority heat. In the priority heat, Soleil Erico, 7.33 to her credit. Elise Limoy opened up with a 7.67. Judges owe us one more score for Elise, and it looks like it is going to be a good one. One more judge to type in his number and then we can give you the situation. We're at the 15 minute and 25 second mark in the priority heat. I am so fired up watching this surfing. It's like really hard not to just jump up and down. <laughs> And, you know, it's just like so awesome to just watch all these ladies, all these men at this perfect. This is the best. It's the best of the best. Malibu yeah. is literally the best of the best when it comes to longboarding. And to witness everybody do their thing here. Forget it. Come on. Where's our where's our expression session heat, Matt? <laughs> it's coming up. I'm it's coming up. Out. It's before the final. I, I've called it. I haven't asked. But Ben Skinner <laughs> actually mentioned in a post seed interview and he surfed all around the world. The best waves at the best location. And we, we had a little debate there of what is a good wave to you? What's your best wave to you? Is it necessarily uh, the actual wave itself or is it the vibe? Is it the energy? Well, or a combination? it's all of it. But really, you know, I relate everything to Malibu. You know, it's like... It's like that one relationship. It's like everything I compare to Malibu as a longboarder. I'm like, oh, yeah, but it's kind of not like Malibu or, oh, this and whatever. It's kind of like Malibu, but like this version of Malibu. Yeah. You know, I just relate everything to this place. It's the best ever. Yeah, Matt, great takeaway from Ben Skinner when he was saying, hey, one of the best waves of my life. And I'm now feel like he really meant it. Mm. And you know what? 
That 8.33 that Elise Lemoy just dropped may be one of the best waves of her life because she has a commanding lead over Soleil Erico. We knew this quarterfinal number one was going to be, Cassia, a, a blockbuster matchup because we have, we have the defending champ against the local girl, Soleil, who's been putting up big numbers. Oh, absolutely. I love watching Soleil paddle out here whenever she's kind of here on an epic day, you know, and it's so rad to see the lines that she's drawing and how she's really utilizing her board. And this matchup right here, I mean, I think every matchup, this entire event, you know, I mean, the waves are perfect. That said, this matchup right here is definitely a matchup of matchups for the quarterfinals. Well, let's watch some poetry in motion and an excellent ride from Elise. Talk us through this, Cassia. So she's just getting up to the nose and she is just in that perfect pocket. Goes from five to 10, holds that 10, keeps holding that 10, 10, 10, 10. Little arch back. She was like, okay, making Matt a ham sandwich. Obviously he's starving, just watching all this great surfing. Back to 10, just holding it so poised, so elegant, so much flow. She's kind of racing through this section again. It's standing up in front of her. You don't really see her do a turn until right now because the thing is just reeling in front of her. You know, she didn't want to get behind it. She was right in the 10, almost that entire wave. It it was gorgeous, stunning. Nasal exploitation, Matt. Love that term, that's fantastic. Obviously referring to nose riding. Now we're talking about the pocket and, and you can see the tail on Alice's board as she's sitting up there. Look how stable that is. You can't do that on any other board than a, than a long board. Try doing that on a foil. Um, <laughs> and I mean, seriously, look at the tail flip. Now that, that board is so incredibly thin in the tail. I can't express to you what a sander and shaper's nightmare that board is. That fin box is actually sanded. I haven't got confirmation of the shaper, but knowing boards, I've got a feeling they've actually sanded that fin box oh, yeah. before they've glassed it in the board because the thing is so refined. Now, we noticed there was not much elevation, not much air under the nose of mm -hmm. her board because the yeah. tail is so big and that was allowing, and the nose rock and the tail rock are allowing her to slow down just enough to stay on the nose. But you have to reward it because it was extremely good. And the toes were clear. There was no whitewash necessarily on the toes. It was clean, it was you know. Clean. It was clean and clear, and you do see a bit of tail rocker. There's also quite a bit of nose rocker, you know. It's like definitely having that kick in the tail kind of hold you high and tight. And sometimes when there is a little more of that nose rocker, it doesn't levitate. It pushes a little bit, you know. So I think, you know, kind of highlighting what you're talking about right there when it comes to board design. Again, though, I just want to see what everyone's riding. I want to see kind of like I mean I love watching somebody like Ben because he's a shaper as well mm -hmm. I love watching surfers who are also shapers and kind of how they put their boards and their craft into the right position that said you know tail kick you know on short boards I think it's different you know people are putting in more like rocker in the nose where with longboard you know it's this tail kick that can really kind of like help elevate you mm -hmm. and like a flatter kind of nose rocker and a little bit more of that kick when you're surfing long point breaks, you know, as opposed to kind of surfing beach breaks when you might need a little bit more of that kick, you know? So, I mean, that was just so well ex executed by Elise, and I'm just so fired up to kind of see more waves come through. Where yeah. are the waves? I'm like freaking out in the booth, you know? Like, I want these waves to come in. It's a little bit lolly of a swell. It's peaking today, fired up. We saw a bunch of waves. This is kind of like one of those swells that you'll see one heat's going to be a little bit mm. on fire and the next heat's going to be a little lowly. I think we're kind of in that. And that is, again, a little bit of a Malibu thing. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on, on these lulls? Bottoming of the tide. We're ah. nearly approaching the low tide. Oh, and you okay. can almost see the rocks there. And we have a full tide coming in, uh, which will be about 7.30 p.m. Ooh. So these Ooh. women are on the bottom of the tide. But the good news is... It's been a pretty lackluster, what has been a very lackluster 30-minute heat. Uh, aside from maybe Sole letting that one go at the beginning where it raced away, they've surfed everything that's come through. Oh, they've surfed so everything that's come through. It's awesome. No missed opportunities from either surfer. Uh, but pressure's on Sole. But if anyone wants to perform under pressure, it will be Sole being the local girl. Mason Schremer up and riding. Schremer riding in the non-priority heat. Just wanted to start her campaign out and get a number on the board. Smaller inside wave, but doing a good job to navigate to a nose ride. Clean cross-stepping there. Has to straighten out. And just a nice little start for the youngster, Mason Schremer. 
That one didn't quite make it down the point for her. And again, because with this kind of crossover heat, they're sitting a little higher. Sometimes you end up getting those waves that don't quite have that wall that goes through what we used to kind of call a trash can peak, was, which is like the ideal kind of like nose ride section. Like that's the one the that- The trash can peak. Trash can peak. Where, where, where was the trash can referenced? Oh, here we go. We have Chloe come on opening up her account. Yeah, come on, as smooth as ever. Super talented Brazilian surfer and just a wonderful style that I enjoy from the surfing of Chloe. Come on, a little bit of a bobble there, but she navigates through that section, has to go into the safety stance, grabs the rail, looking for more open face, and she's gonna stick with this one, finds a little bit more open face on the inside. Nice job of clearing the white water. Back to another nose ride for Chloe Kalman. Really milking this wave all the way in to the cobbles. Great job. Had to fight for that one. But Chloe Kalman came out successful. Beautiful wave and beautiful reading of that wave. You know, she knew to commit. She committed, and that was a fantastic one. And look, I love her paddle style. Look at her breathing. She's look at got her breathing. Flow. Are you a mouth breather or are you a nose no, breather, No, nose breather, Chano? nose breather. <laughs> she is nose breathing Good. as she goes. That's what's up. I wonder where she picked that one up. Beautiful ride as she's just like getting to the nose, five to 10, holding that five through that beautiful section, you know, coming back around, elegant, gorgeous nose ride. And then she kind of is like, okay, this thing is gonna run on me. I'm gonna get low. I'm gonna keep my inside rail engaged and she knows she's gonna make it. She's been here before. She's like, I got this. I'm gonna take it to the inside and really show them what I got. And it's also just good to get a couple under your feet with these crossover mm. swells. I mean, crossover heats, you know? Get a couple under your feet as she pulls it to the inside. And this was the opener, Matt, for Mason Schremer. She had to go. Uh, the second heat have waited for 10 minutes themselves. So she had to open up her account, Mason, and, and apply some pressure. Uh, beautiful tip control, smaller wave, uh, surfing what's in front of her, but this wave did race away. So you, you would like to think that that 417 would not be in a top two at the end of this heat, but we'll have to wait and see. All right, well, let's get quickly to uh, some reporting by Shannon down on the beach. What do you got for us, Shannon? Well, guys, I have a, an update on the world title scenarios. Now, on the women's side, it's still wide open because in the women's quarterfinals, we've got all of those front-running surfers towards that world title. So we'll have a better update for the women's after this round finishes. But on the men's side, heading into the semifinals, which is coming out soon, it's so tight between those four surfers that it's going to be the surfer that takes the win in the event will win the world title. And that's the official car call from tours and competitions from Kira Seal. So the man that wins the event wins the world title. Thank you for that, Shannon, as we see Soleil. Erico on the comeback right now. Soleil needing an 8.67, styling through this section. She's been utilizing the whole board style, flow, grace, all personified in that, that ride. Soleil, Erico, give it up to her. Yeah, that was an excellent, excellent ride. Excellent surfing, gorgeous nose riding, style, grace. I loved her body language. I think body language, again, is the thing that really accentuates your style on a longboard. She had beautiful body language as she was navigating through that kind of like trash can peak section. I brought it back for you, Matt. I love that. So let's dissect this away from Soleil. So a little sleepy at the beginning, a little five to 10 to set up, nothing super critical. And here she starts to apply the pressure. See that tail locked into the pocket, the whitewash over the tail of her board, boom, up on the 10. When it starts to get sketchy and the surf is pushing it, we're going excellent today. Look at the tail. You can see that mini barrel, the, the inside rail on the tail is creating. Love that flow. Reminds me of the seedling. 1999 Thomas Campbell surf movie, that Mexico section, boom, tap it off the top. Oh my gosh, that was a perfectly surf wave for Soleil. Wouldn't be surprised if it went high up into the nines. Well, that was an excellent wave, sorry. Yeah, no, she needs an 8.67, so I, I take it that both of you think that she got the job done on that wave. I feel she did. I mean, you just really saw her board in perfect trim as she was nose riding through that section, a lot of lift. And Cassia, you're right, eight. Point seven three. Soleil Erico takes the lead off of Elise Lemoy. 
That's wow. what's up. That's that was a clutch up. performance. It was a clutch performance, and you also see the difference in how tight that pocket was that she was nose riding through because you really saw how much lift her entire mm. board had as it was going through that section. That was I mean, so cool. It was so cool and so freaking critical. And that's like those little points of difference that really are the difference between like, hey, both of them had great nose rides. Both of them had long, amazing nose rides. But you just saw the subtle difference that turned that into to, you know, the touch up a better wave and put her back into first. And you and I both really appreciate those little subtle, well, being subtle is everything in longboarding. And it's just those adjustments that was allowing Soleil to get back in the pocket, step back into the turn and set it back up all again. And that is how you surf Malibu. Although you can just go out and hang 10 like Elise and the pressure is going to be back on Elise, but she's proven time and time again, she only needs right now a 774 and she's well and truly capable. Here she goes. On the nose. Beautiful wave. Now everybody pay attention to really where her board is tracking on this wave. Like look at how the wave is holding the board. You know, it is it's it's she's perching a gorgeous 10. Look at that thing. Amazing. Here she goes. Oh, she keeps going. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what an exchange and what a comeback right now by Elise. This is an inc it's this heat started really slowly, you guys. Mm -hmm. They sat out there for a long time, nearly 15 minutes, and now we just got fireworks, explosions, everything's happening. It's all going down. I love it. I love it when it comes down to the wire, Kaipo. Like, look at this. You know, the last two waves, both excellent scores from both of those ladies. We might have a little bit of a ping pong match back and forth. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not a judge. I'm not great at that kind of stuff. They both have such excellent surfing, such excellent rides. It would be so hard to be sitting in a booth with a Looking pen and paper seven, in your hand right now. What do you think, Matt? That opening 10 was really critical. She was actually well and truly in the pocket. And here she gets back in the pocket. The wave actually catches up to her. Right. Kind of here. She's, she's pretty deep. The wave's just an almond shaped wave. That's incredible balance and poise. Well, I'm going to say poise. She's claiming it. She's going, <laughs> yeah, bring it on. I can't knock me off. Get me a rugby tackle out here. <laughs> Pass her a gridiron board. She's ready to go. Like, she's so confident. A little like, cross, uh, cross turn, you know, cross stance turn no, too. to get tube the whole way why would you turn out of the tube to get tube again you know yeah. that said you know there was something a little different about Soleil's wave before that where she did kind of pull into those full turns and then set herself back up so you know it's it's gonna be a really hard call down to the right uh, like here we go the this is what shredding. the judges are thinking She's right there, and 8.1 gets her the score, gets her the lead. You can see her hearing the news right now. Pep in the paddle on the way back out. Elise has retaken the lead over Soloy Erico with one minute remaining, Matt. No nose breathing there, full excitement. She's letting it all out. She's claiming, she's kicking. She's not conserving any energy. 50 seconds left to go. She's on, and the pressure's back in Soleil's corner. I got a really feel for Sole. I thought that first score of hers, a 733, uh, given. Oh, and we got waves. Oh, 45 seconds 45 remaining. Take it away, seconds. Kaipo. It's wow. down. Look at this set stacking up. Oh, turn our head over. We're turning our head over the commentary so, booth. Watching so this here we go, though. She's choosing the first wave of the set, Cassia. Now, this is when local knowledge is going to really come into play. Perching straight up into a 5 and a 10, re navigating. Oh. Beautiful, classic. Bottom turn with the sole arch back into 510. As she's, you'll notice she's just a little bit deeper than Alice was on a couple of her tents. Mm. You know, she's kind of like, and then comes back around. Beautiful bottom turn, redirecting, setting back up. Elise is kind of behind it on that one. We got everybody on waves out here. Look at this. Oh. What up? Out the back, <laughs> Big Bombora from Angora. Look at that thing. Oh. This, it's happening, guys. It is Zero happening. seconds. Zero seconds down to the wire.
That's gonna be close. I don't know, it was a smaller wave for Soleil. I'm not sure if it's gonna be enough, but look at this one. Who's in front? Who's on third? Jason Schremer, and then we have behind her, I think it's that next heat, which will be Sophia Colhane. So Alice had a chance to, to actually take off on Mason's wave. And she dream. wasn't in position, I saw that. Well, she had priority. She could have. She should have. She should have. She should have. I saw that as well, Matt. So, but the important thing right now is we need to see what the score is going to be for Soleil Erico on her last ride. She needs a 7.7. .7. Did she do enough? That 7.7 .7 will get her a ticket into the semifinals, Cassia. 7-7, seven, seven, lucky 7. Let's see if she'll take it. It's it's a hard call. I mean, again, I'm no judge, and I, like, want everybody to win all the time because I get so fired up. Everybody deserves to win. They're surfing that good. It's down to the wire. I mean, that bottom turn right there, too, mixing it up. Johnny Fain. Mixing it up. Damn. That, I mean, the purist in us is really enjoying these transitions because we know how hard it is to to do but hanging 10 like Elise as well I mean that's I mean people who pay good money to experience that feeling I mean it's all of it and then so oh, how good was that little stall you know the judges it's not a critical maneuver or anything but that little stall and the, the walk up and that is it the nuances, the nuances and I hope they're all paying attention to the nuances because there was some nuances that were the difference in this way for me personally because it's not a nose ride contest it's no. a it's a surfing contest you know and it's utilizing that whole board and doing it in an elegant way you know that kind of bottom turn that she did remind me of Margot Oberg you know that mm. kind of like you know Us. Soul arch that into kind the of bottom soul turn. arch bottom turn, classic, beautiful execution. I loved it, you know, and then getting to the nose and then getting to the tail again and really just kind of like riding high and tight through that section, high and tight. I, all the ladies are surfing so good. It's like, where do you even go from there? Phenomenally surfed heat from both Soleil and Elise. Wow, that may be the, the heat of the event so far. That was oh, mind-blowing. Sure. If not of the year. I you mean, know, I that think, was wild. Yeah, everybody needs to probably take a break right now, <laughs> just catch their breath, relax a little bit. I'll go out, catch a couple waves, come back in, make sure everybody's all good. It's going to be a hard one. I mean, Soleil's Soleil. on the beach, yeah, just probably like, did stressing. I make it, well, you know? Don't forget, um, coming into this, Elise was fighting for qualification status, and she was sent into the sudden death Elimination heat at the beginning, losing a Let's first Let's take round another heat. look, you guys. That sounds This intense. needs to be a 7.7. .7. One more look at the last oh. wave for Soleil Erico. Right, so carving back this, bang. Oh, see, that's that turn. That's that Margot Oberg turn that I just another loved Another one coming right up, too. Boom, yes, 5.10, critical. Look at how fast the water is passing her board. Look at how she is just gliding. That's trim. When people are like, what's trim? That's trim. You know, Fully. it's like really just like you're basically flying at that point, water, walking on water. Water displacement from underneath the hull of the board with the rails, the fin and the rocker all in conjunction with the surfer's ankles and hips. And that's perfect. Maybe not a perfect 10, but amazing surfing and well-rounded surfing to the criteria for Sol Erica. Beautifully executed. And no matter what the score comes across, her surfing is so gorgeous. I mean, oh, down to the wire. It is so intense. Elise making her way up to the Turtle Bay VIP area. Both surfers waiting for the numbers and the judges still holding back, not giving us the scores. Oh gosh, they're just really messing with us now, I feel like. You know, I'm biting my nails, I'm biting your nails. Well, Matt. I, I don't I'm know thinking where your back, hands have like, been. Soleil's 733 <laughs> and 873, I mean, it, it falls somewhere maybe in between that. We're getting carried away with those little nuances which don't necessarily score, uh, but in the context of the wave, Oh, the weight numbers are coming in right now. They're looking good for Erico. A 7.8, and it is enough. Sole, Erico moves on into the semifinals. But congratulations again to Elise Lemoy and Sole Erico. An excellent heat, wonderful surfing. Wow, and I just want to say, say thank you, Cassia. Thank you, guys. I'm freaking out. I'm so happy to watch that, like, heat, Thank you know. You, Matt. Gosh, what is happening Round of applause. You, uh, round of applause. We're going to clap you off to commercial. Elise, we we'll be back you. after this. Oh, Enjoy yourself. Calm down. Fantastic.
is look at the waves it's turning on all righty so now we've got hana and sophia on our boards here we're waiting for their scores to drop we are still waiting for that second wave scores up white and green and it looks like we've got some action out the back our priority heat is white and green white is in a priority but it looks like taking the wave Green up and riding. She is staying active. Will she get around the section here? She does. She's going to try to set up for that nose ride again, but instead gets back into the curl. She's going to set up again. Looks like white out the back. Green getting that nice five. Red, white out the back goes five to ten right in the early stages of the wave. Green still working it through on the inside. White setting it back up, getting that nose ride section again. Another ten from white. Green. Holding on on that inside, that pretty little section there on the inside. Gets that rebound off the water, unfortunately comes in blue. Same thing happens to Ooh. White, almost simultaneously, not able to stay stuck to her board. White doing a little bit of a swim. Hopefully that board will pop up. Looks like Green's actually swimming a bit too, so ladies, you're a bit in the same situation. You're going for a little bit of a swim. My name is Honolua Bloomfield, and I am from Haleiwa, Hawaii. I started surfing when I was two. I was born into surfing. My parents both surfed. When I turned maybe nine, I really got interested in longboarding. I just loved it for loving it. Surfing was like my favorite thing in the world. My biggest inspiration was Carissa Moore growing up. She was from Hawaii and like the best kid ever you know like we would watch her videos and like it was just so inspiring just to see how much she loved surfing when I was 10 I came to Malibu surf rider for the first time to watch my brother came back the next year and I won the contest and it was my first longboard event like out of Hawaii so it does hold a special place in my heart I mean winning last year alone was super special in that aspect Obviously, it's amazing that I get to represent my blood and my heritage, and I think that's special for anyone, you know? A big thank you to O'Neill for being the main sponsor of this year's Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships here in Malibu. And their three-time world champion is in the lineup in Honolulu Bloomfield, and we get to call the action on a battle between her and Sophia Kalane. Shannon Hughes in the booth alongside Sam Bleakley. And Sam, it's amazing to have an iconic brand, one of the longest standing surfing brands from 1952 originally. For O'Neill behind this year's event here at Malibu. Absolutely, first name in the water, Jack O'Neill's motto, surf, surf, surf. And two O'Neill riders, Honolulu Bloomfield, going for that fourth world title, and Sophia Kalane, also an O'Neill rider going for her first world title. Incredible, what a great matchup. These two coming out of the island of Oahu, the North Shore in Honolulu against the South Shore in Sophia Kalane. They've got just over 30 minutes on the clock and our surfers in that first priority heat, Chloe Kalmon and Mason Trimmer are down to about 11 minutes on the clock. Honolulu Bloomfield currently ranked number one in the world and Sophia in at number eight. As we take a look at some action from the break, Mason Schremer. So Mason Schremer's already got a 4.17, waiting for this score to drop. She's been surfing phenomenally well all yesterday. She had that clutch performance against Caitlin Mickelson, taking the win in the last exchange on her Thomas Beckson built boards. Toes on the tip there, nice sole arch, dropping back down. Look at the way she climbed and dropped within that single nose ride and there we've got those sparkly sections on the face but Mason Schremer throwing that board on rail arcing back into the section staying close to the pocket using the cross steps to climb and drop rising and falling off the rail takes a fall on the inside that board will be close to her now because she was already at the end of the ride so it'll be a strong score and it was phenomenal surfing wow so scores to come through for Mason Schremer she opened on a 4.17 this is just her second wave of the heat down to 10 minutes on the clock with Chloe sitting in that front running position. So waiting for scores to come through. And another surfer who had to wait a long time to receive the scores from her last heat was Soleil Erico. She gets the win over Alice Lemoyne and is into the semifinals. Thank you very much down here with Soleil. Soleil, we just talked about it. Mother Nature has the last lap. You can't script this kind of stuff. No, you definitely can't. I thought this there were gonna there's gonna be a set out there and there wasn't. So it was just like 
one wave and then it would go flat and then another wave. So it was hard to like find the rhythm, but oh my God, I just like tried my best on that last wave and I'm so glad that the judges rewarded me for it. Well, you put yourself in a great position. You were deep in the bowl, nose riding, and I think that made the difference. Yeah, every wave I try to be in the pocket because that's part of the criteria. And I think when you're in the pocket, it sets you up for a better nose ride and more critical nose ride. So yeah. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to let you catch your breath. I'm going to let you get composed and get back out there pretty soon. So congratulations. Hopefully we see you back up here on the glass. Thank you, guys. A flawless performance from Soleil Erico takes her through to the semis. As we see some action now in the water on her backhand, Chloe Kalmon in the white and doing some great footwork for the finish. It was interesting because Chloe yesterday was riding a board built by Neko Carboni's son, Marcelo. Now she's on the Neko board, this green color board, the purple one built by her son, his son. New Advanced Surfboard is one of the biggest surfboard factories in Brazil coming out of Sao Paulo. And Chloe looked velvet on that. There was a lot of variety. I like even the use of the cross step turn on the inside. So it was nice to see the juxtaposition there of Honolulu Bloomfield and Chloe both riding waves in different heats but both going for world titles and both of them will receive big scores for those rides. Scores to drop now across the board for all four surfers in the lineup. Coming up after quarterfinal number three rounds out we'll have our final quarterfinal on the women's side of the draw with Rachel Tilly and Kalis Kaleopaa and those two also tight in that running for a world title as we take a look at live action with Sophia Kalein on her forehand finds a nice nose ride to start, whips it around and sets up this high line, glistening sunshine, nice quick five, and is just also trying to keep that board engaged in whatever pocket there is available on this wave, smaller size, and she's doing very well now to stick it right in the zone, in the money zone as she goes from that five to that 10, continues that perfect trim line, moving forward with grace and style and not really a flinch as she kicks out on the inside. That was so precise and clean and strong and the hold on those hang tens. I was talking to her shaper, Michael Takayama, on the sand earlier today, and he was telling me the enjoyment he gets from working with the surfers and fine tuning particular models for their surfing and the way they want to surf. And Sophia has just really embodied that precision in longboarding all event where she strikes those nose rides and always holds those tens through the critical sections. Yeah, she's really doing everything that she can to make sure she hits the points. Like Soleil was saying in that interview, that having that last opportunity, she wanted to do the best she could, but also the focus in staying in the pocket the entire time. Whether it's on the nose, whether it's engaging the rail to keep that board in that right position, knowing that's what the judges are rewarding. That last heat between Alice Lemoyne and Soleil Erico was one of the best heats of the event. Alice surfed phenomenally well. Her long hang tens were outstanding. But for me, Soleil, one of those rides in my eyes from watching it on the beach, it was, it was just pretty much a perfect ride. It was so dynamic, three incredibly long critical nose rides and, in, and an amazing couple of turns through the inside. I think that Soleil has got more to come, and I think we, we really could see a, a whole extra level coming through in the semifinals from her. And maybe for her as well, knowing that it was so close on this last one, that in the finish, they were divided by 0 0.10. Soleil won with a 16.53, and Alice a 16.43, fell out in second. As Honolua goes straight to the 10 in the pocket on a beautiful wave, and she kicks out in the closeout section. The cool thing about Honolulu's board that she's riding, the Izzy Rider, it's actually the model designed by Israel, the founder of the Mexi Log Fest. Wow. And, and uh, this Bing board here is a board that Honolulu has just got hold of and she loves. And she's worked with a lot of great shapers. She has some fantastic boards by Wayne Rich. She has a famous Two Crows board she's been really successful with. She has a Michael Takayama. She's had Stuarts in the past. She's had a number of boards. She likes that variety, but she's decided that this Bing is the board she wants to be on, and she's looking really strong on it. Yeah, I love that decision from her. You know, she got that feeling with just a couple of surfs, decided to purchase it off, to, off of a friend, and it's paying off very well for her this week at Malibu. And a lot of different surfers have been testing out different equipment. They've been riding what, you know, other surfers even swapping boards in the lineup throughout the week in preparation, which is nice to kind of get that feeling of variety to see what boards are working best. But also those surfers wanting to rely on equipment for a lot of them that they're well and familiar with, like someone like Sophia Colain, who tends to ride the same board so often. 
The focus now is going to be on this heat between Mason and Chloe. We've got under five minutes remaining. Mason's in priority. She's got an excellent score, an 8-3-3, and that's 6-8-3. Chloe needs a near-perfect 9.49, and she's up and riding. Up and riding with a beautiful fade takeoff, drops down the bottom of the wave, and then finds that 10 to 5 combination now on that next section, drives off the bottom as Mason is up and riding behind her with the backlit lighting in the sun in the afternoon now here as Chloe looks to almost duck into a, a quick barrel on the inside. Mason still up and riding, looking to close the door on Chloe Calmon. Gets some great lift out of that last section on the hang five and holds it for so long, finding it again. Just that little bit of footwork as she goes down now into that cheater five position, back to that tall five and steps off the board, and, or not off the board, but back to the tail. Lines it up for another great nose ride through to the inside section, poised and in control, finding that glide, that trim, and the Thomas crew will be going wild on the beach. That was incredible. The read of that wave, early on she committed to the high line. Chloe made a different choice. She committed to a lower line. Her degree of difficulty was much higher earlier in the ride compared to Mason, but the difference was, was that Mason connected that whole section. As we see live action, out of priority heat, Honolulu Bloomfield going for her fourth world title. Oh, she has so much on the line today as she nearly gets taken out by the lip on this one and she'll just sit down to ride through. Great commitment to that outside section, but she's also in that non-priority heat. So at the moment, sitting maybe a little deeper than she will be in the back half of her heat in two minutes time when she's in that priority situation and can set herself up. But for now, banking some scores. And we are still waiting for the second wave of Honolulu to drop in. She's sitting with a 5.67 for her first. Small scores for three, four, and five to drop, but waiting for that second wave of Hono. And we're down to two minutes, 25 seconds for our priority heat though where Mason Trimmer is sitting in the lead over Chloe Calmon. Chloe drops in a 4.83 for her last wave, so she's still chasing that 8.24, but we're waiting for a score to drop in for last of Mason, and it could improve on that 6.83. Yeah, I think it will. It, it's a 6.83 that she's going to replace most likely because it was an incredible wave, and the difference, A, Mason's wave was, was bigger, it was longer, compared to Chloe's, but Chloe took a lot of risk in the early section of her wave and got very deep and very low. She needed to take that risk because she knew she needed a big score. In contrast, Mason just took that elegant gliding high trim line and then she really knew she could ride that wave all the way through to the beach and really started to come alive with her nose riding through the middle towards the end of the wave and capped it off with a beautiful bit of rail work. That's right, for Mason, it was that middle nose ride where she suddenly just started lifting so high that she almost met the lip of the wave and then renegotiated down and just held on to that 10 to five for such an extended amount of time. So this could be a big moment for Chloe because she is going for a world title. There's not going to be long left, but she's sitting there with priority. She's going to be chasing a very big score, still waiting for that score to drop for Mason. So it could well replace the 6.83, meaning that Chloe might need even more than an 8.24. And Chloe coming into this event is ranked number two in the world, just behind Honolulu Bloomfield. Sitting above those third place surfers in Soleil, Erico, and Rachel Tilly, who's coming up next. And at number five in the world is Kalise Keleopa'a. So this title race for the women's side is outrageous as we see a score drop through for Mason Tremor. And it's a 7.67, which means Chloe Calmon requires a 9.07 with 30 seconds on the clock. So Chloe can do that given the wave, but with under 30 seconds, will there be an option? She's sitting there with priority. Mason, you can just see coming up into her inside. She's now sitting there next to her. Those women are both very close, but there's only 15 seconds left. So is the world title race dying out here for 2020 for Chloe Calmon? If it is, we know that she will be back next year as strong as ever. And if it is for Mason Trimmer, this is a massive result towards her requalification for next year's tour to get herself into that top eight to be getting some very valuable points. And the clock has run out though on the great Chloe Calmon of Brazil. A stronghold on the women's longboard tour for so long has fallen out of the title race. Mason Schremer continuing on towards requalification. And we're gonna go to a quick break as Honolulu Bloomfield is sitting in the lead over Sophia Colleen, Rachel Tilly and Kalis Keopaa paddling out for quarterfinal number four next.
Angela Sophia priority situation. Joining them in this quarterfinal overlapping situation, we're going to see Rachel Tilly in white and in green, Kalis Kaleopaa. Paddling right now and up and riding, that is Rachel Tilly going for the 5-10. Getting active right from the start of the heat. here for both of these ladies. One on their forehand, one on their backhand. Kalise kind of utilizing a little bit of the tail, trying to get speed in front, not able to make the section, but White on the other hand, making it all the way to the inside, opening ride for White, great start. Give it up for White. Last year, Honolulu Bloomfield, Bloomfield clinched her third world title as she raced through the surf ranch and scored herself a perfect 10 with an excellent finish. Sam Bleakley. Switched down spiral, and then she backed that up with the win. Uh, well, the win of the world title at Malibu is actually Alice Lemoyne that won the event at Malibu. But just getting to the semifinals was enough for Honolulu Bloomfield off the back of that first event in Noosa, that second event at the surf ranch, and then winning that third world title here in Hawaii. Going for that fourth world title, and it's been the Hawaiians and the Americans who have dominated the women's world longboard title since Chelsea Williams won for Australia in 2014. We had Rachel Tilley in 215 out of USA, Tori Gilkerson, our head judge, out of USA in 216. Then Honolulu Bloomfield won her first in 217, then Soleil Erico 218, and then back to back. Honolulu Bloomfield up and riding, going for her world title, Kalis Kelia Paha. Currently ranked number five in the world, but sitting on 5,000 points from the only event that she surfed in this year on the tour, the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, Kalis took out the win. So she's in a great position looking at those world title scenarios. And we'll get more into that as we get through these results for the quarterfinals. And finally, that score drops for Sophia Colhane. The judges had a lot to deal with, and they would have come back to that once they'd cleared out that finishing heat, which Unfortunately for Chloe, eliminated her chances of a world title, but progression for Mason Schremer. And Sophia rewarded strongly for what was a smaller wave, but the criticalness of those hang tens earned her a 7.10. Incredible. So scores in. Sophia's backed up the 7.1 with a 4. Honolua opened with that 5.67, dropped in that 7.23 was the score we were also waiting for for a while. We knew she was in that leading position, though, when we threw to the break. And now in our non-priority heat, Kalise has a couple of twos on the scoreboard, a 2.5 and a two. Rachel Tilly also with a first score to drop through. And it is our surfers in blue and red that have first priority in the water right now. And priority above all goes to Sophia Kalane in the blue. Now with the paddle chasing a 5.81 to get the advancing position past Honolulu Bloomfield. Quick footwork, finds the five. You can see that wind now coming into play causing a little bit of air brush to the surface of the water as she goes for that five to 10 combination and continues holding on to the five, connects for a second hang 10, has not let off of that front foot for so long, now finds that trim line and glides her way down to the bottom of the wave, sets herself up through that backwash, looking so graceful, so stylish, pedals back and the flow within this has been incredible. So many long nose rides, almost one continuous long nose ride from the back section with tens and fives combined. Goes down on the finish, got a bit of rail work in on the second half of the wave, and she's waiting for a second score. She feels the stoke. You could see the little fist clench there. That was beyond amazing nose riding. She was just locked on that five and pulling up into those tens regularly, and then mixed it up with the rail work. And See, you should have seen the acceleration she had off that off the top cutback. There's the setup, four steps to the nose. Locks into that trim line here, bang, holding it. And then this is where we get multiple tens. 
She's on that same hang five trim line, speeding in the wave, locks in that first 10, stays committed to that five, locks in that second 10, all the while on that same trim line into that third 10, and then four steps back, six steps back, and look at the acceleration here as she redirects and deals with that backside wash and then gets back up for another five and then holds that five as she pedals back again for one more nose ride and one more beautiful, sparkly, smooth, stylish cut back. And look at the body language here. As much as that didn't end as cleanly as she would have hoped, there was a sense of, yes, that was a good score. That's going to matter. Well, the judges are loving it. Score starting to trickle through from the panel. She needs a 5.81, and she gets an 8.17, an excellent score against the three-time world champion in Bloomfield. And that now puts Bloomfield chasing an 8.05 to take the win. Deservedly so. I mean, that was a, a, a functional, beautiful bit of longboarding. Speed, flow, style, grace, footwork, using all of the board, all of the wave. It ticks so many boxes. Had the wave been even bigger, maybe it could have gone even higher. But to get an 817 on that wave was really a good representation of the fact that Sophia can carry this all the way through to a world title. Oh, she absolutely could. She's right there. Her surfing has arrived. We've seen it developing from that 14-year-old final that we saw at Noosa back in 2020 against her good friend in Kalis Kaliopa'a, the 14 and 15-year-olds in the final together at a place where the surfer in the last heat, Mason Tremor, has spent so much time at Noosa. Mesa, Mason taking out the win over Chloe Calmon with a 16-point heat total in the last one, and she's with Strider now. Thank you, Shannon. Amazing. That was such a crazy heat. Um, you know, coming up against somebody like Chloe, do you feel like you have to rise to the occasion? Um, yeah, definitely. She's been one of my favorite surfers since I was really young. Like, I remember watching her in the world titles, like, when it was in China and stuff. Um, and she's just amazing. So I'm just, I'm a little bit, like, shocked, but I'm so happy to be moving on in the contest. And what about your endurance? How do you feel coming into this next heat? I'm definitely exhausted. It's a long paddle, but the paddle's, like, worth the waves you get. Um, I think I'm just going to have a lot of water, reapply some sunscreen, and chill out for a few minutes, I guess, till I surf again. <laughs> and does, does your adrenaline and the level of competition just make you rise to the occasion? Yeah, I think, like, with you kind of have to be on your best game, like, especially in the finals day, like, the girls are all surfing so good. So just got to be on top of it. You can rest when it's over, like, ready to go. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations, and, well, I've said it before, but I hope to see you back up here on the glass. Thank you. Thanks. Huge result for Mason Trimmer into the semifinals of an event with 10,000 points on the line, the World Championship event here. An incredible result for her so far, and she was coming into this event ranked number nine in the world in that position, and she'll be looking to increase that ranking with more points dropping towards her name. She's so humble. I mean, that was a really beautiful posty interview. And like she said, she's already exhausted because the paddle, the length of the ride, the heat, the potential for dehydration, there's a lot of elements. And the surfers who are going all the way to the final today, they will have surfed a number of times. And they've got to deal with the car park culture, the car park scene, the beach scene, the fact that there's not really an opportunity to escape this space. You have to immerse yourself in it. You have to get positive energy from the social experience at Malibu to bring the best out of you because you can't really go off and hide in the bushes here. It is a very social experience. That's exactly it. Down on the beach here, everyone's chatty. Everyone's feeling it. We've got the VIP section as well with some great friends of the surf community that have come down to watch the action today. The, the athletes do have a little zone there where they can kind of tuck in underneath the shade and have their own tables and stuff set up. But it's still a very social environment. And so for all these surfers, they're, they're draining energy in so many different ways throughout the day that it's so important to keep that pace, keep that check with so much on the line coming towards the finals. Absolutely. You'll, you'll notice some surfers, they thrive off that energy. They like to just be around that buzz and, and, and that develops the confidence for them or the, or the space by being in the present to perform at their best. Other surfers will try to find their own quiet zone. Some surfers like to kind of align with their family, with their parents, with their children to find that quiet zone. Others will just creep off into a kind of more uncrowded area, but essentially it's hard to find that quiet space here. So a lot of these women, they will really just be immersing themselves in the buzz of Malibu. Well, let's take, at the, take a look at the deep stats. Powered by Hydro Flask for Honolulu Bloomfield, an incredible 11 career wins on the longboard tour, 69 heat wins, and that very high heat win percentage of a 78.41. As we see Rachel Tilly now going for a soul arch, hang five to start, locks in for the 10. 
pedals back to that middle third and gets that little feeling of the curl of the wave. Back into the hang five, pedals off of it and looks almost to go for that head dip if she can. She's gonna pedal back and go for that re-entry on the finish for a different kind of finish than we're seeing from a lot of the surfers at the end of the wave. And she'll be backing up her 5.50. That, that was super cool, Shannon. That was a beautiful wave. Honolulu now up and riding and locks into that hang 10 to start. Quick 10, back to the five, back to the middle third of the board and back to the five again. Locks in and holds onto it for a long time. You can see those adjustments of that back foot making sure that that board can keep that trim line and the surfers don't nosedive or just have to fall off of the wave. And she's doing an excellent job of staying on the nose throughout this entire one. Starts to race away with her as well and she's just getting that feel as she pumps down the line with a little bit of speed, grabs that rail to execute around the section and it closes out in front of her. And a beautiful display of longboarding from the three-time world champion. So she's chasing at 8. 0, 5, and, and that might get close. That was a really excellent bit of surfing on that 9-6 being bored. As we see, answering back, toes on the nose, our heat leader, Sophia Colhane, soul arching through that hang 10 with style. Uh, incredible. Sophia, she's got that 8-1-7 now. She's looking to improve on that 7.1 in the background. It's a smaller size wave, but you can see that she's just feeling that rhythm with the ocean, keeping that trim line, keeping all of her body movements calm and collected as well. And possibly going for the priority in the paddle battle there. Is she now ahead of Honolulu? Was that a tactical kick out? She it must, was. Yes, Absolutely. there we go. Smart, smart surfing there. She knew there was no more scoring potential and she knows that Honolulu is gonna drop a massive score on that wave because she would have sensed just from the, 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 the size of the wave. And she knows that this is three times world longboard champion as we get the replay. Four steps to the tip, bang, here's the five. Locks in nice and high, there's the 10. Really strong nose ride. The judges have been rewarding those critical 10s early in the wave, and this is a very critical long nose ride into a second hang 10. Keeping that same trim line again for another locked five, sole arching into the third hang 10 there, another five pedals back here and the wave really speeds up and she climbs and drops. See how in the pocket that board fits beautifully in the curl of the wave, climbing and dropping and that section there just racing along, but she already did a lot of that damage out back. She would have liked to have had a little bit of space on the face at the end to just jam a rail direct, some kind of critical surfing from the tail or rail, but answering back Sophia Colhane. But and this, this is was Rachel. the 5.5, the opener for Rachel Tilly. So getting a first look at it here, she found that nose ride to start, finds that trim line as she comes through to the inside with the sole arch, gets that hang five to start, pedals off of it. And a smaller size wave, she's in that non-priority heat, so just keeping things busy, getting scores on the board. She feel confident kicking out on this one, knowing that she's got that 5.5 on the board. Beautiful use of the rail as well. And Rachel's changed up her equipment today in comparison to what she was riding yesterday. This board is a replica of the board that she surfed at the US Open for the Vans Duct Tape Inv Invitational, where she walked away with a semi-final finish and decided with the size today, she wanted a board that would really allow her to engage the rail. I love that sole arch on her 4.8 here. Look at the style here. That narrower tail still working very well and the body language, just look at that finesse. Malibu style all the way back up for the third nose ride here. And then just locked beautifully in the pocket there, low in the wave and just climbs that float to end. It's a 4.8, so not as big as that first ride, that 5.5, but there's still going to be that whole second half of the heat for Rachel and Kaylees because it's 5 minutes 25 seconds left for Sophia and Honolulu with big scores possibly to drop for both of those surfers. Scores coming through now for the last of blue and red. For blue, Sophia, it's a 4.17. It doesn't factor into her top two. For red, scores are dropping through, and Honolulu gets a 6.00, which doesn't meet the excellent 8.05 requirement. And the situation remains the same as we're at five minutes on the clock for quarterfinal number three, and Sophia Colain is hanging on to the lead. That was an interesting score. I think the nose riding was excellent, but the wave didn't allow the variety. After she came through most of that ride with three critical tens, the wave just didn't open out to allow a 
the rail engagement to do that roundhouse cutback, that drop knee cutback, that change of direction that would have ticked some of the variety boxes. So that's why it was just a six, but she's up and riding now chasing an 8.05. And she would have heard that information, processed it from the judges, knowing that she still needs an excellent score. Goes for that five to 10 and gets, gets caught up in that top of the wave. She's doing the right thing. She's, you know, she had to commit to a critical nose ride there. She went for it, but once she started hanging 10, she recognized that she could see down the line of that wave and she knew there wasn't much more scoring potential. Sophia Colhane getting in priority, kicking out because she knew that 417 wasn't going to increase her score by continuing to ride it through to the inside was a wise decision because it meant that she was ahead of Honolulu paddling back out and she's sitting there in the driving seat with priority with just three minutes 45 seconds remaining she's competing with a very good friend of hers but she's also competing for a world title yeah this is an incredible moment all four of the surfers in the water right now with so much on the line they all have that potential to walk away a world champion today as we're down to three minutes and 30 seconds for Sophia and for Honolulu and for Sophia right now, this is a massive achievement to be sitting in the driving seat to hold priority and to have the highest wave of the heat in the 817, to have backed it up well with that 7.10, and to have the three-time world champion who we would think would have that control dynamic in this heat. It's how Honolulu typically does things. She takes control early and she maintains that control. To have her chasing an 8.05 right now, Sophia has done so well within this heat to manage all of the different things coming through. But we must never rule out the three times world champion. She, time and time again, has got the big scores in dying seconds of crunch heats. And what I love about Sophia's run through this heat is the fact that she got that 7-1-0 on a much smaller wave, but the judges really recognize the technicalities of those critical nose rides and really rewarding it high. So they, she surfed the kind of you know wave beyond what the wave could give. And in that, that, that's a reminder that sometimes you don't always need to get the biggest, longest waves. If you really do display dynamic, high degree of difficulty surfing, you can get very high scores. Yes, and you can surf those scores up. You can also be given a wave with easily excellent potential and surf it down and not capitalize on what it has available. We can see a little bit of a line rolling through here. Sophia staying very close to Honolulu as they're paddling farther and farther up first point. They've gone way up the point, so there's a possibility that they might be too far up the point to make this section as we see chasing an 8.05, going for her fourth world title, coming unstuck, Honolulu Bloomfield, because they went so far up the point. And she had to have a, a chance on that one. She had to go, but Sophia is making such smart strategic maneuvers right now in paddling her up the point, in forcing Honolulu to go on a wave like that, in putting that pressure and applying it with priority for Sophia right now. I'm, I'm really impressed with the way that she's handling. She's been holding on to priority for at least the back half Sorry, the back five minutes of this heat, maybe up from that seven minute mark. And she gained that priority, Sam, when she took off on that last wave and she kicked out early, recognizing that Honolulu was still on the inside after getting stuck behind that closeout. And since then, Sophia has been able to maintain control of this heat. And that's been really impressive. Absolutely. And there's still a minute left. So there's still opportunities for both of these women to get a wave. It looks like they're, they're changing position. There's a possibility there that this set could be interesting. Sophia remains in priority. Honolulu chasing that 8.05. Again, they're getting lured further up the point. Is it going to be too deep for them to make that section? You can see that Honolulu has got the inside position there. So she's going to maybe kind of coax Sophia into the wave, but they're really scrambling for this one. It looks like a good one as well, but my fear is that they might have gone too far at the point to make the section all the way through. Wow, down to 30 seconds on the clock. Sophia Kalein about to take out the three-time world champion and crush her dreams at a possible fourth world title. We're in the quarterfinals, and we've got surfers in the next heat that will still be surfing through their quarterfinal for Rachel and for Kalis. But Sophia and Honolulu, Sophia with that priority, is going to stay so tight to her as this set starts to roll through. And that buzzer begins to sound. And Sophia is up and riding, but I can hear the beach announcer saying that it is after the buzzer. And this wave won't count. And an incredibly well-served, strategic, 
and beautiful from a style flow grace perspective of longboarding goes to Sophia Kalane advancing through into the semifinals. Welcome back to the Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. And we just saw the battle of two O'Neill surfers in Sophia Kalane and Honolulu Bloomfield go down. And it was the grommet in Sophia that gets the win and advances into the semifinals. We're now in our last heat for the women's quarterfinals. Up and riding, well, during the break, up and riding was Kalis Kaliopa'a, who is chasing a 4.23 at the moment to advance through because she scored a 6.07 for this wave, Sam. That was great. Opening nose ride, uses a switch stance. She's going to try to meet Sophia Colhane in the second semifinal and surfing velvet smooth there. All the way through to the inside using that combination of rail work, footwork, turns, nose riding, quick 10 again, bringing in the functionality of the switch stance and cross-stepping switch stance and kicking out Cleanly. I know that Wingnut loves a good kick out. So Wingnut, if you're watching, you would have enjoyed that from Kalis Kaleo Paha. I certainly enjoyed that. The Hawaiian fans all over the world would be loving that. That was exceptional. That was beautiful. Wingnut taught me about the, the kick out calling heats with you guys early in my career in China and then in Taiwan. And some beautiful surfing coming through from Kalis Kaleo Paha. With that 6.07, that does still have her sitting in second place position, but she's a lot closer to Rachel Tilly than she was before taking off on that. Rachel Tilly sitting on a 5.5 .5 and a 4.80. She's holding on to priority, and we've got 15 minutes on the clock. And you can see Khalees do there doing the classic stand-up on a big, long board in the water to see what sets are coming on the horizon. So this, this now frees them up because there's not an overlapping heat. We're down to the men's semifinals. It doesn't overlap with this fourth women's quarterfinal. So they've got free reign of the lineup here. In priority is Rachel. But Khalees is just looking to replace that 2.50, deciding to go on this one, Shannon. All right, here we go. Setting up that first section. Picks that high line to start. Quick 10. Pedals off of the 5. Back to the 5 now. Engages that rail. Wraps back into the pocket. Setting this up nice and smooth. So far, flawless surfing. This wave also cleans up that little bit of chop that we have on the face is gone as she comes through to this oily, glassy section and just is linking everything together with style, flow, and grace. That backhand nose riding dynamic, keeping that board right there, high and tight in the pocket. A nice wrap around again. 
as she comes through for a final nose ride and goes down on the finish, but really pushed that risk and commitment to the end. Yeah, I don't think going down on the finish there will matter too much because everything else was exceptional. Her mum, Malia, will absolutely love that look back on the nose. So will her dad, JP, another great surfer, a great longboarder. That was really, really sensational. Smooth, committed, but also the whole way through grace and style was very evident. She never looks flustered. She always measures that footwork and that rail work in line with the pace of the wave. And for me, it's some of the most stylish longboarding we're seeing in the world right now from Kelly Kelly-Opaha. She really has been that, the most stylish. She's also had that flow within her surfing that's come through for the last few years. We've really seen it kind of come alive. And now that strategic side of her surfing, I think her heat surfing is really coming into play. She's still a young competitor. She's just finished high school. She's now taking a little bit of time off before she begins studies in something else and gets to focus just on surfing. And it's exciting to think of, of such a young surfer like this with the the years that she has ahead of her in competitive surfing when she's already right here at the top. Four steps up to the tip, gets the five, gets the 10, stays on that high line. Just a little wash of the water off her nose there whilst hanging five. Sets herself up with a beautiful rail work into a bottom turn, again a high line. There's the five, there's the 10, back up for another five. And there's the super stylish, cool look back. Absolutely love that. And look at the way she just lifts her arms like the wings of a bird to just Gain that balance, that elegance, that soul, that smooth Hawaiian style. This is a great representation of beautiful longboarding here. And the control onto that last five, so deep in the pocket, does take a fall on the inside, but it's going to be an excellent score. And there it is. It's an 8.00. Now puts Tilly with an 8.57 requirement. Surfer in white, Rachel Tilly sitting with priority. And a well-deserved excellent score goes to our surfer in green, Kalis Kaliopa'a. And she's really reinforcing the magic of this board, this 9-2 that she won the event in Huntington on. She looks extremely happy on it, and a shape of Kai Salas is going to be on the sand rooting for her. In that last heat, we saw O'Neill team, team rider Sophia Culhane take the win, and she's into the semifinals on the glass with Strider. Thank you very much. Wow, what a heat. And you were, uh, well, you were saying that she's actually gotten the better of you three times already this year. Uh, yeah, for sure. In Manly and the U.S. Open, we've had all quarters together, and she's gotten the best the last tw t two times, and this is the one that counts, I guess, but Hona's an amazing surfer, and that was a really good heat. <laughs> Tell me about, I mean, I know you're breathing heavy, so there's a lot of physical aspect that plays into these heats. Uh, yes, for sure, especially those paddle battles, and the priority game's really difficult, but you got to know what you're yeah, doing, and yeah. <laughs> uh, and for me, the waves couldn't get any better, size-wise and length of ride. Is this one of the better events you've ever surfed? Uh, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, the waves are pumping. Yesterday was a little small, but I'm so happy that there's waves, and I'm just, that was really good heat, and uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, sounds like you're happy. Sounds like you got some momentum, so we're going to let you get back, rest, and get ready for your next heat. Thank you. Congratulations, Hono. Great to hear from Sophia, and she's into the semifinals, can hardly contain her froth, and we'll have to put a lot more together to make it through that next semifinal. Yeah, I mean, you can really see that, that that meant a lot to her, but she's, you know, the momentum is with her. She's in the semifinal. She'll be meeting the, the, the winner of this heat. We've got Rachel Tilly up against Kelis Kelly Opaha. Rachel is chasing that 8.57. Soleil and Mason in that first semi. Sophia, who will it be, Kelis or Rachel? Semifinals are being set here for the Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. It is a beautiful day here. That wind has just started to come into play, but it's going to be a great day to crown our finalists. That swell pulse through. We've had plenty of action, and it's been almost too much to keep up with. I mean, Rachel Tilly, she's still so young, just 24 from San Clemente. You know, Lerna Dahini and Sano rides the beautiful Josh Martin shape, son of the great Terry Martin, one of the iconic Californian longboarders and shapers. She won her world title in 215, and she has a bachelor's degree in sports management from Bond University on the Gold Coast. Extremely smart woman. I know her whole family, Glenn, Laurie, brother Michael. They're on the sand watching. They're rooting for her. She's opted for the uh, rounded pintail today. She was on the square tail yesterday. It looks like 
the board is going extremely well, but she's chasing a big score, an 8.57. And this is a great matchup between the two of them because in the 2020 season, just before the pandemic kicked in, when Kalise Kaliopaa won her world, sorry, won the world uh, tour event at Noosa, she finished out that win saying that her goal in life at that stage, she was still underneath that, she was in that 15, 15 year old range, was to take out Rachel Tilly's youngest ever World Longboard Championship title, which Rachel won at a young 17 years old. Now, Kalise didn't make that requirement, and that still sits with Rachel Tilly for the world record, as she's now up and riding, perched on that hang 10 from the five, back to that five, and now setting herself up for this next section. Nice engagement of the rail and that pop and drive off the bottom. As she goes into another hang five sole arch to that hang 10, Kalise now with an opportunity behind, and Rachel finding that style, that flow, and that grace, that board looking so smooth under her feet. Back to a sole arch hang 10 as Kalise goes switch stance out the back and faces the ocean. Rachel now finishing off so smooth on the inside, and Kalise with more to come as she walks her way to the nose, perch on that hang five as and she'll decide to kick out early to get the priority on the paddle over Rachel Tilly. That was so interesting. Rachel had a lot of body language on that ride. It was very expressive. There was flamboyance. There was arms in the air. There was, there was soul arches. There was movement. Kelis had a more refined, minimalist approach to that ride. The body language was less, but both of the women equally dynamic as far as nose riding and rail work. Rachel had a lot of extremely strong hang tens on that ride. Kalis had a really good backside hang ten, but she decided to kick out early to get priority on the replay there. We can see those four steps up to the tip and that really strong opening ten was, was absolutely dynamic from Kalis. And just look at the composure here in that steep section, just recognizing that just by switching stance and facing the wave, she might get a little bit more front foot acceleration. And here she recognizes that, yes, there's a little bit more scoring potential, but after this nose ride here, she kicks out because she wants to get priority because she's sitting on that 8.0. Rachel's wave, Shannon, I mean, wow, look at this, 5, 10, Hands up, full sole arch five, back into a sole arch ten, climbs and drops, and then slashes movement back up to the tip there. Six steps up for a five, another sole arch, right hand in the air, a tight ten there. So two really strong nose rides, a lot of climbing and dropping and really good rail release, acceleration from the board from the top and bottom, and then a really dynamic hang ten, sole arch, hands up on the inside. So this is going to be potentially an excellent score for Rachel. And if it's not excellent, it'll be borderline. It'll certainly put her back in the mix to book a spot in the semi-final. Scores coming through now for Rachel Tilly. She does require a big 8.57 to take the leading position away from Kalise. Kalise with a score to drop as well. And both of them still paddling their way back out to the top of the lineup. Scores trickling through now for Rachel Tilly, and it looks like it may fall short of that excellent range, but it's going to chip away at that requirement. It's going to improve on her high score at the moment of a 5.50. So just waiting for that average to come through from the judging panel. Scores dropping through now for last of Kalise as well. And we're down to 6 minutes, 20 seconds on the clock, and our young surfer in green still sitting in the lead. The Waikiki competitor drops in a 5.6 for her last wave, so it doesn't change the situation. Rachel Tilly drops in a 7.07 .07 for her last wave, and now her requirement is much less. It's down to a 7.01 to get the advancing position. So this is extremely interesting because Kelis opted to kick out of that last ride, and she didn't get a score to replace that 6.07. Would she have got a score bigger than 6.07 and put more pressure on Rachel if she stayed with the wave? Or was it a better decision like she has done to kick out and get priority relying on that 6.07 and that 8.0? I feel like the strength of those scores is coming from those outside sections. That It grows as it comes down the line. But that decision to kick out, probably smart because maybe she could have increased it by... 0.5 or one point, but that's not going to greatly increase that requirement on Tilly. Now she's sitting in that position where she's got dominance, she's got the highest heat total so far, and she's got that priority as we're down to that five minute mark. And it looks like there's a wave coming, so we might get an opportunity for a little bit more chance for Rachel to get that 7.01. She's carrying that 5.5. Kalisa's low score is that 
7.07. I love what I saw from Rachel on that 7.07. It was really expressive. I love the, I love the hands in the air, sole arches on the nose rise. I like the liveliness of the board, the flow that she had. I think that she can definitely get that 7.10, even perhaps not on the perfect set wave, perhaps even out of priority, out of position, there's still the chance to get that score. I completely agree. Now, looking at the head-to-head -head matchups between these two, this is their third head-to-head -head matchup, and this is the first time this far in the draw into finals day for the quarterfinals. Prior to this, Rachel Tilly has taken out Kelis Kaleopaa in both of their matchups, which were in the 2019 season. Rachel took out Kelis at the 2019 Longboard Classic in New York, and then also at the 2019 Taiwan Open World Longboard Championships. So those were great battles, but earlier in the rounds, it's nice to see them both having now met up this far along and setting themselves up with that world title conversation around both of them in this heat. The surfer that advances through still has that opportunity to win a world title, and the surfer that falls out will lose that chance. It's such an interesting situation, that kick out from Kelis, a real strategic maneuver to get herself into the priority situation because for all she knew, Rachel could have got the score she needed to move into first position, and Kelis would have known that she needed to answer back on a set wave. She's also recognizing that those opening sections are sometimes what's really making the difference with the bigger scores. So she probably just felt on that wave that there wasn't much more scoring potential through the inside and getting priority was a much smarter move. And she certainly, she certainly like laid the gauntlet and said, you know, I'm doing this for a reason and, and, and made it clear that I'm kicking out, I'm getting priority. Yeah, it, it was a great decision for her, especially considering still, even though today there are a lot more sets rolling through, it's still slow and sleepy in between. And so with this, you know, she kicked out with that priority above that five minute mark. It's a few minutes down now and she's still sitting with it and there hasn't been a rideable wave, a scoring wave that's rolled through. So we could have that as Kelis puts her hand to her watch just to ask or to where her watch would be sitting to ask for that time update from the beach announcers. She checks it as well just to make sure that she pushed that button the moment the buzzer sounded and has herself set up with that two minutes 34 seconds on the clock. World title on the line right here in the water. Rachel Tilly chasing a 7.01. Kelis Kelio Paha going for her first world title. She started last season's campaign, which was delayed by the pandemic so strongly with that win in Noosa. We had that year out and then the surfers came back to the surf ranch and then crown champions at Malibu. Kalis was a contender for the world title last year, but it fell short on the Malibu result. And is this going to be her year? She's going to be surfing against her very close friend, Sophia Colhane, if the situation doesn't change. A repeat of Noosa 2020. Those two in the water together. Absolutely. But this is a repeat in the semis. And again, consequences all the way through. Soleil and Mason will be in that first semifinal. Sophia already booked her spot in that second semifinal. Rachel, sitting out of priority, just needs a 7.01. Down to one minute, 30 seconds on the clock. And in the season so far, Kalise has only entered into one event, the Vans Duct Tape Invitational at the US Open in Huntington Beach, and she took out the win. For Rachel Tilly, she wasn't able to compete on last year's World Longboard Tour, had to pull out due to being stuck in Australia for work. So although she would have been one of the front runners, actually in that world title conversation, based off of her Noosa results, she was right there in the lineup, decided to bow out, and got those call-ups for this year's tour as she did then miss that requalification getting herself a quarterfinal finish for the first event at the Sydney Surf Pro in Manly, then locked, locked her in for a call-up to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, where Rachel found a semi-final finish, proved her worth, got herself up there in the rankings, and was right here again with at least a quarterfinal finish as we're down to 45 seconds on the clock. And Kalis is the only goofy footer left in the event for both men and women. Great find. So will a goofy footer take the win here? 35 seconds left. Is there going to be a way for Rachel to give it a go? Kalise will certainly get priority when that set does come through, if it does in the last 28 seconds. Wow, and now I'm thinking through that last exchange where Rachel got in that 7.07, .07, so it was her highest wave. Could she have done anything more? Maybe it was the wave that wasn't going to facilitate getting into that excellent range because she surfed it so well. Super lively, super expressive. The variety was there, and the, the, also the variety in the nose rides. That's what I liked about it. We've seen a lot of critical nose riding, but generally it'll be the same type of hang 10 that the surfers are doing. But Rachel 
can be proud of the way she surfed. She gave that everything. She's already got a world title in the can, and she knows she'll be back for more in the future. And she is such a fan of the sport. She'll be cheering on from the beach, as well as the rest of the competitors that we've lost from the draw. And Kalise Kaleopa'a will be meeting up with her good friend, Sophia Culhane, in the second women's semifinal. And we've got more action to come, so stay tuned right after this. the wave never came so there's nothing you can do but it's police through stand by guys we're just on that couple minute break resetting the computer the monitor and everything 30 minutes for the semi <laughs> Welcome back to the Cuervo Classic Malibu Championships presented by O'Neill. And we are getting ever so closer to crowning a world champ here. I'm Kaipo, joined by Megan Gordinas, AKA Auntie Megs, mm -hmm. you can find her on Instagram, as well as Matt Chanoski, AKA The Waxed. You can find him on Instagram as well. And thank you for joining us, Megs. Thank you for having me again. It's a uh it's a, this is an exciting day. I don't even know where to start on what's going on with this day. You're feeling it as well? <laughs> I'm, I, I, are you sweating? Because I'm sweating. I just are did you a sweating? wardrobe change. I'm, I'm super shiny right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm sweating like crazy. <laughs> hey, you guys, let's take a look at the bracket right now. Because look, we only have four remaining for the men's. And the story right now is whoever wins this event wins a world title map. Dun, dun, dun. Huh. Phenomenal. We've already seen mind-blowing surfing. <laughs> the scary part is it's still going to come, and we've got some wild heats about to uh, unpack. Well, let's take it to this uh, semifinal number one. They're on the water. We're moments from the start. Actually, we just started eight seconds ago. Taylor Jensen, three-time world champ, out in the red jersey versus Harrison Roach in the blue jersey. Your assessment of this matchup, Megan? Oh, this is, the, I, to me, every heat so far is going to be a final in my head. Everyone is on their top A game. Um, Taylor being that, you know, he has high performance type of style, but he switched over, is riding a single fin. Harrison, Mr. Mr. King of Noosa, I would say. Yep. Right? Yep. And uh, I'm excited to watch this. This is going to be an absolute throwdown. Matt, your assessment. Uh, it's both surfers are at the peak of their careers. Uh, I think Taylor's always surfed exceptional at contest level, and um, Harry's put in some uh, incredible, mind-blowing performances uh, at more of the invitational events in the past. But this year, both surfers have lifted to a new level, and we're seeing that slight onshore ruffle. Uh, the tide's dropped out. We're seeing the incoming tide, but that predicted onshore wind, Kaipo. 
Yeah, we were expecting a bit of a sea breeze as uh, the land inland heats up and creates that convective action. Here we go. It's going to be Harry. Harrison Roach starts off. Scratching wow. a five through a critical oh. section. Has to grab on. Goes into the lazy boy position there. Just hanging on to his board. And that's going to be it for Harrison Roach. Right behind him, Taylor Jensen. Nice five. High line. Trimming through this section. Has to skip through this next section. Sees it breaking way down the line. He has to kick out. And Megs. We had Cassia Midor here in the booth earlier, and she explained that at this swell angle, you can paddle up the point too deep very easily. Yeah, and it looks like both of them did, and Taylor is opt out to kick out of that first wave, is getting on a smaller one just to stay busy in this heat. Beautiful carving turn. Right back up to the nose. Really sticking with this nose ride. Yeah. And this is the kind of surfing that we expect from Taylor Jensen. A mix of powerful rail surfing, just like oh, that. That's the roundhouse I wanted to see. <laughs> I've been then, waiting for those. And a little classic drop knee, but he's really waiting for the walls. Because remember, you got to surf to the criteria. He's got to find mm -hmm. some nose time as well, Matt. Well, and that he has, but he's making the most of it, stepping straight up there, trying to keep that board in the whitewash. And in that case, the, the wave just didn't wall out. You know why? That set that these two were too deep for reeled halfway to the pier in front of the lifeguard tower behind us in the commentary booth. They were three, four really good waves. And there's a lot of reverb and a lot of whitewash on Taylor's wave. But he did surf what was in front of him really well. I think those were the biggest sets that came in so far. All day. Absolutely. Yeah, all day. That was well over Harrison's head on that first wave. And here we have Taylor just trying to get through. You can see that uh, white water, that chop. And on a single fin board, in fact, on any surfboard, you can feel, that was a gorgeous turn there, you mm -hmm. can feel uh, all that turbulence. And, and Taylor, smooth, smooth silk, really quiet upper body. Oh, that roundhouse. And lost the fin a little bit there on the whitewash. And this is where it just bowls out. He almost looked like he almost flicked out there. And here, just getting a little touch in the nose, a tan, beautiful. But nothing super critical, but a great starting wave, given that they just missed the set. And if history is to repeat itself, it might be a little bit of time before the next one. Mm -hmm. Here we go. This is, uh, is going to be a quick one for Harry. Yeah, he was in and out. He see, it seems like they were sitting too deep. He looked like he was about to try and pull into that barrel. But that was, a very, that was the biggest set of the day, I think. For sure. And even the fact Harry went to a stretch five there indicated that that wall, which it really did stretch out a long way, usually the surfers, including Cunniella, and uh, Harry have been going straight to that 10. Mm -hmm. So he's obviously, all right, that's more of a safety maneuver, you yeah. know, because they are leashless. Mm -hmm. Leashless because they're walking up and down the board. The leash gets in the way. Yes, it does. Trust me, I've, I've had a, a couple fumbles myself, walking to the nose, thinking I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get to hang 10, and all of a sudden I get tripped over by a, a leash. So Quarterfinal number four was won by Khalees Kaleo Pa'a. Let's hear from Khalees. She's against the glass with Sam Bleakley. Thanks so much, Kaipo. From one great Hawaiian to another emerging great Hawaiian. Kalise, that was velvet smooth. How does it feel to be in this semifinal? Um, it feels really nice. I get to share my semifinal with literally one of my best friends. Um, so I, there's so many different emotions, but I'm super stoked to be surfing with her. And you surfed against Sophia in that final in Noosa. And how does it feel to come up against her again, someone you know so well, but World titles on the line for both of you. Yeah, um, I wasn't really thinking about the world title, just going heat by heat. But surfing with Sophia, it's really fun. And it kind of takes off the stress because I'm just really comfortable surfing with her back at home. And then that final in Noosa was just really fun. And it was a first for the both of us. So getting a first like semifinal with here too, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And so many great Hawaiian world longboard champions, Dwayne, Dino, Bonga, to name just a few. As far as Hawaiian women longboarders, who do you really look up to? And who's inspired you most? Obviously, Auntie Rail Sun. I mean, like, she's one of a kind. She's a beautiful person. I never got to meet her, but listening to all her stories that all of my aunties, like, tell from her, you know, that's what you want to be. Obviously, you'll be remembered as a world champion, but importantly, you'll be known as the kind of person you are outside of the water. But I look up to all of the Hawaiian women in my life, too. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job embodying that Hawaiian style. Some messages for your fans back home? Uh, all my friends and family back at home watching who have, like, always supported me, um, my community back at home, my grandparents, my cousins, and everybody. Thank you. Back to you, Kaipo. Thank you, Sam. And, oh, man, actually, we actually have the auntie right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lise. 
on the set. Your thoughts, Megs? This is uh, close to your heart. I, I'm not gonna lie. I cried. I cried. I didn't. I had to walk away from everyone. I was freaking out. I'm still kind of shaking, honestly. Um, but it's the semifinal between Sophia and Kilis is gonna be. They're best friends. Yeah. And they surf. They hang out in and out of the water constantly. They're tied to each other's hips. So it kind of reminds me of the rivalry between Sis and I, Kaylee and Moniz yes, and I. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. When that horn blows, friend, no friends. Yeah. That's but, it. But you got to be proud of both of them. Oh, my gosh. So proud I, of how, come they fa uh, how far they've come and mm. how young they are. Yeah. Jeez. 17, I was like, yeah, I get to drive a car. <laughs> and that's it. Like, not a world title at stake. Uh, both are 17? Yes. All right. Wow. Mm-hmm. Great info. Okay, we got some numbers to go through, Matt. That open uh, second wave for Taylor Jensen, 6.83. During that interview, though, we saw Harrison Roach go to town, and we're waiting for that score back to live action here with Taylor Jensen. This is wave number three for Jensen. Fives through that difficult section. And There's a lot of able to stay through that. Megan. Oh, nice off the top. You know me, I'm a high-performance surfer. You know I love to see that kind of stuff. Oh, my gosh. It's like feeding me candy when I see these. <laughs> well, Taylor's got a great mix of both, you know, a modern approach, but still surfing within the criteria with some great footwork. Maybe a little bit too much energy there to get caught behind, but he's going to get a little reform on the inside, Matt. Maybe some tip time, and he gets it. Incredible wave there for Taylor. He had a little, a few obstacles to deal with, including the chop, but he surfed this one all the way through. If he was considering... Uh, running around in an earlier heat, you know, he's wondering about conserving energy with his shoulders. I tell you what, there's no jelly legs out there because if you were feeling a little wobbly, you know, jelly legs are something you refer to as a competitor when you've surfed a lot and you start to really feel it in your thighs and your hamstrings, your calves. You can't tell because we'll watch this replay. It was pretty impressive surfing. Mm -hmm. Well, first we're going to hit this replay here, Megan. Talk us through this. This is Harrison Roach. We're still waiting for the score. Harrison with this high line, hanging 10. Oh, with that sole arch. Walking back, big, actually quick setup turn. Trimming, trimming. Oh, he's in that pocket. It's like oh. his feet are getting barreled. Perfect timing. Reading this wave very well. And the face of the wave actually glasses out in when you the more inside you get. So Just really utilizing that. Sick. Matt, the footwork yeah. so impressive by Harrison Roach on this wave. His board was in trim the whole wave mm -hmm. uh, and that comes from old mouse vintage style surfing we're incorporating the old and that is modern longboarding and here's the exponent and no better exponent than taylor jensen in trim on the nose going through the section on a set wave and driving up over the top the traditional roller coaster with a bit of power put inside and on the inside rail drop knee carve and straight up in trim and on the nose again locked into the pocket Beautiful combination of maneuvers. It is not a nose ride contest. We are look watching a longboard event with a controlled footwork, rail maneuvers. We're looking for tight positioning in the pocket and, of course, nose riding. And Taylor finishing this off with another 10. Wow. And they really are. Meg's on top of their game, both of these surfers. Yeah, they are. This is why I love longboarding so much. You really utilize every piece of the board. And Taylor's a big guy, so on that hang five trimming across that face of the wave, you could tell he was definitely leaning on his back foot mm -hmm. and really just barely touching that nose, but he was very light on that front foot. Sure. And that's, that's definitely what you need to do on that type of wave. Yeah, contrast of styles in those two approaches. We're still waiting for Taylor Jensen's score, but the score for Harrison Roach, a nine-point ride. Big number for Roach, and he's back up and at it again. Gets that trim. Just like you were talking about, trim line, beautiful. Right again, up into the nose, matching the speed of the wave, now turning through the middle of the board. Some rail control has to come around this section for Roach. Calm upper body, oh. great footwork, perched with the 10, wrapping around in a classic style. Harrison Roach slows down one more time and is just toying with the streaking beautiful oh wave my here word. at first point malibu harrison roach putting on a show of classic longboarding beautifully done 10 point ride 
I think that was pretty close. I, I held my breath the whole time. Did anyone else? Double goosebumps. Oh my gosh, that was insane. His lines were absolutely perfect, and that, that wave was so clean. Can't wait for the replay. Uh, just trying to Wrap remain my some hand. Yeah, body composure. Okay, here we go. A whip turn out the back. Upright 10. Uh, oh. Look at him. That was uh, Lance Carson, if ever I've seen it. That transition is all technician. And here, steering, driving from the front third. He gets a little caught behind here. It may keep the score down a little bit, but he makes up for it, Megs. Wow. Straight into an arch 10, fully in the pocket. Hips extended forward. And that gouging carve to get him deeper in the pocket, Megs. Searching for the power source. And he's not done yet. And another one, wow. upright 10 through the whitewash. See how he's actually elevating his body language up. He's, he's, he's extending up and driving through the whitewash, hands by his side. That is the pinnacle of traditional longboard surfing. I would agree. But better than his nine, I think. Well, yeah. I, I, think, I think that was better than his nine for sure. The way that he was poised on his hang tens. Oh, there's that Thomas crew hanging out, proud of all their surfers. So that's... Uh, that's Kylie and Justin Quintel in the back. We've got uh, mm -hmm. Edie, uh, Harry's, his, Harry's partner, and Tosh Tudor there. Um, and then we have Victoria Vergara and Thomas Bexon and Mason Schremer. Thomas is the shaper. Hey, you know why they're clapping right now, Matt? Is because they just heard that Harrison just scored Ooh, a 9.17. Combine that with the nine-point ride, 18.17 on two waves already. That is an excellent heat. He might have already done his work for him. A big mountain to climb for Taylor Jensen. There's all of the judges' score, Megs. Wow. Look at that. Even a 9-5. That's amazing. Now what's going to need to happen is him playing that smart strategy game of keeping priority over Taylor Jensen, yeah. playing that game, knowing that, you know, ta don't count Taylor out. Well, Definitely. With 16.50 remaining on the clock, the heat's, as far as Taylor's concerned, just getting started. He's going mm -hmm. to try and restart. I mean, he could hang on to that 7-5, but guess what? He's now in combination situation, which means he has to. He really does need to restart next. He really does. And, I, you know, with the amount of buzzer beaters that happened today, you really cannot count anyone out. I don't think, I, I haven't caught my breath since this morning. So um, he has some work to do, but there is a lot of time with 16 minutes left, so... Well, there is a lot of time, and we're going to take a little time out right now just to regather ourselves. When we come back, it will be the conclusion of semifinal number one, and we will find out who our first finalist here and a potential world champion. We'll be right back after this. Being here preserving this beach and this ocean is one of the most important things that I could possibly do as a surfer. Today we are joining forces with Jose Cuervo and Surfrider for a beach cleanup to protect this special beach and surf ecosystem. We'd love to put ourselves out of business with beach cleanups and have a clean beach in the first place. It's very important to 
protect and spreading the word about protecting our beaches and nature. We are one ocean! If you're just joining us, you, uh, you're going to be enjoying some mind-blowing longboarding, and we've seen it all day. We're going to con we are going to crown world champs here at Malibu. This is the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. This is a replay of a ride for Taylor Jensen, Matt, that happened during the break. This is an eight-point ride, Kaipo. Beautiful flow and connection in that turn there. Get him a little bit behind the section, but he makes up for it on the inside. And this one's walled up all the way to shore. Love that relaxed body language. Four steps up the tip and that little 10 moment and driving through the whitewash back up to a close 10, a, f a tight five, and then carving back around, putting his weight into that turn. He's way down the beach now in front of the lifeguard tower and finishing off in front of Harrison's fans. Flicks out, he likes the sound of that and why wouldn't you? It's an eight point ride, but it's not enough. That's to right. Bait combination. Normally, Megs, you would be excited with an eight point ride, Taylor Jensen. However, he needs a minimum of an 8.18 to get out of the two-wave combination that he's backed up in, and that's by way of some excellent surfing by Harrison Roach. Yes, and he needs to get out of that combo situation. So at this point, if I was in the heat, I'd be trying to get two tens. That's where my, my mind would be at. It's nearly what he needs to do. Yeah, I exactly. Mean, I mean, Whoa. really to get into play, he's going to need a nine. Now, remember, with the world title scenario right now, now that we're down to the men's semifinals, it's pretty simple. Whoever wins this contest wins a world title. So it's um, some big stuff, man. Eh? You said world title, and I immediately just like froze in panic. <laughs> and I'm not even in the contest. And I'm like, world title, what? There's a lot going on. We talked about the final five at uh, Trestles a few weeks ago, Kaipo. Well, this is our longboard equivalent. And sure. we, are, we are really at the, the, the testing ground, the proving ground, the iconic Malibu Surfrider Beach. Thanks to Cuervo, thanks to O'Neill and the WSL for hosting the best longboarders in the best waves. Yep. And you know what? Everything is not going to end. I mean, we're going to crown our world champions, but we also have big news for you right after we conclude this event. In the 805 post show, we're going to announce the 2023 schedule for the longboard tour. So we got a lot of stuff going on today, Megs. Oh no, yeah. the schedule's coming out, That's, huh? It's a pretty good schedule. Oh no, I can't <laughs> wait to, I don't even know. So I can't wait to, to find out. Yeah, maybe I'll tell you. Oh, are you? Or you can wait for the 805 post show. Okay, like I'll everyone wait. else. I'll wait. You know what? I'll wait. <laughs> no, you I, I'll, I'll tell wait. you. <laughs> All right, well, 11 minutes going down and the clock is running slow for Harrison Roach, but it is at light speed for Taylor Jensen, who is in that combination situation, Matt. Harry's got priority. So as Meg's alluded to earlier, that uh, concept of uh, professional and, pro and performance surfing doesn't go into traditional longboarding very often. You've got events like, say, the, uh, the duct tapes and invitational events all around the world where uh, sharing waves is actually encouraged. Mm -hmm. It's a real 60s um, you know, camaraderie and that uh, happy-go-lucky uh, really fun style events, but I'll tell you what, these two, either of these guys are going to have fun if they're lifting the trophy at the end of today. Oh, absolutely. Just a few rules and regulations you've got to follow, and unfortunately we saw Kai Salas on the, on the receiving end of one of those rules earlier. Yeah, that was a tough, tough... I... I... Kai, but what actually happened in that? So quarterfinal with Taylor Jensen and Kai Salas. First wave, Taylor Jensen took off on, but he stayed in the prone position, didn't get his hands to the rail, did not stand up. So technically, that was not a wave ridden. So what would happen is there's still an open priority between the two surfers. Kai Salas made the presumption that there was a wave ridden. Kai Salas thought that the priority would have turned to him. Taylor takes off on a wave. Kai drops in on him, thinking the priority has been established. However, because of that technicality, the priority was not established. And Kai Salas got, here it is right here. And Kai has, got, Kai thinks he has every right to this wave. Uh, Little does he know, that's what he happened. just got an interference. And just for the viewers at home who aren't familiar with this priority situation, they would have seen a, a blatant drop in, which is what it was. But within the rule book, there is a scenario where you can take off and you can uh, burn or drop in on your opposer, on your, your opponent if it's your turn for the wave, in that, which case it wasn't. That is right. So that's in competition. There is priority. In real life surfing, everyone... Don't do that. Don't do that. 
It's not cool, okay? Everyone's watching, everyone so knows that you're not cool. No snaking in real life. Yeah. I got, there's a whole new generation that really has to realize that stuff. I agree, and it's all about that surf etiquette that sometimes I, and I pull the anti card. When I go out, I'm like, hey, so, <laughs> settle down. Well, if you pull the anti card, I'll pull the grandpa card. <laughs> hey, 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 at this point, whatever works to get them not to drop in, yeah. I'll Cop, go with Cop it. Out just hangs in the car park. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't drop in. He just whistles. Yeah. He does the the good old Hawaiian hui. Yeah. What is it? I'm hui. There you <laughs> go. A little louder. Gotta go, gotta project it from your na'o, from yeah. your from your stomach. Yeah. From your you know what? When you get to be around where I am in 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 just vintage in history, is that uh, <laughs> sometimes sometimes people just say go kaipo, and that's what I like. Oh, you're at that status. <laughs> I've got a couple of those where they're like, go, and then it comes after with the go, auntie, and I'm like, did you really just go, auntie me? I like go, <laughs> uncles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're, we're down to eight minutes. We're having a really good time on the set with Megan Gordinas and Matt Chanowski. Um, and, uh, but out in the water, it's not funs and games. We're talking about a world title, and we're talking about some tense times for Taylor Jensen because he can do nothing but sit and wait for an opportunity and he needs like a two, three wave set, Matt. There's a little bit on the horizon there, but Taylor's used to this. He's not uh, a competitor who usually has an, an, a, you know, an, a massive waves at the end. He's, you know, I was expecting this morning for him to only ride three or four waves and that he did. Um, and it was enough to beat Eduard Del Perro and they had 40 minutes in the lineup mm -hmm. to themselves almost. Yeah, pretty much, huh? So it's, he's not surprised. He, you know, he does need to get at a combination situation, but uh, within three and a half minutes, it's proven that that's enough time to be able to get two great scoring waves and get out in between. Wow. I like the analysis of the, of the time management there, Waxhead, uh, with seven minutes remaining. So really there is a glimmer mm -hmm. of hope. It's, it's a dim glimmer, but it's a glimmer, however, for Taylor Jensen. Saw so Stevie Sawyer yesterday uh, run around, get back out and score another wave. And we also saw the same thing with uh, Declan Wyden. We saw the same thing with Tucker, who unfortunately didn't get the score, um, but perhaps didn't even need to run around. He didn't need a set wave. So the run around is crucial for that three and a half No, it's, it's not. If you don't have any waves and you can shoot back out, depending mm. on how paddle fit you are. But these guys missed the first set wave. They're too deep, remember? Mm, that's There's right. wide swingers. That's and if right. you're out of priority, Megs, Meanwhile, oh my word, Harrison Roach. Harrison just navigating from the nose there. Beautiful style. He faded into his initial bottom turn and just classic surfing by Harrison Roach right behind him. Taylor Jensen on a clean, long Malibu wall, illustrating the big leverage. Swooping cutback for Jensen, more of a classic style with Roach coming through here and look at how picture perfect Malibu is right now for finals day. This is absolutely insane. Look at Taylor still going, hanging 10. He knows he needs to put into work right now. He needs big numbers across the board and with five minutes, a little over five minutes left, his, uh, his paddling strength is definitely gonna need to come into play after he kicks out of this wave. He's gotta book it back out. Spears the board out the back, Taylor Jensen. He's gonna be waiting for his scores. Gonna have to get on that board and get out there fast. Five and a half minutes on the countdown. Well, I can tell you what, the two younger surfers in the next heat, Carniella and Declan, will be licking their lips with excitement. Energy levels. It's going to be interesting for this hit. Whoever gets through still has to surf a final. Hey, mm -hmm. that's a great point, Matt. I mean, it's four heats today for the men for a world title. Mm -hmm. So coming into play will also be just your fitness and endurance, not just your surfing ability. It's being able to sustain that performance level throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And here's Taylor's wave. We'll uh, see Harry's afterwards. So he needed this 10 out the back. And that was very critical. This wave stretched a long way out. So he fits this carve in. It was amazing because it had a little uh, uh, a section in this wave. You know, Megs, it's, it stretches out, but at the same time, you need to stay in the pocket. So it's a mm -hmm. fine line to pick your maneuvers. And he chose them perfectly. I love that bottom turn walking up. As the board was rising, he got to the 10. And the same thing again, a quick little stab to the nose. Very functional surfing. I mean, it's longboard surfing from nose to tail. Mm -hmm. Taylor is on, he's flowing, he's looking connected. Hands released there in front of Harry. And it's gonna be a great wave for Taylor. We'll see where the judges go with it. And it's looking like it could be his best one yet. How's the fade to bottom turn there by Harrison Roach, Megs? 
With that beautiful hang 10, trimming hang five, he knows he has to stay in front of the whitewash, knowing that this tide is pushing in that, that little inside in here. Kind of catches up to you, but he doesn't let that happen to him. Here he is, really utilizing that board. Quick stomp to get into that high line, hand drag, 10, slow it down. You can see behind that wave, you can see the tail really working to stay, to have him stay on that nose. Mm, and oh interesting enough, word. it's a lack thereof tail rocker on Harry's board. Harry's has got, it does have concave. It is a little wider than his regular model, mm -hmm. but it's nowhere near the, uh, the, the extreme flip and the width in the tail that we're seeing from other competitors. Mm -hmm. So it's Taylor Jensen, he's broke himself out of the combination. 8.5 on the last ride for Jensen. Now he can do it and turn the heat in one wave. Jensen needing a 9.67. Still waiting for last score for Harrison Roach. Now, if Harrison Roach improves upon his score line, he can throw Taylor right back into a combination situation. So waiting patiently for last ride score for Harrison Roach makes. And Harrison's, and, and these two surfers, they're, they're vet surfers, so Harrison knows that with two minutes left, he should be playing the priority game to really sit on Taylor, not giving him any type of wiggle room to try and get that score. So uh, we'll see, uh, I think we'll see some hefty paddle battles. And we saw in the earlier heat, Matt, that Taylor Jensen clearly understands the art of priority. Yeah, uh, without a doubt. And even though that uh, priority error from Kai wasn't intentional, but we're seeing some scores looking for Harry earlier. With two minutes 20 left on the clock, things may get Difficult for Taylor Jensen, who's surfing an extremely well to good heat. Two excellent scores with a heat total of 16.5 and waiting on one last score to drop for Harry Kaipo. Wow. Yeah, here we go. 9.4 for Harrison His Roach. Best wave. And that throws Taylor Jensen straight back into a combination. And you know what? That just means. You called it. Harrison. Has won the heat. Harrison's on his way to the final right now. These these last couple of minutes are inconsequential at this moment, Matt. You know, going into this event, Taylor had that momentum. Uh, he put on an amazing display at Huntington and was the clear winner from, from the very first heat. And I would say he was the favorite <laughs> leading into this as well. We had some fantastic performances from Caniella, Harry, and Declan. And I think we do have the four best surfers in the semifinals, but... Only one will progress, a minute 30 left on the clock. It does look like it's getting very difficult for Taylor to break that combination. Let's take a look here. This is Taylor's reaction when he hears the score. He's like, what? Well, the thing is, he's, he's Harry's surfing incredible. Like, almost we've never seen him surf before. We know he's, he's incredible, but it, we haven't had longboard events in great waves. Mm -hmm. Very rarely. And we're seeing, you know, we've seen free surf clips of both surfers, but... You know, this is an all-time event. We're seeing some incredible performances from yeah. both the men and women. And it's good to see longboarding with actual waves. And look at this camaraderie. They know Taylor did that little splash as in, really, you really had to drop <laughs> another nine? Come on. Mm. Four waves ridden, and three of them are all uh, nine. All in the excellent range. Well, you know what, though? Harrison Roach doesn't want to use up all his nines right now because he still has a mission in front of him if he wants a world title. He's on to the final. But like I said again, with the scenario here for a world title, the winner of this event wins a world title for the men. We talked on the uh, post heat interview in front of the glass, and Harry said, oh, I've still got a few more to go, as in a few more interviews with me to go. And I knew at that moment his head was in the right place. There was no doubt. You know, not in a, in a, in a, in a cocky way, but any means. It was a pure in the moment, like, yeah, no, let's go. Hey, yeah. Matt, you got to run past the finish line. You know what I mean? Every single time. You got to have that vision and put it in your head, put it in your heart. And that, that's what I think Harrison Roach has done today. He is our first finalist here at the Cuervo Classic Malibu presented by O'Neill. Semi-final two in the water when we return.
is familiar with these breaks, he is not to be forgotten when it comes to our long right hand point breaks, such as here we have at Malibu first point. She's just been on fire today. Sophia Colhane, she's going to be matched up with her buddy and also from the South Shore, Felice Kelly Opa'a. And we will have to see how that works out. We'll break down the whole world title situation momentarily as we're we'll get underway. But right now in the water with just a few Verbo Classic Malibu Championships presented by O'Neill. Men's semifinal two out in the water. Declan Whiten in the blue jersey. First to get a wave. Whiten on the nose here. And spending an extended time with that hang 10. Weaving through this long wall at Malibu. Declan Whiten, the Australian in this matchup and a relaxed approach, delicate and precise footwork from Declan, working up and down the board, smaller wave, but great line on this wave for Whiten. And the finish, I'm Kaipo Guerrero, I'm joined here by Matt Chanosky and Megan Gordinas on the call for semifinal number two here uh, and we just one more space, one more space for a finalist, Megs. Oh man! I'm not even gonna ask who you're. Oh, I'm gonna. Who do you, who do you who do you favor in this heat? Connie Stewart or Declan Whiten? I mean, my my he's like basically my nephew, so Connie Ellis Stewart for sure. Um, Let's take it down under. Who do you think is gonna win this? Uh, oh. Win win this semifinal, Matt. Uh, both are super relaxed. Uh, I'm not going to give a neutral response. I've interviewed both of them today. Um, I actually think Declan might get the nod here uh, based on. Um, him improving as he's as he's getting through these events. We know what Kani is yeah. capable of, yeah. but Declan's kind of getting better every heat. Well, that's exactly that's the true. tension I wanted to build up here on the set between <laughs> Auntie Megs and the Waxhead. But uh, no, it is this is a great, great matchup. Here we go, first wave for Kaniala Stewart. Look at that poise. Gripping the nose over, uh, gripping the toes over the nose of the board. Kaniala, again, just the precise footwork by both of these surfers show you why they're in the semifinals wow. and being able to maintain that trim line and that nose time. <gasps> and everyone just gave out a sigh of relief as Kaniala was able to complete that ride, Matt. So as we're waiting for those replays, uh, you know why we had that, that sigh of relief is because finishing a wave, it's not just important for the judges, but if you liken surfing to like a, you know, a ballet routine where you never see a dancer stop or, or, or mess up a movement or in a song, and it goes back to you know, ancient Hawaiian times where surfing was, it was a gift from God. You're surfing waves that have traveled thousands of miles to arrive there and it, it's paying respect to the ocean. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, I will, right after, this, after Megs talks over this replay. Here we go with Kaniela Stewart. He is, gosh, this kid is on fire. He is just, I'm speechless at the way he surfs. But um, here he is going for that 10, his poise, really standing there, watching that board trim, riding that Kai Salas board, and then almost dipping under and his quick feet really got him to the back of that board and stomping on that so his tail wouldn't go under. I mean, his nose wouldn't go under and really surfing that smart. I mean, the average person would be so stoked. It was just an element of that wave. So we watch Declan here with his opening wave. Um, talk about poise, very well balanced. Look at him. 
He's in the, we talk about top third of the wave. I love to have been breaking waves in the thirds. He was in the top eighth of the wave. And now there, look at that beautiful trim. His board's locked in. Uh, wide point back, about three, four inches, three inches back, the wide point in that board. So holding him nicely in the pocket. Little adjustment, bang, bang. Straight up in the nose again. A uh, fair bit smaller than Carney's wave, but well executed maneuvers. And a great opener. You know, if there was any nerves, which I don't think there is with either surfers, they're gone by now. Well, the size of the wave does factor sometimes into the score, but it really is what you do on the wave. And in that exchange, Declan Whiten comes up on top. Seven-point ride for Whiten, a 5.83 for the Hawaiian Connie Alice Stewart. So your thoughts on that, Megs? Well, I want to ask you, who yeah. do you favor? Who do I favor in, in, in this heat? In this heat, mm -hmm. I really, as, when I'm in the host position, mm -hmm. I try best to remain neutral because I'm the host of the show, so I'm neutral. Fair. I'm like the Switzerland, if you would, uh, of surfing. Fair. Here. But you're okay. saying you're neutral. What are you feeling, Kaipo? <laughs> Surfing's yeah. about I feeling. I need you to wink left we're not or stats. wink right <laughs> it's to tell me which one. It's not statistics, are we, Max? We want feeling and passion here. <laughs> so you're making me sit the, the straight people, up. The people want you, passion. So. <laughs> That's why we got some passionate people here. Anti Megs in the wax head on the set. Semi-final number two. Remember, whoever wins this event for the men wins a world title. And a guy that has a chance at his first world title... He's one heat away, and he is with Sam Bleakley, Harrison Roach. Thanks, you, Kaipo. Harry, that was an absolute pleasure to watch. I mean, how important is it to just get that canvas, perfect Malibu, to really put on the show that you just did with those three nines in one set, one heat? Yeah, that was really fun. You can't ask for much more than that, really. Malibu's got to be, like, the best, or one of, if not the best, longboard waves in the world. So, yeah, really special to get to surf it with one other guy out. Taylor and I had a semi-final here a few years ago and he was still riding high performance boards and I was on my log and he beat me in that one so it felt good to get him back. Now we're even. Um, but yeah, the waves are pumping. It looks like the rest of the day is going to be epic too so I'm stoked. And so much of your upbringing has been based at Noosa. You know, what are the differences between a good wave at Malibu and a good wave at Noosa? It's kind of hard to compare to be honest. Like, um, obviously they're both pretty perfect little right point breaks but Malibu with a cobblestone so bottom uh, is just just so much more. I don't know. It doesn't change too much, and it's really ruler ruler edge and perfect. Whereas at Noosa we'll get hollow sections and slower sections, and this wave just kind of peels the whole way along. But yeah, I love Noosa though. Thank you. You've got Thomas Bex in your shaper on the sand. You've got a real fan base behind you. How does it mean to have Thomas here? Yeah, it's massive. He's been making my boards for 10 years now. And Edie's here with me as well, and a few of our friends. So, yeah, I mean, Doc's a man. Stoked to have one of my best friends and shapers here. So, yeah. Messages for your family and friends tuning in back home in Australia? One more to go, Mum. One more to go, Dad. See what happens. Good luck for the final, Harrison. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Back Go to you in the booth. Gosh, I love that. One more to go. That's, that's, in that situation, that's the perfect thing to say. But, you guys, I want to give you guys a little update right now on the women's side uh, for our world title. As we look at the women's competition, if Kelis Kaleopa makes the final, only Soleil Erico can beat her. If Soleil loses in the semifinals, there's a potential title heat in semifinal number two. Kelis wins semifinal number two, she clinches a world title. If Kelis loses semi two, whoever wins the final will win the world title. So Khalees gets through, world title is hers. If Sole loses. Loses. All right. Talk so about lot to unpack. <laughs> I mean, so, so message to Sole and Khalees, win your next heat. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Coaches listening out there. That's the aim of the game, right? Win the heat. Hey. It's a lot <laughs> easier said than done. Yeah, you got to take it one step at a time. Well... Kaniala Stewart, another little step with a 5.77 on this ride, Matt. Smaller wave, similar to the size of Declan's first one. Uh, beautiful poise. That board's working amazing. Not as much elevation as we're seeing from some of the other surfers, but it's a sleepy wave. But he gets to work here. Back on the nose again, locked in. Tail all the way back into the pocket. I love Carney's drop knee turn, which he's really brought to the game this year. He's worked on a lot. And clear 10 there, locked in the white, which that board's hanging way out the back. 
sticking through the... If you were in the, in the surf and looked behind, you could see that tail sticking through. Mm -hmm. Another 10 there for Carney. Just hot-dogging this thing all the way through. That wave would have felt amazing. And once again, viewers at home would just love to take just an element of that. But we are at the top level here. So a 5.77 to back up his 5.83. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 5.77 mm -hmm. to back up his 5.83. And Declan open with a seven, so Judge is really appreciating tip time. Yeah. Hey, um, wow. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, like, I'm, I'm digesting the scores right now. Uh, and uh, we still got 19 minutes remaining. But, M Megan, you're you're good friends with Connie Ellis Stewart. Mm -hmm. And we all know about his surfing. We can see his surfing around the screen. But what's Connie like on land? He is exactly the same. Cross and steps? I, cross yeah, steps? cross steps around. <laughs> he can literally skateboarding yeah. one wheeling the kid will just pop up and it, along with his his great attitude in the water it even just comes out with him yeah. out of the water and this he's he he's just an amazing amazing kid i keep saying kid but he's he's actually <laughs> like 20. i want to ask but. the same question for you matt on, on declan whiten because he's from one of your beaches manly Declan sticks to himself a lot. He doesn't go to any other beaches. Uh, he pretty much just surfs North Stain. Wow. He works down the beach at uh, Manly Surf Club as a lifeguard, and he patrols that beach. Uh, he's got his crew there at North Stain. He loves going out, partying with the boys, loves having a good time. He's a, he's a classic Aussie. Well, he's not a kid anymore, but I've seen him grow up, you know, through the ranks. Loves surfing, loves longboarding, you know, a true ambassador for longboarding, a yeah. really proud longboard. Does get on shorterboards at just, times. Just North Stain? You, will you ever find him at Queenscliff? Nah. I've never seen him at Queenscliff. Uh, pretty much from that pipe that we see in the Challenger Series right at the front of North Stain yeah. Surf Club and South. So that's wild because where Declan's from, there's once. a Once. I've seen him once at <laughs> there, There's a pipe. And, yeah. and, it, and it separates this beach. Well, but not really. It's, it's literally just a pipe in the it's, water. It's, a me it's, yeah, a it's, a, it's an imaginary pipe. It's a mental, mental separation, pipe. Yeah. which uh, I love that about the Australian culture. It's local. You get it in Japan too. You surf your little Yeah, yeah, your little um, between little your jetties. Yeah, yeah, and you surf shop there or your cruise there. And, and it could be offshore. Like, I mean, like 500 <laughs> feet around the corner. <laughs> But you're surfing a place that's onshore and small. I've learned the hard way. Yeah, yeah, I know that set up in Shout Japan. Shout out to in our Japanese uh, yes. viewers out there. We love you all. Arigato for watching. <laughs> all right, 17 minutes counting down. A little bit of a lull in this uh, semi-final number two. But right now, Declan Whiten really with the advantage because he has priority and the single highest wave score. But. Now I'm going to have uh, Matt, put, you put your coach's hat on. How important is this next wave for Declan Whiten? Huge. Uh, he doesn't need a warm up. He's surfed many waves today. Wait for a set. He needs the best set of the day and it needs to be uh, a better score than his seven. He just needs to build momentum and conserving energy is a really good option at the moment. But if I had a walkie talkie, it'd be like, wait for a set. Ah, and not to, you know, make it a, a, hot, a, a scary tightrope, but Megan, Declan needs a 4.6 still to take the lead off of Connie Alice Stewart. Now, a 4.6 is not a gimme out here. He needs the wave, and he needs to at least make a few sections to get that number. Yeah, absolutely. And he knows that, you know, Connie Alice can always turn around and, and score just as much as a 7, so he knows he needs a excellent score. And it's, it's not him chasing a 4.6. It's him chasing a seven and eight and that's the mentality you want to go in with is not just meeting that criteria it's exceeding that score well Carney could just given what we've seen of him in the last few years take off on a half wave mm -hmm. and go to town on it mm -hmm. and uh, maybe apply some pressure to Declan you know to Bill and go hey on is there waves that are sitting on the inside we saw that yesterday the women's heats mm -hmm. they got a little sleepy but hey it is mother nature the ocean has its our biggest opponent mm -hmm. is the ocean yeah we got to exactly. work with it, right? It's yeah. the connection. X factor, you know? It's the connection. X factor. It keeps yeah. it why, it's why we keep coming back, and it, it, it's what makes competition so engaging. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have the conclusion of semifinal number two. You don't want to go anywhere. Take a little break, but we'll be right back.
220, 210 really for an epic sell, but we do get the wrap from big Northwest. Uh, anything under a 290 uh, can happen, but if you're if you've got a good set, a good swell, and it's hit 290, you're not here, you're up at Ringo. Yeah, true. And that was kind of a suggestion, too, so you could go to Ringo yeah. instead. <laughs> yeah, let's clear the water out here. It's way too crowded in Malibu. Yeah, it's not worth it. Time check, 14.15 on the clock. It's we, only, we only got three waves written so far. Yeah, a little bit wave star, but here we go. This looks like maybe something, but you never know. 14 minutes, surfers, 14 on the clock. No, I was going to say, yes, Malibu is very crowded, but when you come up here and it's pumping and, and you get one good wave, wherever it is, third point, second point, first point, it makes your day. Pretty much sells it right there. 13 minutes, 45 seconds, gentlemen. Connie, you're still working with that 583 and the 577. Declan, you are in priority. You've got that single score. The Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championship presented by O'Neill is brought to you by Cuervo, the official tequila of the Longboard Championship. By O'Neill, first name in the water. By Epiphone, for every stage. And by Hydroflask, every adventure starts with two simple words. Let's go. Yeah, let's go to our bracket right now. We're in the pointy end of competition here. Cuervo Classic Longboard Championship presented by O'Neill. Harrison Roach is already in the final. And it is the matchup between Connie Alice Stewart and Declan Whiten to see who's going to go up against Harrison Roach for a world title. Kaipo, Megs, and Matt all talking you through this and nothing's changed since we left for that commercial break. So you didn't miss anything other than more pressure being applied right now. I feel on Declan White, uh, Whiten, Matt, to perform because he still has to get a wave uh, to take a lead off of Connie Alice Stewart. It's not a gimme. Mm, priority is, a, is an odd thing. Uh, with 16 minutes remaining when we had that score locked in by Connie, Declan's probably like, sweet, I've got a seven, I've got open strong, I'm feeling good. But he's been sitting now for about 10 minutes. And, you know, there is a sea breeze out there. The conditions have changed through the morning. We've had the tide bottom out. It's on its way back in. So the variables increase as time uh, ticks, ticks along. So the pressure is back on Declan. But I can seesaw. And these guys are confident surfers. So I don't think we've seen the, the last of these waves. I'm predicting another two waves for Carney. And I reckon Declan was going to stab three more waves, given that he's got priority now. It's going to go right down to the end. Any predictions, Kaipo? Um, My prediction right now is that given an opportunity for a couple of different waves, then we could see a switching in, in the positions. But I wanted to ask Megs, if you could whisper something to Kaniala right now, some advice, what would you tell him in his ear? You don't whisper, though. I don't whisper. Come oh, on now. If, I if you were with to only my diaphragm, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would be telling him... I would be yelling at him, boy, you better get moving. Well, it's kind of hard with the with the ocean being sleepy, but I would definitely tell him, like, you need to be dropping sevens and eights and nines. Yeah. And that's why it's, it's so important to, to really watch heats before, too. The ocean's always changing, the, the current always changing, the tide, all of that, but also the way that the judges are scoring the prior heat. You know, you move pretty fast on a longboard. I see no reason why Connie Alice Stewart wouldn't just paddle up the point and try to draw Declan Whiten off of his mark and then double back when the waves do come. Yes and no, or perhaps my idea would be to give him lots of space, uh, sit back a little bit and chase those wide swingers because this mid-range, because we talked about, he only needs to get him, he doesn't have priority, so we won't have choice over which set wave he wants. Um, there is a, a few options here, but you can see there, so you see the section right there. They're on the left-hand side of the screen. The traditional takeoff spot is a little bit further out. Uh, you will see in a normal free surf day, most people sitting further out, but they don't make the sections. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those smaller waves have that clampy section, in, the trash can section, as uh, Cassia referred to it as, and it races along, and that's the perch section, the nasal navigation section. It doesn't need to be a set, as we saw with Alice, we saw with Declan, we saw with him with Tucker, 
and Kai Takayama all logging well above average scores on medium-sized waves. Mm -hmm. Here we go, little check by Connelly Stewart that gave interest to Declan Wyland. He's going to use his priority right now. Whiten, patient to the nose, careful footwork, nice turn there, great flow. You can see him really reading this wave to make sure, like you said, that trash can section, he can beat that. And it looks like he read that very well, staying ahead of that whitewash. Nice carving turns, just setting up turns just to get to that, that, to, uh, that tip time. All the way to the inside. A paced approach, Matt, to make every section. Your thoughts? Ooh, very paced, and he does finish complete. Just another, just a little bobble at the end there. He would have had a few nerves, I think, because there is nine minutes remaining. Um, that was only his second wave, and we've seen throughout this event both of these surfers logging many waves and building as they've progressed. I felt the nerves as Declan was surfing that wave, Matt. Yeah, yeah I could feel I it I felt well. that he was being conservative. We're going to take a look at it one more time, and you can talk us through this. But he knows he can just anchor his score on this ride. Well, that was a little setup turn. We haven't seen that very often in this event, but he just wanted to make sure he gets that 4.6 first. And, I mean, he's nearly there now. But this is the sketchy section, as Meg's alluded to, because it can race away. He's probably on about a four right now. And this, he'd be on about a five here, I would imagine. And the rest is just bonus work. If he can complete here, he's just going to boost his, boost his score. We have no idea what, what the score is going to lock in as. But judging by the rest of the day, it was a well-surfed wave. Nothing critical. But he surfed what was in front of him. And safe surfing, but finishing really strong. So nice option of maneuvers there for Declan to make sure he can completed he didn't need a nine didn't need an eight he just needed a 4.6 mm -hmm. there you go At and you know what <clears throat> a lot of times megs to win the game you got to play the game absolutely and sometimes the game doesn't go in your favor so you really got to search at high and low for, for those waves. And he did exactly that. He really, you could tell where his eyes were on the waves, mm. always looking down the line, far down the line, actually. Like, he, his eyes were past that trash can section to really make sure he utilized his board, surfed that wave to its absolute fullest all the way to the shore. Do you breathe when you're on the wave or are you just- Do I breathe? Yeah, do you know? Like, do you just hold your breath, just hope for the best? Or do you feel reserved and like completely in tune when you're surfing? You know what I realized is different boards, I breathe different. Mm -hmm. If I'm surfing Haleiwa on a six foot day and I'm dropping in, you best believe I haven't, I haven't yeah. taken a breath in <laughs> the past 20 minutes. Sure. Um, but I realized surfing California a lot, I've been here for about a month and really reading the wave it's it coincides with your with your breath work yeah on really walking because you're sure. walking the board yeah and when you're walking in real life you should be breathing right so i realize that breath work is very important especially with uh with this contest and, and a world title on the line well as the beach boys well, song oh the, uh, the venture is song walk don't run mm. was the name of that 60s surf music well, classic i mean Matt, you mentioned nose breathing yeah. in an earlier heat. Mm -hmm. You can explain that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I've been working with Felipe from the surfer's gym, a uh, really uh, talented Brazilian um, breath coach. Uh, he's taught me a lot for bigger wave surfing, uh, handle those two wave hold unders, and in terms of longboarding, composure of nose riding, walking, but also just really appreciating your surroundings while you're sitting in the lineup, paddling back out, and using that downtime for productivity, really doing the belly breaths when you can, and really just focusing on those stomach contractions, and then you can breathe up through the diaphragm and in through the lungs and chest when you need it most, which is often after a wave when you're paddling, mm -hmm. mouth breathing will mm -hmm. come in. Mm -hmm. And then the rest, if you can nose breathe, including training, cross training, Jamie Mitchell talks about it on his Big Wave mm -hmm. uh, podcast. Uh, nose breathing is essential mm -hmm. through activity. Yeah, I realize with boxing a lot now that I, I've trained and also uh, trained people in boxing, that breath work yeah. is very, very important. And it's I true. catching, actually paddling back out, I hear myself physically mm -hmm. breathing and that's a reminder that like, all right, you're getting oxygen, you're uh, exhaling oxygen. And that's, I mean, it's it's really important that the breathing, especially yeah, you, in- you take time to breathe. Yes. Judges are taking time right now and they're breathing and they're finally dropping the score for Declan Whiten. And here it comes in. He's going to get his requirement. Got to 6.27. Now we can really set the situation. Connie Alice Stewart, priority 
needs a 7.44. So Kanyala Stewart, four minutes, 45 seconds, needs the best wave surfed so far in this heat map. Well, I think that score came in, judging by the waves that we had in this heat, it was quite appropriate. Uh, but Kanye was expecting that, no doubt, that Declan had priority. So he was, as uh, Meg's alluded to, he knew he needed to get a seven or an eight um, just because his scores were under Declan's first. And that's never a good sign when both of your opening waves are under your competitors, you know, and it's 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 bad, bad for your confidence, really. But <laughs> Kanye surfs against... Um, his heroes regularly, you mm -hmm. know, surfs with Kai Salas regularly, rides his boards. Um, so he's played that sort of shadow for many times, but there's a lot of young surfers coming up with him in Waikiki and Queens that are um, pushing him to his limit. Yeah, so and his cousin it. being one of them, Kilis Kaleopata. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How can we forget that one? Yeah. Well, under four minutes, and Kaneala Stewart can do nothing but try to maintain focus. Breathe. Breathe. And uh, just hope for a set. Yeah. He's going to need a special wave, Megs, for a 7.44. That's a special wave. Yes. And he is going to have to be praying to all the gods above and uh, to really bring this on for him. The ocean really went sleepy. It must have been this uh, little tide change that's uh, coming in. So. And we had that wind uh, pick up from the north wrapping down with that south swell. So perhaps uh, lessening that ground spell. True. Mm -hmm. um, but, mm -hmm. which is typical everywhere, yeah. as soon as wind picks up from the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. and we are sheltered here in Malibu. Uh, any other beach in the South Bay and Santa Monica Bay will be onshore right now. Yeah. Like extremely onshore. And this would be one of the, which is why it's so iconic, because it's always breaking. Yeah. It's always looking, well, not always, but. A Conditions are well. generally really, really good here because of our aspect mm -hmm. on the coast, mm -hmm. as well as the bathymetry of this wave, right? California's Sunset Beach. Yeah. You know, where it'll be side shore, windy, gusty, but second wave of the set, it's going to be clean enough uh, for you to perform. And the iconic surf rider, surf rider Beach, here we are. We're down by the wall. If you're down in California right now, you might just be able to get through some PCH traffic and make it down for the finals. Here we go, you guys. Two minutes, 25 seconds. I'm spying maybe some lines coming in. What do you think, Matt? There is a little line. Carney does need a 744, though, so it's going to need a, can be con a considerable line. That's not a score you can just pluck out of thin air, and we're not after tricks. As judging criteria has been broken down by head judge, Tori Gilkerson, it's about the complete package and the waves are allowing the surfers to do that today. That is the difference between longboard competition and shortboard competition, Megs, is that you need to put together an entire wave, an entire performance on that wave. In shortboard competition, like on the championship tour, you can throw, get a closeout and throw a Hail Mary, a backflip, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A 540, whatever, and get the score. That's mm -hmm. not the case right now. No. He needs the wave. He does. He absolutely needs the wave. And it's going to be, it's with a minute 30 left. With Kanyala with priority, you can tell he's, a, he's, he's stretching. He's yeah. ready to paddle his heart out with this. I see a little line coming in. He's identified something. Looks a little interested. It's got a long wall down to the bay. It's smaller. Oh, it's big decision. Giant he knows decision. He needs a big, big, big score. This is... This is the Hail Mary you were talking about. This Let's is see the it. year in a wave for Kaniala Stewart. Starts with a five. He really needs this. Gets the 10. Back on the tail for a couple of turns. Back to the 10. Five. Hang in there. Perched on the nose. Woo! Calm oh body. Toes curled over the back. nose. Oh Beautiful trim. Floats the section. Needs more. Needs more right now. Finds the open face again, back to the nose, wow. one more time. Oh my gosh. Salutes in the air, big snap for Stewart. I... Cross-stepping, nice footwork, bangs the finish, drags the spin oh on the gosh. sand, Kaniana wow. Stewart. That deserves a cheer. Do it, this is it, you do it, just do it. Oh my gosh. Thanks, he's gonna let one out. Oh, I gotta. <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! And there goes our sound man. Oh. Ten seconds and remaining. There's nothing left there for poor <laughs> Declan. Isn't that a I'm, somber shot? I'm, that I poor can't. guy. I cannot. I'm crying. Three, I cannot. Two, this one. is. I'm Look panicking. I need to. I need to take a walk. I this need to breathe. <laughs> Everything that we talked about. This is what I need to do. 
<laughs> I he, you talked about a Hail Mary. Yes. Was that not a Hail Mary if I've ever seen one? <laughs> that was certainly a Hail Mary full of grace. And that was the only <laughs> considerable wave that came in in that last 15 minutes. 8.07, Kaniala Stewart yeah. makes Brian the final, Brian. overcomes Eight. Declan Whiten in a buzzer beater moment. Wow. I mean, that was honestly, ha look, three waves surf for Kani, two for Declan. I predicted wow. another few, but then none. There's none that came. The ocean went sleepy, and <laughs> Kanela knew he needed that. And there's Moses Kalelpa, uh, stoked as <laughs> ever to hug his big cousin. Oh, wow. Beautiful drama going down. So our men's final is all set with Harrison Roach versus Kaniala Stewart. They're going to surf it off for a world title. Wow, the action is heating up here on finals day for the Cuervo Classic, the Longboard World Championships here in Malibu, and the local girl Soleil Erico finding a pearler to start things off with. Gets that feeling, that flow, as she trims down the line after that opening nose ride. Locked into a tight five to 10, and now comes around the section, grabs that rail, and let's see if she's able to make it around as the finish of this wave continues to unfold and she engages that rail, adds in that little extra bit of variety and goes for one more nose ride through to the inside, looking casual, calm, and collected as ever. So Lei Erico, the 2018 World Longboard Champion with a chance to win another world title right here at home in Malibu. It's Shannon Hughes joining the booth for the call with Sam Bleakley. Yeah, you talked about looking casual, but you know inside she's giving that everything. And that was a really strong start for Soleil on home turf, looking really lively, dynamic and strong and going for her second world title. She's got an impressive matchup here with Mason Schremer sitting on a personal best result being in the semifinals of a 10,000 event. And in that last heat, we saw an excellent performance on the last wave coming through. With that clutch performance is Connie Ellis Stewart. He's down on the, on the glass now. Thank you, Shannon. Connie, priority. One wave comes through, it's for you. And you just pulled through with pure style. Uh, that was awesome, uh, Frick. I was out there waiting and I was just praying and hoping that wave would come and God gave me that wave. I'm so thankful for that. And I feel like I just pulled a Kelly Slater move right there. <laughs> you definitely did. Talk to me about your composure on the nose through that inside section. Uh, it was nice. I was just um, trying to stay focused, make sure I don't fall, and make sure I try and get that, um, that score I needed. 
Well, eyes on the prize right now, the world title. How's that feel? Uh, feels good. One more heat and it's on. Well, I'll let you go rest up, get your headspace ready for it, and hopefully we get to see you back up here on the glass. All right. You. Coniella into the finals against Harrison Roach, and that is going to be the showdown of a lifetime. Whoever wins that heat for the men's side of the draw will walk away the world champion. Yeah, but you have to feel for Declan. He just didn't get an opportunity at the end there, but Coniella gave everything on that hang turn through the midsection. That was the high degree of difficulty. That was the commitment that gave him the score to get to the final and fight for a world title. But it's going to be a great showdown between Coniella and Harrison. Harrison's three nines in the semifinal with Taylor Jensen were incredible. So definitely stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, because not only have we got the first of the women's semifinals right now. We're moving into the men's final after the second semifinal. Then we'll crown the women's world longboard champion. What an exciting afternoon we have here at Malibu. And that wind has kicked up just a little bit, but those inside faces are still as clean as ever. And so Leigh Erico kicks off with a 5.83 against Mason Trimmer. Mason representing the USA from the east coast of Oahu, currently resides on the Sunshine Coast of Australia in Noosa, surfs right hand points like this all day long. So it's no surprise that the two women with right hand points as their home breaks are the two matched up in the semifinal. And Thomas Bexon, her shaper from Australia, is here. So that's going to give her a lot of confidence. Really good energy around the Bexon camp. Harrison Roach in the final of the men's. Mason Schremer looking to bot book a spot in the final of the women's. And Mason ran to have a chat with Harrison after his semifinal victory before paddling out for her. So she's got some insights on wave selection and a few things coming from that camp. As she gets into that opening nose ride, couple steps forward, finds that second hang five. She's going to now need to do something really dynamic here to spice things up on this wave. Beautiful rail work, perch into that hang 10 now and hooks the five in the pocket. She's sticking with this one for a long time. Pedals back off the nose and continues through the inside as Soleil Erico finds the 10 out the back and finds a good looking line with that little bit of bend in it as well for Erico's wave. So uh, Mason's a little bit smaller now as it comes through to the inside and she finds that five nice and perched, goes for that sole arch as Soleil goes down out the back and Mason's gonna do everything she can on this wave to secure some good points for herself, moving to the next 23 minutes. That was brilliant from Mason. Soleil's wave had just bowled out on her through that middle section. She couldn't get around that, but she had a good opener to that. But she's going to be sitting out there with priority. She'll add to that 5.83. But I expect Mason's score is going to drop as the highest score of the heat so far. Her nose riding through the middle part of that wave was really locked in and really critical. And there was one moment where she was in the 10 and she pedaled back and, and the board just temporarily just left the face, it free fell down into the wave and the control she had was sensational. Scores to come through now for opener of Mason and for that last score of Soleil Erica, we've got 22 minutes on the clock and Declan Whiten lost out in that last heat, but a semi-final result was incredible. And we'll check in with him now on the glass with Waxhead. Guys, we've just got Declan here. It's not as somber as that shot that we saw in that last minute when Carney locked in that score and it was announced to Declan sitting out in the water. What are you feeling now, Declan? A long delay between waves. There's nothing you could do. Tell us everything. Yeah, it's just the way it went, you know. Um, I mean, same thing happened to Skin Dog and my heat in the last one. I was on the winning side of that side. Didn't happen for me. It was always going to come. It was so flat for so long. Um, and I'm just stoked for Carney, you know. He, he deserves this 100%. He's such an amazing surfer. So I'm just, I'm genuinely really happy for him and I um, hope he takes it out, actually. Well, both of you were carrying lots of momentum, actually improving as the heats went on. Uh, what's Malibu mean to you now? Is it somewhere that you're going to feel you're really confident at moving forward to next year? I think this one might have spoiled it for me. I think, <laughs> like, it's kind of pumping and then I think we'd be pretty lucky to get it back like this again next year. I mean, last year... It was quite hard for waves this year. It's, I don't know. I mean, it's my first kind of time spending time here, and that I can't see getting too much better than that. That was sick. Like, surf, I don't know, three heats today or whatever, and I'm soaked. So. And uh, Skin Dog said, actually, one before one of his losses, he said it was the best waves he's ever had at one of the most loca you know best location. Obviously, not actually the best wave, but it's, it's a sense of emotion, isn't it? When you're riding the high of the competition, you're scoring excellent waves. Anything else compared to it? No. Like, 
that that whole being on the beach, hearing the score come in, or even like what Carney just had then, where he he sat and waited for for that wave to come. It came and he surfed it amazing. Like I watched from behind, he was ripping. So that getting the score, getting that reward, I think that's probably the best feeling. And I mean, you can do it in one foot beach slop, but you'd prefer not to. You know, that was those waves were so good. You get it by yourself. Like we were letting insiders go there that you know anyone would die for by themselves out here. So it's I'm just so happy to have this opportunity and um, thank you WSL and. Kira Seal, amazing job as commissioner this year as well, so just stoked. Well, back to you guys in the booth and a not so sombre Declan here. And guess what? Everyone knows who he is. He'll be coming into next year as a favourite. So excited. Well done, Declan. An incredible result with a semi final finish here with so many points on the line towards next year's campaign and just setting himself up with that confidence in you know, the coming years for him on the tour. And in the current heat, we're in semi-final number one for the women. We've got two semi-finals here. So Leigh Erico and Mason Schremer currently in the water with Sophia Colleen and Kelis Kaliopaa paddling out next in the next semi-final. Now the world title scenario, Sam, on the women's side goes like this. If Kelis makes it into the final, only Soleil can beat her. So that means it's gonna have to be a surf off between Soleil and Kelis for the finals. But if Soleil loses in the semifinals, there is a potential world title to be won at the end of semifinal two if Kalis takes the win and makes it past the semis into the final. She will clinch the world title if Soleil falls out here. Now, if Kalis falls out of her semifinal, then it's going to be whoever wins the event wins the world title. Absolutely. Super high stakes on the line. And great to hear from Declan there, positive attitude. Interesting to hear that he was rooting for Connie Ella. Harrison Roach, fellow Australian, going for his first world title. Long overdue, long recognized as one of the most talented longboarders in the world. Not only a great longboarder, also an incredible all-rounder. If he focused just on shortboarding, probably could have become a CT surfer from his youth days because he was a lightning fast, red hot shortboarder. But right now it's Mason Schremer on the replay. And this was a 6.83 up to the nose. Beautiful, nice opening five on the Australia built Thomas Beckson boards. How was that tight footwork? Six steps really close in the tip and then walking all the way back to the tail, that wide point back, that board releasing, staying high again and getting a really critical 10. Look at the sparkle of the line of the streak of spray. And that was the moment I talked about where as she pedaled back, she was so high, she was almost airborne as she dropped back down. And look at the lift in the board in the tail as she get, gets that dynamic hang 10. And working it one more time for a tap of the five and then a pull up for a tight five there with the toes just curled beautifully over the tip. Graceful, gorgeous nose riding from Mason Schremer. Rewarded a 6.83 from the judges. What a great way to start off this heat against the favorite in the water, the woman that's the local in Soleil, the former world champion as well. For Mason to find a score like that, she's only chasing that 2.50 to get the advancing position into the finals. And it looks like we've got another set rolling through here. Our surfer in red, Soleil, is sitting with priority. And she's going to have a look at this one as Mason just pops over the shoulder. And she's going to set up with that high line right off the takeoff, straight onto the nose. Perch for that quick hang 10 to start. Holds the five. She hasn't come off of the nose since she took off on the wave. Back to another quick 10. Holds that five for so long out the back. Now engages that rail. Throws in that beautiful sole arch. Back to the 10 in the pocket. And this is an incredible ride and such a good feeling for Soleil. Riding that velvet hour, the Thunderbolts technology aboard design that she's worked on herself. And goes in for a huge finish. She put all the risk and commitment on the line. Hopefully didn't fall and actually hit that board with her back in any way. She's got to swim in front of her, but that finish would have been unbelievable had she been able to ride out complete. Well, that, that finish could have been the difference between like a perfect score, but I think that she's still going to get an excellent score. That was sensational. Sensational would be an understatement. The, the nose riding, the opening 10 was straight off the bat. The second 10 was even more critical. And then once she started to unleash with the rail work, it was a combination of power and grace. Using that body language, just paying tribute to the beauty of this incredible point break whilst meeting that criteria of surfing with a high degree of difficulty on the cutting edge. 
16 minutes on the clock, so Lei opting for the run around after an incredibly good performance. Let's take another look at it here. So she takes that high line and straight in there with a 10, and then check this second 10, still on the five, pulls up for a second 10 on this section, critical. That was brilliant surfing, and this is where she really starts to unleash. Beautiful sole arch bottom turn, back up to the high hook for a full 10, pedaling back and using that body language, climbing and dropping on that velvet hour board, walking to the tail and then releasing for a big, powerful re-entry cut back turn off the bottom, not finishing cleanly on that float, but everything before that was absolutely spectacular. Incredible performance and scores coming through now for Soleil Erico. Judges already going into the excellent range for the two scores that have dropped of the five. We're going to have five total scores. We're going to drop the top and the bottom score and average out those middle three from the panel. That's how we come to the equation that Soleil Erico has just dropped in an 8.77 and puts Mason Trimmer with the requirement of a 7.78 as Soleil's done the runaround and is now on the paddle back out. Yeah, had she not fallen on the inside there, that wave could have been a perfect 10, if not a mid nine. It was absolutely exceptional. That 877 really demonstrates why Soleil is worthy of getting that second world title. The, the looseness off the rail in that middle part of the wave was just a joy to witness. And the use of body language, what I really like about the way Soleil has been surfing here at Malibu is it's not just the functional nose riding and turns, it's also a little bit of a dance act, a display, but not overworked, not over flashy, just classic. Uh, for me, this is a new type of Soleil Erico, and I think this new Soleil Erico we're seeing is in harmony with a very dynamic board design that's not only working brilliantly at a point break, but working beautifully under her talented feet. I couldn't agree more. And the work that she's been doing behind the scenes with CJ Nelson over the last couple of years, I think it's now all coming to fruition. That beautiful style, that that rail work as well as the nose riding that she's pulling through, but keeping that trim, that flow, as Mason takes off on the high line, gets a little bit caught at the start there, and she's going to kick out. Now, will she be able to actually pull herself out of this wave to get herself back into that priority rotation? It's just a big wall of white water, and on a nine-plus foot board, something around 9.6 that she's riding, that old faithful, it's a lot of board to try and wrangle out of the white water right away. Absolutely, and we got that sea breeze. We had a lot of bumps. She was very far up the point, so she would have benefited from that section being smoother to be able to make it, but you could see the power still in that white water, the way that just pinged her up as Soleil's looking to replace a 5.83. And she's up and riding again. Love that drive off the bottom, that bottom turn through that middle third of the board as she takes off into the nose. She'll pedal back as well as that wave closes down. And you can see those conditions are very different now than what we had earlier on today. Those bigger sets starting to roll through as well. That wind just giving that extra push as Mason paddles so hard. We haven't even had to see surfers actually try to duck dive or get, them, get themselves through waves this week because it's been a bit slower and sleepier and all the surfers have been wide of that shoulder and able to paddle straight back out. Pretty different from the conditions that they battled through between Manly for the Sydney Surf Pro and between the Duct Tape Invitational at Huntington for those first few events. And Mason Trimmer manages to get that priority back now. Down to 12 minutes, 30 seconds on the clock and surfer in blue sitting with first priority, Mason chasing a 7.78 to take the lead away from Unfortunately, 
the wave takes her out and she is going to go for a swim. So today here in Malibu for WSL Rising Tides, it's a really special edition. This is the first time that we've had boys here as well as girls. And we also have four of our very best adaptive surfers for the first time. I went to the Long Beach WSL event in 2019 and I saw them all surf and that was the first time where I was like, wow. I want to be like them, you know? I've worked alongside the WSL to allow adaptive surfers to get in with the rising tides. Like to have a little bit of spotlight and to give them some recognition because surfing is for everyone. The participants that we have here today are the very best in America. They've come from all over the states. All the athletes have been handpicked by the National Scholastic Surfing Association. We're here to crown champions and WSL Rising Tides is also about that because these are going to be the champions of tomorrow. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, every kid rips. These kids rip harder than me. I don't know, I might have to retire after watching these kids surf. We truly believe that surfing is for everyone and we're here to demonstrate that here today on the beach in Malibu. Rising So much fun was had yesterday afternoon at Rising Tides as they had pumping surf just like our semi-finalists right now as Mason Tremor took off on this during the break. Beautiful nose ride, four six steps up to the tip, gets that second nose ride after that opening 10, pedals back from that second hang five. Look at the control of the footwork in there, holds in for a really beautiful locked in nose ride so deep that she got slipped out on and lost a board, but she's got it back. She's paddling back out. She's got a 6.83, looking to replace a 3.33. Soleil in the lead with priority. She's got that 8.77 and that 5.83, but Mason can do this. She's been surfing fantastically all day and yesterday. And she got a wave into that eight point range during her quarter final. So she's already had that feeling specifically in today's conditions. As you can see, a quick hug there for Kalis Kaliopa'a. Coming up next and hugging her is Sophia Kalane's mom, Sarah. Kalis and Sophia, who she's gonna be surfing against in the, in the next heat, they are such good friends from home. And there's Auntie Megs, who we just saw on Rising Tides, claiming she might retire. Megs, don't retire because you've still got some of the best Hawaiian surfing I've ever seen in you and you're an icon and we love having you part of the longboard community. So she will be embodying the spirit of Hawaii for these two women coming up in the second semi-final. There's already one Hawaiian in the men's final, Connie Ellis Stewart. There's a big Hawaiian Connie camp but right now from Hawaii originally, now living in Australia, surfing for the USA. Mason Schremer needs a big score, a 778. And if we see Kalis Kaliopaha take out the world title, we could be seeing her cousin, Connieella Stewart, take out the world title in that Hawaiian contingency. But Soleil Erico is going to have a lot to say about that before that can happen. She's putting together a great heat so far. Nice trim line, beautiful flow, driving off the bottom, setting herself up for this hang 10. And out the back, Mason Schremer having a paddle as Soleil is once again perched in the pocket, finds that high line and drop as well. Great read and negotiation of the sections as she cruises through to the inside, drives off the bottom. That board looking so reactive and comfortable underneath her feet, doing everything that she wants it to do. Keeping that trim line as well as she finds another nose ride through to the inside, goes for a big cut back and she'll kick out clean. Oh, that is beautiful. This is a much more mature Soleil Erica. When she won her first world title in 2018, just at the age of 17, her surfing, of course, was electric. It was brilliant. She was a great nose rider, but now it's still at the young age of 21. She's developed a whole new level of movement with the surfboard, that climbing and dropping, that use of the drop knee, that flow. There's nothing flustered or out of control. Everything looks stylish and strong and dynamic, and I've really appreciated what I've seen. For me, it's been a highlight of the competition, Soleil surfing. She's been just incredible. We've got scores to come through now for Last of Soleil, and that leaves Mason sitting with priority. She may be chasing a bigger score than that 7.78 as scores start to come through for Last of Red. 
looking to improve on that 5.83, and let's talk through it now. So she gets that quick 10 at the beginning. Those opening 10s have been a feature of Soleil's surfing, but just look at the way she redirects and comes off the bottom and then walks up to the nose whilst rising up to the top part of the wave and gets a double hang 10 through this section. Good soul arch, pedals back very quickly, and look at the climb and drop and the body language, keeping the, the arms low and then raising the arms for that turn and then keeping them raised for that bottom turn, nice and high again for the nose rides, dropping back down into the section there and getting another five in the inside as she cleanly cross steps to the tail and releases a massive amount of spray and a beautiful cut back with stylish surfing from beginning to end and being rewarded with a 7.77. Incredible surfing. So Soleil now with the 777, the lucky sevens on the board for Soleil. She's putting Mason in the requirement of a 9.71 to take that winning and that final position away. Soleil was born in New York. She lives here in Malibu. She started at Hanalea Bay, Kauai, age 10. She moved to Malibu, age 15. She's um, studied a, uh, studying a major in um, early education in San Diego in film editing. And uh, her dad, Danny, her mom, Vera, her sisters, Athena and Jollibur, who are both competitive skiers, They'll, they're watching. She's had a lot of coaching from Taylor Jensen over the years, three times world longboard champion. And she's an active campaigner for surf aid and a lot of environmental organizations, the Surf Rider Foundation, a walk on water. She really is on the front line of wanting to protect the environment that she loves so much. And that's such an important thing. I mean, having a look at, you know, these perfect conditions here at Malibu today to see what joy the ocean brings us and to know that so many of the surfers in the draw here like Soleil, like Mason, they're putting in the groundwork behind the scenes to keep our beaches pristine and clean as we see Soleil swinging to go on this one. She's now just in that rhythm. She's already found some great waves. She's back to that hang 10 and she's looking to really close that door to get a feeling for the lineup now and the slightly changing conditions as the tides are different and as the wind has picked up and engages in two beautiful rail wraps now back into the nose, finding that rhythm with the ocean for Erico and back into that hang five Finding another here as that wave pockets out and she finds that 10 through the bowl. Just climbing and dropping now as she digs that rail in for that finishing cutback. That was awesome. I mean, the body language, the power in those turns, but Mason on a long soul arch hang five. Great opener for Mason. This is the way that she needs to keep herself back in the mix. Goes for that cheater five stretch out, that little bit of a tan drag as well. Drives off the bottom and sets herself up now cross-stepping forward to try and find that extra nose ride. Nice bit of rail work and S turns as she comes through to the inside, finds that five to 10, beautiful, compact, hang 10, and she sticks the finish. That was a very difficult wave to ride out of. And the little Grammys with the skimboard and the boogie board are heading up to the top of the point. Wow, that was a radical nose ride through the inside. She's looking to add to that six, eight, three. That might well replace, her, be higher than a six, eight, three. It'll certainly replace the three point 3.8. Soleil, though, she might improve on her 7.77. So Soleil, for me, that the surfing is just incredible. But answering back, this is incredible surfing from Mason. Long five, locks in, arches, pedals back low in the wave here, high in the wave to then redirect from the turn from the top to the bottom of the wave, stretches for the cheetah five, but then walks out really cleanly. And then it's the nose ride on the inside section that is absolutely exceptional. She's gonna be right in the pocket just after this redirect, this stall. She sets herself up, gets the five, pulls up for the 10, and then she's locked right in the pocket and then pedals back, gets low, compresses, flexes, keeps her balance, and somehow survives that nose ride. So Leigh Erico had this one on the first of the exchange. A hang 10 from takeoff has been a big feature, but look at the power in Soleil's turns, but done with grace. For me, this is a futuristic approach to longboarding. This is where women's longboarding could go. Soleil really embodying that mix of finesse, flow, feminine style, but powerful turns. I really love what I'm seeing. And both of the women are on similar shaped boards, the Aussie influence boards with the wide point back, but Soleil's just got that really dynamic turn through the wave mixed up with that nose riding and here she is again just demonstrating the way that when she puts that board on rail she has that lovely energy that composure combining power but done gracefully and scores in it's an 8.8 .8. it betters the 877 so they already has 
and now puts Mason Tremmer with a minute 15 seconds on the clock into a combination situation, chasing two fresh scores to match up to that 17 point heat total. Mason has a paddle to get into that one and is unsuccessful. We're still waiting for Lassa Mason to drop through. It will factor into her top two waves, but it won't be breaking that combination. A 5.6 for last of Schremer has her sitting in the same place, now up and riding again with one more lap with 50 seconds on the clock. She runs to the nose quickly, but can't keep that trim line moving forward. And she's put together a graceful, wonderful display as we see the fish jumping out of the water in front of her for Mason Tremor, but it's going to be, it, it's going to the local, the wave selection and the performance to Soleil Erico. But Mason could be so proud of this run here at Malibu. She's finished in third position, a semi-final placing. She got a fifth losing to Tully in Manly. She got a ninth losing to Soleil in Huntington. It's been a really strong season and she'll re-qualify in the top eight. So she won't have to qualify through her regions. And I think Mason can really be proud of the way she surfed. She has been exceptional yesterday and today. Absolutely. And for her advancing into the semifinals, that gave her that requalification for next year's season. So that was a huge moment. The more pressure for her really was on that quarterfinal heat and making it through. So great performance for Mason on her old faithful Thomas Log. But Soleil Erico on the Thunderbolt Technologies Velvet Hour takes it through for the win. And she's our first finalist on the women's side of the draw. back to the Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. It's been great to have that endemic brand, the original in surf neoprene, keeping us all warm and being able to enjoy these chilly mornings and chilly evenings here on the California coastline for years now, for decades in O'Neill. And one of their team riders, Sophia Kalein, is in the water, currently ranked number eight in the world, up against number five in Kalis Kaleopaa, the two Hawaiians. The South Shore girls surfing Waikiki every day together have met up in a great head-to-head -head matchup once again. Yeah, they were so pleased to meet in this semifinal. They gave each other such a big hug on the sand when they saw that they were both in this. ...onto the wire. Whoever wants to win this world title has got to get into the final and beat Soleil Erico. Yeah, this is a crazy one. There's so much on the line for these two surfers. And looking to get that opening exchange underway. Surfer in red would have had that inside positioning and a non-priority start. But she gives way and Kalis is now up and riding in the blue. Straight to that 5 to 10 combination. You can see Sophia as well keeping her eyes back on Kalis as she cruises down 
the point on the nose, goes for that switch stance. Little trim line, high to low on the face of the wave, back to the nose rides again through this inside section. Perfectly composed and doing everything she needs right now to put herself in that race to take home the world title. Excellent execution on those final nose rides, wraps it through in the pocket, style flow and grace looking controlled, looking composed and finishes off on the inside. Wow, one word comes to mind there, footwork. You know, when we get to look at that again, that was a lesson in perfect footwork. Phenomenal surfing from Khalees Kelly Park. Now scores to come through for first of Khalees, but in the last heat, it was the local Soleil Erica with another excellent demonstration, getting two eights on the scoreboard. She's with Strider now. Thank you very much, Shannon. I mean, I was so impressed to see you step up and surf the way you did. The composure that you had out there was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've been surfing out here since I was 13, so these waves kind of come second nature to me. I wasn't, like, thinking too much on the wave, um, so I think that really helps. And now it's all or nothing coming into the final. It is, um, but every heat I just tell myself, just do your best and have fun and enjoy surfing perfect Malibu with no one out because that's, like, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so I'm just going to enjoy it. Well, I'm just going to let you... Enjoy your moment. I'm going to let you relax and get ready for the final because that was some beautiful surfing. Thank you. <laughs> and Soleil, our first finalist on the women's side and a score to drop for this opener of Khalees. Now, this was a lesson in footwork. Straight up for the five. There's the ten. And look at the clean footwork here. Look at the delicacy, the poise, the patience, and then again a second ten. But then watch this. This is incredible. Look, switch stance climbing and dropping, and then walks seamlessly back in the goofy foot stance, up and back to the nose multiple times, walks perfectly into the turn, walks perfectly out of the turn, back up for a 10. Oh my gosh, if you want to learn about footwork, ladies and gentlemen, watch the video replay of this multiple times and go down to your local spot and recognize that this is footwork at its finest. Yeah, there's really no one else that's better. What she is demonstrating and what she brought through that conversation last year as well is absolutely flawless. Scores in a 783 on the wave that Sophia let go. Sophia now up and riding on her opener, straight into that perch tank 10, goes in for another 10, nearly falls, but sticks through that little bit of coverage on the nose for the water, now finds that little drive through as well. Another hang five, dropping and climbing as well. Sets herself up here through that inside section, finds the nose, now trimming, waiting, finding that trim line for a long time, engages that rail smooth and stylish for the 16 year old as she pedals back and she's looking to put on that finish in front of the photographers. Well, that's going to be a really similar score to Kaylee's. That was outstanding. Those nose rides early on, the commitment, she nearly nosedived on one of those tens because she went so long on it, but she needed to risk a critical nose ride to match the 7.83 that Kaylee's got. And Sophia answered back immediately with some phenomenal longboarding. Down to 23 minutes on the clock, 30 minutes for the semifinals. Coming up next will be our men's final with Harrison Roach from Australia and Connie Ella Stewart from Hawaii. Cousin to Kelis Kaliopa'a currently on screen, bobbing her head, hearing the scores drop and waiting to find out what Sophia has answered back with to the 783 that Kelis started with. So it could be come out a little bit lower because it just didn't have the variety of maneuvers that Khalees displayed on her ride, and it does. It comes out at a 5.83. You know, perhaps one of the main reasons with that would have been the lack of variety. It was primarily a nose riding wave. She had some incredible fives to tens. She did nearly pearl on that, on that first ten, but let's have a little analysis here. There's that five and then pulls up for a 10 here, and she's really committing for a long 10. And then on that second 10, she needed pearls, but keeps trimming. So the judges won't really penalize that, but what they'll look for is perhaps a little bit more variety to take that score into the excellent range. But as far as nose riding goes, this was outstanding. She's back up for another nose ride through the inside, and then look at this turn as she walks back to the tail on this section and then puts that Michael Takayama board beautifully on rail. Khaleesi's wave was a little bit bigger to facilitate that greater variety, but we know that Sophia is doing the type of surfing that can match the scores that Khaleesi is delivering as well. Oh, for both of these women, they're warranting world title worthy surfing throughout the entire event, throughout the entire year, really. I think 
these two specifically in this conversation now, knowing that on the women's side as well as the men's side, the official call is that whoever wins the event will win the world title, with Soleil advancing past her semifinal. That now forces Khalees, who's that front runner in points, to need to now win the event to win the world title. But I think in the demonstration that we've seen consistently through the season, it's been Khalees and Sophia that have maintained that consistency in their performances in a variety of breaks that have really been able to showcase what they can do in all types of ways. And I love that a wave that is so perfect as Malibu that can showcase the flaws in someone surfing, both of them have riven, risen to the occasion within this event to showcase excellent surfing. I mean, if you follow either of these women on social media, you know that they're just constantly locking down and releasing these incredible video clips and photos. They're, their surfing is, is just absolutely sensational and they're an inspiration and they're still both extremely young. But this is that moment where surf fans around the world tuning in have got to decide if it's a strange early or late hour. Am I going to stay up to watch the finals? You definitely should because we've got the men's final coming up, which is going to be an incredible showdown between Harrison and Connie Ellis Stewart, the Australian versus the Hawaiian. We've got these two Hawaiians battling for a spot to meet American Soleil Erico, the Malibu local in the women's final. And then after we've crowned those champions, we're also going to get the exclusive on next year's World Longboard Tour, which is hugely inspiring for up and coming longboarders all around the world who want to qualify to be right here in Malibu potentially next year fighting for a world title themselves. That's right. We cannot wait for that announcement to be shared with the world. That'll happen during the 805 post show after the finals and after that prize giving and we get to celebrate our world champions will then talk through all that next year has to offer for the World Longboard Tour and the work the WSL has been putting in behind the scenes to secure different venues. So we cannot wait. Be sure to tune in to the 805 post show at the end of today's competition to find out what will be happening with these surfers on next year's World Longboard Tour. So we can see, Shannon, that it's a little bit more wind affected now. We're kind of moving into the latter stages of the afternoon. So that does play into the rides that the decision of how you take the line on takeoff with that little bit of wind chop is extremely important. Do you go for the nose ride? Is that a stall maneuver or are you going to try to accelerate? Some surfers able to use the nose ride to stay in the pocket. Other surfers opting to go to the bottom of the wave where they can generate speed off a rail engagement and drive back higher into the wave perhaps for the nose ride. So that opening section is going to be extremely important to make the right call. And we've had that increasing tide over the last couple of hours. That low tide today was just before 1 p.m. It's currently 3.30 p.m. here on the west coast of California. So it's helped those conditions even though that wind has started to come into play. And down to 18 minutes on the clock, Khalees sitting with first priority and wins that opening exchange. And I want to remember back to that moment because it was right at the start of the heat. Both surfers had not had any priority established because neither had taken off on a wave. But Sophia was sitting on that inside position. She would have had right away on the point break if she wanted to take off on it. And she kind of had a little look, but then decided not to go. And Khalees then took off down the line from her. And Sophia sat there staring back at her friend take off on that wave maybe thinking it had a four a five maybe a six point possibility within it looked quite small and that wave just grew as it ran down the point and it offered so much complexity to it that Khalees was able to surf it into a 7.83 yeah the, the use of the switch stance in that ride was was incredible and the footwork for me was like it was a model of the you know the variety of things and the benefit of footwork and a great place to practice footwork is on a long skateboard so a lot of young longboarders listening tuning in even older longboarders who have been surfing for a long time but struggle to, to use the footwork which is the most elegant way to transfer weight up and down the board to initiate nose rides a good way to practice is longboard skateboards on the sidewalk and you can just practice those cross steps you, you just go one step and that art of balancing temporarily on one foot is the secret of the cross step and all of these women they cross step so beautifully it looks effortless but when you start to integrate the cross step into your longboarding it suddenly opens up a whole new world of being able to elegantly transfer your weight around the board it's not just about locking in nose rides or tail turns it's just that elegant movement to keep in trim with the wave down to 17 minutes on the clock and Sophia now having a paddle under second priority 
And she decides to go on this one to lock in and see if she can improve on that 5.83. Nice opening 5 to 10 combination. Back from the 10 into that 5. Holds that front third of the board and now engages that rail on the back third. Back into a nose ride as Khalees takes off on a good looking set just behind in that second wave. And Sophia still getting some great work done through to the inside. Khalees up and riding, perched on that hang 10 and she goes down out the back. Sophia now with all of, well, she would have no idea, but this wave is very significant in the grand scheme of things as Khalees has fallen with the priority on the wave just behind. And Sophia's looking to drop her best wave of the heat. The only benefit of Khalees' fall there is that she will be back out first with priority, but Khalees was on a really good wave and she risked a long 10, but she did fall. But Sophia's wave is gonna be a very, high score. There was a lot happening and particularly that opening hang 10 was extremely dynamic and what she displayed on that was the variety but it was a much bigger wave than that opening 5.83 so is it going to threaten that 7.83 from Khalees Kaleo Paha which was the first score that she dropped. Scores to come now from Sophia Culhane and Fans cheering through from the competitor zone as well as the VIP down here at Malibu. So four steps up to the tip, gets the five, there's the 10, locked in for a 10. And then she comes up in here for a second nose ride, a good readjustment. That rail turn mixed in after that first 10 was really dynamic and definitely ticks the variety boxes. But look at the commitment through this section on that five and then gets up for a second five and gets another tight locked in nose ride and pedals back. So turning variety has been a big feature of this wave. Another nose ride through the inside and beautiful turn away from the wave right there on the shoreline. So I think it's gonna be a really high score. Scores through a 6.83 for Sophia Culhane takes her into the but she will be out there with priority. And she's only chasing that 4.83 to get the jump back on Sophia. Having priority now, Sophia, we saw her going for the runaround. She'll have that paddle back out as well. And the paddle back out, if it's during these little sets, means the surfers don't have that kind of clean exit. They still have to battle their way through a little bit of white water, which wasn't really the case yesterday with the lulls involved. And we're down to 14 minutes, 23 seconds on the clock. Right now, the young 16-year-old, Sophia Kalein, leading the heat against a young Khalees Kaleopa'a, and we'll see who makes it into the finals right after this. The Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championship presented by O'Neill is brought to you by Cuervo, the official tequila of the Longboard Championship. By O'Neill, first name in the water. By Turtle Bay, official resort of the World Surf League. And by Flying Embers, official hard kombucha of the World Surf League. 12 minutes remaining to decide our last finalist for this year's Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships here at Malibu in 
California. It's been a glorious two days of competition. Fast to get through. Thinking of those opening heats yesterday morning where we had so much anticipation and excitement and we knew that the conditions were going to be improving through finals day. And now to be at this stage of competition, Sam, it's gone unbelievably fast. Yeah, hu malahu, which is the Chumash word for the place where the surf sounds loudly. That's the sacred name for this location. It's really delivered. All of the surfers today have expressed how joyous it's been to be out there with one other surfer just trading waves under perfect conditions. You know, overhead sets, 400-yard rides, 200-yard rides have been the average, excellent scores all around. A lot of surfers losing with two excellent scores. I saw outstanding surfing from people like Tony Silvani, Declan White and Ben Skinner, Taylor Jensen, all getting eliminated, but you couldn't have asked any more from their surfing. They were outstanding. Mason Schremer looked brilliant, but still got eliminated. So it really says a lot about the cool to have this event on these two days and to have the finals on the good day of the swell and the fact that Malibu reinforces its status as, as the great longboard wave on the planet. Yeah, it's been just an incredible couple of days of competition and today like you said you know with those conditions we also saw on the women's side Alice Lemoyne, Chloe Calmon and Rachel Tilly be knocked out of the draw earlier in the quarterfinals and they all put together such tight performances beautiful style flow grace for all of them and the margins that they lost by were so so close. Absolutely Alice Lemoyne was sensational losing out to Soleil on that last score exchange. Alice's nose riding was just sizzling hot and she won the event here last year but switching our attention to the present it's these two women going for world titles looking to meet Soleil in the final. Sophia Colhane she dropped a 683 for that last wave we thought it might come in higher than that because everything about it was lively and dynamic and there was variety there was actually on reflection only one hang ten and the other nose rides were fives. And perhaps if the other nose rides were locked in tens, that could have bumped that score up into the excellent range. Little things to improve on for Sophia to try and increase that requirement as Kaniella Stewart talking to Kai Salas now, getting ready to paddle out for his final against Harrison Roach. Big moment there. Of course, Kelis Kelly is the cousin of Connie Ella Stewart, so I'm sure Connie's going to be giving both of those women a high five when he paddles out. You can see Kelis's mum in the background there, big Hawaiian vibes on the sand, massive support base, but Kai Salas, the shaper of both Connie Ella and Kelis's Kalise's boards. Kalise on the 9-2, it's the Waikiki model. It's a board that they, they designed after she won that first event of the season a couple of years ago before the pandemic in Noosa. And she likes to ride kind of slightly tweaked versions of it, but it's a board that you can buy off the shelves through Thunderbolt Technologies. And this is a favorite one that she won Huntington on. So it's a magic board and she's been displaying some magic footwork on that board. So is it going to give it the magic that she needs to go all the way to a world title. She could be on her way there as we've got eight minutes on the clock. She's sitting with priority. Sophia's going to have a look at this wave. Quick little look. She decides not to go. And Kalise, we remember, you know, while testing out this Waikiki model in the board she's currently riding back at Noosa in 2020, had that final heat against Sophia Kalane. It was that event for Sophia. She was only 14 years old, and it was her very first pro event on the World Longboard Tour, and she made it into the finals against her best friend in Kalise at 14 and 15 years old. Now the important moment for Sophia. Big swing to take off into the hang 10. Now pedals back, sets that rail line off the bottom, and just rides it through to this inside. Nice hang five, staying in the curl in that front third of the board, back to the nose now as Kalise is up and riding out the back. Kalise straight to the five as Sophia drives back on the tail. And Kalise decides to kick out of that wave. Sophia's going to continue going through to the inside here. Quick cross steps up to the nose for one last hang five, and she'll kick out for the finish. This could swing the heat. As soon as Kalise took off on that wave, I could see that the run of the wave, it had a wash in it. It had a bowl and a bend, and she knew from takeoff that she wasn't going to be able to make it all the way down the line. But Sophia's wave was outstanding. I think it's going to easily surpass her 6.83 in my opinion. It's certainly going to replace that 5.83, but up and riding Kalise Kaleo Paha. And Kalise had priority on that last wave as well and decided to let Sophia have a look at it. 
Now Kalise has gone down for a third for that second wave. And you can just see her now needing to have that full reset. That moment, I think, happened on that 1.5 that she fell on. On the takeoff out the back when she pushed a little bit long for that hang 10, that second wave that she took off on, that big set, that was the moment that I think shifted that momentum for Kalise. Yeah, I mean, she, she wanted to, to go risky on that. She needed degree of difficulty, so she held that 10 as long as possible. But when she took off on that last wave, then there was a sense that she could see, I could see visually that that wave wasn't going to run all the way through. But it's going to be fascinating to see what we get for Sophia Colhane's scores. We get the replay of Kalise in the 5 and the 10, and that was where she just dagged the nose and didn't connect through that section, but risking that 10. But this, Shannon, was splendid. I mean, the fade, the big swing and getting a high line, and there's that critical 10. That's one of the best tens we've seen of this semi-final. Cleanly walks back, nice redirect, climbing and dropping, low in the way, very hard to do for that hang five. Look how much in the pocket she is on her. Michael Takayama, 9-6 mana T. And then she gets a beautiful walk back, and that was a powerful redirect turn with spray coming flying off the rail edge. And she's smooth and lively and redirecting one more time and walking back up for another locked in five and clean, crisp footwork all the way to the kick out. It's going to be a strong score and it's really going to put the pressure on Kelly's chasing a score. Now, right now, Kelly's is chasing just a 4.83, but the scores are coming through and it's going to be Sophia's highest score, most likely, maybe close to that high score that she has at the moment of that 6.83. As we're down to five minutes, 20 seconds, and it's a 7.17 for Sophia now increases the requ requirement into the sixes for Kelly's. So this is very interesting. That 6-1-7, she could have easily got that score, Kelis, on that wave where she dagged the nose on those on that 10. But I don't think that she could have got that score on the wave behind Sophia's 7-1-7 because she couldn't she she just wouldn't be able to make that wave. You could see it had a bowl, it had a wobble, it was a slightly awkward one. But she's gonna be sitting out there with priority. If into the dying minutes there isn't a really decent set, that's a score she could get on a medium-sized wave, but certainly for these first three minutes, she just needs to be super patient, calm, collected, breathe, keep a cool head. And the main thing is just keeping that line up. If she goes too far up the point and gets herself too deep, she won't be able to make that section. She's got to just have that line up just right. She might be looking for some signals from the beach, or she might just be trusting the lineup she has, or she might just be going on instinct. Down to four minutes on the clock, and a world title on the line in this heat being that the surfer that wins the women's event will be walking home a world champion today. So Lei Erico has already booked herself a spot in the finals. Kalise Kaleopa'a and Sophia Colhane both have the opportunity to walk away with a world title today, given a win for this year's Cuervo Classic. So Sophia's gone for the inside position there. Three minutes, 50 seconds. She's just planted herself to the inside of Kelis. These two women are great friends. They surf against each other a lot, but right now this is one of those big moments where both of them are going for world titles. There's three. There's just over three minutes left in the semi-final at Malibu at the end of the world tour. It's massive stakes here. And right now for Sophia Colhane specifically, she is 16 years old. If she wins the world title today, she will become the youngest ever world surfing champion. She'll break the record that Rachel Tilly set back in 2015 as a young 17 year old. So Sophia knows this. She told me before she paddled out in the heat that she has the chance to get it. She was trying to stay calm and cool, but she knows that she's got a moment like that in her life that she could achieve. Kalise Kaleopaha would be the third of the 17 year old pack to win a world title on the women's side. Rachel Tilly being the youngest 17 year old at 2000 in 2015. Soleil Erico, the oldest of the 17 year olds in 2018. And then Kalise also sitting in that mid 17 range has the chance to get herself that world title. As we see quick footwork from Kalise and she's just chasing that 6.17 now to advance. Quick steps to the nose, pedals back off of it. Everything right now is going in her favor. She's keeping it together. She's made it through that outside section. She's gotten the good work done. She's keeping that board fluid under her feet, demonstrating graceful footwork. But she knows that that wave's not going to facilitate the score. It just didn't have a wall. It just it was it was all bowl and peak, and it had that swing. She had to be a pendulum on that board. She had to move up to the nose and immediately move move back to the tail to cut back 
into the pocket, move back up to the nose, move back to the tail. She never had that trim line to really open up the scoring potential, so she knew it wasn't going to be the score she needs, and she gets a 4 one, 7 Two minutes on the clock, and priority is now handed over to our surfer in red, Sophia Colhane, and she is in that control space. Down to the final minute, 45 seconds. Kalise has put in a good effort. She started so strong on that 7.83. That opening ride was unbelievable. Yeah, I just thought it was going to go in her favor, the momentum she had from the beginning. I felt like Sophia, I imagine that second wave, that 6.83 might come higher on the score, but then she got that 7.17. And we can see moving further down the point here, Police really trying to chip away at that 6.17. Just to do anything she possibly can. Gets a great hang five, now goes for that little front hand jive on the switch stance back to that hang five perfect footwork once again perches holds that five to ten nice and critical as she comes through to the inside section big down carve under the lip and she kicks off on the sand with one minute on the clock she rolls up the beach and we'll see if she makes that run to try and get back into the lineup and down to 50 seconds on the clock. She has given every last ounce of effort that I, she could have. I think body language, she knew that that wasn't a set wave. It was, she was quite far down the point, but look at this, this hang 10 through the inside. There's the five, it's a smaller wave, it's a shorter ride, but look at the skill that we have. There's the switch stance, climbing and dropping, there's the clean footwork, and then watch this, this 10 on this third nose ride here. Incredible, locks in, five, bang. 10 feet close together, so beautifully poised. But she knows that, that the, the, just the position at which she took off on that wave, she would have known it would have been a miracle to really allow a 6.17 on that. Scores to come through now for last of Khalees and Sophia up and riding with 15 seconds still on the clock, looking to secure her position into the finals up against Soleil Erico. Incredible rail work as she carves back into the pocket, sets herself up here again and is getting all of the work done that she possibly can, finding that trim and that flow, putting together a beautiful display of longboarding here for the 16-year-old as she S-turns back, sets herself up for this inside critical section. Will she find the 10? She gets that quick tap and goes for the finish on the shoreline. The clock has sounded and we now await the scores for last of Sophia and last of Khalees. Well, I just think Khalees' wave just didn't really allow that opportunity. She surfed it beautifully. Sophia might come close to replacing her backup score of a 6.83, but that 7.17, I don't think it's going to come close to that. But what a great display from both these women. That first wave of Khalees's, that was textbook footwork. You should all study that for a lesson in beautiful flow and footwork. But Sophia Colhane, so strong, committed, dynamic. Good rail work and incredible hang tens. And will it be her in the final with Soleil? Scores dropping for Khalees. Dynamic, critical surfing, but a small wave without too much to offer. Scores in a 5-6-3 for last of Khalees. Does not make the requirement. Sophia drops in a 6-8-3, which is equal to her second highest score. And it's the 16-year-old Sophia Kalane with a proud mom, Sarah, and brother James on the beach that has advanced through into the finals against the local in Soleil Erico. Insane, what a way to finish out. We could be seeing our youngest ever take the championship in the 16 year old Sophia. Winner of the women's final will take it for the world title. Shout out to Miss Khalees. Fabulous serving, one of my favorite easy fits out there. Great job, Khalees. Okay, here we go, guys. We're going to count it in from 10 seconds. Eight, seven, six, and here we go. Five, four, three, two, and we're underway. Men's final, you're on. That's it. Men's final. Here we go. Two more heats of the day. 35 minutes here between the Paris and Rose. Whoever wins pretty much both these will be the champion.
champion of the event and the world champion. So we've got some exciting 35 minute finals that are gonna play out right here, right now. The 2022 Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championship and we have a battle. That's right, we've got movement out on the horizon. It looks like Drew's gonna start us off. That's Mr. Tanya's <laughs> It's finals time for the Cuervo Classic Malibu Championships presented by O'Neill. Connie Alice Stewart in the blue jersey to a quick start here and a quick trip to the nose for the Hawaiian weaving up and down. Beautiful turn, rail control from Stewart. Little caught up in this section, races in front of it. More time on the tip, touches a five. Back on to a hang 10, Connie Alice Stewart. Quick start, beautiful style with that drop knee cutback for Kaneala, hangs some heels, goes incomplete with that final maneuver, but a quick start, and we got a lot at stake right now. I'm Kuiper Grow along with Matt Chinoski, the Waxhead. Not only does someone win the Cuervo Malibu Longboard Championships, they win the world title. It's all between these two surfers, Harrison Roach and Kaneala Stewart. Three events, this is the final event. These surfers have competed in all three. For it to come down to the last heat, the last 35 minutes of the year, it's only fitting that's between these two surfers who have been improving as the events went by. Yeah, it's gonna be Juan in the water and a chance to win a women's world title in the water is gonna be Sophia Kulhane and she's against the glass with Strider Wazalewski. I wanna hear from her from her semifinal win. Thank you very much, Kaipo. Sophia, talk about emotions. I saw you give a hug to your opponent. You guys are good friends, but to see you walk away, it was a tearjerker for me, so let me know how you're feeling. Um, a little heartbroken, but also super stoked. I mean, Khalees is my best friend. We surf at home every day, and to end up in the semis together was a little heartbreaking, but coming out on top really made me feel pretty good, but yeah. She, uh, I saw her tell you to bring it home. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'll try my hardest, but yeah. Anything you're going to adjust? Or are you just going to keep powering through with what you're on right now? Uh, probably just keep powering through. One more heat, last one, see how it goes. And I love Khalees, and I'm so proud of her, and yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts on a possible world title? Uh, it's been a dream of mine forever, and... Being the youngest, uh, if I win today, I'll be the youngest, and that's kind of mind-boggling, but I'm praying and hoping, and yeah. All right, well, I'll let you gather yourself, go get ready, and uh, well, good luck. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, that's a great sporting moment there, because Sophia Kohane and Khalees Kaleo Pa'a are best of friends, and the mixed emotion coming out in that interview was heartfelt. But now let's turn our attention to the men's final. Again, winner of this final wins the event and wins a world title. First score for Kaneala Stewart, already booked in at a 6.33, Matt. And here goes Kaneala once again, looking behind and decides he sees more. 30 minutes remaining, a lot of time. And we just when we thought Malibu was dying, we saw those nine unridden set waves in that heat with Mason Schremer way out the back, having to try and choose between the two. But fellow, well, almost country person now, Harrison Roach, beautiful 10 to open up his account, steering on the nose from 10 through to five, and that midsection of the board providing that speed. Now pumping, high line down and around. Beautiful time slash there for the Australian, Harrison Roach, and out behind him, Kaniella Stewart. Kaniella Stewart on the nose, poised, perched in a 10 for an extended period of time. Stewart now goes to turns on the outside. Roach kicks off on the inside. More in store for Kaniella Stewart. Beautiful swooping turn. Gets back up to the nose again, perched calmly, exuding style. An early kick out for Kaniella Stewart, and I suspect he's going to want to win a paddle battle 
four priority out in the lineup. And here's the paddle battle, Matt. Incredible uh, vision there from Carney to flick out of that wave. He was well on his way to a great score, but obviously identified that Harry was a little further inside and opted to pull out early and not gain those extra points so he could grab the priority. Gamesmanship, strategy, good idea for Connie Alla Stewart. Let's take a look at these rides, starting with Harrison Roach. Amazing tempo on this wave. Tempo, timing, precise footwork, and here, bang, gets the 10, steers it back into the five through the section, very critical nose riding. But he's not done yet. Kaipo holds it through the section. Looks like a surf ranch right-hander there. But no, we're at Malibu Beach. And steps back into this gouging carve. Step off. And then behind him, Caniella Stewart emulating what Harry had done on the wave before. Maybe not as cylindrical and, and, and much as much energy. But Carney, look at the hips tilted back as Harry finishes off on the inside and gets a front version of the end of Carney's wave. And I like right here. Here's a heads up play. Connie Alice Stewart gets to the nose, finishes the maneuver, sees where he is, sees where Roach is, kicks out early, and proceeds to paddle back out. Here's the first wave. This is a 6.33, Matt. Yeah, a smaller wave to set up this final. Uh, it's about waist high on Connie Ella. Beautiful tip control. We see him sort of climbing and dropping on the nose. Now, that's something that, that really went away from longboarding from the 60s, and we haven't seen it until recent years with this re. Uh, evaluated criteria, but Carney using the full length of the board. Gorgeous trim and timing. The Hawaiian is definitely not looking like uh, a surfer from the North Shore or Makaha, dealing with all that chop and all that bump, but he's looking like a perfectionist, a stylist from Queens, Waikiki. Groom the walls of Queens. Uh, just a beautiful canvas for Carney Alistair to develop his surfing. Noosa, the points up in the sunny coast of Australia. Also a great canvas to develop graceful surfing of Harrison Roach. And Harrison danced to an 8.83 on his opening ride, Matt. Now, uh, we're a little bit cynical of the judges in the heat in the semi-final with Taylor Jensen and Harry wondering what these surfers need to do to get towards an excellent range score, or if not, an even t a perfect 10. But look at that timing, just delaying the five, beautiful technique, 10 toes over the nose. Now watch this, doesn't pedal all the way back, holds it. The board is fully in the barrel. It does not get any more critical than that. See the steering, he's on the inside of the stringer, Kaipo, back on the heels and the other side of the stringer. Subtle foot movements. This is only applicable on a single fin longboard. The choice of equipment for both surfers in this final. And Harry Exub, that's, that's excellent surfing. 8.83. He hears the number, he wants to back it up. Live action now, Harrison Roach. Again, casual on the nose, levitating through sections. Extremely difficult placement of his board in that trim line. Now gets a little caught up on this small wave, has to bail out of it. That was a really fun hot dogging start to that wave. We'll have a look on that replay shortly. But Harry feeling it once that 883 was announced. And that little fade takeoff reminded me of something that I've seen a first point Noosa before, Kaipo. Oh. What did it remind you of? Harry grew up at Noosa, surfing the, gr the perfect sand bottom points. So this points. fade this right bang. here. Yep, it's to set up that section. Very, very stylish from Harry, but he's done it hundreds, if not thousands of times in his life. But have a look at the little technical adjustments through this whitewash here. Most surfers would have fallen off by now, but Harry's looking for the inside bowl. It really did run away. It was a smaller wave, but it had that great shape. We're under priority, Carney Ella had beaten him out, but it turns out good choice from uh, Carney because he's locked in the 767 to go with his 633, but he has priority. Oh, here we go. The women's finals getting ready. Soleil Erico is going to be up against Sophia Culhane. And that is another final in which not just an event win is going to be decided, but a world title. So both men's and women's world champions will be crowned in the water here at Malibu. And that is what has made 2022 season for longboarding so exciting. This is the climax and two very fitting surfers. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Our final four surfers through the semifinals were the in form in, the, in all three events. We saw, we said goodbye to uh, Ben Skinner earlier on. Declan Whiten got the jump of him in the quarterfinal on the rankings, but also in he, the position of moving into the semifinals. And at the last 10 seconds was, was pinched by Caniella Stewart, who waited more than 16 minutes for that wave. Yeah, Kaniala with a clutch play in semifinal number two. 
Harrison Roach continues to, to seek underneath the priority of Connie Alice Stewart. Clock set at 24 minutes, 15 seconds on the countdown. Plenty of time. We're probably going to see, I'm going to say, maybe four more sets within this time frame. Well, let's hope so. But one thing I want to make a note of is the gamesmanship from Carney. I wasn't sure if that score was going to be affected. It was a 7-6-7. If he had continued a little further down the line, I feel like it may have gone at excellent range. I'm just talking a final maneuver or another nose ride, but it made all the difference because by gaining that priority, that first choice of wave, it made Harrison go on, a, on a, a wave that he wouldn't have been waiting for. He just thought, ah, I've got nothing to lose. The mindset changes. Although there was still 30 minutes left to go, Harry's now requiring a 5-1-7. Had he have got that bonus section and made it through the closeout, I think he would have re received that score, but he's still in second place. Yeah, a lot of times I use the term heat control. And when I use the term heat control, it means you have the lead in the heat, and you have priority. So you truly have control of your own destiny. You already are out in front, and now you can wait to improve upon that position, forcing your opponent, in this case Harrison Roach, to really have to deal, you know, kind of on the defense, if you would, where he's gonna have to scrap little waves inside of Kaniala's priority. I don't think nerves will get to either of these surfers, uh, witnessing Harrison's uh, prep over here with his friends and uh, family and uh, Thomas Bexon, his shaper, listening to music, hanging out. I didn't see him drinking a beer, but all the crew there enjoying it. What was Carney's setup like? Carney's with a whole lot of aloha with the Queens crew, the Hawaiian crew right up the beach. Here we go, Harrison Roach. Oh, levitation at his best to the five trim oh. line. Little Quasimodo-ish head dip right there. Oh. And comes through the section right behind him. Connie Ellis Stewart streaking on a wall of his own. Two surfers putting on a show here, as well as Malibu first point providing beautiful waves. Wave ends a little bit early for Harrison Roach, but Connie Ellis Stewart continues on. Calm demeanor, beautiful swooping cross stepped cut back, back to the nose one more time. And Connie Ellis is going to take this one all the way to the beach as we watch the finish right here in the shore break. Phenomenal surfing, excellent surfing perhaps from both competitors, Kaipo, and that's the Queens crew that you just referred to. <laughs> yeah, that's the Hawaii crew, and you can see uh, them all grouped together, and they're all with a singular cause to support two surfers from Hawaii, one in the men's final, one in the women's final. Replay, Connie Alice Stewart. All right, so this was overshadowed by uh, Harrison's wave beforehand. Now, beautiful, three nose rods in the outside section, uh, nothing overly critical, a little shuffle back into a nice rail carve. Rides high, gets that 10. You'll notice these surfers staying high on the wave, and as they drop, a little bit of speed there, stepping back into a nice little drop knee setup turn. Gets a lot of work here, doesn't pull out like he did on the previous wave, Kaipo, deciding this wave had much more scoring potential and it was worth uh, letting go of priority to hopefully get the trump on Harrison and we'll see what this exchange comes in at. Yeah, and replay with that fade, Harrison Roach. Another fade to set this one up, gets low and bang, straight up at 10, two toes, two feet right over the nose. I love that delay. And are in that cup, that bubble of the pocket. So tick, 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 if we're judging. And a nice, uh, easy pull out for Harry. Not a dynamic finish as he possibly would have hoped for, but a nice nerve settler if there was any. And it's definitely going to go higher than his 357. And then you can kiss that 517 requirement goodbye. Yeah, this, these two rides from each of our competitors will certainly leverage what the, the position is in this heat. So we can have a flip of the lead right now and we're still waiting for scores, last score in. Harrison Roach is 6.77, Roach goes to lead, waiting for last score for Kaniala Stewart. Kaniala can regain the lead with a 7.94 on his last ride. Your assessment, like, well, Connie's previous ride, a 7.67, a mm. little longer wave for Kaniala Stewart, not that length of ride matters, but he did fit in more maneuvers in that longer wave. Yes, that uh, that 767 was the one he pulled off a little earlier yeah. to get regain that priority. 
Uh, Harry's ended at about the same time as well. So you could, I don't know, Harry's was a very dynamic beginning, but I thought that maybe I was a little excited by the head dip. Not a scoring maneuver, but it's just cool to it was, see. It's cool style. It's an ode to, it's style. And style is in the criteria, although very subjective. I liked it. I would have gone a little higher, but as I said, not a dynamic finish. May have gone excellent if he had the finish, but uh, we'll see what these lock in at. And a uh, few waves on the horizon. If you're in a four-man heat or an overlapping, you would definitely see a lot more waves being ridden because it hasn't really stopped breaking. Well, Malibu has gifted us, and First Point has been performing all day today with dream-like waves. A little bit of a ruffle right now from the sea breezes, but it doesn't affect the performance aspect of this wave because it really is the beautiful part of this point, first point. Exactly right. You can see those little chops uh, where the surfers are, just tiny little uh, one or two inch chops that are breaking over the boards. And that's the, that wind, that pushing a little side wind swell. But what we've got is a south south ground swell. So it's actually coming and, and coming straight into the bay here at Malibu. Kaipo, update us on the scores. Wow. Well, Connie needed a 7.94. He got a 7.57. So Connie Alice Stewart getting the news right now that he continues to trail Harrison Roach. He's actually lost his lead over Harrison Roach. So Harrison did what he had to do. And that's uh, Harrison now utilizing his priority with that fade to bottom turn again. And again, just calmly, subtly, weight distribution, nose riding technique, trim line for Harrison Roach. Beautiful style, beautiful control on the cutback. Stalls himself again to make another trip for a 10, really tipping oh. it over and losing it there, Harrison Roach. You know, I was just thinking of some, uh, some terms to, to label that nose riding. It's the best I've ever seen Harry nose ride. And I often reference icons from the past, Lance Carson, Johnny Fain, Mickey Dora. But I tell you what, Harry and Carney and a few other surfers in this event, including Soli Erico, Honolulu Bloomfield, are rewriting the book on how to surf Malibu. Some amazing lines. And look at that, Kaipo. Waterman skills. Harrison Roach easily body surfs his way in and retrieves his board. Here's the replay. What went wrong on this one? Exceptional. A lot of went right, though. That. Boom. Redirecting straight up onto the nose in the pocket again. The board is completely high in the wave. A little bit of levitation. I love this turn. Back into the bowl again, and he pushed it. It went a little too high. And the rail slips out. Bang. It's too much pressure on the inside rail. Mind you, he's in that apex of the wave. The, the, it's almost not vertical by any means, but that bowl, the water is uh, spinning up the face, and the board's drifting down. And it's that weight distribution that Harry's been showing. Uh, is his execution has been perfect. It's just a little slip up there, maybe a little chop, or maybe those legs starting to hurt from a lot of heats today, Kaipo. Hey, I mean, it's four wins to a world title today. So both of our competitors, this is their fourth heat surf today. So it's taxing. Mm. It's going to be a test of your physical fitness and your endurance. And uh, gosh, you know, it's all been, and not just that the mental fortitude to stay focused. You're so close to the prize. And it's uh, deceptively hot down here with two different types of seasons in the morning. It's cold with that offshore wind. And as those clouds clear, it's been heating up almost double the temperature right now. Cast your mind back to the semi-final with Taylor Jensen. Harry and Taylor were going for it the whole heat. Excellent range scores, high eights, high nines, sevens, the whole way through. And I did make a mention to see how the energy levels were going to be for the final. And Carney sat for 15 minutes until he got his final wave. Yeah. There's the crew and Sophia Colhane preparing for the women's final against Soleil Erico. Quiet time there. And that is the crew hailing from Queen's Surf Break on the south shore of Oahu, where waves have been ridden for centuries. Carniella embodies that Hawaiian spirit. He's got a little necklace, a uh, little shell necklace that he wears uh, that's an ode to good luck. It's a good luck charm. And we've been talking a lot through this event about connection. Uh, there's a lot of connection through the boards, the spirit of this place with our Chumash Indians and the uh, Hu Mali Hu. Oh, yeah. And they're the, that's the name for a breaking waves, the sound of breaking waves. It's a gathering place. Not only this history goes a lot further back than the classic Malibu wall, those big Wednesday scenes where you're walking in through the pit, you know, the, the notepads, it was a bulletin board as such. 
this is a melting pot of characters, and we've got an Australian and Hawaiian in the final. Well, we're going to take a break. We're going to be back with the conclusion, and we're going to find out who is going to be the world champion of longboarding when we return. It's been an amazing two days of longboarding here with the best in the world at the Cuervo Classic Malibu Championships presented by O'Neill. And now for the men, it has come down to these two, Harrison Roach and Kaniala Stewart surfing it off for a world title. I'm Kaipo joined by Matt Shinovsky, the Waxhead, to talk you through this. And nothing has changed since we left other than the clock. Absolutely. Kaipo, we asked these questions when Arnie Meggs was in the booth before. You being Hawaiian, myself being Australian, I'm sure we can both stand neutral, or do you have a favourite who's going to take this one out? I am... I think either of these surfers are deserving a world title. Both of these surfers have come close to it. Both of these surfers are amongst the best in the world. For sure, we're gonna have a new world champ for men's longboarding. The funny thing is, both of these surfers have been considered to be the, you know, the best at certain times in their careers. The Cunniellas are getting better and better. Harry's in his 30s and he's still improving. He's tweaking his boards, his mindset, although focused on other things outside of longboarding, it still always remains of winning that world title, and it's really cool to see the re-emergence of characters like Harrison joining this world tour, or rejoining the world tour after a hiatus, yes. stepping away from competition for quite some time. Yeah, and remember, Harrison Roach 2021 was one heat away from a world title. So Malibu served Harrison Roach heartbreak in 2021. Will Malibu serve Harrison Roach some flowers? in 2022. He's been surfing Malibu uh, longer than most Australians of, uh, I would say, my generation. Uh, reference guys like, um, you know, Australian guys, there weren't many on single fin longboards, but Harry was flying the, the torch along with myself. It's gone full cycle, Kaipo. There was only niche places like Noosa, like Byron Bay. Uh, Malibu was one of those places, San Onofre and Rincon, where single fin longboards were the, uh, the most suited and the most commonly found surfboard. But these days, these longboards in general, 
I found all around the globe. Every little coastal pocket has got a, a little longboard culture emerging. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the emergence of longboarding. I believe it's it, it's kind of never gone away, but it's at its most popular time where you see people with more open mind. I think he has a hole in surfing. Everyone's kind of gotten into the ride everything kind of, or the ride the right board, or it's okay to ride something different. There was a time in surfing where surfers were really judging, judgy about each other and what you rode. And I'm talking, you know, a lot of like into the 90s. Absolutely. And you, know, you were branded. You were just branded. You either rode a, a rock it out shortboard or you didn't surf at all. Well, the rock it out shortboard doesn't work in every wave in the world. Mm. Matter of fact, it's the worst board that you could ride at many waves in the world. Yeah. But new mindset brings new performance and just way more fun to surfing. Here we go, Kaniala Stewart, up, riding. 7.94 is the mark that he needs to meet. Couple of difficult sections there, but nice carve down. Calm body, back to the nose. Holds that nose ride to trim. Back to the middle of the board, drop knee, cut back. Swoops another turn. Kaniala, showing control. Perched at the tip. Cross-stepping into that cutback. Harrison Roach in the background taking off on a wave of his own. Kaniala looking to finish on the beach, and he does so. Out the back, aggressive turn by Harrison Roach. Skipping through this section, back to the nose, trim line. Roach, big carve again for the Aussie. Around this section, stylish drop knee, cut down. And kicks out early. Now Harrison Roach employing a little strategy to win that paddle battle back for priority. Great exchange, Kaipo. Uh, the waves not as big and dynamic as what we saw at the beginning of the heat. Harry only needed to better a 677. We'll soon see with the replay. Here we go. So uh, a quick whip fade turn and a great 10 on the outside holds that in that critical section, stepping back into a gouging cutback. You can almost see the fin give way, four steps up. Bang, won't make the same mistake that he did earlier with that inside rail dipping down. Another snap, he really puts his body into those turns and a beautiful drop knee, which we don't see from Harrison. It's not really a part of his repertoire. Sees Carney the inside, back out to get priority. Carniala, he needs a 7.94 on this wave. There hadn't been a wave for over 10 minutes to this point, Kaipo, and he needed something. Time ticking down, so he rolled the dice on this and why wouldn't you, a perfect Malibu wall, four steps, up to the nose, utilizing that tight pocket. Beautiful poise style from Carniella. I love that drop knee. Also a recent addition in Nakani surfing. Showing some variety of the turns. And I love that elevated nose right here. Little side sweep just before it. Very subtle. And this one died out towards the inside. A little sleepy. But he surfed this to perfection. And there'd be many surfers out there around the world who would just like... Just a tiny, just that, just that little inside section and pulling off. I love the step off, Kaipo. Steps off right in the beach, milking it all the way through. I guess the question is with Connie Stewart, was there that score in that wave? There's no doubt about his surfing ability and the variety on display, but was there that score on that wave? It was a smaller wave and he was really pushing it when he took off on that. And here he goes again. One more chance for Connie Stewart. Keep in mind, he hasn't heard what his last score was. We don't know, so he's still chasing a 794. Styling and saves it, but gets caught up again. Now, I'm interested if there's a, a malfunction with the fin or something. I did mention a, a subtle side slip before. We haven't seen Carney fall uh, at all today, I don't believe. So, ha oh, and Harry, a little back. Whoa. You can see the backwash there. That's it. Is that the same backwash that knocked uh, Carney off his wave on the inside? Possibly. Kaniala this time showing his body surfing skills, gliding through. Numbers in, See, needs a 794. One judge up, one judge down. Three judges remaining. Kaniala retrieving his board in the shore break. Still waiting on judge one, two, and five. One thumbs up, one thumbs down. The number 794 is the requirement for Kaniala Stewart. Tense times here, Kaipo. That backwash uh, starting to 
wreak a little havoc. We saw this yesterday afternoon. We have an evening high tide around 7 p.m. And it's a pretty big tide. 7, 8, that's under. Two under, one over. Two more judges remaining. Another score under. It's going to come under for Kaneala Stewart on that last ride. Ooh. 7.9, not enough. Seat needed a 7.94, got a 7.9, barely not enough, hundredths of a point. Wow, and it's nothing with Kaniella surfing. It may have been the wave that just let him down there, Kaipo, so good decision of Harry to, well, it's impossible, he couldn't have identified that Kani didn't get that score, but regaining that priority. So we have yet to see a Harry's fifth wave lock in, which will be interesting, because with three minutes 40 left in the clock, our surfer in red from Australia, Noosa Heads, Harrison Roach, leading the world title race. And it's all come down to the last three minutes, Kaipo. Radical, radical. Two judges up out of the judging panel. Three judges down. That is as close as you can get to getting your requirement. Four hundredths of a point short. Just a little bit of backwash. And it's, that's, there's, Let's digest this again. So the start, perfect. Did everything he had to, five and 10. Stepping back into another carve. We've seen this many times through this event already. Seamless surfing, barely falling this whole event. Now stepping 10, beautiful nose ride. Well on his way here to a solid score. Stepping forward, beautiful. You saw that little bit of adjustment there. Gorgeous 10. The wave's shrinking in size though, Kaipo. And it's, you know, it's, it's getting to the point where he's really trying to milk everything out of this. And the judges, for an excellent wave score, they want to see action from start to finish. Yep. And that wave was a little grovelly towards the end. And coming up four one hundredths of a point, but not really, where we really digest things, because the judges did owe us a score for Harrison Roach. That score has come in during that replay at a 7.1. So Kaniala's requirement was going to be larger than that 7.94. Regardless, Kaniala's requirement now, an 8.04, and he's under the priority of Harrison Roach. Harrison Roach really with the ultimate in heat control right now because there's under two minutes on the clock. Absolutely, but positive notes here for Carney is the set's been rolling in in multiple uh, groups. Two, three, four, five, even a six-wave set earlier. So if one comes, likely it's going to be a bit of choice there from Harry. And he's shaking his head for some odd reason. I don't know what they're chatting about. That Having a chat, minute 30 left. <laughs> Look at the body language. Harry is stooped over, no tension, going for a world title, mind you. And Carney just leaning him back, see his feet crossed over, very relaxed. Minute 25 left on the clock. I think we're a little more tense in here I'm, than the surface. Yeah, uh, really relax. Uh, 31 years old, Harris, Harrison Roach. Yep. 31. Uh, it's Vince. a long journey to a world title. Absolutely. He's really gone full circle. Uh, the best thing about these two surfers, though, if it's 10 foot and pumping tomorrow, they're out there. Yeah. They ride all boards, all conditions. They're true watermen in every sense of the word. I mean, you could just tell by the way they body surf. All that too, and it's just the way they judge the waves, the way they position the board, adapt to criteria, um, the way they work with the ocean. It's it's a phenomenal thing to watch and observe, and it's a hard thing to compete against, I'll tell you that much. Well, now Harrison Roach able really to soak in this moment. Down to 35 seconds, a quiet ocean. He does take the precaution of putting himself on the inside of Kaneala Stewart, with priority, that's kind of a formality in a way, so that he can exercise his priority if a wave miraculously did appear. But now, at 15 seconds, it's a foregone conclusion, Matt. Incredible. And there is a little glimmer of waves here. Wow. Is this five This will be the block, yeah. This will be the block right here. They're both paddling. Yep. And time is running out. We've got zero. There we go. we got zero. And you know what we got? Wow. We have a new world champion in the way of Harrison Roach. I am so goosebumpy right now. Oh, even I've got a little tear in here, Kaipo, having shared Harry's journey. But, you know, and also for Carney, amazing surfing this year and through the last couple of years seeing 
Carniella grow as a as a human and as a surfer. It's uh, you know these are the these are the, the reasons why we watch competitive surfing and history has been made. We've just seen uh, world title go down and uh, it's a little bit somber for the Hawaiians, but they still have Sophia Colhane coming up next in the women's. That's right. And if we think about, let's just unwrap Harrison Roach's 2022. Actually, to do that, we have to look back at 2021, where it was a heartbreak loss here for Harry at Malibu, one heat away from a world title. Fast forward, 2022, the tour starts, North Stain, Manly Beach, challenging conditions. Harrison Roach comes back and wins that event and puts himself as the front runner on the tour. Dynamic conditions, he had to surf through from knee high offshore glassy waves all the way up into some onshore up to six feet waves, board changes, a delay in the uh, period of waiting period. And then to Huntington, where he got a result that was a little underwhelming, almost to the point where he, he wondered why he even rocked up to, to Huntington. Ah, oh, this. Let's enjoy this. This is the beauty of longboarding, and this show is absolutely 393 right now because this is just beautiful surfing and the style and soul of surfing. Style, On flow, and grace. style flow, and grace. Um, wow, and just Carney saluting our 2022 World Longboard Champion, Harrison Roach from Australia, claiming his maiden victory as a world champion and the Malibu Cuervo, Malibu Classic. Had to get it done here. Already had a keeper result with a victory at Manly. Negate, no problem. Whatever happened at Huntington Beach didn't matter for Harrison Roach. He had to win at Malibu, and that he did. A long time coming, 31 years, and now a world champion, Harrison Roach, can add his name on a long list of incredible surfers. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and I feel like I want to cheer him up there, too. They've got the 805s flowing and uh, just sinking back a few beers. I'll tell you what, this is uh, an iconic moment. Malibu in pumping waves. The surfers did have opportunity throughout, and it's just been incredible. This is one of the most uh, memorable Longboard Bell Championship two years ever, Kaipo. Title is won in the water, and that's the way we wanted to see it. Harrison Roach rose to the occasion, did his job after against a very talented Connie Alla Stewart, who had a lot of momentum coming into that final. But right now, the brotherhood on full display. And uh, this is the beautiful thing about surfing, no matter what board you ride. Absolutely, and uh, that's Chad Marshall down there. Congratulating him. We had Ben Skinner there and all the competitors coming up. Just really, everyone's ridden Harry's journey. Uh, the, the, the content that we've created this year, as far as the tour is concerned, the stories that have been built, and it's all climaxed today here at, at Surfrider Beach. And, and Harry up against that iconic Malibu wall we've spoken about throughout the event. Goosebump moments here, and so proud of, of Harrison. He has deserved this, as is everybody, but you know, coming right through, surfing beach breaks. We've surfed into the pier at Huntington, and we end here at Malibu Beach. Let's hear from the new world champ. Strider, you got him. We got him, the new world champ. I haven't seen you smile all day until now. You were laser beam focused. You're the Cuervo Classic Malibu champion out here, presented by O'Neill. Let me hear your thoughts and your energy from being a world champ. Yeah, I'm really happy. Um, got very close last year, and it, uh, I realized at that point just like how much it takes to to get here again and then I, I did and I just put my head down and made it count. I would have liked to have not fallen on that second good one I had. I left the door open for Carney there, but um, gee, he got close. I think when the beach commentator announced it, I thought he had the score. Uh, so it's a relief for me, but yeah, I'm ready to have a few beers and relax for a bit. <laughs> Tell me about Carney. Carney, he's got like a massive future. He's obviously one of the best longboarders in the world right now, if not ever. Um, comes from Hawaii, a really important uh, place for surf history. The kid's a sweetheart as well, and uh, no, I, I'm lucky to have him in the final with me, for sure. Well, congratulations, WSL Longboard World Champion. You've gone and done it. Let me hear a little bit more about everybody back home watching. Yeah, so mom and dad, thanks for supporting me. Um, they took me to contests when I was a little kid, you know, and uh, 
Now I've gone and done this. Um, to Fano, yeah. to everybody who's made my boards over the years, uh, to Rourke, all the guys who helped me to get to these contests and to travel and surf. Uh, there once was a time where longboarding didn't have a platform like this and, and it was a different style of surfing. So I'm really fortunate to be here. Thanks to Joel and the duct tape and Vans who put those events on for so many years. Um, and yeah, thanks to the WSL and the sponsors. I'm a very happy man. <laughs> well, congratulations. Go celebrate. Enjoy your time. And once again, right on, brother. Thank you, Serata. You. Cheers. Thank you. The women's final is underway. The local Soleil Erico linking into the opening ride for this year's Cuervo Classic, the Longboard World Championships here at Malibu. And she's on her way to opening up the exchange to getting that first ride ridden. Nice footwork, slow pace to it, engages the rail for Erico as she t climbs up to the nose one more time, gets that sole arch bottom turn, lines it up into the pocket and just engages that rail, throws spray both off that forehand turn as well as the back rail now into that hang 10 again sets it up here with that drop knee cut back and is styling her way through to an early start in the finals against Sophia Culhane of Hawaii and Soleil Erico of Southern California out in the water getting that paddle on and we have a great heat on our hands as we just watched Harrison Roach crowned the men's world champion for this year for the Longboard Tour. Incredible. Shannon Hughes here alongside my good friend, Sam Bleakley, to call all the action. That was a really strong start for Soleil. She's opting to change the wetsuit, a bit of color in the wetsuit, gone for the turquoise wetsuit, but beautiful nose riding and really strong turning. Very good momentum she will now carry forward to the final. But what a joy it was to see Harrison Roach win the 2020 Men's World Longboard Championships. Harrison has been a standout longboarder for two decades, and we've all known that he's got a world title. He deserves a world title, and now he's finally got that after coming so close last year. And we know that Connie Ellis-Stewart will come back for more. He's got a long career ahead, but 
Harrison Roach was just sensational today. He really matched the speed, the pace of this point break with incredible dynamic longboarding. Incredible display of longboarding in that men's final. And now we're into the women's final where we'll see these two battling it out. Whoever takes the win will win the world championship here today. So Leigh Errico came into this event ranked number three in the world. Sophia Colhane came through ranked number eight in the world. They both got that qualification for next season banked and now they're looking for world title opportunity. So Leigh Errico already has a world title. She won back in 2018 at Jensen Harbor in Taiwan on a beautiful day with nice, clean, running right hand waves. And Sophia Colain, the 16 year old, not only has a world title on the line, but could take away the youngest ever world championship title in surfing from the young Rachel Tilly, who won at 17. Sophia could take that at 16 today. It's interesting that because Soleil had that final with Rachel to become the second youngest women's world longboard title winner at 17, beating Rachel Tilly, but, but not beating Rachel's record because she was just a, a slightly older 17. But then Sophia now surfing with Soleil in this final. I remember fondly seeing Soleil win that final, but she's reinvented her surfing. She's taken it even further here. There's remnants of a kind of Australian cat Hughes with the way she turns and uses the drop knee. But all of this nose riding has got beautiful Hawaiian and Malibu, California influence. Look at that turn. That's the cat Hughes reference I was talking about, that beautiful rail work. But look at the charisma and the and the, and the poise that Soleil is showing in her surfing. There's a maturity to this 21-year-old that has really blown me away all event. And the flow and the power and the link and the glide between all the sections has just been first class. Wow, great ride. She opens up on a 6.83 and puts Sophia with that priority now, chasing a score. Finishes off with that quick tap to the nose on the inside section as well. And one of the features of Soleil surfing is that high stance, but that flex in the hips, using the knees and the hips to flex and allow control, but keeping her upper body very high. If you look at her back, a lot of times her back is extremely straight. I saw in the past from Soleil, when she'd go into maneuvers, she would hunch the back a little bit more and widen the stance. She seemed to have developed this incredible technique of, of still doing these powerful turns, but bringing the legs ever so slightly closer, but wide enough to initiate the turn, but using those hips and those knees for all the flex and control and keeping that upper body very straight and it looks beautiful. Yeah, it's really just well-rounded her surfing. I love that breakdown, the fact that, you know, she's brought that stance a little bit tighter, but it still allows for the power and the engagement that she needs to be able to get out of that back foot. And the, the inspiration of these kind of involvement surfing boards in the late 1960s, George Greeno inspired a group of young Australians to put dolphin shaped fins on boards and those Australians led by the likes of Bob McTavish and Nat Young pulled the wide point back, put V bottoms on the board to allow a, a switching planing edges and developed a type of aggressive surfing, which was called involvement surfing, being right in the pocket, right in the power point of the wave. And that was the beginnings of the shortboard revolution. But there was a period of time where footwork and cross-stepping was still involved in these V bottom boards. And then more recently, the rediscovery of those types of boards has been combined with all the knowledge we've gained through the modern longboard era. And what we're seeing from Soleil is an example of that design taken to the edge. And it's really beautiful to see. Well, that board's been paying off for her the Velvet Hour. And in that last heat, we saw Connie Ella Stewart come so close to clinching his dreams. He's gone down in second, but put together an incredible performance. And he's down with Strider Wazlewski. Thank you very much, Shannon. I'm just going to say it. You're a crowd favorite here on the beach, man. Every time you caught a wave, people lit up. It was so wonderful to watch you. Yeah, it was so much fun to be out there. Frick Harrison was killing it. Um, there was waves. And it was just so fun just to be out there surfing with one other guy out at Malibu. And it's perfect out there, but we had a good time. Well, great year for you, obviously. And, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on the tour? And, and what are you looking for next year? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just you know, ready for next year, just come back stronger, try and, you know, train up, you know, work on my some, some stuff, go back, watch videos, and just try and get better. Well, it was a true pleasure to see you out here, man, and I love uh, your style on the, on the nose uh, and your all-around performance and, and a true beauty of a, of a person, so thank you very much, man. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Aloha, guys. Aloha. Connie with a second-place finish at the World Championships, and 
on his way to a long, long career here in professional longboarding. Absolutely. Connie is the poster boy of modern longboarding. He embodies all of that Hawaiian grace and style, but he has this international flavor to his surfing, pulling influences from Europeans, South Americans, Americans, and Asians, and just fusing it all together with that Hawaiian grace. And his charisma, his positivity is something that really shines at every event. And you know that he's going to be going for world titles in the future. And next year might well be his year. And one surfer that gets to spend a lot of time in the water with that Hawaiian crew is Sophia Culhane. Spending time living now on the south shore of Oahu near Waikiki, surfing out there every day that she can. Family travels quite a lot. Her mom, Sarah, her brother, James, they're a little bit of those globe trotters that spend time in Australia and Costa Rica, mostly in Hawaii, but also has spent a significant amount of time in California this season because there's been a great run of events. And Sophia just came off of that fantastic finish with a win for the North American longboard qualifier at Pismo just this last weekend. So four or five days ago, she was victorious and chaired up the beach by her friends. So it's been great to see the young surfer at 16 rise to those heights now, getting that qualification onto tour and coming in with some outstanding results so far. A young surfer, but having started age four, She's already got a lot of wisdom in her surfing, and she's part of a community of Waikiki surfers who have really brought a new energy to global longboarding. And beating Kelly Kelly-Opaha in the semi-final would have given Sophia a massive amount of confidence to know that she could go all the way to take the title. Huge, huge amount of confidence. And now you've broken down so well the equipment that Soleil's riding. Let's talk about the Michael Takayama that Sophia's been riding because the Michael Takayama boards also have started to kind of reshape the way we look at longboarding over the last few years. Yeah, and, and um, Connie Ellis-Stewart was a standout riding the Michael Takayamas a few years ago, and now he's with Kai, Kai Salas and the flip tail design is one of the distinctive pe features of Michael Takayama's boards, but there's so many other elements to them and the beautiful finish to them, the resin tints, the distinctive, the distinctive string of colors, the, the, the vibrancy of everything about them and they're all handcrafted and Michael finishes those boards from the very beginning to the delivery to the bespoke surfer and he, he's an artisan he's a surfboard building craftsman at the finest and whenever you see a michael takayama you spot it from miles away it jumps out at you they're generally vibrant resin tint colors and they have been under the feet of some of the best longboarders in the world for the last five years. We've had so many of the surfers in the draw this week that have been riding Michael Takayamas and also at Pismo over the weekend for that North America and that Hawaii qualifier specifically, being that Michael is a California shaper. I, it was unbelievable the amount of Michael Takayamas that you saw down the beach. And like you said, they're, you cannot mistake them for any other board. The trademark stripe through the middle that tapers off at the top and the bottom, the colors that come through, that design element that he adds into it, as well as those shapes that have become so iconic and, and I think helped a lot of these surfers to find that confidence in finding nose rides and wanting to hold them for as long as they possibly can. And, and of course that happens from the tail. Good nose rides where the board lifts and holds in a steep section, the critical part of the wave, that's dependent on, on a number of factors, but rail shape, tail width, tail shape, and the dynamics, the, the bottom shape, particularly behind the fin, are extremely important to allow that. The older style progressive long boards that might have had wider noses and narrower tails, they might have been exciting for rail surfing, but they tend to nose ride a little bit out on the shoulder, and when you do try to nose ride them in the pocket, they might slide out. So they ride the nose from the nose, but they can sometimes push water and not lift in the critical nose ride. And what we're seeing from the likes of both of these surfers is designs that facilitate that critical nose riding. But competitive longboarding isn't a nose riding competition. Rail work is a big part of the criteria. And you'll see from both of these women that they engage the rail powerfully. Their surfing is holistic. It's a combination of footwork flow, rail work, and nose riding. A set starting to roll through now. Our surfer in blue, Sophia Colhane, sitting with priority. She has yet to take off on a ride. So Lay Erico in red with second priority has to give way to Sophia on this ride. Now up and running to the nose. Perches to that hang five for a moment. Back into a second hang five. Locks in for a long one. She's going to go for that 10 quickly as that wave continues to bowl up in front of her. A longer hang 10, back to the five, back to the 10 as Soleil is now up and riding on a solid set just behind. And Sophia digs the rail but manages to recover, wipes the face and goes back to the nose as Soleil is 
Silky Smooth out the back, and Sophia goes down, slips off the wax, and falls on the finish of her wave, while Soleil Erico is trimming her way through. Multiple nose rides, incredible rail work, and setting this high line once again as she comes through for that long five. Pedals back off, down to the tail, wraps it back into the foam, wow. and gives the stare back to the tower. That was a full roundhouse cutback at the end. She, she, you know, she put that board into a figure of eight S turn all the way around. She's just checking that board is safe and sound. That, that was, was a gnarly finish just now. She got fully sucked over the falls on top of it. That was a gnarly finish, but that was an extremely incredible bit of surfing. She put everything into that. The, the criticalness of that full figure of eight roundhouse at the end of that wave was just absolutely next level. Sophia was looking incredible on those fives, on those tens. She committed to some really strong nose rise, but then once she, she she didn't so much dagger rail, but she, she just toppled forward. She came so radical off that cutback top turn coming into a bottom turn that she kind of leant forward. And then you could just see that there was just a, a little bit of tempo change in her body posture. And then she fell a little bit later down the line. Sometimes when you set off that kind of that little wobble, even if you survive that wobble, later down the line, you've lost a little bit of that rhythm and tempo, and that's what happened to Sophia, which is a shame because she had such a strong start to that wave. The first two thirds of Sophia's wave was exceptional. Scores to come through for both Soleil and for Sophia. Down to 20 minutes on the clock, and it took Sophia about 15 minutes to get going on that first ride with 35 minutes on the clock. So now she can shake it off. She's got those falls put together, like you said, an incredible performance in the first two thirds. So she takes a midline there and now gets a, a high line, but not super high, more in the middle of the wave. Smart surfing. She's got the perfect trim line there. And this is where she starts to get radical on the nose, getting a tight five, a quick 10, and then the longer 10. That's the first long 10, but that third 10 there was exceptional. And then she puts this board on rail and just here, she just takes that wobble. And at that moment, the rhythm, the tempo has changed. And you think that she's recovered here and she does do a couple of really good nose rides, but there was just a sense of a loss of momentum and tempo and rhythm with that ride. In contrast to Soleil's, which was a similar start, straight up for the critical nose ride, gets the 10, gets the soul arch, has a bit of bounce there, but navigates that stylishly. But then look at this middle section of the wave. She just releases back off the bottom and elegantly climbs up to the top using the cross stepping as she's rising up into the wave for another 10 and then pedaling back to the tail. Those release turns are absolutely sensational. But wait for this turn on the inside. She gets one more nose ride here, soul arch, arm up, iconic Malibu pier in the background and then goes for this turn, full figure of eight, roundhouse cut back, rebounds off the foam and then the flick of the rail edge here was awkward. But look at that turn. That was absolutely outstanding, and I think it's going to be a huge score. Scores in for Soleil. It's an 8.67 as we take a look at that fall on the inside. Checks the board multiple times to make sure there's no creases in it and the fin is okay. But Soleil with the better of the exchange, an 8.67 into the excellent range. Sophia with the falls, a 5.67, but that sets her up with a score. She is, however, now chasing a 9.83 to take away the win. For sure, Sophia was on for an excellent score. I agree yeah. I, entirely. It was it was there. It was all no question. there. So, so it had, had that not have happened, I think both of the women would have been sitting on these scores in the near nine range. So as it stands, Soleil with that 6.83 and that 8. Six, seven. Sophia has got a lot of work to do, but we know she can do it. She's been performing in the excellent range, not only all Malibu event, but in the qualifying event for next year's World Tour at Pismo just the weekend before. She comes off the back of a huge win then. She beat a lot of the surfers who are here in this World Tour event. So many of those surfers were in the draw, and there's been a little run of events, the Supergirl Pro, which Rachel Tilly won. Both of these surfers were in the lineup for that one. There's been a lot of excitement and events in the lead up here to Malibu, as we see a nice drive back from Sophia as she finds that next hang 10, five pedals off the pocket, and now redirects here through to the inside, and she's getting some work done. And for her, this is her second wave. Nice critical five to 10, back to the 10, hangs on to the five, Nearly falls and she goes down backwards with the windmills kind of waving. Just that that rhythm lost in the finishing section now really needs to shake it off, settle the nerves, and know that she has everything it takes to take out Soleil in the seat. Yeah, that's that's very true, Shannon. She she does. She's just gotta 
just settle it. She's just It's just about two really good waves, and she knows she can get them. But the nose riding on that wave was incredible. It was a slightly smaller wave than Soleil's 8.67, also smaller than the 5.67 where Sophia fell. But up until that wobble at the end, the nose riding for me was some of the best nose riding of the women's final so far. Scores to come through for Sophia Culhane. She'll be in that second priority when she gets back out into the lineup. And an, an unbelievable display of nose riding of those five to tens back and forth as well, holding in that tight five right in the pocket as we're down to that near 15 minute mark. And, and well, yeah, the nice thing about surfing in a final with Soleil is you know that she spends so much time at Malibu that her lineup is going to be right on the that's money. That's such so a great point. Kind of base She's going to be sitting in the, in the right position, that's for sure. She's been in the right position all day. All yesterday, absolutely on fire. But so Sophia has just got this wonderful alchemy with Uncle Mike, she calls him, Michael Takayama. And he, he's, a, he's a wonderful man and a great craftsman. He's there on the beach watching. Uh, we know Sophia's brother James is here. Uh, her her mum Sarah is on the sand. She, she, she really felt the challenges of that semi-final with Khalees Kelio Paha, two very close friends coming up against each other, only one winner, both going for a world title. So that's one of the difficulties, but also it's that camaraderie that pushes longboarding forward. When you get these hubs, these collections of, of, of electric surfing, they really take it to new places. And Malibu has continually done that. It's continually been a driving force for creative dynamic longboarding over the decades. Yeah, we've seen the development of the sport from this break alone, as Sophia is now up and running again, drops in on the backwash into that five to start, into the 10. So you can see that beautiful glisten of the sun as Sophia now drives through the rail, sets up that turn and kicks out knowing that wave's not gonna have any great scoring potential. But that's the first wave that she's controlled all the way through to the finish. And that could be that moment to flip that rhythm for her. Absolutely, and also it was interesting watching Soleil. She had a look at that wave and she decided not to go on that wave behind Sophia. She knows in her head that she's trying to replace a 683. She'll certainly want to replace a 683. She'll be happy carrying that 867. That's a, you know the type of score that, that could be an important part of winning a world title. But she wants to replace that 683. So she would have had a look at that wave, read it, looked down the line, felt, you know what, I don't think there's a, there's a, there's a seven in this. I'm going to hang on to my priority and wait for a better wave. She only needs one more ride to replace that wave to hopefully get two waves in the excellent range. Requirements at the moment, a 9.83 on Sophia Colhane. She dropped in a 4.67 for her previous ride and a 3.33 for her last. So Lay now sitting tight with priority. She opened with that 6.83, built on the score line with an 8.67 and she's sitting in that priority position out the back. She's had that momentum with her this entire event as well. I feel like it, it's been the most incredible surfing that we've seen from Soleil, that real hot streak. Heat after heat, she's been dropping excellent scores. She's been using that priority well. She's been utilizing her local knowledge in perfect wave selection throughout this entire event. It's been unbelievable to witness. And then to be able to perform, to showcase what the judges are looking for, for that all around surfer from both nose riding and very good, solid rail work. As Soleil is now up and riding again, perches on the nose for a quick moment. Sets up that rail and that big S turn. Now back to that five, looking for a 10 if she can find it. You can feel when those surfers are trying to look for it and she finds it. Sophia now up and riding out the back behind her, straight to the five as Soleil does that full wrap back into the pocket as well. Sophia engaging the rail back to the nose. Soleil on the inside section with more criticalness to offer as she comes through for the finish. Sophia getting some great work done out the back as well. And Sophia now looking to put on a clean finish as Soleil kicks out and paddles as fast as she can to the top of the lineup. Sophia now kind of checking to see maybe where Soleil is but more importantly, focusing on finishing this wave strong. Nice tap to the 10 off of the five, and she'll have a great score to come through. Absolutely, that was a beautiful exchange. Both of those women, extremely powerful on the rail work as well. Not only was it good, smooth nose riding, the power in the rail engagement was exceptional. Soleil's wave was beautiful, but this is Sophia's wave. Sets up, there's the five, four steps up to the tip, soul arch, pedals back to the tail, Big sweeping cutback. See the spray and the acceleration as she switches planing edges and comes off the bottom again for that second cutback after that second nose ride. Third time 
on the nose. Hang five, low in the wave, in the perfect line. Again, sets herself up for another line. Low in the wave, but high in the wave as she gets onto the five. Arm raised behind her shoulders to the back there. And just one more readjustment for another nose ride through the inside, a critical nose ride, and styling all the way through. And then she walks cleanly through the cross steps and just does a beautiful kick out right on the sand in contrast to the slightly bigger wave that Soleil Erico had with four steps up for a full sole arch 10 into a tight five, pedaling back into some sweeping, snaking turns, climbing and dropping and accelerating. And look how she chooses the high part of the wave to lock in that five and lock in that 10. That whole tail board just lift, lifting and locking, allowing that nose to stay out of the face. And again, that dynamic turn. And see how she keeps that upper body quite high, but flexes low in the hips and knees. I love the body language. And then look at this hang 10 through the inside. Just when she's perched on the 10, she drops the arms low. And then how clean is that kick out after that last big turn? That's going to replace her 6.83. And it comes in at an 8.17. Well, scores through for Soleil. Quick out the gates in 8.17. Waiting now for last of Sophia Colhane. But she is officially in a combination situation requiring two fresh scores to take the win, to take the world title away from Soleil Erica. The Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championship presented by O'Neill is brought to you by Cuervo, the official tequila of the Longboard Championship. By O'Neill, first name in the water. By Epiphone, for every stage. And by Hydroflask, every adventure starts with two simple words. Let's go. minutes 10 seconds on the clock and Sophia Colhane has broken the combination she dropped a 7.33 for her last ride that we were waiting for she's now chasing a 9.51 the biggest score of the heat for the final Soleil Erico in the lead with an 8.67 and an 8.17 and it's been a brilliant display of longboarding the style the flow the grace everything that we wanted to see we are eating it up here on the beach in Malibu absolutely just from the semi-finals all of you longboarders tuning in around the world if you want to get a demonstration of perfect footwork watch Kalis Kelio Paha if you want to get a demonstration of perfect nose riding watch Sophia Colhane if you want to get a demonstration of perfect rail work watch Soleil Erico the way she's maneuvering that board for me is separating her from all of the other women she's doing turns and using that whole part of the wave driving off the bottom rising to the top and covering that part of their wave that's much bigger sphere than some of the other surfers who are doing more trim based surfing and part of the criteria is using all of the board and all of the wave making sure to use every single ounce of it, getting that nose work as well as the tail work, but engaging the rail. It's so different from in shortboarding where we see turns that are more like a pivot. They stop that, that flow and momentum moving forward, where in longboarding, we need to see that engagement of the entire rail, not just maybe a stance onto that, to that back foot and that fin to lift and pivot the board. But Sophia Colhane is right back in the mix, Shannon, because she's dropped a 7-3-3 for her 
last wave. There was an excellent display of nose riding and rail work. Both of these women extremely good on rail and that start with that critical nose ride is proving extremely important with Sophia chasing a 9.51 and Soleil looking to replace an 8.17. Sets that high line quick for Soleil straight to the nose. Finds that next high line, trim line, pedals off, doesn't want to force anything too much and engages the rail. Brings in the variety that she's been demonstrating so well throughout this event in her race to taking that leading position at the moment. Continues to find nose rides as Sophia Colleen is now up and riding out the back. Sophia opens with a nose ride, goes to the rail as Soleil engages in that beautiful carve back into the pocket now up to the nose again as Sophia kicks out the back Soleil continues to bring that great rail work and kicks out in the backwash so Soleil's wave all came alive on the middle and the inside for her Sophia's wave was incredible in the early section but she kicked out she recognized that there came a point where she didn't feel like she was going to get the massive score she needed had she stayed on it she might well have been able to replace that 5.67 and then needed less of a score than a 9.51 but interesting decision for her to kick out to get priority into the last five minutes of the heat but I love the way Soleil Erico's wave came along came alive on the inside and that's been a big feature of her surfing in this event the local knowledge and the way she chooses those waves that really come alive in that last half you know they really stand up and get lively and she really matches that energy with powerful present surfing in the pocket down to five minutes on the clock less than five minutes now four minutes 45 seconds specifically waiting for scores to drop through from both of our surfers and we'll take a look at the replays now to see where Sophia's may sit in the score line great midline on the way doesn't take the high line because she wants maximum trim speed there but then out the pocket pedals back to the tail to turn to get herself back into the pocket but looks over the shoulder because she recognized that there was not really much more scoring potential on that wave. Live action, similar size wave, but looking elegant and stylish. Shannon still trying to replace that 5.67. Yeah, she's doing everything that she can. She's staying active, she's staying busy, but it's gonna take that big score, sorry, that big wave to facilitate a giant score now. That's even increased more. It's a 9.71 requirement because Soleil Erico has just dropped in her third eight of the women's final, an 8.37. Brings her into a 17.04 heat total. And deservedly so. Soleil was on fire on that wave. Three waves in a row. An 8.67, an 8.17, an 8.37. Sets herself up high with the stool. Four, six steps, ten. Pedals back. Already had one critical nose ride. A second critical tap of the nose there. And then puts that board on rail. And the read of the wave is incredible. And see how she takes the high line to get that hang ten there. Staying very high to get that set extra nose ride. And again back in for a lock 10. That's the most dynamic 10 of the whole ride. Moves into a five sole arch and just stylishly lifts that arm up and then moves into a very powerful cutback, gaining acceleration off the bottom of the wave. And again, doing another beautiful cutback and kicking out and the body language, the presence, the charisma. This is beyond just contest performance. This is a display of feminine surfing at its finest this is the beauty of longboarding longboarding as dance and i think it's worth all you surf fans looking at the way she's moving this board and the way she's connecting all the dots and utilizing the wave pocket using all of the board and all of the wave well we can't wait to see how this heat unfolds and at the finish of today after a prize giving we'll be tuning into the 805 post show so stay tuned. We'll also be giving the announcement for the 2023 Longboard Tour schedule. Cannot wait to share with the world what the WSL has in store. And it's going to be another great year of longboarding heading into 2023. And we'll be making that announcement during the 805 post show as soon as this heat wraps. We're down to 2 minutes, 15 seconds on the clock. So Lei Erico currently sitting in the lead with two eights in her score line. She's dropping a lower eight as an 817 from her top three waves. Sophia Colleen sitting with a big requirement, a 9.71 a nine to take the win and to win that youngest world title ever away at a 16 years old as we're down to those final two minutes. But it's been Soleil with this momentum and it's Soleil with this opportunity to find herself a second world title. Her first came back in 2018. She could be joining names like Jennifer Smith, like Kalia Muniz, 
as two-time World Longboard Champions, and she could be getting closer to the record that Honolulu Bloomfield holds at three. Yeah, it's going to be an incredible achievement. I was there watching when she won that world title in 2018, and it would be an absolute pleasure to witness her winning a second world title on her in home waters here at Malibu. Her surfing has been outstanding, and she's still young, just 21. But this woman, Sophia Colhane, she has just been sensational. And the, the precision of her nose riding, like I said, referencing all those qualities, the footwork of Khalees Kelly Opaha, the nose riding of Sophia Colhane, and the turning of Soleil Erico. They're three models that we can really all learn a lot from as we see Soleil Erico up and riding low in that wave there. It's a smaller wave, but she's feeling it because she's already got three eights on the board. She's already got three eights on the board. There's only 45 seconds on the clock. She's going to ride this through to the inside with so much of her home community here to cheer her on from Malibu as well, from her California life here and cruising through to the inside section putting in a bit of a victory lap as she digs in that rail and finishes off well, gets in a little bit more footwork, and now she looks back to see with 20 seconds on the clock, is there a chance that Sophia Kalane has caught a wave and could be chasing down that 9.71 to advance? And the opportunity's presenting itself. Sophia Kalane now with one last chance to get a massive score, and that wave shuts down in front of her. She's gonna ride it through with grace regardless. That style and that flow coming through in her surfing so well for the young Hawaiian. It's been incredible to watch her performance throughout this event as she continues through to the inside, but the buzzer sounds and we will have a score to drop from this wave. And she's getting so much great rail work done here. She's got the nose rides, but she gives the thumbs up to our 2022 World Longboard Champion in Soleil Erico. Wow, incredible. I mean, you can see the tears welling up in Soleil's eyes there. She's won her second world title at her home break of Malibu. She really has done herself proud. She was born in New York. She started surfing at Hanalei Bay in Kauai, age 10. She moved to Malibu, age 15, and she has just won her second world title. Soleil Erico from the United States of America, the 2022 Women's World Longboard Champion, hugging Sophia Colhane, who's got an incredible runners-up position, but Shannon, that was such a dynamic display from Soleil. She was unstoppable. Oh, just incredible. Her performance, her board, her equipment, now getting the chair up from Cole Robbins and CJ Nelson behind her in her corner. And she is your 2022 World Longboard Champion, taking a victory out in a year where we've had multiple events. Up until now, it's been Honolulu Bloomfield in the recent years that's taken out the world title every year that we've had more than that single event. And now Soleil gets that win off of a consistent season as well. Absolutely, she got third at the first event of the season in Manly, losing out to Honolulu Bloomfield, three times Women's World Longboard Champion. She got that fifth to Rachel Tilly, um, beating her in Huntington. And now she's taken the win at Malibu and she's taken the world title. Well, let's throw it to the other Malibu local in Strider Wazalewski to take it away with Soleil Erico, your world champion. She's getting a hug right now for Brother Ruben. Soleil took it down. Soleil, congratulations. It's official, the WSL World Longboard Champion. Oh my God, I've been like visualizing this for the last like three months and I've just been out here working so hard and I just can't believe it like paid off. It's insane. It paid off in a big way. You've had a title before, but this really with a whole tour, you know, the, all the events put together really solidifies you as one of the best longboarders in the world. Right now, the best. It's amazing to see. I'm so happy right now. I'm, I'm so thankful for the friends and family that I have. My dad, my mom, CJ Nelson. <laughs> I'm just so thankful for everyone who's been supporting me through the past couple days through like Instagram and stuff. And I'm, yeah, I'm really happy right now. It's insane. <laughs> and tell me, uh, what do you think of all the people down here supporting you? Winning on my home turf is, couldn't be any better. It's actually, like, it literally couldn't be better. I'm just so happy and like I'm just so happy that all the dedication that I put into this and the sacrifice like paid off because I'm like still in college and I had to like skip school and I literally like I'm probably gonna fail out of college after this but it's worth it so it's fine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen your 2022 world longboard champion congratulations.
Stay tuned and we'll be back with more action for the 805 Post Show to break it all down. All across this thing, the Another trip to the nose. Dancing his way to this beautiful section. In control, that was so much style. Trip style through this inside section. Why not switch that? Unreal. Welcome to the 805 Post Show for the Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships presented by O'Neill. It has been an incredible day of surfing here at Malibu. The beach has been packed, the umbrellas have been out. We've seen all the likes of the gloomy cold morning, the, the wind kicking up in the afternoon, but with that crispy hot mid third of the day where there's just so much action that's been going down. We've seen all the sets and we've seen all the excitement of crowning two world champions in Harrison Roach and Soleil Erico. Joining me on the post show as Shannon Hughes is Sam Bleakley and Matt, the Waxhead Chinaski. It's been great to be here calling the action with you. Sam, first reactions on what an incredible day it's been. 
I can safely say it was the best day of competitive longboarding <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. The level of surfing from the men and women was exceptional. It was through the roof. It was just outstanding. Matt, I'm sure you agree. Absolutely. And we're, I'm talking maybe in the scheme of uh, longboard surfing, um, you know, from the glory days of the 1960s, this day will go down as one of the most iconic. The best surfers in the best waves, which is, you know, sounds like a simple task and it's taken a long time to get here and deserve the world champions. And there's so many surfers that have come and gone from the World Longboard Tour that have worked their way and worked so hard behind the scenes to get us here. So we're so thankful for those of you that are tuning in, that are watching today. You know who you are, and, and there's there's a reason that we're here at Malibu today because of you. Yeah, there's people all around the planet who've who've pushed forward this movement to, to re-energize the reason we ride bigger boards, the beauty of longboard, the essence of the footwork, the nose riding, the rail work. And this has come to fruition today, and we can all be proud of that. Well, before we get into more here on the post show, we do have our presentation ready and we're going to crown our world champions. We'll throw down to Kaipo Guerrero now to take us through it all. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, are we up right here on the speakers? Thank you, Malibu. Thank you, all of you. Ta what? Hey, what a tremendous couple of days that we've had here in Malibu and that we've had performing with the world's best longboarders. We had world titles decided in the water just the way we want it. Style, grace, and control all on display here. We want to thank Malibu, the Malibu locals, this community that has been so wonderful. You're an icon of surfing and California surf culture. Oh, I am a, I'm beside myself because this has been probably the best longboard contest that I've ever attended as far as participation, the performance levels, the excitement, buzzer beaters, incredible. Oh, we got some thank yous to give out. So first of all, I wanna thank Jose Cuervo, our title sponsor of this competition. Thank you, Jose Cuervo. Also, thank you to O'Neill, our presenting partner. Thank you to O'Neill. We got some great event partners that helped us out. Hydro Flask, 805, Flying Embers. Thank you to the people over at Epiphone. Turtle Bay Resort and that wonderful VIP area. Our good friends over at Fuwax and Boxed Water. Let's give all of our supporters a hand. And just as importantly, I want to thank the community of Malibu for hosting us and sharing your lineup with us. Mahalo, Malibu. <laughs> I also want to thank the city of Malibu, the Los Angeles Beach County's Harbors, Gary Grisby, and the Los Angeles County Lifeguards. Thank you all for your support. Thank you for bringing this show over here. We are also Deepful, deepfully grateful to our community partners who joined us with our We Are One Ocean beach cleanup here. Thank you to the Surfrider Foundation. Thank you again to Jose Cuervo. The WSL would like to formally recognize Malibu as the traditional homelands of the original Chumash people. Malibu is the anglicized version of the Chumash word Hu Mali Wo, which in Chumash language means the place where the surf sounds loudly. <laughs> now remember, the Chumash people have been here for over 14,000 years and are still here stewarding the land alongside you, the surfers, environmentalists, and others who care about this shared coastline. Thank you all. We thank the, for them for their ongoing presence, participation in this event, and we'd like to pay our respects to the elders of the past, present, and emerging. Thank you. Here to help hand out the trophies, we have Jesse Miley Dyer, the WSL Senior Vice President of Tours and Head of Competition. Thank you, Jesse. We have the WSL Longboard uh, Senior Manager, Kira Seeley. Thank you, Ki Kira. We also have our Chumash representatives in the way of 
Casey Rodriguez and Marianne Parra. Thank you, ladies, for being here. I would now like to invite Casey to say a few words. Haku. First, I'd like to thank my elder, Julie Timomite Stensley, who gave me the green light to lead this amazing journey. Thank you, WSL, for always, always making known that you guys are great visitors on indigenous land. We appreciate all the efforts you come, you bring to us. Not just Chumash indigenous, but the indigenous lands all over the country. We honor and respect you for doing that. Third, I would like to thank Kutosh for blessing us with amazing raves for you guys. Amazing weather. And I thank all of you guys for coming. It really makes our hearts happy to see so many of you joining us on the beach today in a good way. Wherever you guys travel off next, please remember this time next year, we will be here waiting to greet you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's hand out some hardware. Let's hand out some awards. Let's call out the runner-up for the 2022 Cuervo Classic Malibu Longboard Championships. Come on up, Kaniala Stewart. Come on up here. Beautiful surfing. Tani, how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling good. I'm stoked to be here. I'm stoked to make it this far and re-qualify for next year. Uh, thank you guys, everyone, for coming out, uh, watching, supporting us. Uh, love everybody out there. Give it up for Tani Alice Stewart. And the runner-up for the women's for the 2022 Cuervo Classic Malibu. Let's bring up Sophia Colhain, come on up, Sophia. Oh, we're proud of you. 16 years old, big moment. How do you feel? Uh, I feel pretty good. I mean, I'm, everyone keeps telling me I'm only 16 year old, years old, but yeah, everyone surfed really, really great. And congratulations to the champs, and yeah. <laughs> How proud are you of these guys? How are you proud of you of the, your whole crew from Queens? You guys come out here in force. Uh, yeah, I'm really grateful for all my fa friends and family here all the way from Hawaii. And thank you for your support. <laughs> yes, sir, bless her. Let's give it up for these two, our runner-ups. Now, <laughs> let's bring up our champ. It's been a long time coming. In and out of competition, so close in 2021, and now his name is going to be on the list of world champions. Let's bring up Harrison Roach. <laughs> this is our 2022 Cuervo Classic Malibu champion. Let's get a photo. All right. Well, I want to hear some words from you. Long road, great surfing, started the year with a win, ended the year with another win and a world title. Yeah, thanks, Kaipo. First of all, I'd like to uh, pay my respects to traditional owners of this land and the Chumash people. <laughs> pay my respects to... Uh, Elders, past, present, and emerging. Appreciate being here. Malibu is a beautiful place. Uh, it's got a lot of history with longboarding too. And uh, yeah, it's taken a little while to get th to this point. Um, and I got there, so I'm happy. We're happy for it. Let's give it up. Here's our champ of the event and your 2022 World Longboard Champion, Harrison Roach. We got more to give out because on the women's side, the local girl came through for the local crowd and a lot of that was for a lot of your guys' support. Bring up Sole Erico.
Oh, Sole. How, I mean, you came through so many heats in the clutch. Your performance level was excellent. Every time you hit the water, you're feeling right now a title here at home and a second world title. It doesn't feel real, actually. Like, it doesn't. But, you know, maybe later it will. I'm just, yeah, I'm so happy. I've literally been, like, manifesting this. I've been thinking about it, like, every night before I go to bed. And every time I went out and practiced, I would just think, you know, think about the end goal. And I'm, I wanted to give a shout out to Sophia because she is so young. She's 16 and she's in the final. So I just wanted to give a shout out to her. Yes. And um, wow, this is amazing. I love, I love this moment. <laughs> this is a big moment. Soak it up and let's have one more round of applause for all of our champions. All right, <laughs> we're not done yet. We got the event trophies, but we got to give up the big trophies. Let's first, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the big trophy. Harrison? <laughs> well, we'll give a moment because uh, actually, we want to thank, of course, all the blessings that we had, and you know what? The good vibes that we brought brought some waves, and Malibu gave us those gifts. Thank you so much. Okay, now let's make it official. Your 2022 World Longboard Champion, Harrison Roach. Trade out there, Harry, and this is the moment. Hoist that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Your women's 2022 World Longboard Champion, Sole, two times. Here we go, Sole Erico. And with that, I'm going to throw it back to the set to the 805 Post Show. We have some big announcements coming in the Post Show. We're going to talk about next year's season, and it's looking good. Thank you, Malibu, again, and congratulations to Harry and Soleil. Thanks so much, Kaipo, and a massive congratulations to our two world champions, Harrison Roach and Soleil Erico, and to our finalists, and Connie Ellis Stewart and Sophia Culhane. Incredible displays of longboarding, of traditional longboarding celebrated here on the beach in Malibu this week. And it's been such a pleasure to be able to see all the action, Sam. Harry's famously modest at award <laughs> ceremonies. He finally wins a long overdue deserved world title. He doesn't feel the need to lift that above his head. He knows his surfing has been doing the talking for 20 years. And I'm so pleased to see Harrison win this. This is a real statement. He's been doing the type of longboarding that people have been looking up to around the world for two decades. And he's finally got that long overdue world title. Absolutely. He saw the transition a long time ago and it, there's sort of a alarm bell start ringing. We were chatting about for Offset. Like, it's crazy that this world title represents so many people and the emerging uh, style of longboarding that is seen all around the world. All those little cultural pockets. An incredible celebration as we can see those world champions getting some photos and to be able to see that celebration of the sport here against the classic Malibu wall. Yeah, iconic. I mean, this is such a heritage location, you know, from the early days of Tube Steak to Lance Carson to all of the 90s resurgence longboards like Kassir Maydor and Carla Rowland Zamora and Jimmy Gambo, Josh Fairborough. Dane Peterson, and then now this contemporary crop with Soleil Erico winning a world title in front of the iconic Malibu wall that has shaped surfing lifestyles around the world for generations. Well, let's take a look at Harrison's road to the world title. His final say, Matt, was pretty unreal. Phenomenal surfing, the best I've ever seen Harrison Roach surf, and I've seen him surf pretty much every competitive event since he was 11 years old. Surfing the full length of the board, ticking the boxes, the criteria, but doing it with so much style. Style is subjective at the best of times, but not in this case. Harry telling people and making a statement 
Will he come back next year? I don't know because he did this. I don't know if he can trumpet. Can you surf any better? Exactly. This this might be the icing on the cake for him. He might be happy with this. And it was so special that Thomas Beckson was on the sand to watch because Thomas Beckson creates these incredible designs that Harry rides. Yeah, and this board in particular, Shannon, uh, was designed specifically for this win at Malibu. That's right. He needed to make some adjust adjustments to make sure he could really get those deep pocket nose rides and the extended nose rides, but as well as carrying that rail work, his partner ED was here with him on the beach as well. And I mean, look at this section. That's the mid-board trim we talk about that sets him up. Everything was purposeful. His whole routine, his just performance, everything was functional like that. Just, I mean, you, you can't coach that. You can barely train for it. It's a feeling and it's a connection that we've referenced so many times throughout this event. And we know all about the surfing that he's been doing for so long at Noosa, but he's also spent a lot of time here at Malibu and he's had those massive heats with Taylor Jensen that he's sometimes lost by a narrow margin. But this time, that semi-final, when he had that momentum from the semi, you just felt it was going to be his year. Yeah, once he made it past that semi-final, all things were working in his way. He took out Colt Robbins in that quarterfinal as well. And then Connie Ellis Stewart, who was one of the informed surfers of the event. And Connie Ella Stewart for me is the contemporary poster boy of international longboarding. He just embodies all the cool charisma. It's everything we want to achieve, that style, that upright posture, those hood ornament hang tens, that Hawaiian style. And we know he's going to be back for world titles. He could win, you know, at least at three or maybe more world titles in the next 10 years. Uh, just, it's an, such an international uh, art form, lifestyle, sport, whatever you want to call it. But what the performance that we saw today was incredible and the highlight reel will be one of the best we've ever seen in the history of longboarding. And one of the main standouts in that highlight reel is none other than the local Soleil Erico. Her road to winning a world title, her second world title here at home was such a graceful thing to witness. Well, from the get-go, I was loving the reinvention of Soleil surfing. I remember her winning that world title with trim base surfing and more of a squat roundhouse cutback. But what she's got now is this flex and power in these knees, this hip work, this release off rail, this wide point back. That board suits her and the nose riding is as critical as ever. Everything about this has been dynamic. That velvet hour board has bought a type of longboarding to me that I know a lot of women around the world are going to really now aspire to achieve themselves. I think a lot had to do with the foot positioning. You can really notify that front foot and that's, that's just not a simple thing to identify and change in someone's routine. It's everything. It's your power base. It's the way you, you feel comfortable. It's that front foot is just leading and she's opening up those hips, allowing that fluid flowing surfing from the tail middle and the nose. And there was a lot of body language. There was a lot of Australian influence to the way she was surfing. I saw elements of, of Nat Young, of Bob McTavish, of even Wayne Lynch. And then I, I felt like Kat Hughes, the great Australian female longboarder who won, was one of the modern pioneers of the drop knee for Australian female longboarders. There was a lot of that in Soleil surfing and she was just on fire and I felt like she would have that momentum and sure enough she did take the win. And she started with that win against Alice Lemoyne in the quarterfinals then took out Mason Tremor the Australian in the semis and then to match up with the 16 year old and Sophia Kalane for that final. What a way to finish things out. And we must g give a big shout out to Sophia. She was a model of nose riding. I felt Kalis Kelly Park Aha was a model of footwork, Sophia was a model of nose riding, and Soleil was a model of rail work. But Sophia, her nose riding on those Michael Takayama boards was textbook. And I just say to all of you surf fans around the world, watch the video replays, because today was beyond special. Well, it's been a special day, and we're going to continue on with more of the 805 Post Show after this. And we're going to bring in Jesse Miley Dyer to talk us through the longboard tour schedule for next year. So stay tuned for all that information.
Welcome back to the 805 Post Show. We're here in Malibu, where we've just crowned the new World Longboard Champions, and it's been a really fun couple of days with some of the best surf we've seen all year, and the surfers just being so excited to get the opportunity to surf here at Malibu. Shannon Hughes in the booth, joined by Sam Bleakley, and now Jesse Miley Dyer of Tours and Competition. And Jesse, you're going to break down the news for us on the new Longboard World Tour, but first off, your thoughts on this week's event. Oh my gosh, I mean, what an amazing event and what an amazing wave. Um, but you can't go wrong with, with crowning two world champions in the final here. And I mean, <clears throat> to, for us to have to, a day like today in Malibu and the waves we've had today, um, it's been incredible. I'm, I'm really proud of the whole tour. So are we. We're so excited as fans of the sport. And now to find out what's happening next year. What can we look forward to for that 2023 tour? What are the stops? How many can we expect and where will they be? Yeah, so actually we're going to be having um, four events for the 2023 World Longboard Tour. So we're extending um, our ev event footprint by one. And, um, you know, we've got a mixture of some classic point breaks in there and some new spots. We're going to be going to Bells Beach. Um, we're going to El Salvador. We'll be in Malibu for uh, a world title. And then we have a fourth longboard tour stop that uh, is yet to be determined. So excited to see those those stops coming through, Sam. Oh, wow. Uh, what an honor to get the first reaction to that. I mean, Bells Beach, Jesse. I mean, that is iconic for surf culture globally. And what an exciting opportunity for longboarders to put on a great display at another iconic point break. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and one of the things, too, when we're looking at Bells and El Salvador, Malibu, it's, it's this condensed format that we're looking at. Um, we're going to be having these events closer together so that we can allow the athletes to travel and, you know, really a, a, a great focus on on longboarding for the surf industry. Well, falling on to that, what can we expect for that qualification process to qualify for the 2023 tour? How many surfers? And yeah, what do we expect for that qualification process? So we're going to have 24 surfers for both men's and women's tours. Uh, we're taking eight off of the 2022 tour, so we're going to have that eight as of today. Uh, then we have 14 that will be coming from the regions, which is really important for us. And we're really focused on uh, regional qualifiers right now. And the goal is absolutely to have more than one in each region. And then we'll have two event wild cards, which will be determined by the tools and competition team. Incredible, Sam, to see those numbers up to 24 for the longboarders. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is fantastic. I mean, we can really see from this th these last couple of days the, the strength and depth of international longboarding represented from as far afield as Peru and around Europe and here in the States and out of Hawaii and Australia. And it really is exciting to expand that field to 24. And I know there's a lot of young talent out there who will be super hungry to get the chance to win a world title next year here at Malibu. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, WSL Rising Tides yesterday, when we look at that, that next generation even, um, there's a lot of young kids coming up. And, and I think 24 is absolutely the right number. And seeing that the numbers have increased to that extra four surfers, what are we looking at for a format? So the format um, for our finals day is going to be the big one that we're really excited about. So when we're coming to Malibu next year, we're going to have a one-day uh, event format that will be crowning a world, world champion. And every and that will be similar to the CT as we looked at. That's, that's the event to crown it. Um, we're going to actually have eight surfers in that format. So it'll be the best eight men and women. And, you know, it's all going to come down to that final day. And you've got to win it in the water. Incredible, Sam, to see those world champions crowned in the water. Absolutely. And such an exciting schedule, you know, to be crowning champions at Malibu. And also the role of El Salvador has a big part to play in longboard culture. There were scenes in Big Wednesday filmed in El Salvador. And, yeah. uh, you know, and it, it was a replica of the iconic right-hand point break. El Salvador is packed with some of the best longboard waves in the world. And that's going to be extremely exciting to move between bells to El Salvador to have that fourth location and then to crown those titles with that shorter field here in Malibu. I mean, it, it, you know, we couldn't ask for much more. It really makes me excited about what we're going to see next year and the performances, because I've noticed this year that people have really put a lot of emphasis into that relationship with their surfboard shapers to really not only be dynamic on the nose, but dynamic on the rail. And that makes for exciting surfing, not only for the spectators, but also for the surfers pushing themselves, pushing the boundaries and taking longboarding forward. Yeah, we heard a lot of feedback this year around um, the types of waves that the surfers, you know, for longboarding want to surf. And, um, you know, we've really put a lot of time and effort into thinking about those point break style waves where the tool is going to shine. And, you know, obviously the jewel for longboarding is here in Malibu, which is why that's where we'll be crowning world champions next year. But to have um, El Salvador and Bells, I think uh, is awesome. And um, I'm really excited to see, see us be, be there. 
I think that's so incredible. It's going to be a wonderful celebration of longboarding next year, bringing in those extra events as well, and some international destinations and some different ways maybe than our surfers have been competing on, which is great to see. Jesse, I want to know, how is the WSL, you know, what are the thoughts behind the scenes for the WSL tours and competitions team on longboarding now that you've been able to see the celebration of the sport here at Malibu? Um, you know, I think that um, this year for me, just learning a lot about longboarding and, and being a part of it, really for the first time has been awesome. Um, you know, we've got, we've we've brought in Kira, we have Tori as our head judge. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of uh, energy being put into it and a lot of focus. And I think that's really important, you know, for us when we're looking at this tour and, and, and thinking about, you know, how amazing it can be for both our athletes and for us and for something for us to be proud of. Um, that's that's a really important thing. So I'm really happy to have Kira and Tori on the team, and and for us to to be really um, you know really solid for the tour going forward. Well, on behalf of longboarders worldwide, I thank you. We're so excited to see the investment from the WSL, and we cannot wait for next year. Jesse, thanks so much for breaking it all down for us. Sam and I will be hanging in here, and we'll ta be taking a look at the Cuervo Top Five right after this. to the 805 post show. Good evening from Malibu. We've just crowned our world champions in Harrison Roach and Soleil Erico as the sun is beginning to set and the locals have taken to the lineup. Finally, they get to enjoy the perfect sets that have been rolling through throughout the day. Shannon Hughes in the booth to call the post show alongside of Sam Bleakley and Matt Chanaski. It's been great to call the action with you. And we've got a great setup now leading into the flying embers wave of the day. There were quite a few good ones to pick from and let's see which one landed at the top. Oh my word, Harrison Roach. 
Harrison just navigating from the nose there. Beautiful style. He faded into his initial bottom turn and just classic surfing by Harrison Road on a clean, long Malibu wall. Oh, he's in that pocket. Perfect timing. Reading this wave very well. Matt, the footwork yeah. so impressive with Roach coming through here. And the look at how picture perfect Malibu is right now for finals day. This is absolutely insane. Come on. Four waves ridden and three of them are all nice. All in the excellent range. Well, he finds three nines in the semifinals. The 9.4 for Harrison Roach out of a semifinal results in the Flying Embers wave of the day, Sam. Oh, he was just on fire. And the, the, the measured pace, the way he walks in line with the lip, everything is always in that pocket. And the nuances, the way he surfs the middle of the board, I don't think any longboarder in history has surfed the middle of the board as well as Harrison Roach. We have to cast back a very long way to see a performance like that to Nat Young in 1966 and a regurgitated world tour at some amazing waves. The tempo of Harrison Roach throughout this event was just perfect. Walks away with the highest single score of the day with that 9.4. And now we get to talk through the Cuervo top five, the top five moments out of today's action and kicking off with number five, Kai Salas goes for broke with that nice trim line to start and literally breaks the fin out of the back seat. Uh, I mean, Kai Salas has just been on fire all yesterday and all today, but the hold on the nose here, he was absolutely gunning for that world title and rode this way right through to the inside and didn't hold back whatsoever. Everything mixing up and not backing down one moment until the full Rio onto the sand, knocking the fin out. It was commitment, it was dynamic, and it was right to the front line. He needed the score at the time and he needed a dynamic finish and that he provided. He actually made this onto the short, fin snapped out and he got the score at the time. And you saw the fin pop out of the water there. Absolutely. And there was a minute left at, at that stage. He was wondering, do I get back out in the water? And he saw the fin, board swap, heat was over. And it was a great heat with Kaimana Takayama and, and he, he referenced back to how inspiring it was to surf that heat and really be pushed to the edge. Take, took the run around. And now taking out number four was the buzzer beater from Soleil Erico in her quarterfinal earlier today where she took out Alice Lemoyne. Well, Alice Lemoyne had been doing some of the longest nose rides we'd seen all event on her Luffy board, the model called the one. But what we saw from Soleil Erico was mixing it up, that element of the criteria that says use all of the board and all of the wave. And when she puts the board on rail, look at the ground she covers, the top of the wave, the bottom of the wave, and then projecting off the bottom of the wave to come back into the high section for the nose rise. This was incredible all-round longboarding, and it was the type of surfing that took her all the way to that world title. Scored a 7.8 for it, gave some jumps on the beach with her friends and family around, and that was her real start to that run to a world title. Coming in at number three, it's Connie Ella Stewart, putting in a clutch performance, pulls through with an 8.07 to advance to the finals, Matt. Phenomenal surfing from Connie in that heat against Declan White, and absolutely clutch. In the last few minutes of the event, he was under pressure, hadn't even surfed a wave for over 15 minutes and came up with that beautiful hang 10. And just when we thought it was finished, he finished it right in the shore break with an off the top, surfing it right to the sand. Footwork from Carney and the variety in his turns, throwing in those little drop knees is a huge improvement from what we've seen. And it is scary times. The Hawaiians are looking dominant. Put together an incredible performance to walk away number two in the world. Get that requalification for next year, but really just display what longboarding is all about from Coniella Stewart as our number three. Up next, number two in the world is the world title for Harrison Roach, your 2022 world longboard champion, Matt. Once again, the tempo and everything in the did not put a foot wrong in pretty much any of his heats. It was one slip up that actually caught Carniella off in the final as well, where a bit <laughs> of backwash caught them both, you know, with that incoming tide. But look at that, just hot dogging off the tail, using the full length of the board. But it was his round turns that set him up for these nose rides. Very little concave in this board, letting the tail do all the work. And Harry's body language shows that he knew how confident he was in getting those scores. Incredible performance from Harrison Roach, your 2022 World Longboard Champion. Yeah, and it was all about that nose riding from the tail as well, using that board design to really allow that lift. But 
Harrison's nuance is that footwork and that connectivity, the way he works the middle of the board between sections, is something that famously was under-recognized in longboard competition, but is now getting rewarded. And he's it's, it's long overdue, this world title. All longboard fans have known that he's been one of the best for a long time. With the chair up. And then Soleil Erica wins her second world title after her first in 2018 and becomes the 2022 world longboard champion. The read of the waves was a key thing for Soleil. A lot of her best waves all delivered through the midsection all the way to the inside because she chose the right line early on. And then once she gets loose through these inside sections and comes hard off the bottom, climbs to the top to engage for the lock on the hold of the nose ride with the classic posture with the Malibu pier in the background. That is absolutely iconic into that amazing roundhouse cutback. Uh, sitting on the beach and watching that final live and that roundhouse on the shore break, my gosh, the finishing maneuver on that just showed and, t and really was a tip of the hat to show the judges she was leaving nothing left to be answered. Was the nose riding enough? Yes. Was the mid-board connectivity enough? Yes. Were her end section maneuvers and choice of waves enough? Yes, yes, and yes, and here it is. Best rail surfing of the event, Soleil Erico, but all round, using all the board, all of the wave, dynamic, and also the body language. For me, this was longboarding as dance. Wow, we have to say with performances like that from Soleil Erico, with gracious wins and those emotional moments from both of our surfers, we have to say that the future of longboarding is bright. Absolutely. I mean, Harrison finally has got that world title. When Justin Quintal won that world title, it was a sense of relief for a lot of longboarders around the world. Finally. Uh, you know, these are people who have excelled in the duct tape invitationals. And to be able to translate the type of longboarding that people love to this WSL level and to have the whole tour orientated around this future-facing approach to longboarding is really special. So. Big plus for the WSL, big thank you. Stoked for Harry and also Soleil, for me, a role model for the future of women's longboarding. Incredible, Matt, to be able to just witness all the action and be a part of it. And finally, it really feels like longboarding has become its own. You know, this, this, there was a story to be told this year and we climaxed it here at Malibu. Who would have thought the final between these four surfers, anyone could have gone any way. Khalees getting knocked out in that semi-final. There was so many different scenarios coming into this. But it ended up at the very last heat with Harrison taking that win and Khalees and, and Sophia battling it off for that, uh, that Hawaiian world title. But Sole taking the win. Yeah, incredible performances to be able to see the local take it out. And Harrison Roach and the Australian stay tuned for highlights. But also tune in to the EDP Visla Pro and Ira Serra for more action in Portugal all the way through October 9th. Malibu, the iconic longboard wave. This is the longboarders' pipeline. It puts our hair on end when we see good longboarding. It really especially is. It's the way. most exciting thing. Lovely use of footwork. No downtime in between. You can have that was sensational. She just ticked all of the boxes that those judges are looking for. There's no That was outstanding from Connie Ella. Oh, look at that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Looking as loose and groovy as ever. That was a beautiful bit of surfing. Chloe come on, coming through in a clutch situation. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to crown world champions today. This is going to be a fantastic day. Kawabunga, let's get it going. Executing everything with perfection. This is like a longboard dream tour.
This is one of the great stylish longboarders of the modern era. We have the quarterfinals on the way. I'm so excited about this. It is enough. Sole, Erico moves on. Well. Wow. <laughs> Mason Shrev has been surfing phenomenally well. approach to longboarding. This is where women's longboarding could go. Finding a beautiful trim line. It's going to be Juan in the water. 2022 World Longboard Champion, Paris Approach. Our 2022 World Longboard Champion, Delay Erica. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.